This video is sponsored by viewers like you. Thanks to all my patrons. Be warned that footage from these shows often contains flashing and strobing lights. Please proceed with caution if you are photosensitive. Or if you care for children. What in the fuck? If you played any number of Sonic the Hedgehog games, you know they can go in some pretty wild directions. But just as often, they might leave you with a sense of, wow, I paid money for that. Turns out his history with television is just as spotty. As I've mentioned, I'm working on a full franchise retrospective of Sonic Boom, and it's not a spoiler to say that it was a bit of a misguided spin-off that didn't quite pay off. But Boom wasn't his first show to make everyone stop and ask, why? Sonic Underground, his third and final cartoon produced by Deke Entertainment, coming half a decade after their Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Hedgehog, better known as Sat AM. Both cult classics for very different reasons. Where Adventures was a light-hearted, Looney Tunes-esque goof-around, loosely based on the games. Deke made a lot of licensed cartoons for games at the time. Sat AM was a dark, dystopian story of rebellion. Underground bears most similarities to Sat AM in its blueprint, but with a new plot, new characters, and a new version of Mobius. Before starting this video, I'd never seen or interacted much with Sonic Underground. My knowledge was limited to only ever hearing that it sucked, and... The detractors didn't make me want to avoid the show nearly as much as that made me want to watch it, so here we are. The story is such, Sonic is now one of the triplets of Queen Alina, the ruler of Mobius overthrown by Dr. Robotnik. The Queen is given a prophecy as to how she can defeat him, but it requires her to separate and abandon her three children. Many years later, the kids are reunited with each other and form a rebellion slash rock band while they search for their lost mother and use instruments as laser guns. Meanwhile, everything looks like if the Mighty Ducks cartoon was digested. This is absurd. But it's not that much more absurd than what happened in Archie. It's basically a weird reimagining of the Archie Sat AM setup, just putting Sonic into Sally's place. Here's the thing. We're over two decades past the beginning and end of Sonic Underground. In that time, we've had the two adventure games, Heroes, Shadow 06 Unleashed, Colors, Forces, Sonic X, Sonic Boom, the lawsuits, continuity reboot, and subsequent cancellation of the Archie comics, and the complete reevaluation of everything about all of them and their placements in the franchise's history. I feel like it's time Underground got the same. But there is no reevaluation without going back and understanding the context. And goddammit, I need to know the context as to how this happened. So let us return to 1993 and the show that Underground replaced. And maybe, just maybe. I intend to do with Sat AM what this video is for Sonic Underground, an episode-by-episode -episode review. But for the sake of this video, I'll stick to a thorough overview of my thoughts on the show. However, those full episode reviews will be put together as a Patreon exclusive for a full year. There will be a link below when that video is out. For now, let's start at the beginning. Sega of America approached Deke Entertainment in 1992 to create a cartoon based on Sonic, who had just released his hugely successful sequel and introduced his best cast member. Sonic the Hedgehog, or Sat AM as we know it now, was originally planned to be a lighthearted and comedic Saturday morning show, but Deke wanted to produce more episodes for weekday syndication, and after some arguing with ABC, they settled and made the Looney Tunes-esque Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog to take that weekday slot. Sat AM instead became a darker, more story-driven show, and by its second season, Deke actually cancelled Adventures so they could focus on it more. While Deke animator Phil Harnage is believed to have drawn one of the show's earliest pitches, as seen here in the UK's Sonic the Poster Mag No. 1, the show as we came to know it was largely the brainchild of veteran TV writer Len Jansen. He wrote the original show bible that would be heavily reworked for the actual production, though much of that bible would also be carried over to the Archie comics. Archie's initial miniseries actually beat the show to release by almost a year. Jansen also wrote the pilot, Heads or Tails, which has that much lighter and sillier tone that would be given to Adventures and early Archie instead. I will level with you all. First time sitting through Sat AM, I didn't see what was the big deal. I certainly liked it, but aside from some baller art direction, I didn't see why it was such a sacred cow among certain corners of the fandom. But I did see why people got attached to it. And then I sat through it a second time after watching all of Sonic Underground, and I really saw it. This is Sonic's best cartoon. The ball's in Sonic Prime's court to beat it, and it has an uphill battle. Number one, Tails. 
What a freaking angel. He is so cute and sweet. He does no wrong at any point in this series, and he warms my heart whenever he shows up. His and Sonic's brotherly relationship shines whenever it actually gets to appear. This is not foreshadowing. He befriends a dinosaur, and it is the cutest goddamn thing. Sonic Max on the dinosaur's mom. It's some weird shit. He does his first official mission as a freedom fighter, and he does so well. I'm so proud of him, and he barely shows up. Fuck this show. No problem. Number two, the art direction and animation. Season one is a little jank. You can tell which part of everyone's face was a separate animation cell because things like this happen. Oh, merci. But I'm so used to the flat and sterile look of the digital age that the hand-drawn gritty look of this show is so refreshing and appealing. The backgrounds alone make this show worth watching. They are incredible to look at. The animation in general gets a big bump in season two. Its first half is a joy to watch with some wonderfully fluid and expressive character motion. Though it feels like the budget started getting cut by the time of the Antoine shorts, put a pin in that. Number three, the voice acting. We of course have Jaleel White as Sonic, then only really known for playing Steve Urkel on Family Matters for three to four years by then. And being as young as he was, Sonic mostly sounds like that. He brings a lot of confidence and personality to the role, which helps to break through the nasal readiness of the voice. But right alongside him is Kath Susie as Sally and Nicole, the late Christine Cavanaugh as Bunny, a very young Bradley Pierce as Tails, Mark Below and later Cam Brainer as Rotor, all giving very organic and charismatic performances that instantly endear all of them right from the pilot except Antoine. I won't linger on Kath Susie's voice. If you've heard it, I don't need to. Hi guys. Special mention to the late William Wyndham as Uncle Chuck, who brings so much warmth and fatherly charm. Chuck's a big highlight whenever he appears, in part because of Wyndham's performance. <laughs> you should have seen your faces. And of course, the famously, viciously horny performance by Jim Cummings as Robotnik. He might be the most famous part of this show, like his fellow Robotnik Long John Baldry was for adventures, but for very different characters. Snively, what color is my heart? Credit also to Charlie Adler as his long-suffering lackey, Snively. He does a great job as the simpering, put-upon slime ball with delusions of grandeur. And yes, that is entirely a compliment. Snively's great. Tim Curry as Sally's father. Yes, that Tim Curry. Michael Bell as Nagus. And Shari Belafonte as Lupe also bring a lot of charisma in their cameos in season two. And you know what? Rob Paulson is doing his very best with Antoine. It's not his fault. Antoine is just in the completely wrong show. Especially season two, we'll get to it. Season one had different writers for each episode, and to the production team's credit, the tone, pacing, and energy stays pretty consistent despite that. Mobius is a dark, gloomy, techno-dystopian setting that pits nature and rampant industry against each other. Though with touches of magical realism, Sonic has super speed, Tails can fly with his two tails, people can be transformed partially or entirely into robots, but maintain at least some of their original selves. The plots usually start with the Freedom Fighters taking out Robotnik's installations, trying to get a leg up on him power-wise, or disrupting his plans, and the unique problem or scenario is extrapolated from there. Sally gets replaced with a robot copy, they find traces of her father's whereabouts, creepy horny goat man, things like that. Other times, Robotnik causes a problem a little too close to their hideout of Knothole Village, and they need to solve it so he doesn't find them. Usually the solution is, use Power Ring. It's just a little too convenient, so it's refreshing when they have to do something else. But things also get weird sometimes. It's clear the writers were still figuring out what Sonic's world would really look like, and what would fit into that context. Hindsight shows that the franchise on the whole leans a lot on sci-fi. Eggman and his robots are the primary antagonists. The Death Egg is an homage to Star Wars. They sometimes go into space and meet aliens or time travel. But Sat AM only came around after Sonic 2, and it's still experimenting with the boundaries of the franchise. Franchise. It's not just techno-dystopian, it's set in a kingdom with a princess trying to get her father, the king, and their throne back. So there are also elements of fantasy in there. But they're incidental. It can be easy to forget that Sally is an actual princess, even when characters are calling her princess. As a character, she's very grounded and an active leader and fighter. So when the show foregoes its more grounded concepts and jumps straight into fantasy, it feels like a non sequitur. On one hand, we have Sonic and Sally, easily the show's best episode, where Robotnik switches Sally with a very convincing robot duplicate. The tension of the episode is waiting to see if the heroes will see through the charade before the robot can give away Knothole's location. 
But on the other hand, we have the episode Super Sonic, and there's just this fucking wizard. There's a wizard asleep for centuries, and Robotnik steals his power for himself as the plot of the day. His power is a magic computer, but still, it's magic. The Sonic franchise would play with magic and fantasy a lot more as it went on. The Chaos Emeralds are magical in some way. We have Sonic and the Black Knight. And Naga shows up in Season 2, and his design and character feel like they fit better with this world. But... This dude's just a fucking wizard in the middle of this Blade Runner hellscape who never shows up again. He feels more like something from the Smurfs. Hell, he looks like Long Gargamel. The episodes in general hit more often than they miss, but you do get a snoozer like Warp Sonic with its tedious romantic jealousy and dick waving by Sonic and Antoine, and this dude is just uncomfortable to look at. Harmonic Sonic feels like it's just from a completely different show, though it has this incredible moment. Hold it, hold it! Now what your problem is? You're all and Sonic's Nightmare and Sonic Racer feel like they don't fully capture the potential of their ideas. Go away, Sonic Underground, you'll get your turn. But the remaining nine episodes, including the pilot, have a lot going for them. And again, Sonic and Sally, a legit great piece of television. Highly recommended. But all that is just season one. Season two is a different beast. The show now had creative leads in writing duo Ben Hurst and Pat Ali, who wrote Sonic and Sally. With them and new director Ron Myrick at the helm, Sat AM not only visibly looked different, but began telling ongoing stories about the Freedom Fighters developing a de-roboticizer, the presence of a realm called the Void, Uncle Chuck regaining his mind and working as a double agent, the heroes meeting other cells of the Freedom Fighters, and Robotnik planning his final complete takeover of Mobius, the Doomsday Project. This season was also, notably, boned by the executives. The higher-ups at Deke decided the show needed two major changes. First, a new female lead character, who came in the form of a dragon named Dulcie. You know how Antoine in Season 1 feels out of place because it's like he came from a different show? Dulcie seriously looks like she wandered onto set from Dragon Tales. Season 2, Episode 1, she is just a main cast member out of nowhere, and you're expected to welcome her like she was always there. This is going to be difficult if you don't like her shtick. She will spend a good 20 seconds of each appearance crashing into the ground or into buildings, then babbling dizzily to her absent mom. Hey, I'm home, ma. The exact same way, every time she shows up, and boy does it never get funny. However, and I do mean however, I like Dulcie. I don't love her, but I do like her. I didn't at first, obviously. Hell, I didn't at seventh when she gets her own fucking episode. But by that point, two things have started to happen. One, the writers massively toned down her obnoxiousness. It actually allowed the charm in her personality and Cree Summer's vocal performance and her camaraderie with the cast to come through. They learned to rein her in, and she is much less of a distraction in following episodes. And two, that second major change to the show has become so much worse than her. Antoine. He's not just out of place in this show anymore, he's the reason to not watch it. Take everything deeply unfunny and uncomfortable about stereotype comedy, take away the comedy, and anything halfway charming and subtle about the character, and just pay Rob Paulson to blather high-pitched for 20 minutes. The vocal performance is like if the flanderization of Spongebob happened in one season. Dr. Edgehog, bonjour. How much farther, my princess? Ah! Oui, oui, oui. You are all nothing but the lowly pheasant. <laughs> then, take away two entire episodes that were planned to introduce new groups of freedom fighters and give them entirely to Antoine. Executives demanded four Antoine shorts for this season. One of them, Ghost Busted, is actually a tale short made in tribute to a late friend and animator, and it's saved entirely because of that. The other three are ass. If you plan to watch this show, I beg you at minimum to skip The Odd Couple. It is unwatchable. And frankly, ghost busted, but only visually. It's really hard to look at. But it doesn't even stop there, because he's such a major presence in the other episodes, and he's even more of a useless coward now. I understand wanting comic relief and such in a dark show like this, especially one targeted to kids, but Christ, he would get them all killed yesterday. Ant somehow takes the place of Dulcie as the annoying and unnecessary load on the series over the course of the season, actively ruining Cry of the Wolf in particular by never shutting up about- the girl! Don't forget the curse! There is no curse! 
is no stupid curse! His mere presence redeems her as a character. My patrons and I were dreading the episode dedicated entirely to her, and somehow it's the point where we completely turned around on her, because by then the writers made Antoine so much worse. They also have her tell Antoine to shut up a lot, so we came around on Dulcie pretty fast. And it's so disappointing, because if you were able to delete him from the season, it would easily be as good as the first. Season 1 tends to get the most love because it has the least awful in it, but Season 2 has the intriguing, ongoing plots, Uncle Chuck is now a major player and is a very welcome presence, the episode where they briefly de-roboticize him is a favorite of mine, especially the haunting scene of it being reversed. That episode is followed by Sonic getting high as balls and becoming Snively's best friend, and I'm only half kidding, also a favorite of mine. And I know this will sound insane, but while there's no episode as good as Sonic and Sally, Dulcie is a respectable second place. I couldn't believe it either. I can't say Antoine is the only bad thing about this season. The two-parter about time travel and the overall Doomsday Project plot also don't live up to their potential, and Sally saving their fucking nanny but not Uncle Chuck is some horseshit, but it would easily be on par with the first otherwise. Deke and ABC did a lot to hurt this season, and the fact that the whole show ends here is an eternal loss. For all of my criticisms, one thing I will never dispute is how much love was put into this show. Ben Hurst gave an interview that's included in the DVD box set, and he talks very fondly about the experience of writing and editing on the show, working with the enthusiastic artists who would drag him down to their offices and show him their work, bigging up Len Jansen and season two director Ron Myrick. We fell in love with what we were doing, which is really unusual. It wasn't just a job, it was truly an adventure for us as much as it was uh, an adventure that became something on the screen. He ends the interview by talking about how the crew would gather around to watch completed episodes with food and drinks, and they'd cheer and boo like they were watching sports. There was a real camaraderie behind the scenes that is tangible when you watch it. Some of Sonic's worst and blandest moments felt like they were missing heart, from the main subject of this video to, frankly, the whole of the 2010s for the franchise. Something like Sat AM, with as much passion as was put into it, sticks around much longer in people's minds. These days, Sat AM stands as a bit of a sacred cow for older Sonic fans, especially if they grew up with it or with its cousin, the Archie comics. Despite the flaws in the show I could point out, and have, I don't think it's just nostalgia goggles. There is a lot to like and even love, but I think its best friend in hindsight is the haunting specter of what could have been. Before Ben Hurst passed away, he revealed several things they had planned for a season 3, outside of just Snively and Nogus taking over. There was a fervent, grassroots movement among the fandom to revive the show for several years after, but it sadly never came to be. Hurst revealed why when he answered questions from fans in the 90s on the Usenet discussion group alt.fan.sonic-hedgehog. I'm from the 90s and this is like archaeology to me. He talked about a meeting he had with Deke's executive producer Robbie London, who would be relevant again very soon, about potentially reviving the show for a third season. London said it just wasn't going to happen because, at the time, Sonic as a general franchise didn't pull in the same big numbers as the Ninja Turtles or Power Rangers, who the show was competing with while it was still airing. Apparently Sat AM ranking 9th in the ratings with 4.8 million viewers was not big enough, but this was the 90s. Broadcasting was a gluttonous beast that had another decade or so before it choked on the internet. Hearst also noted that a lack of marketing played a big part, and that it suffered from the same problems as the then-active Sonic Underground. It didn't get mass marketing campaigns or a lot of commercials, and it aired unpredictably, all factors in low ratings. Indeed, some people never even saw Sat AM until it aired in syndication, and Hearst credits this to being how it really gained its audience. In other words, too late. This raises the question, why then did they make another Sonic cartoon? If, according to Robbie London, Sonic didn't draw in viewers, and the fan demand for a third Sat AM season wasn't good enough, why did they bother with a whole new show at all? It's most likely because in 1997, the Sega Dreamcast was on its way. So, get Sega's flagship character on TV again, and that might help boost sales of the console. Yes, Sonic Underground and Sonic Adventure were concurrent with each other. They don't relate in any way and neither help the other, but it's funny to think about. Later in 2005, Ben Hurst talked about his experiences writing on Sonic Underground and why Deke made it rather than reviving Sat AM. There had been a change of leadership at ABC that led to Deke ultimately trashing the idea of a third season, despite the strong push from fans, and instead going in a different direction. The reason? 
so they could make more residuals by adding songs. Sonic is a licensed property. Deke were only there as hired guns to make Sega money by making Sonic cartoons. By adding musical numbers to the show, Deke themselves made more royalties from reruns. Theoretically, the songwriters would get royalties, but Deke made them sign over most or all to the company. If that sounds kind of shitty, you should read about the mess that led to the Archie versus Ken Penders lawsuit. This shit is shit and it's everywhere. The point being, Underground ultimately existed to make cash for Deke and not just for Sega. So that's how we got here. Corporate bullshit. Hearst said that he was not happy working on Underground, that he was sad he didn't get to develop it at all like he had with Sat AM, and the writing process sounded like a mess. It started out with cattle calls, Hearst and Ali became story editors after previous writers were fired, and they had to save unusable scripts from other fired writers and they weren't credited for it. Not really a show with a creative vision. Never mind that the turnover was two episodes a week for its original airing in France. But he also said after rewatching some of it that he was surprised it was as good as it was. Does that mean it's good? My turn to find out, I guess. Down the hatch. Oh. Before we begin, I want to... Before we begin, I want to consider the original air dates of these episodes, both in France and in America. The show first aired in France half a year before it aired in English-speaking countries, and as a partially French production, I'm inclined to believe that this was also roughly its production order. It's not uncommon for cartoons to get aired somewhat out of intended order, and Sat AM Season 1 is like a jigsaw puzzle, but the funny thing about Underground is that there's only one change between the two regions, and that's for what counts as the first episode. In France, it was wet Bell Blues, while in the US they swapped its placement with the later episode Beginnings. The latter is intended as the origin story of the show, so it's at least understandable why they moved that to the front. Except, it's only the first third of the three-part origin story arc. There's 40 more minutes of this story that America didn't see for over a month because Beginnings was episode 26. As such, these two episodes seem to exist as both episode 1 and episode 26. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to look at them as both. I'm going to compare what it's like to go from each of them into episode 2 and see which works better as an introduction to the show. But later, when we reach episode 26, we're going to wrap back around. We'll see if beginnings shouldn't have been taken so far from the origin story arc. But in English, they decided it should go first, and they had the benefit of an extra half a year to make that decision. So let's start there. We begin with this legendary theme song. Triplets born, the throne awaits. This song rocks way harder than it has any right to, and considering one of its songwriters worked on the rest of the show's songs, reminder, there's one in every episode, I'm actually kind of looking forward to hearing them. The animation is a bit overstimulating in that 90s way. Lots of flashing, images flying past too fast. If the song wasn't directly telling you what's going on, you probably couldn't follow it. Also, Queen Alina's voice is off sync and it's never not distracting. But overall, this title sequence does a good job at building hype. These were my thoughts after it played for the first time. This is a really stupid setup, but it's one with potential. Yes, Sonic the Hedgehog has siblings and they're a rebellious rock band, but at its core, the show's about a family that was separated coming back together. They're triplets, reunited, looking for their mother. There's real potential for pathos and emotional stakes there. There's even kind of precedent for it. Sonic was supposed to have a Sonic the Hedgehog band during development of the first game that would appear in the sound test. It's where Vector originally came from, but they got cut to make room for... Sega! So yes, this is silly on its face, but it's not like it can't work. But like we saw with Sat AM, potential only goes so far. But it's time for an actual full episode, Beginnings, written by Ben Hurst and Pat Ali, who will write the most episodes from here on out. Queen Alina narrates the opening, as she will do for most episodes, and she tells the story of Robotnik's takeover and destruction of the land. There's an interesting detail added to this show that wasn't in Sat AM. This Robotnik got his funding from the upper class, and they were spared roboticization while the working class were all sacrificed. Classism, exploitation, and the rich selling out the poor. That's shockingly real for this kind of show. The royal family is outlawed, but the Oracle of Delphius gives Alina a prophecy as to how they can overthrow Robotnik but it requires her to give up her children. We see her tearfully drop off the babies at different homes, and at this point I need to ask, why does everyone look like this? This show is so goddamn ugly. I mean, Manic gets stolen by a thief and is raised by a cockroach? 
You're telling me there's a cockroach dad in this show? Never mind, this show is amazing. I'm totally on board. The kids grow up and we see a bit of their lives and their unique skills, including an utterly adorable scene with Manic and Cockroach Dad. His name's Farrell. I call him Cockroach Dad. Manic is a street rat who knows how to steal and play drums. Sonya is posh and knows gymnastics and piano, and also does this. Her action jingle is a prog rock organ and I'm never ready for it. And Sonic is working class, super fast, rambunctious, and plays guitar. Jaleel White reprises his role as Sonic from the earlier Deke shows, and by this point he'd voiced the character off and on for almost a whole decade, so he sounds comfortable and organic in the role. It helps that he's aged more into the role, his voice is a little deeper, not as nasally. It's a lot less Steve Urkel and a lot more teenager with attitude. No problem, Uncle Chuck. Fast is my middle name. But he also voices the two siblings, and credit to him, they sound like different characters. Sonya's dialogue was obviously sped up to sound more feminine, if only it were all that easy for us, and she and Manic can be hard to understand sometimes with how fast they talk. But they have different vocal affectations and personalities from Sonic. I am never stepping foot in a sewer again. It's dirty, it's smelly, and it's disgusting. Hey, that's my home you're talking about, princess. The effect is like actual siblings who just have similar voices, rather than just one voice actor coming out of three characters. So mostly a good job there. With that, the players and their skills are set. It's time for tragedy. Sonic's home is destroyed, and his foster parents are captured. Commercial break. That's a lot in just five minutes. Most episodes of this show break at around the seven minute marks. I feel like this one should have too. It could have used a couple extra minutes to breathe and let us get to know some of the cast. But clunky as this introduction is, it has my attention. We return from commercials and Sonic meets Uncle Chuck! One of the best parts of Sad AM was Chuck and his relationship with Sonic. Here's my live reaction. <laughs> it's gonna be all right, shiny boy. Oh no. Yes, Chuck is not voiced with great tenderness and warmth by William Wyndham, but by legendary voice actor Maurice LaMarche, live from a hospital bed. Forget Cockroach Dad, I'm suddenly very worried again. We jump ahead a few years to literally Chuck's hideout from Sat AM. Chuck sends Sonic out on a Freedom Fighter mission, and we meet this version of Robotnik, voiced by Gary Chalk. Now, if the Resistance uses their secret weapon, they'll be in for a big surprise! <laughs> Gary plays a lot of characters back on Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, including Grounder of all people. Look up the throttle! He's no Jim Cummings, but I'll be honest, Sad AM Robotnik doesn't live up to the reputation. However deliciously slimy and villainous his voice is, he's never actually that intimidating, in part because he never succeeds at anything. He's only scary in a Let them explore. Perhaps they'll find my little surprise bad touch kind of way, which to be fair is terrifying, I'll give him credit for that. Gary Chalk is not an upgrade though, certainly not this episode. He's got a cool charismatic voice, but it feels like one any voice actor in his range could have done. Both Jim Cummings and Long John Baldry owned their roles, but Gary Chalk feels like he's renting. However, he and the writers do eventually figure out how to play this Robotnik and use him effectively. I wouldn't say he impresses out of the gate though. Ah, uh, can't wait. Robotnik activates a shield around his factory, but Sonic pushes his super speed to the limit to break through and deactivate it, then blows the factory sky high. Robotnik's bots are only able to identify that the assailant was blue. <laughs> Sonic's knocked out from the mission, and Uncle Wheezy cries tears of worry that would be much more heartfelt if he didn't sound like that. You cut him bad, Sonny. But then the Oracle appears, and he and Sonic actually have a pretty cute back and forth until Sonic does this with his mouth. It's at this point I need to mention the animation in this show. It's junky. Unlike the first two Deke cartoons, this one was produced with digital assistance, and I cannot tell if that helped or hindered them. Everyone looks off-model in every other shot, there's always some weird animation choice or mistake happening, and the camera pans and zooms so erratically yet smoothly that it's always distracting and makes it hard to follow what's happening. Often the camera is just too close to the characters, so you can't get a sense of where they are and what's around them. It's the same problem with the breakneck pacing of this episode. It's hard to get attached or invested in the characters or the story when there's so little room to breathe. I do kind of like the main trio so far, but I'd like them more if I didn't feel like I could smell their chilly breath. The Oracle reveals who Sonic truly is, and that he has a brother and a sister. 
Cut to these two jobbers, Sleet and Dingo, Robotnik's lackeys for this show. It's a bit of a tradition for him to have some long-suffering idiots working for him, going back to Scratch and Grounder on Adventures and Snively on Sat AM, later carried on by Boko and Dico on Sonic X, and today by Orbot and Cubot. They were all connected to him in some way, though, being his robots or his actual relative. Sleet and Dingo are unique in that they're unrelated bounty hunters forced to work for him, and it gives them a dynamic with him closer to Snively, hating Robotnik's guts, and occasionally trying to pull a fast one over him for their own benefit. It's an interesting idea, but as always, the failure is in the execution. For one, Sleet sounds like this. Oh, sir, thank you for seeing us, sir. How may we serve your royal greatness? That's sure Maurice LaMarche again, doing... that voice. I'm not sure what accent that is. Mostly because I don't think he does either. The accent would be fine if Maurice gave Sleet any life, but everything is said in that hushed, bored tone, even when he's supposed to be yelling. Sleet is the smart schemer of the pair, so it should work, but he's often put in situations that require a lot more volume than he's giving. I wouldn't call him Miss Cast, though. Put a pin in that. Dingo, true to his name, has an Australian accent and sounds comparatively fine to my ears. He's voiced by Peter Wilds, and he's the dumb muscle of the pair. Smart thin guy, dumb big guy, it's a standard setup. But they do have another unique gimmick. Sleet has a transformation remote because I'm already tired of asking questions, and every episode he transforms Dingo into something new. And no, the triplets never learn to look for the orange things staring at them. Between the two, I like Dingo more. The situations he gets into sometimes give him a sympathetic edge. But then he also gets a predatory crush on Sonya that just straight up undoes a lot of that. So he's nowhere near my favorite. I just wish that they, like everything else in this show, weren't so over-designed. That's part of why Maurice's voice for Sleet doesn't fit. His huge mouth needs more voice than he's getting. Robotnik forces the pair to work for him, and tasks them with finding the Freedom Fighter's secret weapon, which we know is actually Sonic. Cut back to Sonic and the Oracle. This episode has just no pacing. The Oracle says that to find his siblings, Sonic must sing the song that's in his heart, which means song time! There's something missing, something's not quite right. Yes, every episode has a song and an accompanying music video. Jaleel White does not sing for any character. Instead, Tylee Ross sings for Manic, Louise Valance sings for Sonya, and Sam Vincent sings for Sonic. Double D's voice actor is Sonic's singing voice, and man, he's trying. But he's the worst of the three by a significant margin. He's got this nasal scratchiness to his voice that almost works if you think about it like 80s hair metal or butt rock. It's not so far removed from Johnny Joelli, but he just does not have the range that these songs ask of him. And I can feel it calling to me every night. Louise Valance feels most like she's trying to emulate Jaleel White's voice for Sonya, and she ends up just singing very blandly. She doesn't bring much personality or energy for a long time. A little voice inside tells me someone is out there. It's Tylee Ross's Manic who's easily the best, overqualified even. The dude is literally award-winning and was discovered by Pete fucking Townsend. What the hell is he doing in this show? He's got a really good voice and a lot more charisma. Songs where he sings lead tend to be the better ones, especially if Sonic isn't there. But in general, the music is terrible. I'll admit up front, I have no tolerance for kids' cartoon songs. I like the songs on Adventure Time and Steven Universe, and that's pretty much it. But the ones on this show are bottom barrel pop lyrics and melodies not meant to be listened to. Credit to the work composers Jean-Michel Guerrero and Mike Piccarillo put into these. This show was rushed from top to bottom, and I'm sure if given the time and money, they would have used more actual instruments and less blatantly obvious MIDI. <laughs> This is in the show. And sometimes the singers harmonize and it sounds nice. Sam, Louise, and Tylee at least have compatible voices. But if you don't like kids' music mandated by TV studios to be for kids that don't remotely sound like real songs by actual songwriters, you're not gonna enjoy these, let alone Someday, which sounds like a first take for all involved. Very bad first impression. Also, if you're in any way photosensitive, you're not going to enjoy these music videos, which are edited to be as obnoxious as possible. Really, if you spent any time songwriting, producing music, or video editing, these songs are just offensive to all the senses. Also, I discovered something thanks to Pine Lee's video on The Annoying Orange, a show I purposefully avoided for my own health. That is what Sam Vincent sounds like when he sings. United in the light of love. Now watch me whip. Ow. Now 
now watch me nanny. -na. You can't unhear it, you're welcome. But the song is done, and now Sonic can feel the presence of Sonya and Manic. Cut to Slate and Dingo figuring out that Sonic is the one who broke through the shield in the most convenient bullshit TV way possible, but it's a cartoon, whatever. Robotnik is furious to learn that it was a hedgehog, meaning Queen Alina's children are out there. And if they are... The prophecy! Robotnik. You seriously couldn't have just smothered him in a sleep, Oracle? I'm starting to think this is all your fault. Your days of tyranny are numbered. You will listen. You could have ended this before it happened. Fuck this guy. Sonic is out playing his unamped guitar at a club when Manic and Cockroach Dad hear him. Manic runs off. Then we see Sonya and her fiancé Bartleby, who's like an Antoine clone but posh British and you're supposed to hate him. And Sonya hears the guitar and runs off too. Cue the obvious low-grade MIDI guitar. Mind if I sit in, dude? It's so bad, y'all. But that face makes up for it. Manic and Sonya ask to sit in and it's just... I want to cry. <laughs> that music, these horrible background characters, the complete lack of buildup to the triplets reuniting. It's magic. Sonic reveals that they're siblings and tells them to meet him in two hours. Unfortunately, in that time, Robotnik figures out Sonya's identity and captures her family, along with Uncle Chuck and No! Cockroach Dad! Say goodbye to everyone in this shot, they no longer exist. Quick note, I love that Robotnik needs to retinal scan the triplets to confirm they're Alina's kids and not just look at them. Not that he could scan their eyes to begin with, but we're beyond worrying about plot holes here. There are bigger problems. Also, Dingo immediately becomes a sicko, so he was very quickly on my shit list. But he also made this face. Ooh, pretty. Christ. The Oracle tells the triplets that their families are gone, and they must go on a journey to discover the power of their medallions and grow their bond with each other. They immediately bond and are now traveling with each other to take down Robotnik, I think. The ending is so rushed and abrupt, and man, am I not excited to see yet another fulfill the prophecy story that inherently removes all agency from the protagonists. And wow, does this show think blood relatives are your only true family. But also, boy does this episode not introduce the central motivation of them finding their mother, whom none of them even know about yet. Glad they made this episode one in English. If you were one of the kids who waited years for a third season of Sat AM, and you tuned in day one to watch this being aired instead, I get it. I completely understand the crushing disappointment you felt. What a downgrade in so many ways this one episode is. Would you want to keep watching after that? What if the rest of the show is this terribly paced, blandly written, awfully scored, and ugly as all fuck? Reminder, this is just the first of a three-parter origin story, which would not be aired until much later. And yet it feels like it needed to be a two-parter on its own. They crammed in so much, so little of which comes back. Bartleby's a recurring character, but Cockroach Dad isn't? Thanks, show! Though, also... I can't argue there. <laughs> thank you, more sincerely. I don't know how much I could have handled Uncle Chunk in his lungs. Don't you do nothing stupid while I'm gone, you hear me? Maurice LaMarche voices so many characters in this show. He's only good at, like, two of them. And it takes, like, 20 episodes before Sleet is one of them. I don't know that I would go so far as to call this a disaster of a first episode. Not until we've talked about Wedding Bell Blues. But I will say this. It completely changed my mind on a sad AM season 3. I was not convinced that a season 3 would have been as good as people think it would have been. Or that Deke wouldn't have found some way to screw it up. Just look at the climax of the Doomsday Project. Or just look at Antoine. But after this one episode... Fuck it, I'd have rather had a season 3. Everything wrong with this one episode vindicated almost everything wrong with Sat AM season 2. That isn't Antoine. Who is most of what's wrong with season 2, so not a lot. Now that all of that's said, I need to come forward and spoil something for you about the whole rest of this video. Sonic Underground has things in it that I like a lot. It has whole episodes I like. It has characters who make every episode for me, or at least give me something to look forward to every time. Sonic Underground does eventually justify its existence outside of corporate interests. 
But if you wrote off the whole thing right now, I would not say you're wrong. <laughs> Again, this was just the first episode in English-speaking countries. In the original French airing, Wedding Bell Blues was the actual pilot of the show. And as we're going to see later, it feels like it was supposed to be the English pilot too. Because episode two, To Catch a Queen, is not a smooth transition. This episode was written by story editor Doug Booth in his only writing credit, and it opens with the captain of Alina's guard being hunted by Sleet and Dingo. You can literally see them mirror the shots so they could fill more time. The triplets think Sleet and Dingo are after their mom and go to help, and this introduces Sonya's bike and Manic's hoverboard, which they use to keep up with Sonic and which only seem to turn up depending on the writer. Sonic's I'm waiting catchphrase returns, but specifically the annoying drawn out version from AOSTH. We're waiting. Nice try, kids. But that's my line. Yes, this is actually important. Four amazing things happen in a row with this one scene. One, more MIDI music. It almost sounds like an old Doom level. Two, this scream. I don't know why that cracks me up, but it does. Three, this shot. And four, how Sleet and Dingo ultimately catch the guy. Sleet turns Dingo into a baby, throws him, and yells, Somebody catch my baby! And it works. What is this goddamn show? The Sonic Underground investigate the guy's ship and learn that he's named Argus and that he's the captain of their mother's guard. There's a sweet moment where they find an old photo of them all together, and Manic realizes he must be seeing their mom for the first time. Sleet drops off Dingo and turns him into a fly while he takes Argus to be roboticized. Luckily, high-ranking bots get initiated at a gala because what's plot without contrivance? But I guess we can call it world building. The gala was the point where it really stuck out to me how ugly all of the character designs are in this show. It could almost be thematic if they wanted to specifically make the traitorous wealthy ugly, but it's not limited to them, so the show is just generally repulsive. The triplets disguise themselves as sound bots in an honestly charming scene, where they actually get to interact on a sibling level and kind of rib each other. I also like this throwaway line from Robotnik. Is everyone having a real good time? Because that would be against the law. It's a very 80s and 90s thing, having the villain just hate fun. I don't know how dated that was by 1999, but it's actually a good fit for Gary Chalk. That kind of energy works for his voice. The trio disrupt and destroy the initiation, and we see their magic instruments for the first time. Sonic's is a three-necked guitar that looks like his head and really just fires lasers. Sonya's is a keyboard that doubles as a fog machine that she uses to smokescreen the group. A weird choice, but it kind of works with the rebellious and espionage angles, and Mannix is a drum set that he can use to cause earthquakes. Like his character himself, Manic gets the most use out of his drums throughout the show, though Sonya's keyboard has another ability we'll see a lot later. It's a gun. The triplets use their medallions to give Argus his mind back. This is the first time this has happened, so they're lucky it worked and they didn't, you know... <laughs> Robotnik and his goons are taken care of and the heroes escape, but as Argus is about to tell them where to find their mom, the roboticization reverts and he's back to being a mindless drone. He returns to Sleet and Dingo and gives away the hedgehog's location in an actually kind of sinister scene. The show's bad about letting Sleet be scheming and vile, even though it's probably the best use of his character. Manic suggests the best way to find Queen Alina is to get the word out, and that means an impromptu concert! Looking for someone, do you have for one? This episode's song, Have You Got the 411, is honestly not bad. Heavy upward inflection? It's an upbeat bubblegum pop number with a surprisingly good hook. The singers harmonize well with each other, and it's written like a lost love type song, which helps a lot in making it feel like someone would actually write and play it outside of a kid's show. The problem is it's about their mom, which gives it an awkward Freudian edge I don't think was intentional. Reminder, not one of them has ever met this woman. Also, the singers for some reason never sing on beat. But Sleet does this during the music video, so I'll lean towards liking it. That's one out of two, folks. I am keeping track of this. The song doesn't actually work, go figure, but an old orangutan, I think, locks up, who's obviously Dingo in disguise, and tells them where to find the queen in exchange for a date with Sonya. He tells them to look in the old waterworks, but of course it's a setup, and Sleet is ready for them. This is how the episode goes to commercial, then comes back. Thanks for dinner, Sonya. It was great. I took Dingo out for dinner. <laughs> Ah! 
I like to think she was wailing the whole way through a Capri Sun ad. They escape by climbing the water tower with gunfire raining down on them, but this is a show where bullets only hit you when you're blocking. Manic apologizes, and the way they play it is like it was a moral lesson about making mistakes and how that's okay, but it's so out of nowhere and was not set up at all, so we'll say they whiffed that message. The triplets get ready to use their medallions on Argus again, but in the meantime, Sleet has Dingo pose as him in case the Queen really does show up. Argus's mind is returned, and he reveals the rendezvous point was right over there. Holy shit, Manic, you're officially my favorite. They see Dingo in disguise, and the only one who could reach him is Sonic. But this is one of the continuities where he's aquaphobic. But his siblings get him to do it by... Come on, bro, we're waiting. How many times do I have to tell you? That's my line! I think we were supposed to applaud there. Sonic saves his mother from Dingo, but he has to destroy the entrance to the rendezvous point to do it. Just the first of many so close and yet so far moments we'll see throughout this show. It will get less impactful, but it works this time. Argus is able to help Sonya and Manic escape, and chuck Sleet in the water before he roboticizes again. Sonic messes with Dingo in a pretty funny way. Dingo, no! Dingo, yes! And off they go on another adventure. To Catch a Queen is nowhere as slapdash as the first episode, but it's dragged down bad by its rushed pace. Like I pointed out, there were a lot of little moments I liked throughout it, even the song with some generosity. The triplets will frequently run into characters of the day in the following episodes, somebody who helps them out and then never turns up again, usually a fellow freedom fighter with some loose connection to the Queen. This is one of the few times where that connection is not loose. Argus is a direct line to the Queen, and was someone who knew the triplets when they were babies before they were separated. There was a lot of potential for the trio and us to develop more of a connection with him, but the show hates breathing, so it doesn't really happen. It also doesn't help that, like I mentioned, Beginnings doesn't introduce Queen Alina to the triplets. They didn't know about her yet. It makes anything involving her or their feelings towards her fall flat on its face. There's a good episode buried in here, and if Sonic Underground didn't just exist for the songs and was allowed the time and love of Sat AM, say by also being a Saturday morning cartoon, I think we could have seen it. But it was a quantity over quality job, remember, two a week, and so we're gonna get a lot of Saturday morning level plots trying to fit into a weekday level context, and all of them innately have a minute less to breathe because of the song. That tug of war is going to be a constant issue, and it'll be interesting to see how the better episodes ultimately manifest. But now it's time to take a step back. We started with Beginnings, which was not originally the pilot for the show, and in fact it was only part one of a three-part story arc. To Catch a Queen is better, if only because it actually resolves itself, but these two together don't introduce the show to viewers in the best way. So now we turn to the actual pilot of the show, the original episode one, Wedding Bell Blues, and let's see how that compares as a first impression and a lead into episode two. Like Beginnings, this episode was also written by Ben Hurst and Pat Ali, and there's a reason I'm shouting out who wrote each episode. We'll get into that after episode 10. Queen Alina here. Becoming the legitimate king of Mobius is Dr. Robotnik's deepest, most dangerous dream, which is soon to become the Sonic Underground's nightmare. We get a junky and janky introduction to the Sonic Underground. The animation's rough, but so is the audio quality of the dialogue. They must not have nailed down what pitch-shifting technique to use for Sonya, because she sounds almost bit-crushed. There's artifacting in her speech, and the definition and high end in her audio is gone. Oh well, I guess that's to be expected from the lower classes. But weirdly, so does Sonic. His voice is somehow even more artifacted, like the file got saved at a fraction of the bitrate than usual. And it does sound like there's a little bit of pitch shifting on him too. I know what you mean. I'm so cool. Oh. Always look good. This was not a problem that I caused for the record. I didn't rip the DVD wrong. I didn't edit the video to be a bitch. It sounds like that in the episode. And I'm sure of it because Manic sounds just fine. I'd rather be low class than no what? class. Looks like we got a bad case of sticky hey, fingers. Hey, where I come from, you never know when you might need something. Put them back. Again, Jaleel talks a little too fast as him sometimes, so he can be hard to understand in general. But just in pure sound, the high frequencies and definitely are all there, so I'm very curious what happened with the other two. This doesn't happen at any other point in the show. 
If it weren't for that, I would say this is a decent introduction to the cast in terms of their quirks and their dynamic with each other. Sonic is the speedy egotist who loves chili dogs, Manic is the laid-back thief, and Sonya's days are numbered. It's still just the start of the episode, but where Beginnings was concerned about the backstory of these three and how they came together, this serves to introduce them as they are in the entire rest of the show. These are the three protagonists we're going to be with for 40 episodes, this is how they interact with each other and fight Robotnik, and this is the van they drive around in like if Miss History Inc. was militia, but in English they thought the episode with a swath of characters we'll never see again where the triplets don't meet until the end took greater priority. Give me back my cockroach, Dad! Robotnik makes a public announcement. Tomorrow he will marry Queen Alina. Did he say married? Did he say to the Queen? Dude, did he say trap? Or was it just too obvious to mention? Manic, why are you a better Sonic in this? There's no way Mother would marry someone she doesn't love with all her heart. You've never met her! The team decide to crash the wedding, and to get in, Sonya suggests help from her fiancé, Bartleby, one of the only side characters in Beginnings who's actually in the rest of the show. Meanwhile, Robotnik laments that the fake wedding is too expensive, and Sleet suggests scraping some more cash off the crusty wealthy, and Robotnik chooses Bartleby. I would call this a plot contrivance, but once you've met the guy, you'll want to rob him too. So frankly, it's the most believable thing we've seen so far. The triplets arrive at Bartleby's place, disguised as carpet cleaners. Hackney carpet cleaners! Though Sonya outs herself because she doesn't need to hide to her fiancé. This is a recurring thing with these three. The brothers do dress up while Sonya's off somewhere getting hit on. The only difference here is Sonya's also dressed up at first, and the boys aren't in drag. Sonya schmoozes while Manic steals Bartleby's shit because he's already the best character in the show. And Bartleby the bootlicker disrespects the fuck out of their family. I'm so glad your mother has finally come to her senses. Uh... After all, given your disreputable brothers, and the unfortunate fact that all three of you are wanted criminals, <gasps> your tarnished family needs a major polish. Oh! One more word out of you, I'm gonna polish this floor with your face! Sonya convinces him to cover music for the wedding, just in time for Sleet and Dingo to show up and demand his tribute. He manages to haggle half the tribute and supply the music, and so the team's stage is set. The show doesn't quite know how unsympathetic to make the nobles, so don't worry if you don't quite know how to feel about Bartleby just yet. You will. The team arrives in kind of adorable disguises. Quick note, their van is part of their disguises this episode, but that doesn't come back. It's too bad, it's a fun idea. They're supplied with instruments, but they just chuck them down a garbage chute, which is also pretty funny. Unfortunately, that means they summon their actual instruments, and we get our next song, When Tomorrow Comes. When tomorrow comes, we'll be walking in the sun. It sounds like something you'd hear at Sunday school. It's not related to anything in the episode, it's just to waste a minute, but at least it's brief. Sonic took the time to scout out some of the building, but thanks to bullshit TV zoom and enhance, Robotnik finds them out anyway. The three split up. I bit my tongue. The three split up. Manic finds a secret passage. Sonya magics up a new dress and goes into the bridal chamber. And Sonic checks outside. Sleet sets up a chili dog trap because Sonic is nothing if not his own stereotype by now. And then turns Dingo into a giant Venus fly trap. But Sonic escapes by throwing the chili dog down his throat. And then Dingo explodes. I'm very curious what you expect me to say to that. It's both amazing and so abrupt it doesn't even register. Cut back to Manic making it to the bridal chamber himself, then Sonic. Why did they split up if they're all here at the same time within a minute? They think their mother is there, but the bride is, of course, just Dingo. Oh, thank goodness, it's only a trap! A trap?! Sonya gets captured, and her brothers escape through the secret passage. Okay, I guess splitting up affected one, fine. The villains threaten Sonya with roboticization if she doesn't accept her role as crown princess, and allowing herself to be adopted by Robotnik. I in fact, you may call me Dad. Bartleby also says that Alina's absence has amounted to abdication. The now adoption ceremony begins, and he announces that Robotnik will not be made king if Queen Alina appears and shows that she has not abandoned her throne. I'll give the villainous plan some credit, they covered a lot of bases. Either the wedding goes off and, as far as anyone is concerned, Robotnik has married the queen and is therefore king. Or, Robotnik adopts Sonya and becomes king that way. Somehow, if anyone knows more about Throne Ascension, please confirm or deny. Or, Queen Alina actually appears here, and she can be captured. It's not foolproof, SWAT bots are not known for their competence, and Manic quickly formulates a plan to impersonate the Queen. There's the drag. But the villains have given themselves a lot of opportunities to succeed here. In defiance of the show's own internal logic, the SWAT bots develop competence and stop Manic from impersonating the Queen. God damn it. But it's okay! Halt! 
I forbid this ceremony. How time, guys. Nice going, Manny. The trio escape, as does the queen. It is over, your majesty. You're coming with us. <laughs> well, well, well. Your children may have escaped, Queen Alina, but at least I have you! Carrie Chalk is very good at screaming. They rendezvous and make a realization. Brilliant work, guys. Which part? Your impersonation of Mother. What else? It sure was, Manic. Exceptional job. So kind, but I never made it. I thought it was you. Oh, wait a minute. If it wasn't Manic or Sonic, then it had to be Mother. Wow. The nightmare has I'm going to assume they're not actually watching her leave, and this is more for the audience, because, oh my god, she is right there! Stop crying and run! Every time someone cries on this show, I want to be emotionally affected, but everything is so rushed and abrupt that nothing leaves an impact, so it's never earned. It's like crocodile tears. I'm on estrogen, Sonic Underground! You literally have an advantage, and you're failing. Sleet and Dingo get thrown in the dungeon. I want my own cell! And the episode ends. <sighs> This is a clusterfuck, but it's the better introduction to the show. Reminder, this was the intended pilot, and it was aired as episode one in France. In English-speaking countries, they swapped it with episode 26. That's such a weird choice, considering they did not bring forward the other episodes connected to beginnings. So going into episode two, it feels like there are whole pieces... Ah, I bit my tongue again. It feels like there are whole pieces missing in this setup that suddenly get added, like their team dynamic, the van, how they're fighting Robotnik, and the central motivation of them finding their mother. It's in the theme song, but it's not in beginnings. It's like finishing Sad AM Season 1 and jumping into 2 and suddenly Dulcie's there. Whereas, if they'd kept Wedding Bell Blues as Episode 1, I feel like all the necessary pieces in the show's status quo get reasonably introduced. Underground is largely episodic in its plots, so we don't really need a detailed backstory. At least not right now. We just need to know what this show is like day to day by seeing it in action. Compared to Sad AM, which has three different episodes that can count as its first. The pilot, Heads or Tails. The first First in the production order, Sonic Boom, and the first in the airing order, Super Sonic. None of these are an origin story. They didn't write that until season two as part of the underwhelming time travel two-parter. But if you watch either of the three, you get the idea about the characters, what they're about, and what their goals are. The pilot is obviously the most proof of concept of them, and makes more of an effort to lay out groundwork for the rest of the season, and I do recommend watching that first, but you get up to speed regardless. Wedding Bell Blues works the same way. While it's nowhere near as charming or engaging as Heads or Tails, mostly because there's no tails. Hi, Mom! Hi, sweetie! Did I just imply I'm his mom? It does flow into episode two a lot smoother and establishes the feel of the show. Though not to kick this dead horse one more time, I buy Sonic's adoptive sibling relationship with Tails a lot more than with his actual siblings. Side note about the title sequence, it wasn't uncommon for lower budget cartoons in the 80s and 90s to put a lot of cash into the titles and spread it a lot thinner in the actual show. I would argue Sat AM is an exception. With Underground, we can conclusively see that the title is animated better, but it's also paced too fast and you can't see what's going on, so it's more representative than you'd expect. But now that that's done, we have been officially introduced to the show. Unfortunately, I'm not so far from where I was when I was watching Sat AM Season 2. I don't have a goddamn clue what's coming. I don't know whether to expect the following episodes to be boring, trash fires, or sudden diamonds in the rough. The main heroes are okay, I already like Manic a lot. But at the beginning of Sat AM, I liked pretty much all of the Freedom Fighters right away, except Antoine. Robotnik, Sleet, and Dingo are kind of nothing so far. But like I said, I don't think Sat AM Robotnik lived up to his reputation, and Snively didn't really come into his own until Season 2. So my indifference to them isn't unique. The real problem for me is that Underground is so structurally messy that I can't get a handle on its energy. I can feel under the garbage pile, something that can get me to enjoy this show, if only I can meet that energy, or if at least the show can meet me halfway. I think for that to happen, it's gonna take one of these writers figuring out how to work within this tight framework. They didn't have the budget, they didn't have the time with a two-a-week turnover, and with a song being crowbarred into every episode, and Ben Hurst corroborated this, they ran out of space to allow their ideas to just breathe, and they had to make a lot of unfortunate compromises. Sad AM, whatever criticisms you can make, for it. It ain't over till the fat bot sings, Robotnik! Occasionally there was just a weird pregnant pause, but for the most part, 
The pacing was just right. I know Sonic is known for his speed, but rushing a story doesn't benefit anyone unless you're a jokes-per-minute rapid-fire comedy, which Underground is not. The animation is plenty rough, I'm sure that's not helping, but it was clunky and sad AM too. I think it comes down to the writers trying to cram a half-hour story into 20 minutes, plus a song that even the animators and editors don't seem to want to waste their time on. One of these writers is going to have to figure out the show's strengths and how to use them in such a small space on their own. And if one of them can't do that by at least episode 10, the end of the show's second week on air, and a quarter of the way through the entire season, I think it'd be fair to write off the whole thing. You know, <laughs> I just realized something. At the end of my first video, I went on a whole rant about YouTube culture, satisfying the algorithm via self-flagellation and humiliation, and now we're doing a video on Sonic Underground. <laughs> And it's happening. It's happening to me. It's only, it's only my third video. <sighs> New filming day, fresh hair and makeup, and finally, a legible script. From here on out, I'm going to close each review with a letter rating. It's not a serious academic score, don't get too worked up over it. It's just a way for me to track my enjoyment of each episode and how well it comes together. Considering the F and two Ds that the show has been so far, I'm just hoping for one C by the end of this segment. That's the low bar that I'm setting for this show. I've got something in my eye. That's the low bar that I'm setting for this show. Just give me an inkling of potential and I'll keep watching. A fun little fact, I'm filming this the day before Sonic Frontiers comes out. So, tally-ho. Episode 3, Mobodune, was written by Peter Hunzinger in his only writing credit. Literally. It might be the only thing he's ever written. Assuming it's not a typo and it was actually written by Peter Hunziker, who is a prolific TV writer and was writing for cartoons at this time, it would not be the last time they misspell a writer's name. Also, you notice how the text is blue this time? And usually it's black with a colored border? Yeah, that's what the text changes to behind the flash at the end of the card. So I think they just generally fucked up this title. The episode opens with Alina already threatening the end of a team we just met. Everyone has a place that their heart yearns for. A place they call home. Manic is about to find such a place but his newfound home may mean the end of the Sonic Underground. The opening is just a wall of exposition, with the boys helpfully reminding Sonya that they're looking for Mobodune, a magical place where the triplets were born, but which only appears for a short amount of time each year. Kind of like Little Planet in Sonic CD. Come on, sis. You know the word is the Oracle said we were born there. And when the moon's full on the second even day of the third month, bam, it chills up. And when the moon's full on the second even day of the third month, the second even day of the third month, just like clockwork. A weirdly fascinating thing happens right away. Sonya whines about all of the trees, so Sonic just cuts them all down. I think they're implied to be dead, but still. I associate Sonic a lot with nature, especially the nature versus technology conflict that was a major subtextual theme in early Sonic media. It's jarring seeing a Sonic who doesn't seem to care. Dingo is disguised as a tree and tries to capture Sonya, but the trio fight him off and hurry to Mobodune before it appears. Well, this time I want you to yell, you're under arrest to those criminal hedgehogs. Now burn rubber! I'm gonna try not to harp on Maurice LaMarche's performance as Sleet too much, but I feel like it's relevant how much he has to stop and breathe in his lines. It's like he's just not getting enough air, or he's not comfortable with this accent. It gets in the way of his sinisterness a surprising amount. He does get better, but it's distracting early on. Everyone makes it to Mobodune, and this happens. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. What? Okay, I like that. The triplets explore a market and start looking for their mother. Manic gets caught with his sticky fingers by this lady. But it turns out this place is a money-free utopia. Cue Sonya going to a salon and Sonic getting chili dogs. The lady, Mayor Winningham, is the leader of Mobodune and already knows the triplets. She is sketchy as a drawing tablet. Wait, Manic, I have something to show you. Hey, like, you know my name. <laughs> of course I do. I know all three of you. How? You'll learn everything in due time. And if I may say so, it's good to finally have you back where you belong. She shows Manic the city's power stone, which is how they return every year and how the city stays beautiful. And she shows him the room where the triplets were born. He has a complete crisis out of nowhere. I never thought I'd see this day. Sonic's always been cool, having this Mondo world as his home. And Sonya, huh. <laughs> With all those servants and stuff, 
I always thought she had too much of a home. But me, I always wanted to just have one place where I really belonged. A place I could call my own. You have that now, Manic. Truly, you do. You had cockroach dad, you little shit. Do I need to explain why this should not be episode 3? That's really a conflict and motivation we needed to see at any point before. Even in the first few minutes of this episode, not have him dump it all out at the one-third mark. And even outside of the context of this one episode, we and him have had barely any time with Sonic and Sonya's lives so far. If this was pushed further back to episode 10 even, this probably wouldn't feel so egregious, but as is, it falls so flat as a conflict and motivation for Manic. Sonic and Sonya Sonya do their shit for a minute, Dingo splashes Sonya with water, she spins him, which is one of her powers now, and apparently so is the prog organ. Sonya, spin! <laughs> and they continue to do their shit for a minute, so we know it was the important use of runtime. Eventually, they catch up to Manic, who shows them where they were born, and he announces that he's going to stay. The pacing on this episode is like watching a YouTube video at 1.5 times speed. Mayor Winningham was here when we were born. Wait a Mobius minute. That means you know our mom as well? She's one of my very best friends. Would you believe she's not an antagonist? Because they wrote her like one. Manic suggests introducing themselves to our hometown homies with this episode's song, I Found My Home. This, people of YouTube, is how not to mix vocals. Tylee Ross and Sam Vincent have been respectively hard panned to the left and right stereo speakers, and it is so disorienting on headphones. To be fair, kids at the time were probably listening through TV speakers, so as an experiment, I've mixed the song down to mono to hear how the vocals sound together. And just for fun, I added some tape compression to replicate if the music wasn't mixed like shit. <laughs> It's not perfect, the two singers are out of sync with each other, and Sam's voice is so sharp that he's really getting in the way of Ross's much better vocals. But it's almost good, right? This song is very nearly a Boston song, a big 70s arena rock crowd pleaser with guitar hooks and melodic vocals. Just by hard panning the vocals like that, they completely ruined what is easily one of the best songs in the whole show. No, you don't get to have this one, because I'm fucking pissed. You did this to yourself. Also, Manic's hair flies away like birds in the music video. And I just don't know how to deal with that. Right as the song finishes, Robotnik's forces arrive and demand money as back taxes. But Mobodoon doesn't run on money, so Sleet threatens to rob them. The Sonic Underground can't use their medallions to fight because they wasted all their power on the song. I can't believe that's a consistency. And I can't believe that even the show is saying these songs are a waste of energy. The heroes retreat to formulate a plan, and the SWAT bots strip the place of everything valuable, including their precious power gem. Also this. <laughs> Is that a stock scream they just have on file? I love they used it two episodes in a row. Without the power gem, Mobo Dune starts dying. Oh man, I can't believe it. I finally find a place to call home and now Mobo Dune is Mobo Dune. So now the team have to act fast, get the power gem back before they run out of time and Mobo Dune disappears forever. I'll stall the convoy while you slow mos catch up. Adios. But what about your plans to stay in Mobo Dune? Hey. If we don't save the Power Stone, Mobile Doom won't be worth staying in for anyone. You know, there are times when I don't have mine being your sister. Now, if Mayor Winningham can just help me with some supplies, we can be out of here. What? Like hairspray, nail polish? Yeah, along with grappling hooks, rope, not to mention high explosives, if you got them. Oh, I had no idea they taught that kind of stuff in charm school. I let that play because I just like that bit. Sonic once again kills a tree to block the convoy, and then even more. This Sonic does not care about nature. Stylish entrance, Sibs. I'd have to say your delaying tactics show a certain flair as well. Do I know this girl? Trying to save Mobile Dune seems to bring out the best in us all. You got that one right, bro. So what's the plan? I'm glad you asked. Manic, you take all our medallions. How do we know he's not just going to sell them at some pawn shop? You don't. Yep, he's my favorite. Medallions recharged, they proceed to annoy the shit out of Sleet and short-circuit the SWAT bots, allowing them to drive the convoy back and return the stolen items. Meanwhile, Sleet just straight up tosses Dingo in a Mobodoon and leaves him for dead. I don't see you until the next time Mobodoon shows up in our world. It'll be way too soon, sucker. What can I say, Dingus old sport? You're out.
Power Gem returned, Mobo Dune is restored, and Sonic and Sonya say goodbye to Manic. Unfortunately, they missed seeing their mother while they were dealing with the convoy, but at least Manic has found his home. Psych! Why all the long faces, guys? <gasps> Manic! You're back! You got that right. See, the thing is, Mobo Dune's a beautiful place, but I finally figured it out. My real home has always been with the two of you. Besides, freedom fighters all over Mobius are counting on the Sonic Underground. And without a drummer, you guys couldn't play your way out of a paper bag. And then they play a quick reprise of I've Found My Home. Aw. If only this show didn't play on Fast Forward, I might have felt something. To the episode's credit, the triplets interacting and ribbing each other are easily its best parts, so you do get a sense that they like each other. You just don't get the sense that Manic feels out of place and wants a real home. In this episode or the previous two, or even three if we're counting beginnings. Honestly, an easy fix for that would have been to just air this episode later in the season, after we've learned more about his life on the streets. We're only a couple episodes away from that very thing, so I don't think that would have been too much to ask. Same for mixing the vocals, not stupid. This was almost a good episode, damn it. D+. Plus. But before we continue, I want to share this moment from when my patrons and I were watching this live. Oh, I almost forgot. She dropped by while you were saving the Power Stone. She's sorry she couldn't... <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's even better than the one that I was aiming for. We got so many good screen caps from Sat AM and Underground. I'm going to share them all at the end of this video. Episode 4, The Price of Freedom, was written by Martha Morin in her only writing credit. The trio are on the run from Sleet and Dingo, and there's a good 8 seconds of just this shot. Sonya gets splashed and then stuck in a tree, and so she fogs them and they fall into the river. Her brand new outfit is ruined, and so is her motorcycle, and she decides she needs a spa day and a break from her brothers. Her vanity and spoiled nature tend to be the only character traits the writers use, so I hope you find them endearing now, because you sure won't by episode 20. She leaves for one Mindy Latour's place, but conveniently, Sonic got a note that said Queen Alina is in the same area, so off they go after her anyway. Mindy is as much a spoiled princess as Sonya, and whenever she's on screen, the animation takes a nosedive into Elder Scrolls NPC meets wall territory. At the very least, she's one of the first characters who isn't ugly, but her love for polka dots is something to behold. Old. While the girls go shopping, Mindy shows off a new watch built by her father, who had to start the factory to pay for Robotnik's taxes. Sonya puts it on, and in a moment I can only describe as abrupt, she immediately starts hallucinating about Robotnik and her mother. No moment to show her getting drugged from the watch or something, she's just immediately soused. It's a cute detail that she and the band are playing Have You Got the 411 from episode 2, though. <laughs> The songs never come back like that. She wakes up and is in a completely different, much more revealing dress, and I'm extremely concerned what happened while she was out. She discovers that the watch is actually a spying robot, sending info to Robotnik's intelligence agency, or RIA. So, sis, doing a little moonlighting between mall trolls? Can the comedy, Sonic. This is serious. Sure it's still not transmitting? Sonic. What I said about being fed up with you guys, I... Yeah, yeah, you were way wrong, I know. So get your pampered butt over here. A moment to appreciate this face. I like this face. Sonic and Manic wait outside the watch factory when the watch bots themselves go after them. They take out a number, but the RIA and a one Agent N show up and catch them. Aha! Just as my departed surveillance unit reported, two hedgehogs down and one to go. The female is in the house. Find her. Luckily, Sonya arrives in time and drops them right on Agent N. They break into the factory, Manic doing what he does best, Elder Scrollsing himself. Mindy must be in the area. They piece together what's going on with the watches, Robotnik's plan to spy on the populace, when, yep, there she is. They reveal the truth of the watches to the Latours. They're spies for Robotnik's intelligence agency. <gasps> Daddy? Is it true? You knew, didn't you? Oh, Daddy, how could you? Believe it or not, Mindy, I did it for you. Yeah, right. Hear him out. When you have children of your own, and maybe you'll understand, I wanted to keep you safe and happy. If I said no to Robotnik, he'd take everything away. And I couldn't let him do that to my little girl. But, Daddy, these things are spying on people. What about Mobius? God, you don't even need a good prompt, do you guys? This episode's song, Money Can't Buy, is the only song in the show sung by a character other than one of the main triplets. Though Mindy is voiced and sung by Sonya singer Louise Valance. Money can't buy the things we really need. Like the sun or the rain or the air we breathe. 
she is phoning it in hard, but I can't blame her. It's one of those kids' cartoon songs where it's insufferable the second it starts, because you know it's not a real song. It's a lecture. And I didn't think the mixing on these could get worse, but they managed to capture the sound of listening to music through phone speakers perfectly. But I get the idea of the song. Mindy is saying to her father that he and his love are more important than their money and wealthy lifestyle. She's like 15 and raised in money, so I don't buy this for a second. But fine, it's a sweet message. It does lend itself to bad faith readings because it's a rich girl saying money can't buy what's important and bitch, I'm a millennial, I know better. But I'll chalk this up to being part of the same problem the rest of the shows had. Failure in execution, but not in concept. Believe me, Mindy, I'd love to knock that pompous, bullying, blowfish roach Tundnik on his big round butt. Oh, Daddy, I don't need shopping and facials and manicures. You, you don't? don't? No! Well, I could cut back. I know I could definitely cut back. I want to be a freedom fighter like Sonya. I want to live life on the run, enemies around every corner. So what should I wear, my pink camouflage gear or the safari suit? Sonic, your face game this episode is top-notch. First, we've got to get you away from here. We sure do. Sleet and Dingo are going to come by looking for the watches. No problemo. You go pack. Sonya, Manic, and I'll get the shipment ready for the Furball Twins. Come on, Mindy. We haven't got much time. Pack only the bare essentials. Right. You think my aerobicizer mini gym will fit in our luggage? Didn't think I'd say this, but I'm coming around on Mindy. She's not as much of a POS as you'd think, and she's got some good one-liners. Why, yes, she also never comes back. You've been paying attention. Slate and Dingo arrive, and the Latours make a break for it. A moment to appreciate this face. This episode's doing a decent job of being intentionally funny, I'll give it that. While the mercs break in, the hedgehogs make some adjustments to the watch bots, and the background music is kind of jamming. Yo, shouldn't Mindy be back in the house by now? Probably doing a farewell facial. The Latours get caught for... Again, it's predictable, but damn it, I like it. Sleet stops them by turning Dingo into- oh my fuck. Well, that's not predictable, and I can't believe it works. The Sonic Underground show up, and Sonic looks Spongebob for a moment. Sorry, sis, but I can never pass up a chance to go bowling for boneheads. It's the chubby little cheeks they give him. They all beat the shit out of them with the suitcases, but Agent N catches up. <gasps> Traitors! Blue polka dot and otherwise, you are all under arrest. Damn it, stop! You're gonna make me like this episode! Everyone except Sonic gets captured, and Sonya is about to get roboticized, but Sonic arrives with an army of modified watches, and they tear Agent N and the SWAT bots apart like the scarabs from the mummy! Then Sonic sends them after Slate and Dingo, so not only does this Sonic not love nature, he will kill his enemies. Take a long look, honey. It may be the last time you see it. It's hard to leave home. Hey, but you still get to hang with your dad. That's right. That's all that matters. It sure is. Home is where your family is. Even if they are just a pair of fashion challenge spine heads. <sighs> okay, I'll give it to them. I liked this episode. It's clunky as fuck in its pacing and messaging, it's animated especially poorly, and the song is a disaster, but it speaks to how far a bit of charm and good humor can take you. It's even an episode where Manic doesn't do a lot, and I still enjoyed it, so good work, Martha Morin. I'll give it another D+, plus, but I won't pretend I didn't enjoy it. If the show had some actual polish, it could have easily gone to a C. Episode 5, Underground Masquerade, was written by Rick Merwin in his only writing credit. Sometimes you have to take a step back to realize how far you've come. In Manic's case, however, that one simple step could turn into a slide of no return. Yes, this is the episode that takes a look at Manic's life thieving on the streets. It starts with Sleet and Dingo on the way to collect a Duke's taxes. Hi, Sleet. Don't you think it's a crime to give Dr. Robotnik all these taxes we work so hard to collect? Unfortunately, Dingo, Dr. Robotnik would have us arrested if we kept the Duke's tax payment for ourselves. Unless, of course, 
we could find someone else to take the blame while we take the cash. And then a dog walks a caterpillar fish like a dog, and I'm reminded that the show looks like Goof Troop's bad future. We meet a child pickpocket named Max. Oh, fuck you. He sees the golden Robotnik statue on Sleet and Dingo's scorpion car, gets out a bungee cord, and swipes it from right in front of them. Hey, you! Put that back! Not so loud, Sleet. You'll scare him. Hey, you! Sleet takes off right after the kid, but luckily the Sonic Underground turn up in time to save him. Thanks! <gasps> now turn it around and burn rubber! Weirdo geekoids are after me! Any particular reason we should care? Here they come! Dingo and Sleet are after you? In that case, compadre, the Sonic Underground is at your service. Time to juice! <laughs> Well, even the show itself was like, fuck it, move on. Max introduces the team to his posse of kid thieves, who disguise themselves as street performers, and it reminds Manic of the old days. Maybe we can use them in our gig tonight, at the Duke's Masquerade Ball. No way, Sonic. You know that Mother may be at the ball in disguise. And if she saw an instrument like an accordion in our band, she might disown us all. I have an hour-long video about my love for They Might Be Giants that I would like to speak with you, Sonya. Sonic catches one of the kids thieving and gives the rich people back their money and jewelry. So yeah, fuck this Sonic. Sleet wonders why the trio are hanging around these kids, and he transforms Dingo into a child named Archino to infiltrate the group and find out. Not bad, Sleet. I like this new me. Unfortunately, since your brain is still the same defective cabbage as ever, I'll be listening to everything that's going on and feeding you your every word. Now go and wait until one of the little monsters takes you in. And I can decide whether we should arrest the underground now or save them for something even better. I like that they told us up front what the bad guys are up to, and we're following them as they build on their plan. Makes it easier to keep track of what's happening. The Sonic narcs tell the kids off for stealing some more, and Manic tries to be a mediator. Look, little bro. Sonic's right, and stealing's wrong. I know. I've been there. As soon as you tell me how else we can survive, sign me up. Oh, Until wait a minute, then. Max. We're playing at the ball tonight. Maybe he can help find you homes. Now you're talking, girl. And maybe me and Allegra and Clifton can jam with you. Sort of show the Duke what he's getting. This is what I mean about keeping track of what's happening. Maybe me and Allegra and Clifton can jam with you. Show the Duke what he's getting. What? Is that a thing we just don't know about? If you're an orphan on the streets, you can get yourself a home by singing for the rich? I think she meant that they can put in a good word with the Duke and he'll help out, but that is not what the line sounds like even when you're paying attention. Archino gets the attention of the juggling dragon kid, who he gets to take him to the group. Meanwhile, Manic shows off some of his own thieving tricks from when he was on the streets. Back when I was in circulation, I used to like the sneeze technique for lifting necklaces. Great! We're trying to find homes for these kids, and man is conducting a clinic for pickpockets. Watch carefully. <gasps> oh, wipeout. Oh, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, let me clean up. I'm so sorry, ma'am. Check it out. Looks like the manic man still has the touch. That was incredible. And Sleet sneaks around in the shadows, somehow not making Dingo give himself away as he talks to himself. Manic reminisces some more about his childhood, worrying his siblings, when Sleet and the SWAT bots attack. A moment to appreciate this face. Is his big mouth and tiny voice supposed to be ironic? It was the 90s. Hang on to your hairdos, everyone, because we're spinning out of here. <laughs> Sleet and Dingo reiterate their plan while I finally know what he looks like! He doesn't look like he should be in Sonic anything, he looks like he should be in Bloodborne! <laughs> Sonic and Sonya run ahead to meet the Duke, while Manic stays back to practice with the kids, with multiple instances of Sonic having blue arms, and one time Manic's missing his gloves. I usually won't point out little errors like these, but they keep happening this episode. Archino shows up and talks himself up, and the show very kindly cuts away before the music starts. Bummer me, Hortis, that you have to give all this loot to Robotnik for taxes. I'm going to warn you now. Bummer me, Horace is Sonic's new catchphrase this show. 
He says it too often. If I don't, you'll toss me in jail. And all the secret work you're doing for the Resistance with your wealth and power would be lost. Thank God you're here, Sonya. Considering we were introduced to this show with the information that the wealthy and powerful sold out the working class to put Robotnik in power, it's awkward that so many of the team's allies so far are rich. But we've now seen the treasure, and we're told it has a security system. So we cut back to Archino, convincing the kids to steal it for the Freedom Fighters. Then listen, when I was given Sleep the Slip, I heard about a huge tax payment he's collecting from the Duke. But if we steal that, the Duke Duke gets in big trouble. Not if we wait till Sleep takes possession of it, then he takes the fall. He eggs on Manic to prove he's still got what it takes by getting through the Duke's security system and bringing back just one coin. Wait, he impressed the Dragon Kid by doing sleight of hand with a coin? Does that count as a motif? Rick Merwin, I think you've ridden before. Hey Max, can I count on you to cover me while I'm gone? From one to ten and back again. Excellent work, Dingo. Now that he's taken the bait, the Hedgehog will do all the work and get all the blame. While you and I get all the gold. <laughs> the band dress in just the most ghastly disguises for the ball, and they start by playing the show's theme song, but then quickly divert to this episode's song. Let the good times roll. You know what? I reject this on principle. Name it something else. You're not winning this fight. Hey, come on, everybody, come and have some fun. Dance to the fiddle till the morning comes. I don't reject that dancing, though. That's amazing. <laughs> While the song's playing, we follow Manic as he switches places with Max, breaks into the vault and steals the coin, and makes it back before the song even ends. To be honest, I forgot the song was playing while it was still going, so I think we can leave it and never speak of it again. Archino takes a couple of the kids to the vault himself. But we were supposed to wait and steal the treasure from Sleet, not the Duke! We'll steal it when I say we steal it! <laughs> Perhaps you misunderstood. I am calling the shots. But I'm the one who gets to carry him out. So let me repeat, you're gonna steal that treasure, or I'm gonna let you have it with one of my best. The ball was a success, somehow, and the Duke offers the street kids good homes. But then Sleet arrives, and his plan seems to be a success. Manic is caught and arrested, everyone's disappointed in him, and the Duke immediately turns on the team. Okay, show. I know you're on a time crunch, but do you even care about yourself? Sonic believes that Manic only stole the coin on a dare, and Sonya starts gleefully dancing around a guillotine. It was these kids. They suckered our brother back into his old criminal way of life. Keep it up, princess. What could have happened to that money? What does it matter? I'm the one who majorly goofed up. Manic, you're why I'm still watching. Chin up, honey. Max is out walking and kindly recapping what happened to himself when he comes across Sleet and Dingo holding these two kids captive and also giving their whole plan away out loud. Conveniently, Max finds a camcorder, so he films their confession and makes a break for it. Conveniently, Queen Alina is nearby to help him escape. He catches up with Sonic and tells him the story, and they go to break Manic out of jail. Hey, Manic, pack your bags. We're busting you out of here. Sonic, now that we know the truth, I want Manic out of there too. But the police will be after us in a minute. I know. That's the whole idea. Oh, guys, I'm so sorry. First things first, Manic. Get in the van! Sonic draws the police to Sleet and Dingo and plays their tape confession to the cops, getting them arrested. The Duke admits his mistake, and the kids have their new homes again. <laughs> you didn't steal this one, Max. You really, really earned it. You got that one right, Manic. My old thieving ways are history. From now on, I'm a freedom fighter, walking and talking the straight and narrow. You and me both. And now that we got that settled... It's time to juice I could mock how in your face this attempt at a moral is, but really, the morality angle just feels like an obligation rather than what the episode was about. In truth, I appreciate this episode for taking a look at Manic's thieving roots, even though I'd have liked to have seen them two episodes ago. And I like that Sleet and Dingo have a clear, sinister plot that we're able to follow from the beginning to the end. This episode actually knows what its own plot is and is able to stick with it and tell its story. It's actually a cohesive episode, and it's probably the best? 
bold italicized question mark? Look, it's still a bit of a drag to sit through, and they sure lost confidence in their viewers' ability to pay attention by the end of it. But yeah, once again, almost a good episode. I still prefer the humor of The Price of Freedom, though. Eh, C-. minus. Episode 6, Tangled Webs, was written by Ben Hurst and Pat Ali, and it opens in the hellish skies above one of Robotnik's SWATBOT factories. Learning to trust is one of the hardest lessons in life, especially when you are surrounded by evil. Sonya and Manic prepare to take it down with a new drone, but they have to wait for Sonic, who is hanging out in a smoky resistance club, eating chili dogs and being watched by his mother. We meet a new character, Cyrus. His mouth is too big. He does look like an attempt to make a character who could look somewhat like a Sonic character, but they got all the proportions and coloration on his head wrong. Cyrus does this, and they walk off to talk while we cut to Robotnik. We've located their underground pavilion, sir. Units are moving into place. Now, all we have to do... Oh, spare me the details! Just make it happen! I should point out, we haven't seen Robotnik himself since episode 2, and I think it's part of why this show isn't coming together. I don't like or care about Sleet as a villain, and we get a lot more of him. Just make it happen! But Gary Chalk's Robotnik is far more of a presence when he's on screen. The computer identifies an intruder at the factory, which turns out to be the drone Sonya's piloting. Those eyes, they can only belong to... Sonya. Are you fucking kidding? The drone melts a control panel, but Sonic still hasn't arrived. Where's Sonic? No biggie, I'll just go ahead, he can catch up. No, we've got to stick to the plan. If Sonic doesn't show, we cancel. Cancel? Oh no way, this Wattbot factory is going down. There's a weird recurring animation error. Sometimes characters don't stop smiling when they probably should. Manic sneaks in, but is promptly captured by Dingo, and Sleet takes out the drone so that Dingo can warp outside and grab Sonya. <gasps> now, Sarah. It's Sonya, you twit face. Whatever, Sophia. Where is Sonic? You see why I wish we got less of him? But Sonic bursts in just in time to save his siblings. You can't just show up whenever you feel like. <laughs> uh, can we talk about this later? With the original plan ruined, Sonic just destroys the factory himself. This would be a cool scene if the show understood scene composition and camera work. We've got to get out of here. I swear to God I'm going to defend your casting, Maurice, but you're making it hard. The team return to the pavilion and celebrate, but Sonya's frustrated. One tofu dog with the works, please. Hey, sis, we did some nice work today. No, you did some nice work today. On your own, as usual. Let me guess. You're mad, right? But you can't be too mad, cause you ordered me a chili dog. Oh please, be my guest. What is this? That would be a tofu. Huh? Yuck! Couldn't you just yell at me instead? Okay. Sonic, we were captured because you were late! Because you didn't follow the plan! Because you decided to improvise! See, and it was much better. Hey, wait up! And so we have our heavy-handed plot of the episode. Sonic needs to learn to stick to the plan. To wit, I guess, he introduces his siblings to an old friend, Cyrus the Glitchy, whose father is being held captive. Another freedom fighter mentions something called Sanctuary. What Sanctuary? Uh, sorry dude, inside stuff. Sanctuary? Why haven't I heard of this? Hmm? Are your units in position? Some, but if we attack now... We need a distraction. Launch the attack. Robotnik's forces invade the pavilion, and the chili dog stand closes up and goddamn takes off like a UFO. I wish I could have come up with that. Robotnik contacts Cyrus during the skirmish. What are you doing? This wasn't in the plan. Plans change. I want to know about Sanctuary. You'll find out for me. Hey, we had a deal. Now we have a new one. Go be a hero and gain their trust. Like I said, Gary Chalk would find his place as Robotnik. He's slotting in pretty well now. More tanks break in and grab Sonya and Manic, but Cyrus has a special laser. Ah! Hurry! The effects only last a few minutes! <laughs> oh, thanks, bro. What is that thing? Parabolic inverter! My father invented it! I can see why Robotnik wanted him. Sonic finishes off the SWAT bots, and everyone regroups in a new location. 
This booger monster is incredible. The other guy from a goofy movie applauds Cyrus, and everyone moves out to Sanctuary. Why is Sanctuary such a mystery? It's our only safe haven. It's where we keep our kids. Huh? Kids? No way I can do this! Oh no! We lost the signal! Did you record the coordinates? Record? Well, I didn't think we needed to. Silence! Assign a special task force to this. When we find it, Sanctuary will become Cemetery. We meet some of the kids, and yet they all look like nightmares. They plead the Sonic Underground to play a song for them, and we get Teach the Children Light the Way. And I'm warning you now, if you're in any way squeamish, just skip this episode, because there's no coming back from this. Here's my and my patrons' live reactions. As the laughter of a child Or the wonder inside Every little smile Love and hope and tenderness Our laughter soon will leave Children want a world to grow Where they feel free Hang on Hang on, we gotta watch that again Or the wonder inside Every little smile <laughs> Maybe love and hope and tenderness or laughter soon will leave. Children want a world to grow where they feel free. Aside from being blindsided by that moment, what a man you are, Sonic. Uh, this sets off my creep meters pretty hard. I feel like they're asking me if I want to see inside their van. Back in their hideout, Sonya, Manic, and Cyrus make some adjustments to the drones so they don't need to use the visor, but good luck catching that first time watching. No more virtual hood. Just program the coordinates you need, pin the pod, and like... <laughs> okay, okay. Let's say Sonic is, like, in the kitchen. Which he is. I simply enter the coordinates, and... That beep indicates the pod has arrived. So now I activate it. I loaded the pod with flour for the test. <laughs> hey! <laughs> it works. Swell. The four sneak into Robotropolis. Oh, this place is gross. Hey, you're talking about my childhood home. And they formulate a plan. Sonic rushes off and marks the guard bots, but Cyrus gets nervous and reveals that the whole thing is a setup. Cyrus's father is only a hologram, and Robotnik sends his forces after them, capturing Sonya and Manic. <laughs> What does it take to stop that little pest? Sir, I know what it takes. Hostages. Oh, Cyrus, that little attack of conscience you had. Naughty, naughty. Well, just to show you that no good deed goes unpunished, show him, Dingo. Sonic sneaks in to mark the room, then sends in the drones to clear it out. No! Stop him! Central control is down! You don't huh? say. Hey, Manic, those little pod things are neat. You guys want to go get a chili dog? Don't worry. As long as you don't move, everything will be fine. I'd love to stay in chat. Not... See you at the company picnic. What do we do? Ah! Ooh, hedgehogs! No! Everyone is saved, except for one person. In the fight for freedom, my children were learning that while the winds are sweet, sadly, there are also losses. I'll give him this. I didn't expect consequences in this show, but I did expect that whole follow the plan thing to matter. 
I'm not going to give them a this was almost a good episode because we're better than that. But there were seeds for a good episode about consequences here. It's a recurring motif throughout the show of people making deals with Robotnik for the safety of the people they care about. And it always goes wrong because you can't make deals with tyrants. Cyrus learns that the hard way when he loses his dad and almost sells out the children of the Freedom Fighters. Meanwhile, Sonic is showboating because he thinks he's unstoppable on his own, and that should cost them, and he should learn that he's not. But he never actually messes up, and he's only proven to actually be unstoppable. That trap Robotnik left for him at the end doesn't matter because his siblings were going to get captured anyway, and he escapes unscathed. It feels like the focus was on the wrong thing. The real plot of this episode is Cyrus being a double agent, not Sonic being an egotist. The problem is, this script feels like it had three different episode ideas shoved into one, a constant issue with Hurston Ali's episodes, and it feels like that before the first commercial break. The erratic pacing and terrible animation especially hurts this one. And while it's clear Hurston Ali care about world building and recognize that there are big stakes involved in this show, they still haven't been able to fit their ideas to the show. They're trying to write sat AM quality pitches to a weekday sugar high. D minus. My Kingdom for an episode that understands the brief. We've got 21 minutes, and at least one of those is given to a crap song. Somebody's got to figure out how to fit a complete story into that format that's able to take its breath. Episode 7, The Deepest Fear, was written by brothers Michael and Mark Edens, who would together and individually be recurring writers for much of the show, like Hurst and Ali. They have a third brother, Matt, who will also write a later episode. The deepest fears are those which we will not admit, even to ourselves. But admitting to them is the first step in overcoming them. Show thy monstrous self, O oh Moby Deep. Come and face the wrath of Captain Sonic if thou hast the courage. We open on a surprisingly cool fight scene of Sonic as Captain Ahab fighting a one Moby Deep. Nice detail, Moby Deep looks a little like Dingo. Sonic wins the fight by tying up his tentacles, but he gets thrown overboard into the sea. Whoa! Hey, bro, wake up! Whoa, that was one nasty nautical nightmare. That's what you get for eating three chili dogs before you take a nap. You said it, Sib. Takes at least four to make me sleep good. The team drive by the Moby and Sea, which visibly freaks Sonic out. This is something we saw back in Episode 2. Like in a lot of Sonic cartoons, this one is aquaphobic. I think it's more or less canonical in the games that Sonic can't swim, but a lot of properties like to play it up as a phobia. I just didn't expect this one to be consistent about it. I hope the message about meeting Mother there turns out to be true. I hope so too, sis. But if it doesn't, we can still hit the beach for a swim. Swim? Mm -hmm. Why would we want to do that? This van's a stopping, then Sonic's a bop. Is he acting freaky or what? He does seem kind of zippy about something. Sonic arrives in Port Mobius and is pleased to find a Queen Alina statue, but it's actually a trap set by Sleet and Dingo, and the statue is of Robotnik. We heard you were headed in this direction. You must not know Robotnik's the local hero around here. Blast him! <laughs> Sonic makes his escape, managing to knock down the statue onto Sleet. And just before Dingo can grab him, Sonya and Manic finally catch up. What took you so long? She wouldn't drive any faster. The wind messes up my hair. How do you flanderize a character in your second week of airing? Also, you're in a car! The message said we could find Queen Alina at the Port Mobius docks. Sounds like a line to me. Look out, sis! <laughs> While Sonic takes out one more SWAT bot, Sonya accidentally drives the van off the dock and onto a ship, and something incredible happens. Here's my live reaction. You could have at least put us on the front row. Arr, welcome to the Queen Alina. Arr, I'm Captain Squeege. Couldn't help you uh, the lasers it. blasting up it. in town. Ye wouldn't be making trouble and dragging me into it, would ye? But we need a screen cap of it. Yes, meet Captain Squeege. I love him. Now I know what you're thinking. 1999? 1999, right? But no, this originally aired in France on January 27th. SpongeBob's first episode aired May 1st. So despite being a sea sponge doing a cliche Long John Silver accent, this is not an attempt to ape the success of SpongeBob. This was somehow the Edens Brothers' own idea. And yes, he is uncommonly ugly. But give him a chance. Sonic's the name, and Resistance is our gang. Well then, glad
glad to meet you. I'm the head of the local resistance. Fact is, I am the local resistance. Huh? So this is the Queen Elena we're supposed to meet. A showboat. Looks like the show's over. So Captain Squeege is less a grizzled old sailor and more a showrunner. But he's all the triplets have got due to Robotnik having the townspeople's loyalty. Why would anybody want to be on Butnik's side? Arr, they think Robotnik can protect them from Moby Deep. But Moby Deep is just an old legend. Arr, he's real, all right. Maybe you're just the three hedgehogs that can help me catch him. That'll show everybody they don't need Robotnik's protection. Sleet sends out a search party to find Sonic, who he believes is still on the waterfront. Meanwhile, Sonya puts together that Robotnik is the one sinking ships. We're here to fight Butnik, not sea monsters. Wait a Mobius minute! There's something fishy about this. What if Robotnik's sinking ships so the Port Mobians will be afraid and come to him for protection? Good thinking, sis. Now that that's solved, I'm out of here. Hey, I got an idea how we could prove it. Yeah, well, will it take long? Manic puts together a way to find the size of something underwater, but it requires someone getting into a tank to test it out. How can we test it when there's nothing in the tank? Dig it! Just jump in the tank and act like a sea monster. Go jump in a lake. How about you, Sonya? And get my hair wet? Get real! Arr, what a bunch of whiners! I'll play Moby Deep for yous! Huh? I hate when that happens! This joke is so fucking stupid, and it had me rolling. This is when I came around on Squeege, for the record. Now, we just take the boat out to sea and see what's really out there. Moby Deep or one of Butnik's subs. As much as I'd like to go on this gourmet cruise, count me out. Somebody's got to keep an eye on Sleet and Dingo. Somebody fast. I knew Sonic didn't like water, but he's acting like he's afraid of it. I've seen this kind of thing before. Even sailors get afraid of water every now and then. Sonic can overcome his fear if he has to. You don't know my bro Sonic. Confirmed. Manic has no faith in Sonic. The Queen Alina heads out to sea, but Dingo was keeping watch as a buoy and goes to report its movement to Sleet. Side note, I like that the seagull has a hat and scarf. That's very cute. Meanwhile, Sonic searches the port. Hey, buttheads. How in the ass did that work? He comes across the exact submarine they suspected, in time for Sleet and Dingo to send it out to sink the Queen Alina. He's unable to get on board the sub, so he has to find a way to warn his siblings from the shore. <gasps> what I gotta do is warn Manic and Sonya. Good idea. Thanks, Sonic. Glad you're here. Me too. I love you. What? I didn't say it. Kill me! That sea's full of water! I'd better signal Manic and Sonya. Yeah, good idea. For fuck's sake, folks, I think I like this episode. The dumbass then spends the next minute trying to figure out how to signal them, but it doesn't work because Manic and Squeege are also dumbasses. Now to lower the microphone. That lighthouse must have a short circuit. They're not turning back. Better try something else. I love them. Instead, Sonic swipes a patrol boat right as Sleet and Dingo prepare to sink his siblings. At this point, we reach the second commercial break of this episode, and fuck my ass if I'm wrong, but I think this episode is actually consistent and able to breathe. SWATBOTs try to stop Sonic, but he uses momentum to shake them off, including this incredible shot. Whee! Unfortunately for him, he also gets shaken off, and he's stuck hanging onto a rope and water skiing behind it. The boat crashes into rocks along with pursuing SWAT bots, sending Sonic into the water. He starts to flail in panic, but he's saved by an unlikely friend. Who are you? I'm Moby Deep. Moby Deep? You're supposed to be a sea monster. Sometimes it's hard to be what you're supposed to be. Whoa! 
God damn it, why is this episode good? So yes, the real Moby Deep is just a friendly whale. I think also voiced by Gary Chalk. Turns out he and Sonic have something in common. I can't swim! Sorry. Hey, no hard feelings. If you do me a little favor, how would you like to trash a submarine full of trash? I couldn't do that. I'm afraid of boats, especially submarines. How can you be afraid of a little thing like a sub? It can hurt me. How can you be afraid of the water? It's wet, it's deep, and well, I, I can't swim. Can't swim? Let me give you a lift to shore. Moby Deep's a bud, and he gives Sonic a ride to the Queen Alina. Just in time for Manic to detect a submarine, Sonic arrives and reveals that Moby Deep is real and not the one sinking ships. But the submarine hits the boat, and I was not prepared for what happened next. Here's my live reaction again. <laughs> I, I think I'm coming around at Squeege. I'm just never ready for him. <laughs> Before the sub can ram them again, the team devise a plan to scare them off by playing this episode's song and annoying them to death. It would work on me, is all I'm saying. Now, it's a nautical episode. We got your cliche sailor squeege and a Moby Dick parody. The song's gotta be a sea shanty or foxhole or something, right? Nope, it's New Orleans jazz. I guess Port Mobius is supposed to be a send-up of New Orleans. Port Town, showboat. You know, okay, fair enough show. But you were projecting sailors and sea shanties, all right? But this song, Face Your Fear. Sam Vincent is really playing up the campy theater angle, and it sounds so annoying coming out of a megaphone. Just take a big deep breath and face your fear. But I guess the song's okay. I like that Sonya's carrying the entire thing with her synthesized horns. It helps that this is one of the more creative music videos, and it doesn't hurt to watch like some of the others. But no, it doesn't make the list because I can't stress enough how much I hate those vocals. But their plan works, and the submarine literally starts exploding, giving the team the chance to blast Slate and Dingo out of the water. They attempt to retreat, but our boy Moby Deep ain't having it. Mm, fish. Dinner time! Ah! Woo! Faster! Hi! Jesus, Squeege! Need to put a bell on you. The day is saved. The people of Port Mobius no longer need to fear Moby Deep or support Robotnik. But it turns out... It's a good thing ye came to Port Mobius when ye did. Huh? Huh? Thought he sent for us. Like, didn't he? If he didn't, then who did? <gasps> I'll be damned. A good episode. Without caveats. Considering Tangled Webs basically said that Sonic is infallible and can do what he wants, a very limiting approach to the character, which frankly I think we're only just getting away from now. I appreciate that the Edens wrote an episode so specifically about one of his weaknesses. He never follows the plan because he doesn't need to, but if he's on a boat, he's gonna be goddamn challenged by his phobia. And the result is the first episode that doesn't feel like it's rushing. It has a steady pace, and it has several moments that made me laugh, on purpose and otherwise. I don't like the song, but it would have worked if Sam Vincent just toned down his singing a bit. And of course, my man, Captain Squeege. One of the worst character designs I've ever seen. And if you've got trypophobia, there's no saving it. But he goes to show how cliches like the pirate voice can actually work if you give the character charm and creative twists like being an absorbent sea sponge. I had a lot of fun with this episode, and if this is what the Eatons Brothers can do with this format, I'm definitely looking forward to more from them. A solid B. I am just very nonchalantly going, I hate when that happens. Like, it was genuinely funny. That's m like my kind of stupid. <laughs> <It's> squeege. <laughs> I really want you to draw that female Nazo hanging out with Captain Squeege. <laughs> Personal request. I really want to see it. Whether or not she's into him, I'll leave that up to you.
Episode 8, Who Do You Think You Are, was written by Hurston Ali, and it takes us to a Middle Eastern-coded desert city. I'm worried that this will age poorly. We open on a local freedom fighter running from SWAT bots, who loses them with some clever acrobatics. As my children learned about each other, they also learned from each other. And sometimes, the road to learning took them to faraway places. Good, we're back to not having a point. Thanks, Queenie. We cut to the triplets in their hideout, where the van appears to have been battered and fried, and we're reminded that Sonya is the girl. Then we cut to Manic in disguise getting a message. Most excellent! And then back to the hideout, where Sonic cleans the van and Sonya puts on a mud pack. Phew. I was worried the show was stabilizing. <laughs> you hate getting dirty, but you smear mud all over your face? It's a special cosmetic mud from Tashistan. Mud, which is dirt plus water. <sighs> it is rumored that in the catacombs beneath the palace lies the royal journal of Her Majesty, Aluna. <gasps> palace? Where? Cut to them arriving at Tashistan right alongside Sleet and Dingo. <laughs> Sleet and Dingo's tribute ship. Great timing. Maybe we should wait until they leave. Nah, what's the difference? Actually, having them right here makes me feel right at home. The three come up with ways to find the journal without being seen by the SWAT bots. Manic takes the sewer, Sonya goes out in disguise, and Sonic buzzes the town. Meanwhile, the rebel from earlier smashes one of Robotnik's drones. A SWAT bot identifies him as Rafi Hajani. Sleet comes up with a plan to catch him by disguising Dingo as another drone. Uh, I don't think I like this plan. I don't want to be a bot. The bots don't bounce back when they're hit. But you will. You can lead this right to the kid. Don't you want to be a hero? No. Dingo passes right by Sonya and doesn't recognize her eyes because they weren't obscured by a visor, fucking dumbass. She tails him until Rafi smacks him with a plank, and she provides backup when patrols arrive. I'm gonna let what happens next play out, and then I'm gonna ask a question. Sonya. Oh, Sonya. <laughs> I have never heard one talk before. Say goodbye, bot. No! Oh. Oh. oh, you're under arrest. Huh? Wow. Uh-oh. Quick, come with me. Huh? Listen, I am your friend. We must get away from here. I don't remember you, friend, but okay. So here's my question. Just answer in your mind. Don't need a comment. What happened? Could you tell? Because that in no way signaled to me that Sonya just got amnesia. Yeah, that's what happened. Getting slapped in the face and going, Huh? Oh, wow. That's supposed to mean she just lost her memory. I did not catch that first time watching, so it took me whole minutes to notice. I wanted you all to know right now as a courtesy. I can only hope it helps. Also, Rafi's voice actor isn't credited, so I can't comment on how racially insensitive this is, but I've heard Middle Eastern and South Asian accents done much more exaggerated in other shows, so I guess that's a relief. Rafi escapes with Sonya, but they're surrounded by bots. Luckily, Sonya's martial arts instincts kick in, and she fights them off handily. How did you do that? I don't know. Well, I hope you can do that again! Spin and wing time. Huh? Where'd that come from? What are you going to do? Reminder that I couldn't tell she had amnesia until my patrons pointed it out in the chat, so I thought this episode was about her learning that she's developing superpowers like Sonic, like they're familial and not just limited to him. I'd rather be watching that. By the way, Sonya has super strength. It just never really pointed out. Though in hindsight, I guess it's obvious. They make their escape through the sewers, right before Sonic can find them. Mongo mess! Wonder what happened? Sonya's shawl! Sonya! Sonya! Listen, was that not the name the bot called you? Was it? Well, whoever you are, you better come home with me until you remember. These streets are dangerous. You're lucky he's with the Resistance girl, because that's a Mayor Winningham level red flag. He takes her to his mother and Nana, and she promptly smears clay on her face. I'm just gonna leave you with that. We cut to Manic, who I have been missing. Sonic tells him Sonya's gone, so he makes for the rooftops, because Manic gets shit done. Quick cut to Sleet and Dingo, Sleet's mad, and back to Rafi's house. Huh? How interesting. I'm sorry. It's all we have. Oh, of course. That is beautiful. It looks valuable. It's odd looking, isn't it? I suppose I should know what it is, but 
It is all right, my child. Be patient. I'm sure your memory will come back. And back to the brothers, because I almost forgot what show I was watching. Anything? My bud, leader of the <gasps> Thieves Guild, says there were no arrests today. Thieves Guild? And then pan to Rafi and Sonya. Come, I must sell my pots. Better cover your face. It is the custom here, and the bots will notice. But what about you? I am a boy. Besides, I am so quick, they will never catch me. You really remind me of somebody. While Rafi sells Nana's pottery, Sonya sells her medallion to buy the family some more substantial food. Manic doesn't notice her because he can only get so much shit done, and the salesman turns in the medallion to the cops. Manic comes up with the idea of playing a song so that Sonya can find them. Cue the Middle Eastern flavored, We Need to Be Free. We need to be free like the wind across the desert sand. We need to be free like a nomad roaming mystic lands. It's fine. Damn it, Sam Vincent is trying, but he has just the scratchiest voice. More Tylee Ross, please. The plan works, though. Sonya and Rafi notice, and the brothers see her while she's dancing. Some SWAT bots chase her, and she gets covered in green liquid. The boys escape while Sonya slips into a pole and gets her memory back. Glad that plot's over. She and Rafi get captured, but without her medallion, she's unable to fight back. Poor Princess Sibyl. Yeah, him getting her name wrong is a whole running gag. Delivery is everything in a joke, I'll leave it at that. Sleet figures out her brothers will sneak in from the sewer, so he turns Dingo into a Dark Souls enemy and kicks him in. They arrive, Sonic whines a bit, and then Dingo shows up. You can tell I'm already done with this episode. Hey, ma <laughs> so, what kind of disguise do you think it will take to get us into the palace? Oh no, oh my god, oh I don't. Okay, show, I'm back, you have my attention again. Aren't they 15 or some shit? Why is this happening? Oh, hello. And who are you? Good answer! As if to drive home how uncomfortable it is having two young boys dressed as sexy dancers, the scene transitions through Sleet's dick. Anyway, Sonya kicks open the cell. Back to the little boys seducing Sleet. And you know what? I'm irrationally angry that their padded boobs are bigger than mine. I'm having to work for mine, you tiny bitches. Needle your own thighs, why don't you? Manic finds the entrance to the catacombs, and Sonya sees her mother in the sewer. She finds a note about the journal, but Rafi gets captured by Dingo, and she has to brave the dirty water to chase after him. Cut back. How is it getting worse okay oh dear god this show sonic does a spin while manic steals back the medallion wow what a woman and they regroup with sonya in the sewer okay girls just take me to the roboticizer room and you won't get hurt sonya sonic manic yeah, yeah. You know, real talk, we almost got through this episode without an ew, boys in drag reaction from the characters. Sonic and Manic were actually quite positive to each other. You're looking pretty spiffy. So true. Yeah, get on their level, Sonya. Let boys be feminine. Ignore my hysteria. I've just never had cartoon child hedgehogs give me dysphoria before. Sleet and Dingo begin roboticizing Rafi, but our heroes in their respective disguises arrive to save him. Sleet escapes with a control panel, so Sonic destroys the capsule, leaving Rafi with a robotic lower half, a la Bunny from Sad AM. I will miss you, Sonya. Me too, Rafi. Uh, could you get the door, Rafi? It would be my great pleasure. Perhaps they have done me a favor. That's cute. He learned that from Sonya. He's gonna be fine. And like everyone else, we'll never see him again. And their mother's journal says, fuck all. There's not much here. Read it. Okay. According to this, the seer told her, I will rejoin my children, but there are many roads we all must travel before we are reunited. Hmm. Interesting. We came all the way out here for that? Well, we did learn one important thing. Manic makes a much prettier girl than you, Sonic. <laughs> oh, thank you, darling. Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> Aw, uh, she did get on their level. Remember, folks, clothes have no gender. Wear what makes you comfortable. Do you even want a recap? This really is like Sad AM Season 2 in that I cannot begin to guess the quality of the next episode. We went from surprisingly solid and fun to one of the most half-hearted attempts at a cliche setup I've ever seen. Plus, little boy sexy dancing, and man, I don't know how to deal with it. The song was passable, but I'm just glad the coded Middle Eastern people were treated halfway respectfully, because, spoiler alert, the show's gonna get tired of that. F.
Episode 9, The Last Resort, was written by Michael Edens, and I am crossing my fingers for him. They misspelled his name in the episode card. That's at least not a good sign. A thing of beauty should be cherished and protected. But if we fear to lose it, it can lead to betrayal and ugliness. Ow, oh, gross! I'm getting cobwebs in my hair. And why would Robotnik hide the royal seat of Mobius in a yucky place like this? Because nobody looked for it here, except us. I hate to say it, bro, but you're right. Nobody but us would look for something here. And that makes it perfecta mundo for a trap. Might be a trap. Shit, it's probably a trap. Might be a possum in the trash. It's probably a trap. Sonic's right, as we get yet another obvious dingo transformation. How do you guys not look out for orange every day now? The three fight off the ambush pretty easily, mostly through bullshit. Sonic does this. <laughs> Got you bring this mongrel? I think that was supposed to be a tornado, but they didn't bother putting in wind or anything. Sonya flips, and that's all she does. And Manic makes a pair explode by... Okay, that's actually hilarious. They escape the building without issue because this show doesn't know what tension is, and the triplets keep driving out to the desert. Sonic gets them lost and won't admit it, and Sonya gets mad at both her brothers because they're boys. And man, I wish these writers hadn't given up on her as a character eight episodes ago. Why won't guys ever admit when they're lost? Hey, don't include me in this. I'm on your side. Well, you are a guy. Hey, I resent that. Manic, the non-binary hero we deserve. Luckily, they find a little oasis in the desert. Would you look at that? It's like all of Mobius before Robotnik took over. They drive down and meet the local leader, Stripes. Welcome to Lake <gasps> Valley Resort. I'm Stripes. And you are? I'm Sonya. And these are my brothers, Sonic and Manic. I'm gonna pause here for a minute. Not for any major reason. I just want you to live with this face for a while. Hmm. What a dream boat. Furries, you're welcome. Okay, we're good. Very pleased to meet you. And your brothers. And like that, Sonya immediately has a new love interest. What brings you to our valley? Well, you know, we were just kicking some swat. Oh, yeah, we're kicking back. Seeing the sights. Tourists, know what I mean? What's with the elbow, bro? Don't blab about the resistance till we find out which side they're on. Interesting bit of continuity there. We just saw in the last episode written by the Edens that some towns are on Robotnik's side. I genuinely did not expect the Sonic to learn anything. It seems the Valley manages to stay independent by just minding their own business, so the triplets agree to stay for a while. Stripe sets them up with a sweet little sweet. It's beautiful. If there's anything you want, just ask. This reminds me of vacations with my foster family when I was a child. It reminds me of what I never had when I was a kid. I keep being surprised when actual continuity shows up. I didn't think anyone cared. And it's continuity for an episode that technically hasn't been developed yet, at least in the original French airing. Maybe there was more of a show bible than it feels like sometimes. Because the theme song makes it clear they were separated as children, but the natures of their childhoods weren't really looked at until beginnings. You had cockroach, Dad, you ungrateful little shit. I could get used to this place. Don't get too used to it. We still don't know which side Stripes is on. And we lead into the first commercial break with our answer. Ah, Stripes, I hope you're calling with good news for your sake. Are there strangers in the valley? Yes, um, two. Two strangers. It's three I'm interested in. Oh, well, can't have everything yet. Are they with the Resistance? I... I don't know, but I'll find out. Well, you'd better be fast. Remember our deal. I leave your valley alone if you turn over all members of the Resistance to me. Yes, sir. I know. If they are members of the Resistance, you must roboticize them now! You can never trust a face like this, can you? I like this setup. There's a lot of intrigue going on. Stripes is another poor patsy who's made a deal with Robotnik, one that will inevitably go badly for him. But he doesn't give up the triplets yet, and he only says that there's two because he's interested in Sonya. There's finally real tension, and once again it's paced in a way where it's watchable. All right, episode, I'm back on board. The next morning, we get either a gigantic fish or just a weird perspective error. Those happen sometimes. Don't worry, we'll get to it. Sonic and Manic split up. Sonic goes to pretend he's a tourist by playing some tennis, and Manic scopes out the village, though Sonic warns him not to do any thieving. Keep your fingers out of trouble. Uh, that's business. I'm on vacation. Try to remember that. 
Know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's such a little gremlin. I love him. Sonia wakes up to, frankly, not the fanciest breakfast, a quick bubble bath, and a visit from the local hunk, Stripes. I saw this and thought of you. It's perfect. Everything's been perfect. I'd almost forgotten what it was like to live like this. We try to keep things in the valley the way they were, in happier times. He takes her out to see the sights while... Bummer me, Horace! Sonic Sonics for a bit. I would joke that Sonic Underground did the whole playing every position in a sport by himself thing before the movie, but this is like one of the first things you come up with to show super speed. Let's not give it too much credit. I like how it ends, though. Out! The ball was over the line! <laughs> what do you mean, out? That ball was in by a Mobius mile! That's it! Game over! <laughs> I hate it when I'm a sore loser. Ah, I don't like that, though. We fade back to the real hero of the show, scoping out the town. Once again, he notices some apples and tries to steal some, but he gets caught. Luckily, the merchant is very generous and offers him more. But Manic fucks up. Man, I haven't been this loaded down since we raided a Butnik supply depot. You're with the Resistance. You're the ones who turned the rest of Mobius into ah. a wasteland. Oops. Why did I open my big mouth? Listen, you've got things seriously backwards, okay? The Resistance is trying to save Mobius. If you give up fighting Robotnik, we'd have peace and things could go back to the way they were. With Butnik in charge? Oh, dream on. Get out of here! Another moment of the show being surprisingly real. Thanks to Robotnik's seemingly unstoppable regime, the townspeople have fallen victim to learned helplessness. They now see the Resistance as their enemy because they threaten the facade of safety they built in their resort. But we know the sad truth. You can't make a deal with a tyrant. Too wet. More abrupt romance. I could stay here forever! Why don't you? I've always thought the valley was beautiful, but it's even more beautiful now that you're here. I'm tempted, but I can't. The work I do with my brothers is too important. I can't turn my back on the rest of Mobius. It's useless to fight Robotnik. The only way to save what's left of Mobius is to make a deal with him. You can't make a deal with someone who wants to destroy everything. Anyone who do that is just too afraid to fight for their freedom. I'm not afraid. I'm only trying to save my home. Them immediately being into each other is dumb and I don't buy it, but I appreciate what it facilitates for the story. I'll give them that much. Sudden song time! Without any transition, we go straight to this episode's song, the Latin pop style Listen to Your Heart, which happens to be Sonya's first solo. When you look into his eyes and you're not sure if he's telling lies or if it's real. Listen to your heart, girl. Listen to your heart, girl. Listen to your heart, girl. Cause the heart's not gonna lie to you. Listen to your heart, girl. Listen to your heart, girl. And I know you'll always be hearing the truth. If you listen to your heart. When you keep I won't bury the lead. We have our second song I like. For a few reasons. One, I just like Latin American music to begin with. Two, I like that it's the first song that's non-diegetic. Diegesis refers to whether something is happening in-universe or out of it, whether it's part of the story or part of the storytelling. Most songs on the show are diegetic. We see the band perform them in-universe to an audience, though a lot of what happens in the music videos probably isn't happening. Listen to Your Heart appears to be non-diegetic. It's a look into Sonya's personal conflict from her perspective, done in the rules of a musical. You talk until the emotions get too great, so then you start singing. Not a good musical, mind you, because the plot doesn't progress at all, but it is another surprisingly decent song just as music. Louise Valence has some trouble hitting the notes, but she's trying. She's putting a lot into it, and I like the boys' harmonies backing her up. And you don't know which road to take or how to feel. Listen to your heart, girl. So yeah, another song I like without a lot of caveats. That means we're two for... Ten, fuck me, the show is my hell. The brothers arrive and tell Sonya about the townspeople, and she recounts that Stripes said he made a deal with Robotnik. Sonic decides to scope him out at night to find out just how far it goes. Side note, I like that in the middle of the conversation, Manic just takes out his sticks and starts drumming. Everything I know about drummers tells me this is 100% accurate. They just do that. Sure enough, Sonic watches Stripes give him and Manic away, but he once again leaves out Sonya. Sleet and Dingo will take care of those troublesome hedgehogs this time. Bomber may Horace! It's better than Sakura Blue Cheese, at least. <laughs> It'll be a pleasure roboticizing Sonic and Manic, and then I'll deal with their sister later. Take plenty of SWAT bots with you and destroy that valley! 
Once those annoying hedgehogs are gone, I won't need Stripe's help any longer. Told you Gary Chalk would get good. Sonic tells them what he saw. Sonya immediately yells at him for not trusting Stripes because I'm not sure anyone writing this show even likes her, and Stripes stops them from leaving. I can't believe you told Robotnik about us. Sure changed your tune fast, Sonya. Not you, Sonya. Just about Sonic and Manic. I'm sorry, but there's no other way to keep the Valley safe. I never desert my brothers or the Resistance. The Resistance will never be able to defeat Robotnik. I'm only doing what I have to do for everyone here in the Valley. What about the rest of Mobius? I can't do anything about the rest of Mobius. Sleet arrives with a fleet of SWAT bots and orders the Valley destroyed. And you even have the lovely Sonya. Excellent. Roboticize everyone in the valley. And get rid of all this green stuff. I love how nature-hating villains was such a thing in the 90s, before we realized how shallow and short-sighted that really was. Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, of course they mirror the shot, complete with the same sound effects. I had a deal with Robotnik. Deal's off. Robotnik doesn't need you anymore. Now that we have the royal siblings... Don't count your siblings before they're catched! The siblings hightail it out of there, not before a SWAT bot breaks its neck on their van. But of course, they're just building up speed before heading back to save the town. Please stop shoving the camera into the characters' faces. Stripes gets taken to the portable roboticizer. And here's what I meant about Maurice LaMarche. This'll hurt you more than it will me, I'm glad to say. But look on the bright side. At least you won't have to tell Robotnik how Sonic and the others got away. That's what I mean when I say he was not miscast. He was misdirected. Sleet needs to yell and fuss a whole lot less, because this voice is not good for it in the slightest. He needs to speak low and threatening a whole lot more. LaMarche is actually pretty good at that, and it is fairly intimidating. It's still an awful lot of mouth for such a soft voice, but it would have worked so much better. It brings to mind his voice for father in Codename Kids Next Door. At first, those kids next door were a minor nuisance. That's why I entrusted you with their destruction. It's actually closer to Uncle Chuck than I remember, too. No! Okay, okay, but I don't want to see so much as a scratch on it when you're done. Okay? You understand? But LaMarche is able to be intimidating and to yell in Father's voice just fine. Really, I'm just baffled by every decision surrounding sleep. This could have worked, folks. Stripes gets put in the machine, and this happens. If you know what that was, please tell me. It looks like Sleep made him bashful, so now I'm calling it Slingo Hint number one. The triplets return, and the utter lack of a soundtrack is really sticking out now. Sonya saves Stripes in what's almost a cool moment. I ought to let them roboticize you, but I'm not that kind of girl. I'm sorry, Sonya. I was wrong. Then welcome to the Resistance. Ah! Whoa! Stripes rallies the villagers, who just throw fruit at the SWAT bots, but they and the show are dumb, so it works. They also take out the tree cutters easily, and Manic drums a bot's head to make it explode. Sleet tries to set a trap for Sonic by transforming Dingo again, but we've given up on tension, so it backfires immediately. What's this? Whoa! Sonic, no! Oh, phew, okay. I take it back. They're just putting the tension in weird places. The team say goodbye to their new friends. I know now I can't make deals. I have learned no other lessons today. You could still stay and fight by my side. I wish I could, but my place is with my brothers. I'll always be glad to have you as a part of the Resistance. And as a friend. Maybe the next time we need a little rest and relaxation, we'll be back. Yeah, there's nothing more relaxing than kicking some SWAT butt. This was no deepest fear, but it is one of the better, more consistent episodes. The show will have a recurring problem with creating tension, mostly by letting the heroes get out of trouble way too easily, and we saw that here in the beginning and the end. But the real meat of the episode is actually some decent tension. Will this Stripes guy sell them out to protect his town, or will Sonya convince him to fight Robotnik? There's also the tension from knowing that you can't make a deal with Robotnik that he will in any way honor, so we're waiting for the ball to drop and for Robotnik to attack anyway.
I also like that we see a couple new aspects of this world, namely places that have given in to learned helplessness and are hiding from Robotnik through passiveness, and simply places in the world that are unconnected to the triplets' search for their mother. This is just where they ended up after their original plan was botched. The execution is somewhat bland. There's nothing with the charm and energy of a Captain Squeege here. Sonya is continuing to devolve as a character. A lot of the feminine stereotypes she exhibits, like her vanity and haughtiness, can be reasonably explained as her posh, luxurious upbringing, but they're also shit that was often dropped on girl characters at the time anyway. And for the record, feminine stereotypes are not an inherent negative. I mean, look at me, I've embraced more than a few. But because Sonya is the girl of the group, and she needs to have some kind of dynamic with her brothers, that dynamic often boils down to she She's the girl, and it leads to her feeling stuck. I mean, did she really need to fall for this guy at first sight? There's also way too many close-ups on the characters, especially Sonic. The animation is still struggling for space, even if the writing is better paced. And while I like the song, its vocals really needed a second take. But overall, it's another solid and consistent episode from the Edens. C. Episode 10, Come Out Wherever You Are, was written by Hurst and Ali, and I'm gonna make the prediction that it will care about lore, but be paced like the Tour de France. The life of a freedom fighter is hard, and the sacrifices are many. In these dark days, only an elite few live normal lives, all because of one evil presence. We open on Robotnik talking with Bartleby, told you we'd keep coming back, about the upcoming debutante ball. Oh, and the invitations. They've all been sent, sir. Excellent. The trap is set. <laughs> so this is trap. We cut to the recipient of one of those invites, Sonya, who daydreams about attending the ball, even while they're on the road to... Cyrus? Uh, sorry, what? Cyrus wants to see us pronto. Hey, man, what's bugging her? I'm guessing it's got something to do with that paper in her pocket. Hmm... Whoa, sorry, sis. Manic, you are not slick. The boys don't know what a D but on T ball is, but fuck me, Cyrus came back. He's the first guy after Bartleby to actually last longer than one episode. And his mouth still looks awful. He fills the triplets in on Robotnik's latest invention, the Predator. He's putting a brain in a plane? Why? To hunt freedom fighters. Then maybe we should hunt the brain. There's a fair bit of techno babble here. We gotta stop! That's where this comes in. Yeah, shut up, Sonic. But the gist is, it's an intelligent, indestructible ship able to search for and capture unroboticized people. Cyrus calls his solution a sleeper. What's it doing? Assimilating and altering the molecular structure. Plant this on the ship before they install the brain. And we control the Predator. You've got 12 hours. Think you can do it? Are chili dogs a basic food group? Robotnik and Slingo arrive at the Predator's construction site. And of course, if anything goes wrong, he threatens them with roboticization. I don't want to be roboticized. Why? It could be an improvement. Oh, yeah. Cut to the triplets preparing to sabotage. Good effort, Sonic. Wait a minute, Sonic. Let's recap. Now I set the explosives to make them think we're going after the brain. Then, when the bots go after you, I tunnel under here and slap the thingamajiggy on the ship. Then I can distract them so you two can escape. So can we get to it? Remember, when the light flashes, it's time to spin. Out of here! Good luck, sis. But while Sonya's doing her job, she finds herself daydreaming about the ball again, allowing herself to be captured way too easily, and of course forgetting that she can do one of several things to fight them, like, say, throw them like they weigh nothing. Luckily, Sonic hears her call for him. Bummer, may horse! The brothers have to do a bit of improv, with Sonic doing pretty much everything Sonya was supposed to do. Glad her just being the girl is still consistent. I do want to say, though, in case you're wondering why she's daydreaming about Bartleby, who I can't imagine she's still engaged to after he sold her out, I don't mind that she does, necessarily. It's consistent with her character to be a spoiled rich POS, so I see her daydreams as her longing for peaceful times past. A kind of sad what could have been. We'll see if the show sees it that way, though. Sonya's dropped off next to Sleet, but Sonic arrives, an explosion goes off, and he falls in the hole. Sonya does nothing for a while, until she decides to do her organ mist, and this happens. And you know what? I'll take it. And then it happens again. Sonic distracts the bots while Sonya enters the lab where Dingo is waiting, disguised as... Krang? It's... 
genuinely upsetting to look at. He grabs her while she sets a bomb, and Sonic sets the sleeper. I like Sonia. So long, Carthead. <laughs> They blow up the facility while Manic fires mortars. They recoup and hightail it out of there. Their plan works as none of the villains figure out what they were really doing. And the Predator? Not a scratch. We're installing the brain now. Ready to launch in 10 minutes. Excellent. Back at the hideout, the boys wonder what was going on with Sonya, and I think the entire scene was lip-synced in the dark. Well, let's ask her about it, but be cool. Don't get her all crazed. Cool? Hey, that's my middle name. Huh? Yeah, remember, cool. No problemo. Morning, guys. Okay, what the heck happened to you last night? What? Okay, that's actually funny. Point to your writers. Is this about that invite you got? What? Oh, I... Uh, you wouldn't understand! <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I think that went well. Unfortunately, we still don't know what's going on. True, but I think I know how to find out. Cut to our favorite posh prat, Bartleby. Oh, how simply yummy. Ow! The blazes. Excuse me, my good man. Hey! Whoa, Bartleby, nice jammies. Whenever Bartleby shows up and the characters fuck with him, it always improves the episode. Nobody likes or respects him, it's great. Sonya's flipped out, and it has something to do with a stupid uh, D-butt-on-T-ball thing. It's debutante, you barbarian. Debutante, okay, whatever. What is it? Why, it's every young girl's dream, the day she is officially introduced to society. Ah, okay. Well, then you and me gotta figure out some way for her to go. Sonic, I had no idea you possessed this level of sensitivity. I don't, but she's wigged out so bad, I'm afraid she's gonna get caught. Sonic admits he wants his sister to be happy, and Bartleby suggests making it a masked ball. Why, that's a wonderful idea, Bartleby. Then a masked ball it shall be, Dr. Robotnik. So, Bartleby thinks he can hide Princess Sonya behind a mask. How amusing. <laughs> First time watching through the show, this was when I came around on Gary Chalk, for the record. I don't know why he's been absent from so many episodes. He needed to be present so he could find his footing like this. We cracked the code and we're testing for pilots. You guys want to try? Uh, we're on our way. On our way where? Huh? What the? This is what all the best people are wearing to the debutante ball. They're cutting off the top of their head. Sonic, what did you do? Oh, nothing much. Me and my pal Bartleby just fixed it so a certain sister of mine can go. You did that for me? <laughs> well, Manic helped. He stole the invite. Oh, you guys. Hey, what are you... Oh, come on, sis, don't wrinkle the fur. Imagine me! Hug Manic, you piece of shit. He's waiting for it. Cue of this episode's song, the synth dance pop Society Girl, an homage to Aqua's Barbie Girl, with the Ken call and response even, and a pretty pukey music video. Society Girl! It's not good, but compared to some of the shit we've heard so far and will hear later, it succeeds by doing the bare minimum for a passable electronic pop tune. And call me crazy, but I don't think they worked any of their own social commentary into this one either. It's a barefaced celebration of wealth. The song is so boringly bad it doesn't even register once it's over. Uh, I hate to break this up, but don't we have to be somewhere? Cyrus sets up a VR system to train Sonic to fly the Predator. Don't forget, you've got passengers on board, so you've got to maintain a safe angle and good flight attitude. I've got a way cool attitude. Watch this. Whoa! Sonic quickly gets shot down. Passenger injuries, 100%. How about you give it a go, Manic? Do it to it, bro. 100% casualty rate. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Uh, that cuts it. I'm groundbound. 
In contrast, Sonya does a perfect run, making her the pilot, but sadly, their chance to hijack the Predator is on the same night as the debutante ball. Sorry, sis. Hey, why don't we do both? Huh? Can you say secret passageway? So far, I'm correct. Hurst and Ollie are caring about continuity. We now have the secret passages from Wedding Bell Blues. Which reminder did not air before this episode in English. Good work, executives, nailing it like always. And I do mean the coffin. Aw, oh, I thought they were holding hands. Fuck it, I'm counting it. While the guests are being announced, the brothers peek through the eyes of a painting in a shot that is just goddamn adorable. They didn't even try to blend it right. The eyes are just animated on top of the painting. Sonya arrives, and Bartleby tries to pass her off as his cousin, Sarah, while Cyrus tells the boys that it's almost time to act. Cousin Sarah is about to be announced when Sonya does something actually kind of badass in this situation. Announcing Sir Bartleby of Dresden and his cousin... Just a moment, please. Hmm. Announcing Her Royal Highness, Princess Sonya... <laughs> Hello, Butnik. Seize her! He's about to capture her when she gets a surprise bit of help from the balconies. Mother? <gasps> Queen Alina! Get her! And grab this one! Sonic arrives to get her out of there, and she takes her place on the Predator override pilot seat. Meanwhile... There she is! Oh, thank you so much for the lovely party favor. Yeah, you thought I was joking. Manic, non-binary icon. Non-bicon. Sonya handily pilots the Predator, because again, tension. Meanwhile... Sonya! Hey, big boys. Care to take a little spin around the floor? Sonic non-bicon? Eh, I think trans men already claimed him. Spin? Again? No, thank you! Oh, what are the chances we'd all wear the same dress to the same party? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Manic, you fuck it. I love you. With the plot resolved because I called it, paced like the Tour de France, Sonia opens the strange device her mother gave her. Oh, it's lovely. I wore this at my debutante ball. I'm so proud of you, love, mother. Oh, thank you, guys. Aw, what a dumb episode. I mean, it's inoffensive. Don't worry, we will be offended. But Hurst and Ali's weaknesses feel pretty clear now. They obviously care about the world and the continuity, and it's cool seeing them bring things back from earlier episodes, but something's just going wrong at some point in the pipeline, whether it's their initial script, the directors, the animation. Their ideas are just not translating to entertaining episodes. This one has the benefit of a solid through line, though. Sonya dreaming of attending the debutante ball, and that helps with its consistency, coherency, and even brings a hint of sincere emotion. But once again, tension and pacing are thrown out the window. For something Sonya cared so much about, out, the ball is over and done with in a couple minutes, as is the Predator, a very dangerous ship that could cost the lives of millions. Perhaps it was the same problem as one of Hurst and Ali's previous episodes, Tangled Webs, the one that introduced Cyrus, funnily enough. That one felt like it had three different episode ideas shoved into one, and while this one is a lot more coherent, it does feel like the ball and the Predator needed to be separate episodes so that they could both be given the proper attention and gravity. Not a bad episode, but unless the Predator comes back later, it's probably one you can skip. D+. With that done, we have passed the episode 10 mark. I thought it would be pretty fair to write off the entire show once we got here, unless one of the writers was able to figure out how to write within this format. And I was hoping we would get at least one that I would rank at minimum a C, reasonably watchable, proof that this show has some merit and isn't completely disposable. And looking at our list, not only did we get a few in the C range, we even got one that I ranked B. 
a pretty good episode I actually recommend watching. And two of these standouts were written by one or both of the Edens brothers. So we have our answer. At the very least, the Edens seem to know how to write solid episodes for their show that are paced sanely and have good storytelling and ideas in them. Funny story, in Ben Hurst's posts on Usenet, I think he basically subtweeted that he didn't like their episodes. He felt that they weren't in the spirit of Sonic. He didn't specify who it was, but the Edens were the only other writers that lasted almost as long as him and Pat. And, you know, rest in peace, Ben, but they're doing laps around your shit. <laughs> but we're not out of the fire yet. We also had an episode I rated F, which Ben and Pat wrote. And remember, I also rate beginnings in F, so it's still a bad report card. But the low bar I set has been cleared. I will hold to it. We do not need to write off this show. I will put my faith in it that it will continue to be worth my time, sporadic as that may hold true. And in fact, I'm looking forward to more episodes written by the Edens. And however bad this show gets, I can only hope they continue to provide highlights that make it worth watching. But well, that's 30 episodes to go. I'm gonna need a goddamn break first. Seeing as this video was heavily inspired by Quentin Reviews and his videos about iCarly and Victorious, I'm taking another cue from him and having a quick intermission. We're gonna look at some of the very minuscule marketing this show had. I also considered doing something similar to his list of eye crimes, and I am keeping track of a few things, but what else would I? How often the animators forget Manic's quills? How often Sonya whines about her hair? Actually, with how much I whined after I cut my bangs too short, I relate to that a lot now. My patrons did note all the time Sonic said juice in both shows. But you know what, I'm gonna keep this intermission short. Just know that he says it... TOO MUCH! Like Ben Hurst pointed out, Sonic Underground didn't get a whole lot in the way of marketing. It got a few stickers, thank you Wikikidia for finding that picture. It got a few Puzzmobiles, which are about as rare as the stickers. And it got two notable tie-ins. For one, in the year 2000, it got its own Tiger Electronics game! For those who've never gotten their hands on anything by this company, they're cheap and easy games built around very basic movement, maybe one attack, all on a liquid crystal display. Any position or attack this game can show you is already printed onto the screen. Game & Watch was an LCD thing, but Tiger Electronics stuck around long after it and pumped these out for so many licenses. If you loved video games as a kid, and your parents and grandparents didn't know shit about them, they probably bought you one of these. I used to have the Crash Bandicoot one as a kid. And now I've got Sonic Underground. I'm going up in the world. Credit to the user Skua on the Sonic Fan Wiki for these photos of the original packaging. Every person's photos and posts I show here will be linked below. I bought mine used and it's a bit worn down. Some of the paint has rubbed off over the years, but it looks a little better than when I bought it. It was like Sonic came to my house after playing in the dirt. Some alcohol and Q-tips went a long way. Credit to Tiger, it's relatively sophisticated for an LCD game, faint as that praise may be. You're running around as Sonic and fighting off SWATBOT, Slate, and Dingo by just pressing the spin dash button, which some sometimes attacks all enemies no matter what. You collect musical notes, and sometimes Sonya or Manic shows up, and all three play a song at the end of each level based on how many notes you collected. Sonic slows down over time, but you speed back up by pulling this switch, which revs up a little motor inside the body, and it sends a little marble flying around the outside. At least if it's held horizontally like this, and it's hard to see anyway. It's six levels with three difficulty settings, and at the end of level six, the triplets find their mom. Yes, the end of the show is in an LCD game. Cute little toy though, I like it. The only other tie-in I could find was an odd one, Denny's. Yes, Denny's. There was a whole thing with a kid's activity book, and they had these tall displays at the entrances advertising Sonic Underground branded Sonic and Knuckles plushies. Yes, Knuckles. He is in this show. No, he's not in it anywhere enough to justify this. Credit to Sonic Toy Hunter on Twitter and Skua again. Thanks to them, we can actually get a good look at this stand. It seems the Knuckles piece was detachable, and it looks like the plushies were either $1.99 each or $3.99 for both, assuming the price didn't literally get cut in half at some point. These days, they're rare enough that you're lucky to get one of them for $20 loose, and upwards of $50 if they're still in the bag or still tagged. I did manage to get my hands on both of these plushies, they look pretty alright, they're just the classic Sonic & Knuckles designs in toy form. Except Sonic has the medallion unceremoniously stapled to his neck. Knuckles is especially cute, he had this charming chubbiness to him in this era. My Sonic is still in his original plastic bag, and I think I'm gonna keep him there. Not for collection purposes. 
for punishment. They're bigger than I thought they'd be, but compared to Tails over there, he clearly had his growth spurt before they did. All is right with the world. Also, thanks to Zentler Adventure on YouTube, we can even get a clear look at those activity books. Original video also linked below if you want to see the whole thing for yourself. It's simple stuff like crosswords, mazes, jokes, and puns, but if I was a fan of this show as a kid, I'd have eaten this book up. Those activity books, man, there's some nostalgia. I remember going to Denny's with my family once as a kid, and my dad and I kept laughing at this dinosaur crossword that literally spelled out Stegosaurus. But that's it. Those were the only tie-ins I could find. I was so disappointed in the utter absence of Manic that I bought some fan-drawn stickers off of Redbubble. Manic Money is by Mochi Princess, Manic Monday is by Skater Dan, and Badly Drawn Manic is by Cade Bug. This is actually the Pride variant for the logo of a Tumblr roleplay account, Badly Drawn Manic. But it's Manic, it's cute, and it's gay, so I bought it. And I bought doubles because these motherfuckers are going on my hat. Now all is right with the world. All right, we've had our break, we've had our fun. Time to see what else this show can throw at us, starting with another episode written by one of the Edens. Episode 11, Winter Fakes All, was written by Mark Edens and opens over a red sky. We all feel proud of our special abilities and accomplishments. Too much pride can be a terrible trap. Another load of formerly free citizens on their way to be roboticized. I can hardly wait! <laughs> Unfortunately for Robotnik, our real hero is here to save them. He reprograms the truck bot and explodes its head. Whoa, that really blew his mind. What's wrong with that truck bot? Someone's hijacking my prisoners! Stop them! Or just keep standing there. The rest of the team arrive to help out, just in time for Manic to get blown away. Luckily, Sonya remembers, finally, that she has an actual gun. A baby stroller rolls into their way, but Sonic moves it in time. Your parents should be more... Huh? Careful? Whoa! What an ugly baby. <laughs> Food you again, Dingo? <laughs> Watch out! One defective baby carriage coming at you! I've got him this time! The team escape with the truck bot into the subway, where I imagine Sonic shreds most of the prisoners while trying to free them. There's only two of them in that huge truck, and the triplets are confused as to why they're dressed for a track meet. Robotnik fills us in. He's been capturing the fastest Mobians he can find to create a speed bot, which looks like something I remember chasing me in one of my nightmares. But the point is not to exceed Sonic, it's to bait him. Citizens of Mobius! To prove that he's the fastest being on the planet, my speed bot will race all challengers. The winner will receive a big, big prize. And a big surprise. Did I look all right? They say television adds 10 pounds to you. It's around this point the show starts leaning a bit more Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, Long John Botnik with Gary Chalk, and it's a good fit for him. Chalk and Baldry both had more theatrical presences than John Cummings' version. Of course Sonic will know it's a trap, but he's so proud of his speed that he won't be able to resist the challenge. <laughs> What a laugh, too. That's hilarious. Now, if you're familiar with Sat AM, you'll notice that this plot is almost completely recycled from the Season 1 episode, Sonic Racer. All I'll say is, I think that may have been the point. Just you wait. We return to the triplets, where Sonya and Manic are practicing, but Manic cannot stop blast beating because he's the best character on the show. Sonic arrives and tells them he's heard about the race. <laughs> A drum solo in this number. Cool, huh? Hey, I just heard Budnick's challenged all comers to raise his new speed bot. Yeah, right. It's a trap. Uh, she's right, bro. It's a trap. See, best character. Now Sonic knows it's a trap too, but he's not about to pass up a challenge. Sonya's not happy to hear this. If you want to walk into a trap just to prove how fast you are, don't expect me and Manic to come save you. <gasps> I was confused why she went straight to yelling at him, but keep in mind, they've probably been fighting together for weeks, if not months. 
I'd already be sick of his shit too. My patron Shaykun also made a great point when we watched it live. I'm 100% with Sonya. If you intentionally walk into a trap solely because of your own ego, you get to deal with the consequences yourself. If there was something to be gained from walking into a trap, they'd go in together, and they have several times. Indeed, later that night, Sonic lets his ego guide him as he takes off to face the race on his own. His siblings get woken up by the weirdest snoring sound effect I've ever heard. Oh man, stop snoring! Or at least find a better rhythm. If I have dark circles under my eyes, somebody's gonna pay! Wake up and go back to sleep. He's gone! What the f- What? Oh my fucking god, that's genius! Why have I never seen sawing logs literalized like that before? That's so fucking funny! He's gone to enter that race! How could he do anything that dumb? We gotta stop him! Hey, wait a Mobius minute! I thought you said if he walked into a trap, you weren't gonna help him. Do you always mean everything you say? Well, yeah. That's a good shit-eating face. Sonic decides he needs to enter the race in disguise, so he goes into a beauty salon and swipes a few things from the customers. Bartleby is one of them. Please fuck with him, Sonic. Please, please, please. I want to look my best today. I'm going to the race, you see. You know what, the horrified guest made it. I'll happily take it. Sonic puts on his disguise, which is frankly more recognizably him than when he... You, you know what, we'll stick with it. Let's not go back there. He figures that Robotnik might still recognize him, so he gets a SWAT bot to scan him. He's not recognized, so all is good. But unfortunately, he hears a child being captured. One of the first side characters in this entire show that looks like he could be a real Sonic character, and it's this random cat. I'm just a kid! Give me a break! Innocence is against the law. Again, actually funny. What is happening with this episode? Sonic frees the kid and takes out the SWAT bots, which makes him realize something. Phew. Something tells me a disguise just won't juice it. I can stop looking like myself, but I can't stop acting like myself. Oh. I guess Sonya was right about that race, and I was wrong. Whoa, did I say that? And thus, Sonic does the completely unexpected. He doesn't go to the race. Yeah, he goes back to the van, sits down, and he doesn't enter the race at all this episode. Put a pin in that, we'll talk about it at the end. But remember, his siblings are going to the race. <laughs> These fools will clap even louder when Sonic is captured and the Resistance destroyed. Keep a sharp lookout. Don't let Sonic slip through your fingers. I'll get him. These fingers are pretty sticky. Sonya and Manic arrive and figure out how to get in. Sonya sees Bartleby, and much to her chagrin, he's there with a girl. <gasps> get down! It's Bartleby! But who's that woman he's with? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and he's having a very good time! You sound jealous. I am not jealous. Why should I care if Bartleby takes someone else to this stupid race? Now go get their tickets. Oh, please stick the landing episode. You're already my favorite so far. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Um, coming through, coming through. Nice pecs, Bromeo. Commoner. Your tickets. That's odd. I seem to have misplaced our tickets. No tickets. Ah! Hey, put me down. Ooh, a private box. Damn, fucking with Bartleby twice? Can we get a third today? Come on, rule of threes show, you can do it. Bartleby's tickets are for a private box right above the starting line, so the siblings get a nice clear view of the race. Whoa, we must be right under Robotnik's own skybox. If we only had a gun. Sonya. Sleet decides to enter Dingo into the race, first transforming him into a horse. Uh? Hmm. Not really you. Not the front half, anyway. Wow, he just called Dingo a horse's ass. I can't believe they got away with that. Instead, he transforms Dingo into a tiny woman on a unicycle. And at this point, I officially had no idea where this episode was going. Hmm. What if Sonic wears a disguise? How will I know it's him? Oh. The SWAT bots have orders to attack the winner of the race. That's sure to be Sonic. Sonic's sure to wear a disguise, sis. How are we gonna tell which one's him? 
Sonic knows nobody's faster than Sonic. He'll go after the winner. And then we'll rescue him. Simple. The racers approach the starting line. A pig creature ribbits like a frog, and this happens. Yeah, Dingo, don't be a creep. Welcome to the first ever Mobius Challenge Race. The race that will prove who is truly the fastest being on Mobius, and which one of them is Sonic in disguise. I bet you 10,000 Mobiums that Sonic is the ugly one in the dress. That's Dingo. Ah, too bad we didn't shake hands on it. <laughs> ah, you risen welcher. The race is on, and... <laughs> That wouldn't work. Okay, that's just fucking glorious. I love that. Back at the van, Sonic decides to just watch the race, but in the process... Bummer me, Horace! Sonya and Manic must think I'm at the race! They've walked into Butnik's trap! Cue this episode's song, a hoedown called Built for Speed. It's a non-specific celebration of someone who's fast, so I could hear a real bluegrass band playing this about a race car driver or something. If it were more specific, it wouldn't be too far removed from Jerry was a race car driver. I think it would maybe make the list of songs I like if Sam Vincent wasn't once again dragging it down. I don't think he's on the beat once. And on the list of nasally singers out there, boy howdy is he not John Linnell. But the song overall is fine, if only because its high energy fits the scene. That energy, call me crazy, is giving me real kids WB flashbacks. Maybe that's why I like this episode so much? It feels like it wants to be Animaniacs or Tiny Toons, what with this random Marilyn Monroe reference thrown in, and it's a surprisingly good fit for this show. And I appreciate that the music video is very low frills. It's mostly just the scene itself, with little running sonics going across the top and bottom of the screen. The bottom one is the same one from the title cards. That's a cute detail. Be cute more often, show. But not like that. To the surprise of everyone, Dingo knocks the speedbot out of the race and wins. Here's my live reaction to what happens. I have a private box. I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> land on him, land on him. Yes. Now shoot him. I told you that was Sonic. Whoopee! Hooray! <laughs> I won! I won! <laughs> Oops. Poor Dingo is about to get his shit rocked when Sonya arrives to save him, still unaware that it's not Sonic. Manic takes the opportunity to cause an earthquake underneath Robotnik. I can stand by and let those SWAT bots get you, even in that dress. I didn't know you cared. Of course we care. You're. <gasps> huh? Brother? Chill out, sis! The big bro with the big mo is here. If you're Sonic, then who is that? <laughs> Meanwhile, Manic makes Robotnik bounce around and knock himself and Slate out of the window. Slate is able to transform Dingo back. Let's keep <laughs> riding forever, Sonya. Yeah, put a pin in that too. Slate makes it back, but Robotnik slips and falls on. Oh my god, did we get a fourth time? <laughs> Fuck yeah, we have a new best episode. Now you'll never get away from me. Keep that pin in there. Sonic makes Dingo crush himself under a metal door and they escape. How he kills this SWAT bot is pretty funny. It's so understated. Sonya, I thought you cared. None of this would have happened if I hadn't wanted to prove how fast I am. Now I'm not just the fastest thing on Mobius, I'm the tiredest. I'm too big to rake. You're so tired, I bet I could beat you to the van. Get serious, sis, and watch me haul some hypersonic haunch. That's our bro, never too tired to be himself. Let's juice! Considering the incredibly low bar I set for this show, 
This is a really good episode. It has the usual weaknesses, it's a little all over the place, a little unfocused, and the song is only serviceable at best. But it's the first episode that feels like it's having fun with itself. Mark Edens took a predictable setup, one literally identical to a plot from Sat AM five years before, and turned it on its head into a really funny comedy of errors. Sonic doesn't do exactly what everyone expects him to, and it surprises the viewers and even the characters within the show. Going back to what I was saying about tension, we now know that Sonic is not at this race, but no one else does, so we have no idea how it's going to go, and that creates investment. And I like that Sonic decides not to enter for a pretty organic reason. He's going to go, and he makes a disguise to do it, but in the process he realizes he'd be caught no matter what, because he would act exactly how everyone expects him to. So instead he accepts that maybe Sonya is right, and he doesn't go. And he doesn't go-go, rather, is what I wrote. But his siblings aren't going to leave him hanging, so they sneak in to help him anyway, unaware that he's not there at all. It's actually a pretty clever episode, and it's genuinely funny. I audibly laughed out loud a few times. That sawing logs bit is almost too good for this show, and I cheered when Bartleby got his ass crushed. Like I said, any episode that fucks with him gets easy bonus points. I will say, though, I'm still disappointed that Dingo continues to be a creep to Sonya. His reactions to her saving him suggest that he's not used to people looking out for him, and knowing his relationship with Sleet, that's almost certainly the case. He's a goon that only gets used by other people. Sleet literally transforms him into things to use him. It's almost symbolic. And Sonya being kind to him for a change could be the impetus for a redemption arc. Once he's felt what it's like to be treated like a person and not a Swiss army knife, I could see him switching sides if he wasn't written so predatory. There's the bedrock for sympathy in him, but I wish they didn't bury it in him always trying to grab and kidnap her. I doubt he will have any redemption. I don't expect this show to think that far ahead. But this episode showed it was possible with a little more foresight and a little less this. But even if it's not a perfect episode, and I shudder to think what that would look like for this show, it's so far the one I most recommend watching on its own merits. It points to the dichotomy of this show, that tug of war I mentioned between Saturday morning, sad AM level plots in a weekday AOSTH context. Not saying more dramatic plots can't work, or even haven't worked, The Last Resort was a solid episode. But considering this and the deepest fear, that sillier energy seems to work better. B+. Plus. Episode 12, A Hedgehog's Home is Her Castle, was written by Len Jansen, and I expected that it would be about Sonya missing her childhood home. And yeah, that would have been better. In these troubled times, the hardest lesson my children will ever have to learn is to trust. We open with Manic searching in the sewers before he sees his mother, who drops a message for him. Except... Welcome back, your majesty. Did he get it? He got it! <laughs> My own castle? Wow! I didn't even know we had a cousin Albert. Why'd he leave it just to you? Because he didn't know about you two. <laughs> Cause nobody else would take the drafty old thing. Who wants a dumb old castle anyway? I do. We can use it as a headquarters. Hm. Oh yeah. It's so convenient. Only a jillion miles from here. Yo, maybe we'll find out more about Mom. Ah, uh, probably no chili dogs there either. Fine. You stay here. We'll go check it out. Meanwhile, Sonic gets a hankering for chili dogs and ends up at another obvious dingo trap. I need fuel for where I'm going. Where you going, Sonic? You got a sister? No, nope, just chili dogs. Count yourself lucky, pal. Sisters are royal. Hmm. Hey, how'd you know my name? Huh? Oh. Ah! Slate, help! The old double team, huh? A short chase ensues that feels so half-hearted and compulsory that even Sonic's bored and mocks it. Hello? Anyone home? Oh. 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 Why did you? Aren't you forgetting something, Bucketheads? Oh yeah? What? That wall! Uh -huh. Hello. Another case for always using seatbelts. Cut to his siblings driving up to the blatantly haunted castle. Isn't it beautiful? Whoa, gives me the creeps. I like that there's so much lightning that it strikes the drawbridge 
and then the caretaker, Belloc. I am Belloc, the castle caretaker. This is Hooter. Uh-huh. Welcome to Worst Castle. Worst Castle? Did I write this? Not to get your hopes up, but I really hoped Belloc would be our new Captain Squeege. He's not. He's not really anything. He shows them to their rooms, which are already occupied. Thank you, Bella. <gasps> oh, look, more potential. Nah, it just needs a little spring cleaning. Yeah, along with summer, winter, and fall. And the, your room, sir. Huh? Ah! Okay, that's it. I'm out of here. We have Manic's first downside. Doesn't like bats or rats. Manic begrudgingly goes in his room, but Sonya immediately sees something without any buildup as we fade to commercial. What? 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 I think I just saw Mother. I'm telling you, I saw her! Well, there's nothing here. No way out. Yeah, if you have no idea what happened there... Good, your eyes work. But yes, so far this episode is nothing like what I expected. But doing a kind of Halloween haunted house episode has potential. I'm still with it. Sonya checks herself with a new dress in a mirror, but the mirror shows a flame in the reflection. Cut to Manic hearing noises and seeing a walking monster head. Sup, bro? Sonic! Oh, what are you doing here? Sonic has gotten some new anti-gravity sneakers. It was a thing in Sat AM that they just introduced in season two out of nowhere, like Dulcie. But he kept using it in that show, so at least it was a consistent thing. In this show, I think he only uses it one more time way late in the series. Thank you! Thank you! Ah! Sonya walks in and tells him that she saw Mother. He promptly runs out and throws his siblings under the bus. Mom! If you're here, come on out! It's your favorite kid, Sonic! Most handsome, most talented son, Sonic! He's approached by Belloc, who frightens him up to the ceiling. And in trying to get Sonic to his room, they have a quick back and forth I can only describe as tedious. I'm much more entertained by watching Hooter, who if he wasn't seen flying around earlier, I would be convinced was taxidermied alive. Sonic nearly gets a chandelier dropped on him in one of the least tense ways the show could have done it. This little bitch can dodge lasers, but he notices that the rope was cut. Speaking of, sudden cut to Sonya, who sees her mother in the mirror. Cut back to Sonic, looking for Manic, who tells him from inside the castle walls to sit in the chair, which makes him fall back into a trap door. Cut back to Sonya, who's now five yards away from the mirror and walks directly into it. She explodes. Cut to Manic, who watches Sonic Sonic fall down in the dungeon with him. I like that there are suspended cages. That's kind of dark. But it'd be nice if this episode could decide what's important. Anyone with ADHD who's seen this episode, how did it go for you? Because I'm neurotypical and even I'm struggling. They see a large door and Sonic suggests a Manic brand earthquake to knock it down and almost buries them instead. You gave me an opening. He sure did, Sonic. He shoots down the door and they rush back to Sonya's room, but the door is locked. Sonic sees Belloc, who runs away frightened, so Sonic gives chase with his freshly painted arms. Oops, there they go. While Manic opens the door, he does it immediately. Sonic catches Belloc and threatens him with music. I seriously thought he was going to shoot him, but no, he just plays some kind of sloppy guitar that the animators didn't even begin to bother with. <laughs> I will tell you everything! I'm all ears! I was born in a small village, not far from... No, no, no! <laughs> okay, fine, you get one point, Belloc. I did not want to help him, but he... He threatened to eat Hooter! Who threatened a... Uh, Hooter? His name is Sleet. He's on his way here right now with Dingo and the SWAT Pup Battalion! Oh, please, please don't let them get Hooter! We cut back to Manic, who looks at the mirror and gets engulfed in mist. Commercial. I want to give this episode a fucking inhaler. I'm telling you, Sonic, she's in there. Sup with the mirror, pal. A portal to different places, but Queen Alina told me it is very difficult to find your way around. Hooter will back me up. Whoa, you've met our mother? Oh, yes. She is very fond of Hooter. Manic twitches a bit while Sonic runs in to find Sonya. He ends up in a crystal dimension where he finds her and she says she got lost. Sonic then gets lost. <laughs> <laughs> now what? We walk slowly until we find the way out. Walk slowly? Slow goes against my nature. Okay, okay, fine. You speed around and bounce off the walls. I'll walk slowly. 
Okay, okay, I'll give walking slowly a shot. Okay, they managed two cute bits, I'll give them that. They think they find their mother, but it's still a no-go, and she pieces out while they're stuck in there. I love you, my little mammoth. The mirror is your way out. Remember, the mirror. She's a little out of practice at being a mom. Sonia, Sonic? Did Mother come through here? Mother? I didn't see anyone. Someone touched. Yeah, please don't finish that thought. Hide me! They are here! Sleet and Dingo arrive, and Sonic hatches a plan involving all the traps in the castle. Cue this episode's song. Let's do it to it! A bug shit shit show of a Scooby-Doo theme. One, two, three! Let's do it to it! The music is blaring, the singing is piercing, the sound effects are drowning everything out anyway, and the editing is nauseating and impossible to follow. I guess it's kind of funny that it's like a send-up of Night Trap of all things, but God is it hard to watch. And yes, to listen to. As someone who enjoys Scott Walker's later period casually... <laughs> I cannot emphasize enough how unappealing this is musically. Yeah, I, I think I'm just gonna breathe this root beer for a minute here. Sleet panics and calls in every SWAT unit to the castle. Well, it's been nice knowing you all. Come on, everybody! Hang on and we'll blast right past them! <coughs> no, Sonic! We'll never make it past all of them! <coughs> the mirror. That's it! We have to go in the mirror! Are you crazy? Manic, if the mirror breaks, we could be stuck in there forever! Whoa! But Mom told me in my dream! A dream? Now there's something I can trust! But they're out of options, so they jump in. <laughs> Instead of getting lost, they're immediately teleported away from the castle because we've been over the show's thing about tension, and they watch it explode. A dream she touched me. Nobody clip that! It felt so real. Maybe it was real. Yes, I believe it was real. Go oh, fuck yourself, lady. Yeah, so the opening narration, if my children need to learn, trust. In other words, if you fall asleep and hear me in your dreams, listen to it. Despite the premise having potential, a Halloween haunted castle episode, it falls apart very quickly. And I do mean quickly. This might be the worst episode so far at maintaining focus. They cut back and forth between the characters so fast while closing in on them too much so you can't see what's around them or what's happening. It's like being spun in a chair. The song and its music video are easily the worst so far with no redeeming qualities. Belloc had potential to be as charming as Captain Squeege. He's like a large loopy bat guy and bats are lovely, manic. But aside from his introduction and one funny joke about him telling his life story, they don't do anything with him. Maybe they were banking on his owl hooter to carry all the weight. F. <laughs> Episode 13, Artifact, was written by Michael Edens. That title suggests nothing, but I'm just hoping you can wash the taste of that last one out of my mouth. We like to think that the past doesn't have any effect on us. But ignorance of the past can be as dangerous as a ticking bomb. Her intro is actually very relevant to what happens, but nowhere as relevant as that goddamn hair. Now that is an artifact. I don't know of what, but its society is dead. Anyway, the Sonic Underground are in disguise as very boxy waiters at an upper-class auction. This is a bad idea. Someone's sure to recognize me. I know everyone here. Take a chill pill, sis. The message we got said Budnick's gonna make a big announcement that can mean trouble for the Resistance. We gotta be here. Besides, none of these rich guys will pay any attention to a waiter. Just remember, if anything bad happens, I told you so. Sonic proves to be exactly right, because Sonya goes right up to Bartleby and he just eats off the tray while bigging himself up without once looking at her. So far, the Edens have been good at making us hate him and enjoy watching him suffer, so don't worry, he's on a timer. Oh, what a twit. As if Robotnik would ever ask Bartleby's advice. And really, what's with our hair? Attention, please! <laughs> I'm sure you've been wondering why I ordered... 
invited you here tonight. <laughs> I like it. You've all heard the legend of the lost city of Mobu Pinchu. Well, it's no legend. He reveals two artifacts from Mobu Pinchu and opens them up to auction. It's of course an extortion. You got this one cheap. Bit higher on the next one. But the Sonic Underground aren't going to let him just sell off priceless Mobian artifacts, so they attack the SWAT bots and take the rocket. And next time, remember to thank your waiter! And Manic swipes the orb in secret. They make their escape with parachutes they hid under a cloche. A very spy movie exit. Robotnik orders Sleet and Dingo to recover the artifacts, while Robotnik takes over for them at the dig site. Meanwhile, Sonya suggests talking to a professor she knows to learn more about Mobu Pinchu, and Manic declines to go sell his orb for money to help the resistance. However, the truly hideous professor, with a rambling voice and affectation I can only describe as tedious, figures out that it's not from Mobu Pinchu. It's from the last Mobian War. Well, at least, uh, the last one until Robotnik came along. Wouldn't Butnik's own experts tell him it's not for Mobu Pinchu? If Robotnik asks you a question, would you give him an answer he doesn't want to hear? He's got a point there. This is just an old Mobian shell case. If it were in better condition, it could explode. <gasps> Cut right to Manix selling the orb, which is in much better condition. It's from Butnik's private collection. Hmm. I wonder if there's something inside. Okay, hell yeah. I'm on board for Manic fucking up and killing someone. Let's do this. Manic celebrates making 2,000 mobiums from his sale, but the Sibs arrive to spoil the fun. Wow, there's a lot the Resistance can do with this. Wheel Sonic gets an eyeful of all these books. Yo, bro, what took you so long? I thought you were gonna meet us at the Prof's lab. Oh, uh, I had a little job to do for the Resistance. What did Sonya Zo teach say? The joke's on Butnik. Those artifacts of his aren't worth a mobian dime. They aren't even from Mobu Pinchu. They're bombs from an old Mobian army ammunition dump. <laughs> if we're lucky, Butnik will find one in good condition and it'll blow up in his face. Oops. What do you mean, oops? Well, uh, while you guys were busy with the SWAT bots, I took that ball thing Butnik had. You mean the orb? Where is it? I, well, like, wanted to raise some money for the resistance, so I uh, sold it to a guy I know. I hope he likes to travel, because he's going to be scattered all over Mobius if that bomb goes off. They hurry back to the fence, Vince, to buy it back. But he's already sold it off to someone else, and he's not too concerned about them. Sonic doesn't stand for it. Uh, all right, I'll talk. Just don't spin me again. I I sold the orb to some pompous rich guy, uh, Boodlehead or something. Huh? You mean Bottleby? We've got to get that orb back. You can't do that to me. I'll show you. I'll get even. I know just the person who'd pay to learn where it is. Cut to Vince selling out Bartleby and the triplets to Sleet and Dingo, ungrateful bitch. I'm gonna let this scene play out, and then I'm gonna ask a question. And, uh, this kind of information doesn't come cheap. I gotta look out for number one, you know what I mean? Of course. Name your price. I'll make sure you get everything that's coming to you. Okay, Bartleby's got the orb, and Sonic, Sonya, and Manic are on their way over to his mansion to get it back. You have done well, my criminal friend. Hey, it's a pleasure to serve Robotnik and uh, make, say, a uh, thousand mobiums. You should have asked to be paid before you told me who had the orb. Grab him. Hey! Hey, wait! Hey, what are you doing? We had a deal! Look, I told you everything I know. You can't do this! Sleep! I said you'd get what's coming to you. My question. Did you hear what I meant about Maurice LaMarche? That was actually threatening and sinister. Maybe not perfect, but a damn sight better than him whisper yelling and falling asleep at the mic. More of that, please. Also, I like this bit. <laughs> With all the money we save Robotnik on snitches, he should give us a raise. You mean, we getting paid? Uh, I've been meaning to tell you about that, yeah, but not right now. We've got some hedgehogs to round up. Come on, Eden, stop trying to get me to like them. The triplets sneak into Bartleby's property and try to get him to give back the orb. His douchey bootlicking is further emphasized. When are you going to grow up, Sonya, and stop fighting Robotnik? Your brothers are a bad influence. You used to be such a nice hedgehog. Now blow it out, 
out your ears, Bartleby. However, Sleet and Dingo arrive, and everyone proceeds to destroy the gallery. My paintings! My baby! My paintings! Sleet captures Bartleby and freezes him with a remote, which is a brand new function for it, and they make their escape while the triplets fight the bots. We've got to get the orb back before Bartleby's hurt! He may not be my fiancé anymore, but I don't want him blown up! Oh good, she did dump his ass. I know we were all very worried. I'll say this for Bartleby. He has the potential for a redemption. It feels like they're pointing him in that direction, that he's only on Robotnik's side because he's a little bitch. We can only hope, though. It's Sonic Underground. The triplets give Chase up a mountain to the dig site. Sonic hops out of the van and opens a pathway. They spend an awful lot of time pondering how to get up the mountain, which looks like this, before Sonic decides to carry Manic and Sonya to the top one by one. If Sonic thinks I'm letting him carry me up that mountain, he's lost his own! They eventually realize they're at the Valley of Mobu Pinchu, where Bartleby is brought before Robotnik. So, you thought you could get this cheap, huh? <gasps> You'll be ruined when your rich friends hear you tried to cheat them out of the money for their SWAT bot protection! You wouldn't tell them that, would you? You'll be blacklisted from every party! No! Sonic runs in and swipes the bomb, but Sleet transforms Dingo into an orb and tosses him in. Sonic starts juggling them, and the others grab Boodlehead, but he cares more about his orb. A short game of catch plays out, with Dingo immediately changing back and landing on Sleet, glad they're focusing on what's important this episode, and an ill-fated SWAT bot catches the bomb before it eventually lands at Bartleby's feet. <gasps> My orb! <laughs> Cue this episode's song, because you can't pass up the chance for pyrotechnics. You can't own everything! You can't own everything! You can't own everything you see! You can't own everything! You can't own everything! You can't own everything you see! You can't own everything, a very MIDI-sounding, badly mixed, motorhead as corporate rock song with a MASSIVE EPILEPSY WARNING. It's easily the worst video to watch so far, especially if you're photosensitive. Please skip ahead if you are. It is awful. Okay, anyone left, you take your eyes in your own hands. Now, the song itself, cheap as it is, almost works. The problem, as always, is Sam Vincent's voice, but the song leans on his sharp, scratchy singing in a way that kind of actually works for this music. But again, he's trying to do a lot more than he's capable of, and he just highlights the limits of his vocal range. You can own everything you see. But really, the song failed the second that MIDI electric guitar kicked it off. Also, much like the whole tension of the last episode, the bomb is disposed of immediately at the start of the song. Glad they're here, they really bolster the storytelling. The triplets run into a random cave and discover the real Mobu Pinchu. Inside is a whole room of treasure, and they see Queen Alina's... seal? Signature? Their mom drew on the ground, and thus the treasure must be protected until Robotnik is defeated for good. Yeah, it'll be a long time before Buttnik comes back looking for Mobu Pinchu. I wish Ma could have seen us send the old butt face packing. I've got a feeling she knows about it. She knows. It's been a while since I've said this. That was almost a good episode. Unlike the holistic clusterfuck of the last one, Artifact falls apart completely in its third act. As soon as it comes back from its last commercial break, all semblance of what's important to the plot and should be focused on falls out the window. Wasting time on going up the mountain, dicking around with the bomb, disposing of the bomb, Bartleby, and the entire plot during the song, and ending on a damp squib of a resolution. Everything before then is pretty good. Manic swipes an artifact to make money for the resistance, and the others learn that the artifacts are actually bombs, just in time for the orb to activate and give us an actual countdown. That's a good setup. As always, tension is an issue in this show, but it's never screwed it up like this by doing a good job of creating that tension and then giving up on it entirely. The first two-thirds of the episode make up for it, so I won't go down to a D on this one, but I can't give it higher than a C-, minus, barely passing. Episode 14, BUG, was written by Len Jansen, who has not impressed me so far. Though the land was under a dark cloud, my children still found time to play. Yeah! But Manic had a lesson to learn about teamwork.
We'll see about that. We open on Manic flying around on his hoverboard when a stealth bot notices him and gives chase. Sonic shows up in time to save him, with Manic accidentally lip synced to his line. Hang in, bro! He tosses the bot into some rocks and catches Sleet radioing in about Alina. Queen Alina has been spotted in Quadrant 10. Check it out and report back. Do you understand? Affirmative. Check Quadrant 10. Over and out. Before having to save Manic from the world's softest cliffside. <laughs> Tell me what you were doing out here alone? <laughs> Surface some awesome thermals. Yeah, and what happened to the buddy system? Next time we go together, and I'll show you how to shoot thermals. Good, I was worried the lesson wouldn't be milk toast. They rush back to the van, then drive off to an outback oil field. You can always smell when Robotnik's been somewhere, can't you? These wells have been burning for months. Why would Mother want to come to a place like this? Ew. I don't know, but... Manny, look out! What is it with you and Potholes, bro? You never get enough of them. I don't know how many more my teeth can take. Come on, you guys. How many have I hit? 38. 38. Ah! Ah! Wrong, 42. So button it up with the backseat driving, all right? How much farther? 12 miles. Ah! Good old Manic shreds one of the tires, so they're stuck far from the destination. Luckily, Rudy, aka Lizard Mad Max, shows up. I think he's voiced by Maurice LaMarche, and it's one of the few on this show he does well. You Sonic? Who wants to know? Name's Rudy. The party's at Mother's. And the musicians are down the hall. I'm Sonic, and this is Sonya and Manic. It's like the most understated Australian accent I've ever heard in a cartoon. Part of that is he's still bored out of his mind, but it actually works this time. Not his animation, though. They had no idea how to make this guy move. Rudy tells them about strange orange bugs flying around the area. Bottle flies? Bugs? Ew! Shh. And how his fellow members of the Freedom Fighters suddenly turned on him while doing the scream again. Ah! Yeah. A bunch of me friends wanted to take me to Robotnik. I was lucky to get out alive. I think it's something to do with those bugs. This stinks like Robotnik. We could do with a bit of help here, hedgehogs. Eh, what do you think? Hmm. You got it, Rudy. First, we gotta catch one of those bottle flies. Ow, ick! Manic wants to go with Sonic to check out the village, but Sonic says no and rushes off at high speed, which makes Manic mad. As it should, remember the buddy system, you fuck! But Manic sees his board and decides that if Sonic can go solo, then so can he. At this point, I'm wondering if the lesson about teamwork is that Sonic doesn't need a team. That's a great lesson for kids. If you're less capable than Superman, then you can't do anything. Sonic arrives at the village, and it's been torched. He finds one of the bugs and gets its attention with a pretty hilarious Garfield face and catches it in a jar. Whoa, if you're a real bug, I'm a SWAT bug. Yeah. Meanwhile, Manic is enjoying his flight when he gets stung on the nose by one of the bugs. Ouch! Must report. Must report to Robotnik. Sonic returns with the bad news. No! Sonic hands over the bug and asks where Manic went, and Rudy could tell it's a fake Robotnik bug. The Robotniks flies all right. Metal. Fake flies with full metal jackets? Oh, just what we need. How do the Flybots make you loyal to Robotnik? Must be this serum. They inject it through their stingers. And boom! You're pledging allegiance <laughs> to Butnik! Cut to said butt, getting a recap from Sleet about the effectiveness of their plan. And what news of the Queen? Uh, well, we haven't been able to raise this stealth bot on the radio. No blithering incompetent! Find that stealth bot or I'll turn you into a can opener! Dingo then arrives with Manic looking, frankly, how we all think he should look normally. Well, well, a hedgehog come to visit. <laughs> I am pleased. I am your humble servant, sir. I believe he's a flybot victim, sir. You see the sting mark? Ha! We're officially at AOSTH levels of silly. At your service, Dr. Robotnik. Excellent, Hedgehog, because I have a very important job for you. Anything for you, sir. We need to extend the effects. Give me one of the modified flybots. 
To redose, we'll simply activate a radio signal, and the Flybot will administer a microdose with a stinger. So, just before the effects wear off, we drop him in the outback? Exactly. Then he'll deliver the hedgehogs to us. Bark like a dog! Ah, loyalty. You've got to love it. <laughs> now this is a cool premise. One of the triplets unintentionally becoming a double agent. Still don't know what we're learning about teamwork here, but carry on. We return to the others waiting for Manic, just in time for him to fly back. Where you been? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I know you want to help, bro, but disappearing ain't cool. Sorry. I saw one of those bottle fly things and chased it all over the place, but it got away. Just need one from Sonya and we've got them all. They fill him in on the plan. They've scavenged the lasers from the stealth bot, and Rudy helped turn them into a turret, and that's how they're going to take out the bugs. With guns. Uh, cool. How we doing it? By the oil wells, at dawn. Dawn? Couldn't we make it 9.30ish? I hate to lose my beauty sleep. Just kidding! Actually, I'm with Sonya. I can't get out of bed until noon. Let a girl sleep in. That night, Manic gets another poke from the bug and goes tottering off in the most adorable five seconds of the episode. Before radioing in to give away their location. This is Manic calling Dr. Robotnik. Come in. Are you still up? What are you wearing? Sonic wakes up when he hears the rumble of Robotnik's forces approaching. While Rudy guides them to a new hiding spot, Sonya somehow hears the bug poking Manic again. I feel like she, of all people, would have a problem with just waltzing into an occupied bathroom, but she does catch him in the middle of reporting in. Hedgehog, come in! Where are they heading? I repeat, where are the hedgehogs heading? Ah! <laughs> Manic doesn't remember anything, including ever being stung. But luckily, the bug chooses that moment to try again. I remember being stung by a fly, huh? I've heard that sound before. Me too. Must contact Dr. Robotnik. It's coming from his fanny pack. <laughs> Rudy freaks out, and Sonic shoots it in the most overdramatic way. This one's radio controlled. Oh, man. What the f- I didn't add that. That's in the show. Luckily, Sonic, for once, feels like sticking to a plan, as he and Rudy have come up with a way to get rid of the bugs using the van as bait. Cue this episode's song, Never Give Up. Never, never give up. A very kids' TV take on Arena Rock that would be a lot better with any other singer. Reminder, Tylee Ross was discovered by Pete Townsend and won an award for his lead role in Tommy on stage before the show. Actually, that might be why he shows up so rarely. He was probably too expensive. Anyway, it's mixed like shit, but the guitar rips, so it's good enough to make the list. I did it! God, making it to that list is a Herculean task for this show. Through a combination of a lightning storm and Manic going ham on the turret, they're able to take out the bugs. Sonic gets his tail toasted several times for good measure. Bye-bye, bug butts! I think we got them all. I hope Sonic took care of the rest. Ow! Sonic, are you okay? Of course I'm okay. <gasps> I just want to be alone. Huh? Ow! They drive Rudy back to the destroyed village. Here's my live reaction to what happens. Everything's gone. Sheila, you're alive. Rudy. Of course her fucking name's Sheila. Oh, so oh it's great safe. to see you, mate. Swap bolts burned the village, but we got away. Where are the others? Stay down. 
There he is again! You know what? It's not Sonya, but I'm counting him. We got all we need. Great episode. Well, we got rid of the Flybots, but we missed Mother again. No biggie. We'll catch up to her. But in the meantime... Now, bro, about your going solo. I know, dumb idea. From now on, it's all for one and one for Robotnik. Must contact Robotnik. Oh my gosh! Gotcha. <gasps> <laughs> As is often the case with this show, this had a decent premise, but fumbled the execution. Manic inadvertently becoming a double agent for Robotnik has a lot of potential, but once again they barely do anything with it, it's over and done with in minutes, and no actual consequences come from it. A big problem is the setup, him getting mad that Sonic leaves him behind and going off solo. What lesson about teamwork does he learn from this? Cause it seems like it's supposed to be trust others to do what they're good at, and sure, there's merit to that. So why is the episode about Manic? He has the least ego of everyone in this show. The only lesson you teach with him is get used to being left behind because you're not good enough. If there's any character that would be impatient and not trust others to get their job done on their own, it would be Sonic. His narcissism is practically his other character trait besides Chili Dogs, and aside from the one episode about his aquaphobia, the writers treat him like he has no real weaknesses. Sonya and Manic have their own skills, and I'm ignoring the medallions because they usually just amount to weapons. But there is a massive power and skill imbalance in this team. Sonya's super strength means that at her weakest, she can lift SWAT bots off the ground, and most problems they face can be solved by Sonic sawing it in half with his own body. And that's something Sad AM and Archie addressed, if not directly. They showed why Sonic has the Freedom Fighters and what skills they have that he lacks. And even in later games or the IDW comics, they show why he has Tails, Knuckles, Amy, etc. They all can do do things he can't with speed alone, and they bolster his abilities with theirs. Underground Sonic is just sad AM Sonic without any of his nuance or, frankly, good parts. That's what this episode needed to be about. It needed to be Sonic not trusting Manic enough to do what he's capable of, and Manic getting to prove himself in spite of his lack of combat abilities. That would address that power imbalance, and show to the audience what Manic really brings to this team that isn't there with Sonic alone, or even with him and Sonya. My boy's green as grass, just give him some sunshine. But overall, the episode is okay and has one of the better songs. Not high praise, but I'll give it a solid C. Episode 15, Sonic Tonic, was written by Mark Edens, and it opens in a beautiful oasis in the desert. Another one. I built the hanging gardens of Mobius for my children, before they were even born. Someday, I would bring them here, and show them all the trees and flowers of Mobius. All here in this one beautiful spot. But before I could share this beauty with them, there came Robotnik. Robotnik destroys much of the plant life and discovers the last living Velocitree. I thought it was a weird portmanteau with Velociraptor, but it's actually for Velocity, and y'all, that is so disappointing. My traveling lab can process an entire tree in seconds. You should see it make French fries. <laughs> The Velocitree is the fastest growing thing on Mobius. By condensing it to its essence, anyone can have sonic speed. I call it Sonic Tonic. Dingo is chosen to test it by pouring it on his feet, and it causes him to vibrate uncontrollably. But once he calms down by falling on the others, he's able to run at sonic speeds right through the wall. Sleet takes some for himself, and off they go to capture Sonic. Can't you two work any faster? You've been trying to hook up this sound system for about five minutes. Whoa, has it been that long? Let me show you how to do it. Yes, Sonic, please continue to show that you don't need your fucking team for anything. The job's no problem when you got the speed you need. Oh, we still need to test the system. Boring. I'm gonna go check out concert security. Back in a flash. Oh, don't hurry. Sonic runs up to security, but can't see anybody. There should be some resistance guys here watching for SWAT bots. I'd better have a look. I swear to God, does Dingo just not look like that to them? 
Also, where is he looking? Sleet changes Dingo back, and Sonic makes a break before they can surround him, but they easily follow him to the hideout. Sonic tries to fight them off while the van escapes, but they manage to tie him up in a coat of chains. I'd hate to be in your shoes. <laughs> huh? Enjoy it while you can, Butnik. I won't be staying long. <laughs> Just long enough to make you my robotic slave forever. Can I ask one quick question? Don't interrupt me. Can't you see I'm gloating? I just want to know how you made Sleet and Dingo fast enough to catch me. I owe it all to your mother. What's mom got to do with this? It was Queen Alina who saved the rare Velocitree in her hanging gardens. And it was Sonic Tonic made from the Velocitree that made Sleet and Dingo fast. Any more questions? Yeah. Were you born this ugly, or did you have to work at it? Roboticize him. Before they do so, Sleet suggests that he and Dingo get paid beforehand. Are you suggesting I might try to cheat you out of your reward? Sounds in character to me. Why don't we discuss this in private? I like the occasional reminders that Sleet and Dingo are not actually loyal to Robotnik. They're bounty hunters. A lot of episodes seem to forget that they work for him under duress and just treat them like his evil henchmen. But what's interesting about their dynamic with him is how they're not. And I like seeing them push back against Robotnik or try to get more compensation for their work. Especially in a situation like this where it's a conflict Sonic can exploit. It's what made Snively a more interesting character in Sat AM Season 2. And I hope it gets played with more as the show goes on. These guys have a problem with being interesting, after all. Sonya and Manic arrive at the lab to save Sonic. I like that Manic has a whole keychain of lockpicks. And they sneak in through the vent. You always take me to the nicest places, Manic. Just try to show you a good time, sis. Just gonna let you live with that exchange for a while. Back with Sonic, he tries to rile up Dingo by making him think Robotnik and Sleet will cut him out of the reward. It doesn't go how he expects. Maybe Sleet will morph you into a fly and swatch you. Keep your hedgehog trip shut. You're just trying to get me rattled. Whoa! What's happening? Ah! Either I'm seeing things, or you've got enough feet for ten dingoes. Yeah! <gasps> what happened? Whoa, whoa. That was quite a feat with those feet. So, remember how I said this video was inspired by Quentin Reviews? No reason. Sonic breaks free while Dingo literally falls over his feet and meets up with his siblings. Sleet and Robotnik negotiate on what they'll do with Dingo's half of the reward. Damn, Sonic called it. For a dumbass, he's perceptive. Unfortunately for Sleet, the same thing happens to him. It must be a side effect of the Sonic Tonic. Ah, what a waste of a good invention. Now he's useless. I wonder if the same things happen to Dingo's guarding Sonic! The triplets find him falling over himself, and they decide that Robotnik can't test out his tonic on anyone else. Can you crack the code to the lab safe? Dude, does a SWAT bot rust in the rain? Sonic goes to see if there are any SWAT bots around. <gasps> yep, they're around! Manic stops them by activating the fire extinguishers, and they have a conversation entirely in non sequiturs. What are you waiting for? You're so slow, you're standing still. Put your jets in retro, bro. Guess I overdid it with the fire extinguishers, huh? You never know until you try. Now let's shake and stay in my way. They run slowly to the van until Sonic starts running fast, and he tells them they need to hurry to the hanging gardens. If you want us to move faster, maybe we should use some of this tonic. No way! You may not be a morphing mutant mutt like Dingo, but we still don't know what this stuff might do. Besides, I could teach you to be fast. If you weren't such slow learners. Sonic is so full of himself. He acts like just because he's fast, he's the leader. His dude really burns me up, and we're not talking a slow burn, know what I mean? Somebody needs to put Sonic in his place. Which of you is in charge? Because I wouldn't listen to any of you. They drive out to the desert when... Bomber May Horace! <gasps> a blowout! Sonic leaves them to change the tire while he scouts for Robotnik. And the two decide they've had enough of him disrespecting them just because they're not as fast as him. Cue this episode's song, The Power Poppy, The Fastest Thing Alive, sung by Manic and Sonya. No Sonic! Yes, it does make the list. I did it! But not just because of that. I wish I could go faster. I really wish I was the fastest thing alive. Here comes that Sonic Blast. It's 
It's got fun energy. I like the bubblegum scatting they do as the hook. And I like to be the one that everyone says, look at him go. He makes a drumstick smoke. Who is that guy? Yeah, Tylee Ross outclasses everyone on this show. But the YouTube pooper in me cannot help but stop a line right at I go streaking and start giggling like a fucking idiot. I go streaking. What if the same thing happens to us that happened to Dingo? You said it yourself. Dingo's unstable. He's always morphing into something. No way it could happen to us. No way. No way. They go for it and they give themselves the tonic. When we come back from commercial, Robotnik is trying to sweat the tonic out of Sleet and Dingo, which manages to work, and he sends them to the Hanging Gardens. Sonic sees this, runs back to his siblings, and bitches them out for not changing the tire. I'll run ahead while you two change the tire. No, you change the tire while I run ahead. Did you see that? She did it, didn't she? She used the tonic. Hey, sis, wait for me. Manic's fast, too. Sonic changes the tire and drives off after them, hoping to catch them before they make Mark Edens very happy. They arrive at the gardens and see that Robotnik already destroyed all the plants. I guess they looked better before Robotnik found them. At least I beat you here. Huh? No way, Sonye. I won the race. You think you have to be faster than I am? You're just like Sonic. Where is your brother, by the way? Sleet and Dingo arrive, but before they can fight, the feet thing happens. Thank you for keeping your shoes on, Christ. Sonic drives up and does exactly what I was hoping he would. Let Medic and Sonya go, and I'll let you have the Sonic Tonic. Robotnik doesn't want it. He has no use for something that doesn't- Looks like I need a plan B. Grab him, Dingo! You're not even good enough to be I'll my- I'll make you eat those words! Sonic runs up the building, and the SWAT bots give chase. Bummer, May Horace! Sonic tosses the tonic into the water, because this Sonic does not care about nature and pollutes indiscriminately, and is about to break into a second song this episode, when the tonic starts affecting the dead plants. The gardens start to regrow and take out the opposition. Wait! I have an idea! All we have to do is- Oh good, the writer's other fetish. Glad they could work that in too. No wonder Ma loved it here. You were right about not using that tonic, Sonic. Yeah, but you never would have tapped the Sonic if I hadn't teased you about being slow. I promise I'll never do that again. Ah, oh, can't you speed up some? I think I just saw a turtle pass us. <laughs> other than the excess of feet. This was an okay episode. Like the last one, there's more potential to this idea than was actually explored. Neither pair of Sleet and Dingo or Sonya and Manic spend enough time being as fast as Sonic for it to amount to anything. Sonic just suddenly realizes he shouldn't tease his siblings about being slow, like he's actually emotionally intelligent enough to notice that. It probably would have been more worthwhile to focus on one pair gaining that speed for the whole episode, rather than to have both of them, and the result is neither gets to shine. C minus. Episode 16, Friend or Foe, was written by Kevin Donahue in his only writing credit. It's an episode I was excited for because it's the deep cartoon debut of another of Sonic's longtime franchise friends. We begin on a beautiful golden floating island. Following their quest, my children continue to learn one lesson, that things are not always what they seem. The triplets fly in on the rumor that their mother will be on the island, but the Oracle warned them. The floating island is fraught with danger. Beware the echidna. Fraught? What kind of stupid word is that? Fraught means filled, as in filled with danger. What danger? If you're so fraught, I'll check this place out. Sonic! Sonic spins off right into a trap. Meanwhile, Robotnik calls in to Sleet and Dingo. Dingo doesn't realize that's what's happening, and a whole bit happens of Sleet trying to answer, but Dingo keeps getting in the way. Robotnik reminds them of the plan. Turn the echidna against the hedgehogs and get me the Chaos Emerald. And when we take the emerald, the island will plummet down and crash. And the hedgehogs will fall with it. <laughs> <laughs> The two go off to find the echidna, and they too fall into a trap. You wolf face, you should have stayed home. Now you get to beat dinner. You can call me Knuckles. Knuckles is voiced by Canadian voice acting veteran Brian Drummond. At the exact same time down in the US, Ryan Drummond began his tenure as Sonic. They're not related from what I can tell, but it's a pretty funny coincidence. And now Brian is the Canadian Eggman. What a world we live in. His voice for Knuckles is a much higher pitch than what we're used to these days. But this was in development before Sonic Adventure came out. He hadn't appeared in anything vocally yet. They were probably just going with something similar to Jaleel White's pitch range. Also, he has chubby cheeks and is very squat. 
Knuckles threatens to serve Sleet and Dingo to his pet dinosaur, Chomps. Sleet tries to convince Knuckles that they're the good guys and the hedgehogs are bad, using a purposefully badly voiced hologram. Gotta cruise, dudes. We gotta find that Chaos Emerald before that dopey Defender Knuckles gets us. You are not often right, older brother. But on this occasion, I agree. Come, Manic. We are more clever than that dumb Knuckles guy. It's more effort than Eggman usually put into tricking Knuckles. But it's still lame as fuck. He lets the mercs go, demanding they leave immediately. And he heads off to find the hedgehogs while Chomps threatens them and then eats the projector. We gotta find those emeralds. Gotta find those emeralds. Sonic continues to be the worst. <gasps> and they find a sacred pool where a vision of their mother appears. However, Knuckles earthquakes in to get in their way. At this point, the animation shits itself, and for the rest of the episode, we'll refuse to clean it. What's happening? Whoa, dude, you nailed that landing. I give it a 10. You came here to steal the emerald, but I'll stop you. Chill, fella, we're not thieves. Well, mostly we're not. Anyway. Knuckles does his unique special move for this show, a couple whirling fists, then approaches Sonic and makes him fly back against a tree. Boy, that guy's good. And we go to commercial as he digs into the ground. Don't know why they cut there. But we come back to him not in the ground, just revving up. Sonic is a shithead and jumps right into fighting, despite Sonya suggesting they reason with him instead. Good idea, sis. Not. They collide, branches fall on Sonic, and the very next shot they've been pulled off. You guys can jump in here anytime, you know. Uh, we knew you had it covered. This is the quality we're getting for the rest of the episode, strap in. Sonya tries to tell him that they're not there to steal the emerald. They're looking for Queen Alina. He, of course, doesn't believe her. Sonic spins him around a bit, and Sonya, trying to help, just gets them all dropped in a trap. Knuckles looks extremely off-model the entire scene. Sonya and Manic fall all the way down, but Sonic is able to stop and climb back up. <laughs> It. You're toast, knucklehead. Out of here. Cut to Slate and Dingo walking down a cave where they reach a river, and Slate turns Dingo into a boat. Cut to Sonya and Manic taking stock of where they are, and they find a door that Sonya starts cutting through. Cut to Sonic running up to the hole, and then Knuckle shows up. That's got her. He does more of the whirly fists, but he just keeps running past Sonic. I literally said out loud while I was watching it. What is this stupid speed. shit? Cut back to Sonya and Manic breaking through the door. Crash in. Cut back to our embarrassing fight scene. Good, we're back to the awful pace that I'm used to, where Knuckles uses his traps against Sonic. This happens. And then back to Sonya and Manic, now in the same cave that Sleet and Dingo were in. Sonya says like the third vain thing she said this one episode, when Chomp shows up, he sneezes up the hologram that Sleet showed Knuckles, then rolls over in pain. Now there's something you don't see every day. Y'all. I was ready to like this episode. I wanted to. It has Knuckles in it. This is the point where I knew I didn't. Cut back to Knuckles running across a bridge that looks like honeycomb. It's a cool design at least. And Sonic runs up. As he carefully crosses, Knuckles starts breaking it apart. Bummer, Bay Horus. Sonic makes it across in just the worst looking way, but he makes Knuckles start to fall over. I'm gonna let the scene play out because I know you've been waiting for it. Was it very nice? Uh, uh. Hmm, need a hand? Ah, just a little joke there. What? What? Whoa! Whoa! Ah. Why'd you save me? Let's talk, bud. Yep, it's that episode. One of the two anyone knows about from this show. What the fuck happened? The show never looks great, but this episode sticks out in how shit it looks. We cut back to Sonya and Manic trying to help Chomps. Manic straddles him, and he burps up the projector and slobbers all over Manic as thanks. I wanted you to hear that in those exact terms. Yuck. Thanks. Ugh. A holo projector? This reeks of Robotnik. No, I think it's his breath. They ask Chomps where he got it, and they figure out that it was Sleet and Dingo. The two have just arrived at the Chaos Emerald. Ouch! <gasps> Is that it? It's fantastic. Cut back to Knuckles filling in Sonic. They're always after something. The Emerald! No! The island starts falling. Sonya and Manic catch up to the baddies, and they conveniently give the two an exit. 
Convenient. Haven't said that word in a while, but is practically driving this plot. Dingo notices Sonya before he looks back, and that distracts him, so he hits his foot on a rock and drops the emerald. Slate notices and sends out SWAT bots to grab the emerald. Cue the song, Not Always What They Seem. Another massive seizure warning. They do the goddamn flashing of the drum emblem again, and it's even worse this time. I'm not even photosensitive, and I think this shit is unwatchable. It's too bad, because the song is okay. People It's not mixed like shit for once, and Sam Vincent actually tones down his bad, screechy habits. But holy fuck, they ruin it with a flashing video. It misses the list entirely for that. They stop the SWAT bots and recover the emerald, and they give it to Knuckles to put it back in place. Sleet! Bingo! You better have the emerald. If you don't, I'm going to have you roboticized piece by piece! Where are you? Answer me! Sleet? Did you ever hear a little voice like talking to you. Knuckles offers them food that Sonic, of course, puts away because this version is a complete piece of shit, and they tell him that they were there looking for Queen Alina. Queen Alina is your mom? Why didn't you say so? They did, you little bitch. I knew her. She was here when I was just a kid. A kidna. He shows them a message left by the Queen in the Emerald's chamber. In the final days of Robotnik's tyranny, allies will unite with my children. First among them will be Knuckles, guardian of the Chaos Emerald. This episode is draining. It is a sucking void where nothing of consequence happens, more so than most of this show. There's plenty of bland dialogue in most episodes, but never has it felt like characters are talking while saying nothing, and there is no impact to anything happening, especially not that laughable fight with Knuckles. The best thing I can say is it introduces him in a way that feels pretty true to his character. Hot-headed, gullible, but ultimately a good guy who just wants to protect his island. But boy did the animation do him no favors. This episode really drives home the rushed production schedule for this show. We've seen plenty of clunky animation before, but it's so constant and in your face here that it's memetic. This one scene and another quickly approaching are some of the few things anyone knows about this show because they're so infamously ridiculous. But it's not appreciated just how unwatchably boring the actual episode is. Hard F. Well, the Knuckles episode sucked, but the next one, Head Games, is written by Michael Edens. Maybe it'll be fun. Oh no! We open with Alina's monologue over palm trees and stone statues. Too often, we chase after... <laughs> Hold the fucking phone. Oh, I... I think it's a necklace with musical notes. For a second there, I thought it was its feet. I thought that was feet, and I was... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so disappointed. What looks new and promising. We have to remember that sometimes <laughs> the old ways are best. Okay, Boomer. We cut to the absolute worst visualization of hunger I've ever seen, as Sonic ditches his working siblings to get some chili dogs in his blue sweater. <laughs> He orders six chili dogs, and the vendor stops to nod to Alina in the distance, then stuffs a goddamn basketball into the bag. For perhaps the first time this show, we see Alina with her cloak off, in person, not in a photo. <laughs> Sonic eats the dogs in the least appetizing way possible, before discovering the wrapped ball, which turns out to be a coconut. Hey, look! Fan mail from some nutcase. You are needed on Speedster Island. QA? QA? Huh? Queen Alina! It's a message from Ma! She wants us on Speedster Island. But how? That's in the middle of the South Mobian Sea. See? They're interrupted by a SWAT bot attack and make a break for it, complete with a reminder that the guitar is a gun. Maybe a cruise isn't so bad. Things are getting too hot around here. We cut to Speedster Island, where we meet the native tribe who appear to be coded Polynesian 10 car pileup. This is the chief and his son, Montu. When can I try, Fada? You promised to teach me how to use the net. Soon you won't have to fish. We'll have jobs, money to buy things, a new way of life. 
I don't want a new way of life. We've always been happy here. No fish again. The old ways don't provide for us anymore. We must change if we are to survive. At that moment, Sleep, Dingo, and our good friend Bartleby shows up. Oh no, this is probably racist is the right reaction. Just a rush of dread. This island will make a wonderful resort for the aristocracy of Robotropolis. Oh no. They're gonna try to say something, aren't they? I will say, this dumb bitch is the right character for that. Mmm, just smell that tropical air. And so quaint and rustic. Of course, the village will have to be relocated. We can't let a few huts take up prime real estate. Yes, Mr. Michael Edens is tackling colonialism in that good old 90s, ill-fated good intentions kind of way, where you put a headdress on a bear and give him an accent. Let me present Club Robo, the latest in high-tech beach resorts. And we'll even use the stone heads down by the beach for decoration in the lobby. The chief laments that he may have to sell the island to Robotnik, since his people are unable to feed themselves without fish. But Montu opposes him. Montu runs crying to the stone statues we saw earlier. Obviously caricatures of the triplets, and the best ones I could have hoped for. Why has my father sold out? He beseeches the statues, the guardians of the island, to help, but they don't respond. Maybe you are just a legend. If you won't protect us, who will? We jump over to the triplets, now approaching the island, and they're quickly attacked by more SWAT bots. Sonic shoots them some more, straight up like his guitar is a rifle, but the van's pontoons get shot, and it sinks. We fade to commercial as Sonic sinks too. We return to Manic saving him immediately, glad that happened. Montu arrives at the beach to see Sonic kissing it. He thinks they're the guardians and runs away, spooked. The trio chase after him, but since he seems afraid, Sonic suggests playing some music to chill him out. Cue this episode's song, the reggae flavored Take a Chance, I hope it isn't racist. Assist. You have to learn to take a chance. You never know what you might be missing in life. Could be something you really like. You must learn to take a chance. Fuck me, the white bread sub UB40 cod reggae is bad enough. He's actually putting on an accent. Michael Edens, I know you weren't involved in this song, but you enabled this. Might be the best time you've ever had. As the song finishes, they discover the Guardian statues. Montu bows to them, and they put together that they're here to help the villagers with a Robotnik problem. What strangers, man, are mad too? The two who come from Robotnik. The big one, and the one I don't trust. Dingo and Sleet. And the pompous one with all the money. <laughs> Sound like anybody you know, sis? I'll be. The chief approaches, so the triplets hide while he and Montu talk about how incredibly naive he is. Sonia and Sonic go to fuck up Bartleby, while Manic stays behind to study the statues and the carvings around their necks. Which I'm still not convinced isn't their feet. Come on, show, at least give me this. Sleet calls Robotnik, and they naturally tell the audience the entire plan. They're the reason there are no fish around the island and the people are starving. And Robotnik plans to roboticize the villagers as soon as they sell the island. However, Bartleby doesn't seem to be in on this plan. Sonic and Sonya sneak past the SWAT bots to S Bartleby's quarters. They hear him approach and hide in his closet. Bartleby rich bitches for a minute, then shenanigans ensue as his closet is automated and the arms grab the siblings. What? Stop that, you stupid machine! Uh! Hi, big boy. Bartleby! Sonya! What are you doing here? You can't build the resort, Bartleby. I'm bringing these peasants into the lap of luxury. Yeah, luxury Butnik style. Ow. Sonic wanders away in silence, right to where Dingo is waiting disguised as a chair. The SWAT bots burst in through the wall. Yeah, fuck you, Bartleby. We go to commercial, come back, and Sonic escapes. Dingo charges after them, but Sonia does a backflip to nowhere, and he runs into the closet. The SWAT bots open fire, blasting a hole in the wall and allowing the siblings to escape. I don't care if we have to destroy the whole village! I want those hedgehogs! This 
is no time for dress up, Dingo. After them! We cut back to Manic, who's figured out what the carvings are, right as the other two arrive. Montu runs in, asking to go with them after his father betrayed the village. But the triplet suddenly thinks selling the island to Robotnik was okay, because the chief did it out of love. Don't bother unpacking that, the village is under attack! Sleet! What's going on? We haven't actually bought the island yet! Details. Besides, Robotnik wants those people roboticized anyway. A good resort needs waiters and bellhops who will do what they're told. And Robotnik doesn't tip. You can't! Slate orders the people roboticized, and that fucking scream comes back. <laughs> but the Sonic Underground arrives to save them. They trip a few bots, spin others to pieces, and drop coconuts on them, but there's just too many. Dingo has turned into a rope and grabs them, and my racist senses are tingling. <laughs> Tell you what, if Bartleby gets his cheeks clapped, then this is not the worst episode so far. It's a very low bar and a pile of shit that doubles as a ramp, but they can clear it. Sleet tantrums Dingo back to normal, freeing the triplets. Manic reveals that the carvings are musical notes. Here's my live reaction to what happens next. All we have to do is play! God. Come on, come on, come on, show. Silver lining. Oh, fuck you, bitch. Hold on. Oh, my God. <laughs> you idiots! We cleared the low bar. Montu forgives his father for giving up the island so quickly, and Sonic wonders how to get home without the van. Manic has an idea. See, even his statue is the best. Look at his smile. With everyone safe, the Guardians return to the Earth, and everybody dances now. Man, I am astonished by this thing. I've never seen such a bad episode do such a hard 180 at the last minute. It's clearly trying to say something about colonialism, that it only benefits the wealthy and powerful while destroying indigenous people's homes and cultures. But it does it while doing this. <laughs> And you get that awful, dated story and music for 19 and a half minutes, and then a giant stone statue of Sonya javelins a tree into the bad guys. Silver linings, I guess. Still one of the worst episodes so far, just for sheer cringe factor. I'd suggest skipping everything and watching the end, but I don't know that you would feel that same euphoria without all the shit clogging at first. D minus. Episode 18, When in Rome, was written by Len Jansen, who is not doing well. It was this episode where I finally noticed that when Alina cries in the title sequence, they reverse it later. Just sucking them back up, now you'll never unsee it. Also, this whole time, none of us could parse Bummer May Horus, and we thought he was saying Bummer My Horse. We have a rare opening without an Alina log, as the Sonic Underground break out of a Robotnik compound. Sonic kites a SWAT bot into a whole firing squad at the entrance, and they make their break out of the resulting hole. That's three missions in a row now where we've come up empty. Three times! What's up with that? We're getting nowhere fast here. We're doing some good work, Sonic. Oh yeah? Is Butnik still around? Do we know where Mom is? Are we making any real progress? Uh, yes, no, and hard to say. But Sonya has an idea. They go to the useless Oracle and ask him for guidance. They drive to a snowy place. Feel free to remind me if we've been here before, because Sonic remembers it, but I sure don't. But at least we get everyone in cute, poofy winter outfits. They enter a crystal cave and promptly fall down a trap door into a wide, mystical library. The Oracle appears in a projection from a crystal, and the triplets ask for help in finding their mom and fulfilling their quest. Well, young hedgehogs, uh, I can help. But there is a price. Well, here it comes. Shoulda known you never get something for nothing in this world. Whoa! Indeed. In this case, my cynical young friend, the price is merely an act of valor. 
He opens a portal to an oppressed world. The triplets are tasked with freeing the people within, and if they succeed, he will help them. However, as a caveat, their medallions get left behind. Good luck, hedgehogs. Your true purpose and faith will keep you safe. On the surface, I like this setup. Saturday M Season 1 had a similar episode, the one with just some fucking wizard, where he strips Sonic of his speed and forces him to prove himself without his superpower. If you're nothing without the suit, you shouldn't have it, that kind of thing. I like the idea of testing the siblings without their destiny music guns, but as I've discussed, Sonic throws off the entire power balance of the team with his speed alone, so the medallions are largely redundant as it is. The three arrive in this new world, but are immediately separated. Manic finds himself before a Centurion SWAT bot and sees a girl about to be run over by Dingo on a chariot. Whoa, whoa! Thank you. Oh no. Hey man, why don't you watch where you're going? How dare you touch my horse? Take him away! Well, this is just great. So yes, we have our obligatory historical episode. In this case, a Mobian take on the Roman Empire, with Sleet and Dingo sitting in as this world's villains. Sleetus and Dingus. It's almost a predecessor to the Sonic storybook games in that way. But less charming. We then cut to Sonya, and I'm gonna play the whole bit because it's kind of magical. Hurry up, girl. Citizen. Who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, uh, sightseeing. I'm with the tour, but I got separated. Your papers. Sorry, I'm taking the whirlwind tour of the city. Time to twirl and swirl! This can't be good. Next, we check on Sonic, who revs up to find his siblings, but falls flat on his face. To my pleasant surprise, the Oracle also took his speed. That means all three of them are completely without any of their powers. He too gets captured due to having no papers. Hmm, I bet you're wondering why I called this meeting. Trey amusing, Sonic. Now how do we get out of here? We've got no medallions and no powers. Bet I know something that will help us get out. I hear you, little bro. No, Sonic, he's a drummer. They all do that. Okay, there are just crap instruments for him down there. Oh, I get it. If this place is like Robotropolis, they probably won't like music either. So when they come to stop us... Exactamundo, sis. We very quickly get to this episode's song, Where There's a Will, There's a Way, the world's most out-of-place old-school hip-hop track. Where there's a will, there's a way. Wherever there's a will, we can find a way. Together we'll overcome and win, come what may. I don't need to tell you that when this song started playing, I got the worst chill down my back. Even Tylee Ross can't save this nightmare of white people doing children's TV rap. If there's one good part, it's the rats waving lighters. Yes, Brenna. I can't do anything about this. A centurion appears to stop them, but if we're being honest, I think they would have gotten the same result by playing Mersbow. I'm bored. Where is my juggler? Sorry, your majesty. You sent him to the lion's den, remember? But I do have the new prisoners for your inspection. Very well, bring them in. The triplets snark and mockingly bow to the emperor, but it's Sonic's farty stomach that pisses him off. What was that? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Dungeon Gruel does it to you every time. And he gets sent to the gladiator pit. Manic gets made the new juggler, and Sonya, the Emperor's personal servant. They're not happy, but he threatens to feed them to the lions. Listen closely, hedgehogs. You do exactly as I say, or Dingotis here will feed you to the lions. Lions? <laughs> Very hungry lions. Clear here. Personal service is one of my best features. I was born to entertain. Sonic gets tossed into battle with a Minotaur, yet another of the many characters who feel like they're from the wrong show. But I don't want to rob you of another good moment. Hey, yo, you've been pumping some iron, huh, big guy? Whew. 
That steam's probably not a hit with the Minotaur babes, huh? Huh? Yeah, I'll bet it ruins <laughs> a lot of good hairstyles, huh? Huh? You need some help with the honeys? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, bud, you have come to the right place. Because when it comes to cool, the hedgehog's a slice of ice. That's the stupidest shit they could have gone with, and I live for it. We cut back to his siblings trying their best. Sonya introduces Lydia. Hi. Who was the daughter of the rightful emperor, Augustine. She was made a slave while her father was imprisoned in a tall tower. Because to free people from the yoke of oppression, you don't free them from an empire. You just reinstate the last one! I feel like it's supposed to be an intentional parallel to their actual goal of reclaiming their own mother's throne. Sonic was weirdly monarchistic for a long time. Unfortunately, Sleetus slips on the dropped fruit, and they get sent to the lions. And of course they reuse the footage from before. Don't forget what show we're watching. We come back from commercial to see Sonic sexy up the Minotaur with sunglasses in stride. Smoking! Now walk the walk. Mm. Hmm. No? Almost. Well, it's a start. Why is this dumb bit with a minotaur so good? We cut back to the lion pit with Sonya and Manic ready with spears. Okay, we've got them right where we want them now. What are you talking about? Well, all we have to do is break out of here, keep Lydia, and rescue her father from the tower. Once the crowd sees their rightful leader, they'll join the fight. And I know you're just gonna tell me you've got a plan. Uh, was there any doubt? You're gonna pick that lock while I hold off the lines. The vibes are definitely not good. Here's what I thought would happen. Manic would struggle with the lock because he only has a spear, Sonya would keep the lions at bay, and the two would get within a hair's breadth of being lion chow when Sonic and his new buddy the Minotaur would save them. I'm saying this now because it's better than the truth. We return to the Minotaur being fully sexy. That's it. Now you're officially styling. Now that you have helped me, Hedgehog, how may I be of service? Wow, you speak better than I do. Well? Since you offered... Why does he sound like John Wayne? <laughs> Emperor Sleet releases the lions and Manic runs to the door. He promptly breaks his spear, which is hilarious, and Sonya uses hers to keep them back. We return again to the Minotaur, pulling the grate off their arena. Cool! And they see that someone's being fed to the lions. They're gonna save the day, right? Sonya's fighting the lions, Manic is struggling with a useless tool. It makes sense, right? Manic! How's that lot coming? Ugh, I'm trying, but it feels like I've lost my touch. You could say that again, Manic. So about the show's problem with tension and convenience, they had the almost too obvious setup of Sonic befriending the Minotaur so that they could save these two from the lions because how the fuck do you lockpick with a SPEAR?! But no, we'll have to make do with the lions waiting until the two can escape before they run after them. Glad I got invested. Ow, I bit my tongue again! Lydia leads them into a hedge maze with the SWAT bots and eventually Dingus in pursuit. But Sonic and the Minotaur finally show up. The Mino cracks some Centurion heads, and they head to the tower to free Augustine. Manic picks the lock with something more sensible this time. Lydia is reunited with her father, and the heroes step out into the Colosseum to make an announcement. You dare to return? Maybe you should listen to the hedgehogs. This Minotaur is a head-on collision of stupid, and I love him. The triplets incite rebellion and announce the return of Emperor Augustine. Hedgehog! You have freed these people using only your natural abilities. And now, you have earned back your powers. Yes! Sweetest, time for you to take a ride. Sonya promptly whirlwinds Emperor Sleetus into hell, and the three return to the Oracle's library. Ah, welcome back, my young friends. You succeeded without your powers. Now think what you can do with them. And the point of all this is... The prophecy will be fulfilled. You will rejoin Queen Alina and become the Council of Four destined to defeat Robotnik. If you are true to yourselves and your powers. 
And if your hearts never lose faith. As long as I got a shot, I'm there. Well, what about Mother? When will we see her? Shake it. Uh, I hate to be rude, but could we just get an answer? The answers are contained within the glow. Look deeply. Is that what the world will look like, or is that... How does he do that? Don't have a clue. Look! Remember, be true to yourselves. I don't know what that accomplished. I hope it's something. What a mixed bag of an episode. I can't help but be inherently bored by the idea of Sonic in ancient Rome. Episodes like this where our heroes are dropped somewhere in history feel very stock to me, which is a problem with a lot of Len Jansen's episodes for this show. A Hedgehog's Home is Her Castle was a Haunted House Halloween episode. Bug is a kind of mind-controlled betrayal episode. Though for that one and this one, Jansen did come up with some fun, creative twists on those ideas. The problem is just the inherent low stakes of this show. Despite the dark and brooding setup, the characters never really feel in danger because there's always some convenience that will get them out of it. Even in a situation like this where they're explicitly stripped of their powers. This feels like an episode where Manic is supposed to shine, being the one of the triplets with almost no powers or combat ability as is. His his rogue skills should really come in handy a lot more often this time, but instead he's given the one overly convenient scene of lockpicking with a goddamn spear, I will not get over this, and he makes a token offhand comment about feeling off his game, and that's it. He's otherwise just the usual lovable goob that he always is. For an episode that's supposed to test the team's valor, none of them are really tested on anything except their loyalty to imperialism and fascism, I guess. Sonic facing his aquaphobia was way more of a test than this. That said, Sonic saving the day by helping a Minotaur get sexy is one of the best things to happen in this show, so again, I'm mixed on this one. It's a bit of fun, but it could have been so much more. D+. Episode 19, The Jewel in the Crown, was written by Mark Edens, and maybe he'll pick up the slack where Michael seemed to drop it. We all make mistakes, but determination, the will to keep going in spite of those setbacks, is one of the greatest lessons we must all learn in life. Hey, check this out, sis. Ew! Get that thing away from me! You know how I feel about bugs! Creepy, creepy! We open on Manic and Sonya in the sewers, with Manic showing off a robot bug he plans to use to spy on Robotnik. We then see Sonic making chili dogs in the sewer, to Sonya's dismay, and frankly, I'm on her side. Yo, scoop this, guys. I'm almost to Robotnik's back door. Manic, don't say that. He drives the bug up to Robotnik's lair, where he and the Mercs are discussing a jewel, seemingly taken from the Crown of Mobius, and currently owned by a merchant. The crown was lost when the Queen went into hiding. Now the merchant has the jewel, possibly pawned by Queen Alina to finance the resistance. Uh, uh, let me see if I can get closer. According to legend, the jewel glows brighter the closer it gets to Queen Alina. Like a homing device. It will lead us straight to the Queen. Hmm, my thought exactly. <laughs> Before Robotnik can say the merchant's name, the bug goes into Dingo's back door. Bummer me, Horace! The triplets discuss how they're going to get the jewel. We could, uh, liberate it. Absolutely not! No stealing! Well, I mean, temporarily. You know, to keep it away from Butnik. Sort of like, uh, protective custody. Hey, if it is the crown jewel, no way Mom would have sold it. That merchant must have stole it. Yeah, we'd be recovering stolen property. I wonder what it would feel like to wear a jewel that big. Oh, brother. Off they drive to Emporium, a place based off of more of my fears that this will be racist, to find the merchant with the little information they have. The place seems all but deserted, but they hear a flute, so of course it's a goddamn snake charmer. Who's a crustacean? You wouldn't know where the Street of Jewel Merchants is, would you? Thanks. I... Uh, you, you know what? Fine. Is this stereotypical? Answer? I don't know what it is, so never mind. We cut to Sleet arguing with the merchant about the price of the jewel. The crown jewel of Mobius. The genuine article. 
I think the merchant is also Maurice LaMarche, seemingly battling himself in a duel of questionable accents, because he's somehow one of three voice actors they have. Sleet storms off, and the merchant nods knowingly to a hidden Queen Alina. The triplets arrive at that moment and find the jewel, but Sonic struggles to take it. I don't think Mom would want us to steal, no matter how good our motives are. Reminder that they still haven't met her. But while they're arguing, the rug Sleet sold the merchant wraps them up in a burrito, and he wanders in and takes it himself. The punches and grunts of pain reveal that the orange thing is once again Dingo, and the two make a break for it. As we break for commercial, I need to point out that the animation is extra bad this episode. Aside from the bug of all things, this especially looks like it was animated in a rush. Almost friend or foe level junkie. We come back to Sonic running after them, but the merchant tries to stop him. Sonic bypasses him and uses some nearby thread to catch their tank in a net. Do you have the jewel? Yes, but the, the situation's gotten a little tangled. Sonic formulates a new plan while they sit tight, involving a pot of olive oil he doesn't pay for. But as long as you don't steal the jewel, Sonic, you fucking dipshit, he proceeds to drown the mercs in it. They burst out of the tank and drop the jewel. Be cool, I got the jewel. And they escape the approaching SWAT bots by knocking over a line of cloth. Whew, that was close. Yo, Sibs, hit me with the spotlight. Thanks, bro. I thought the stage had gone dark. Okay, we've got the jewel, but how do we get Sleet and Dingo off our trail? No problemo, sis. Manic just gave me an idea. Cue this episode's song, The Cosmic Dance, a traditional Egyptian-style dance craze number where I have to remind you that unless these characters are just very short, they are children. Why did you dress Sonya up sexy? It was bad enough when it was the brothers. Also, the song is crap. Stop having them gyrate in the camera. Please let me leave. Sleet finds the van, but it's empty. It's a decoy. I thought it was a van. It is a van, but it's a decoy too. You see, when you use the van to... Oh, I've attached the tracking device. Now find those hedgehogs! Mark, you wrote Winner Fakes All. What happened, man? Uh, what about them? That's incredible. Never mind, Mark, you're good. How dumb do you think those hedgehogs are? It's too obvious. Forget about them. They're only snake charmers. <laughs> snake charmers? Get serious. The triplets then get swarmed by snakes. Ooh, snakes! How charming. They lightly jog back to the van and drive out to a gloomy forest. The jewel is glowing even brighter, but they're stopped by a fallen tree. Bummer, May Horus. Sonic clears the path because this one has no love for nature, but eh, tree's dead anyway. He then kills live trees, so really Sonic says fuck the environment. Sleet, following them with a the tracker, says and does this. I love the brilliance of me. The triplets cross a bridge and arrive at a large, quite beautiful plant seemingly turned into its own temple, with the mercs not far behind. We fade to commercials, and I hit a neutral spot in my brain where I wish this nothing of an episode was actually worse. As the siblings search inside, Sleet and Dingo lead a group of SWAT bots after them. I don't know, Sleet. This place gives me the creeps. Maybe we ought to call Robotnik? <laughs> Maybe we should. Robotnik, we have followed the hedgehogs to Queen Alina. Will you be joining us for our moment of triumph? Your moment of triumph? You pathetic mongrel! I'll capture Queen Alina myself! Robotnik tells them to wait, but Sleet decides to go ahead and get the Queen first so he can use her as ransom against Robotnik. He apparently forgot about the fleet of SWAT bots right behind them. Good luck getting out of this alive, boys. We cut to the triplets arriving at what appears to be a throne room. They see the Queen sitting there, immobile. You don't think, after all this time, huh? that she's... There's only one way to find out. Mom, it's us! We've been searching for you for so long! Wait a Mobius minute! That isn't Mom! <gasps> it's all just a setup! But why? Why lure us here? Not huh? us! Botnik! We stumbled onto the jewel by mistake! But why bring Robotnik here unless it's... <gasps> a trap! 
At that moment, all of the plants spring to life, firing spores and trying to close their wall sphincter. They narrowly escape the room, but now they have to deal with sap seeping from the walls and carnivorous flowers. Also, there is no music for a lot of this, and it's kind of awkward. The mercs and the bots catch up in time to see the triplets haul ass out of there, and the sap, moving vine walls and carnivorous plants start taking out the baddies. Manic tosses the jewel, and Dingo catches it, but then the vines catch them. Just what I always wanted, to be stuck with a sap forever! I told you we should have waited for a botnik. Oh, will you shut up? <laughs> Cut back to the triplets having a token fight with a couple bots that they win easily because need I remind you. Also, the music comes back for this and then it's immediately gone again. However, the vines won't let them drive away so easily. But Sonic takes care of that instantly. Glad I wasn't invested. Robotnik finally arrives, yells at the mercs, and Dingo drops and shatters the jewel. These fingers are pretty sticky. Does this mean we don't get that reward? Oh, you'll get your reward, all right. Back at Emporium, the siblings try to figure out what the hell just happened. Manic finds the tracker, and Sonic wonders aloud what was up with the jewel merchant. Why did he want to trap Robotnik? Inside his shop, they find the answer. A portrait of the queen. Mom laid a brilliant trap for Robotnik, and we blew it. We didn't know. We were trying to find our mother. So what do we do now, man? We keep looking. Freedom is a long road, full of unexpected twists and turns. But we must keep going. Don't lose hope. Someday we'll be reunited. Once again, this was an interesting idea for an episode. I like that the Queen was being visibly proactive in trying to trap Robotnik when she hasn't done much in the show, at least that we've gotten to see. And I also like that her kids end up falling for the trap too. They also want to find her, so it makes sense for the jewel to work as bait for them as well, if accidentally. The episode fails purely on how bland it is, not helped by the especially messy animation. The carnivorous plant palace is a pretty cool location, and that scene does actually have some good tension, but there's just no sexy minotaur to elevate it. Yes, that's what I'm calling it now. An X-Factor that makes a weak episode briefly amazing is hereby called a sexy minotaur. The casually racist island episode had a sexy minotaur, but this one has no sexy minotaur. It's not a bad episode overall, but you can skip it without missing anything. D. Episode 20, Three Hedgehogs and a Baby, was another written by Len Jansen. Yes, it's that one. We're not talking about it right now. Episode 21, Doomsday, was written by Mark Edens, and he and Michael have not been on their game. Sometimes in the fight against tyranny, we find friends in the most unlikely places. Dude, talk about the middle of nowhere. Couldn't we have just sent these guys a car? It may not look like much, but the nomads out here have been fighting Butnik for years. Legend has it the tribe's chief, if you can, was captured by Butnik but escaped. The resistance needs anyone who can get away from Butnik. They complain about the heat until the van's engine overheats, allowing SWAT bots to find them. However, the nomads are also nearby. Manic has a rare asshole attack. Great, a million square miles of beach and no ocean. Show me the city. I can't stand all this wide open space. Show me the city. Get over it, bro. Nobody said being in the resistance was a walk in the park. Yeah, but it wasn't supposed to be a hike through the desert either. What good could a bunch of nomads who live in a sandbox be to the Freedom Fighters? <coughs> oh, I don't know. It's not all bad. A girl could get used to this place. <gasps> and then the bots turn up and Sonic conveniently fucks up, but the nomads save them. Oh good, I was worried it wouldn't be racist. Eden's Brothers, is this your thing now? The Nomad's leader has a badass electrical sword, and I think is Maurice LaMarche again. And he introduces himself as the previously mentioned If You Can. Yes, I think it's spelled that way. If there's a second half to this joke, I don't know it. They help get the van moving again in a pretty clever way, and take them to their camp. Of course there's sexy dancing! It's the desert! It's all these people know about it! Sonic introduces his trio as Freedom Fighters and asks for their help fighting Robotnik. But if you can, want Sonic to prove himself by completing a trial and joining their tribe. Something about if you can gives me the creeps. I don't trust anybody who hides his face all the time. Get your eyes checked, bro. Did you see how he blasted those bots? They make no effort to hide his secret if that isn't obvious, but I'll let the episode have its reveal. The tribe's people do this again. <laughs> 
And Sonic's test turns out to be a fight with a car lack. I'm struggling not to sigh as I write this script. He runs around a bit, steps on its eye, and ties its limbs together. Sonic the Hedgehog, you are now a member of the Askan tribe. <laughs> I hope these poor voice actors got paid well. Cue this episode's song, True Blue Friend. If the lyrics weren't the usual horrendous kids TV propaganda, this would kinda rule. The music's great, and nowhere as embarrassing as I expected, if still not mixed well. I dig the melodies and harmonies, and even Sam's voice sounds better here. Like they hard panned the vocals in the stereo again, but it's not disorienting this time. Eh, fine, it makes a list. I did it! But I still feel like I'm being indoctrinated into something. I still don't trust if you can. First he hides his face, and then he didn't dance when we played. You worry too much, bro. Give it a rest, Manic. If I don't get a good night's sleep, my eyes will get puffy. Manic decides to scope out If You Can's tent, and he discovers what you can very easily tell because it's already visible. He's been roboticized. Thing is, this is a cool idea, and it actually plays into how roboticization looks specifically in this show. In Sat AM, it was a full body transformation. Everything about you becomes robotic. In this show, it's more like becoming a cyborg. Only certain parts of you turn mechanical, and that makes it more obvious how much the process is a corruption of a person. Argus has been the only real exception so far. He's the only character who's been completely transformed. I don't usually like how roboticization looks in this show. It's over-designed and ugly, like everything else. But I like that this episode is playing with the potential of its unique look. You could theoretically hide the robotic parts of yourself and sneak into rebel groups. Provided they're dumb as bricks, and you're in a kid's show that operates mostly on conveniences, but this show needs as much credit as it can get, so I'll stick to calling this a positive. Manic is about to warn his siblings when If You Can's guards catch him, and we fade to commercial. When we come back, it's the morning, and Manic is nowhere to be found. His siblings are suspicious and confront If You Can. Have you seen Manic? We've looked all over camp for him. I have not seen your brother. Perhaps he went for a walk and became lost. We'd better go look for him. No, my people will search. Sonic is your people now, smart guy. Again, he's not hiding in plain sight very well. The siblings aren't convinced, though, so they march right back into his tent, where he's arguing with the guards who caught Manic. You did what? <gasps> we had no choice. We had to leave him in the desert. Without food or water? Manic is the brother of a member of the tribe. Or did you forget that? But he saw you if you can. If he told the tribe your secret, you would be an outcast. Time to face the music if you can. Where's Manic? <gasps> Roboticized. I don't get it. You're supposed to be Butnik's enemy. Robotnik is my enemy. The roboticizing process malfunctioned. I have my free will, but the Robotnik's machine left me chained. Only Jamal and Amir know my secret. Fear the rest of the tribe would never accept or trust me if they knew the truth. Amir and Jamal were only trying to protect me. I am sorry for what they have done to your brother. So the story is not that the rebel leader is a double agent, which to be fair would be a really obvious twist as we've discussed, but rather that he's afraid to reveal to his tribe what he's become. You know what? Sure, I'll take it. Same thing happened to me when I tried on a dress and I waited 11 fucking years to come out. Don't waste your youth if you can. Manic has been left in the sun snare drum. I kind of love that name. But it's the hottest part of the desert, so the clock is ticking to save him. If you can, climbs onto Sonic and they run into the desert. And Sonya gives them Manic's hoverboard for the return trip. We cut to Manic wandering exhausted through the desert, then to Sleet and Dingo. <laughs> Look, Sleet, tracks! Huh? Look, tracks! They should lead us straight to Sonic. Uh, that's what I said, Sleet. Quiet, Dingo, I've got hedgehogs to catch. Then cut to Sonic and if you can, then cut to Manic again, collapsing with the vulture ready to eat him. Dude, nobody rang the dinner bell yet. Cut to commercial, return to Manic hallucinating a juice bar. Lemonade! Not fair, dude.
Cut to Slate and Dingo scouting out the nomad camp. Dingo slobbers over Sonya, but Slate tells him to just go to the camp. Cut back to Manic, passed out, but Sonic and If You Can find him in time and drown him in water. Mm, that's the wettest water I've ever tasted. A sand twister comes out of nowhere. Manic still thinks If You Can works for Robotnik, but Sonic clears it up, and they make their escape without much issue. They return to the camp, but it seems to be empty. They find Sonya and the tribe tied up. Huh? It's a trap, Sonic! Slate and Dingo! Did someone call? Give up, Sonic. I can't believe I begged you this time. No way, Sleep. Just watch my feet. It's a trap where they did nothing. Everyone escapes the tent and the SWAT bots attack, leading to another awkward fight scene. But at least this walk cycle made me laugh. The nomads also get to show their stuff a bit, and Manic leads a few of the bots to the car lack, which is a little rad. But then Manic just sashays away and gets grabbed himself. Why have you made him such a dipshit this episode? Don't drag my boy down with you. At the very least, he's saved by the guards who dropped him in the desert in the first place, which is a nice enough resolution to that conflict. The tribe scares Sleet and Dingo away, and Manic gets the van fixed. Thanks, Jamal. That ought to do it. Sonic, we want to thank you and your siblings for your help. After yesterday, Robotnik should not trouble us for quite a while. Hey, we couldn't have done it without you. And I apologize for the way your brother was treated. Hey, chill if you can. No harm done. Oh, thank God, he's still the best character. I love him so much, y'all. If You Can decides to take responsibility and reveal himself to his tribe, stepping down as leader and casting himself out. As their newest member, Sonic gets the first vote on who will replace him. I choose... If You Can. 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 But my robot parts, they are... Hey, do you lead with your body or your mind? You're a great leader, no matter what the package looks like. Yes! Hell yeah, if you can. Good luck with HRT. Uh, what? Anyway, we end on one last checkup on Sleet and Dingo as they're stuck in the desert, where Sleet turns Dingo into a parasol. Ah, much better. I'm gonna get his sunburn! Have you got any sunscreen, Sleet? Sleet? While this isn't a bad episode, it's another one that's well below what the Edens are capable of. It's just bland. The Edens seem so confident in their first batch of episodes, but by this point they're falling victim to the same problems of erratic pacing and dull, inconsequential storytelling as the rest of the show. Plus their new recurring issue of uncomfortable stereotype coding. The problem with the island and nomad tribes is not the framing. Neither is portrayed as villainous or untrustworthy, inherently or otherwise. And they're certainly not portrayed as stupid, helpless, or uncivilized in any way. They're all good people treated with respect by the heroes. And you can understand where they're coming from in their respective situations. But their cultures and behaviors operate entirely on stereotypes. And it's made these episodes age like milk. Thank fuck they at least don't use words we now recognize as slurs, that and a surprisingly decent song gets this episode up to a D plus, but no higher. Episode 22, Mummy Dearest, was written by Hurst and Ali. Will we ever leave the desert? For all of us, the future is shrouded in mystery. But my children were about to learn that sometimes the key to the future lies in the distant past. Cyrus has given Sonya an Intelliputer, which allows them to listen in to Robotnik's control room. I don't want those infernal hedgehogs learning about this operation! Nice computer junk! Don't worry, sir. <gasps> we'll be underway by tomorrow morning, and they will never find us in Hammurabi. Are you getting this stuff down? No, the computer is recording it. Good, see to it. I'm going to inspect the expedition myself. I want Alina. The triplets notice a book with the royal hedgehog crest, which they figure has to do with this expedition, so they hatch a plan to get the book. Sonic drives up with drivable SWAT bot disguises. Cool, huh? It's a new metal that Cyrus and the guys came up with. Super light, but super strong. Yeah, I remember that. They sneak into the control room, no problem. Bother my horns! That sounds so weird in a deep voice. Manic tries to crack the safe, but he can't do it inside the suit. So the others stand guard while he gets out. Unfortunately, Robotnik returns at that moment. But they stall him long enough for Manic to get the book and climb back in the bot. Entrance denied by order of Selene. What? That's preposterous. Move aside. No admittance. Are you insane? I'm Dr. Robotnik! Doctor? Hey, Doc, I got this pain in my elbow. 
What? But something needs to go wrong, so Manic fucking trips on a wire and breaks his suit. Oops. Hello. Super light, but super strong. Are you sure Cyrus isn't still a double agent? Sonic grabs his siblings and makes a break for it as Robotnik calls for lockdown, but they escape just in time. Also, I love Manic's fainting southern bell face. They use the Intellicutor to scan the book, and it shows them the scroll of Amon Rappi, their distant ancestor. For that, I gotta tell Cyrus we lost his SWAT bot disguises? Oh. How about a step-by-step -step blueprint of how we can overthrow Robotnik? Cut to Sleet and Dingo being updated by Robotnik, who's already scanned the book and sends them the info, along with orders to take care of the hedgehogs when they arrive. <laughs> Back with the triplets, Sonya reveals that Amon Rapi predicted Robotnik's takeover to the letter, and she's still busy trying to translate it. But that's not important. What is, is Manic drumming absentmindedly. Manic is the most real Sonic character. They hit the desert, and the van switches to tank treads, and here I only thought it transformed to the pilot. But the SWAT bots tail them. There's something forming. Looks like a warning of some kind. In a lovely shade of purple. Speak in my language, Sonya. Sonya learns the warning is for the deadly sand snake, which lives in the purple sand. The SWAT bots attack, but the sand snake gets them first. The average sand snake is as big as a Mobian Mega Whale! Ah! Oh yeah, that's about right. Robotnik and Slate celebrate their deaths, but not Dingo. Ooh, Sonya. Oh, shut up, you soft-hearted fool. For anyone who still liked Dingo, moaning Sonya is most of what he does now. I'm sorry. The hedgehog brats may be finished, Sleet, but Queen Alina remains. I need that scroll. Shall I release my escort ship, sir? Yes, you won't need them anymore. <laughs> Back in the van, the triplets assess the situation. They're still right behind the snake's teeth, so they drive forward under the uvula and arrive right behind the snake's teeth. Hold your slow claps. Hey, open up! He's not gonna open up down here. He'll get a mouthful of sand. Hmm. Manic, that's brilliant. It is? Sonya props open the snake's lips, forcing it to ingest sand and return to the surface. It releases them, and they arrive right at the pyramid. I know I didn't completely love Sat AM, but I really miss watching a show like this with stakes. Sonya checks her computer and thinks they should look for the back entrance. There seems to be no way in, but they find the hedgehog crest and just bumblefuck their way inside. They're immediately caught and frozen by Hotep, the 800th Maurice LaMarche character so far, who considers how he'll kill them for trespassing until he sees Sonya's royal medallion. He apologizes and lets them go. I probably know what you're thinking. We'll talk about it after the recap. We come back from commercial with Sleet and Dingo checking out the front entrance. Sleet changes Dingo into a ball to activate all the traps and see what's down the hall. And he says it's a dead end. Okay, come back. We'll have to try that other entrance. <laughs> Transition back to the triplets in Hotep, and he tells them the way to the main chamber and that he'll disarm the traps. Just as Sleet and Dingo arrive. I appreciate that they're playing up Sleet's cleverness. I don't appreciate the white goo he sprays on everyone. <laughs> You all look like mummies. How appropriate. Sleet forces Hotep to guide them to the scroll, and Sonic tries to brute force his way out of his binds. I was so sorry when you died. <laughs> Fucking damn it, Dingo. You're so much wasted potential. Sonic breaks out and frees his siblings. Sonya screams at Dingo and kicks his ass. Dingo! Ah! And then the mercs get the tables turned on them. The joke's on you. We called for a swap bot battalion. Shut up, you idiot! With the clock ticking, Hotep says he can show them a quick way to the chamber, but they have to go through the two chambers of death. The first is full of water, which Sonic once again bumblefucks his way through. Yes, I am bored of this episode already. I was ten minutes ago. Cut back to Sleet and Dingo ordering an attack. Cut back to the second trial, the fires of Amon. Sonic also breezes through this one, but at least he gets burned at the end. If you're not gonna actually put these kids through real tests, set them on fire sometimes. I'll take that at least. They reach the chamber where a bunch of mummies come to life. They stand around and let themselves get swarmed, but the mummies mistake Sonic for Amon Rappi and begin bowing to him. Amon Rappi himself appears as a spirit, also voiced by Jaleel White in Sonic's voice. What a handsome lad! Oh yeah, they're related. Why have you come here? A scroll. Huh? Oh yeah. We've come for the scroll of Amon Rappi, your ghostliness. We needed to kick some robotic butt. You may take it, but first, 
Oh, not another butt. Okay, okay, spill it. There is a price. What if it's some kind of quest that takes years? Oh, man. The price is a song. I have been waiting an eternity for music. Phew. <sighs> no problemo, your ancestorness. He didn't say a good song. Cue mummy rap. Rap with a W. It's as bad as you think it is. Suffer with me, won't you? We are Sonic, Sonic Underground. We're looking for a scroll that belonged to some Egyptians. It'd be no problemo if I could just read these weird inscriptions. Thank you, my children. You have given me a wonderful gift. Take the scroll. Have you ever been... Have you ever just been so embarrassed to watch something that you want to cry? I want to cry. What's going on? I feel so bad for everyone involved in that. Robotnik's forces arrive, but Amon Rappi curses them with immobility. Crash in. The triplets leave and see everyone frozen, and I think at this point I would just slit their throats, but hey, I'm no hero. I'm liking this. They return to their hideout and read the scroll to finally learn how to stop Robotnik for good. Oh, oh, what is that, Horace? All that for nothing? Look, etched into the glass. What does it mean? I remember this one from school. Translated, it means hedgehogs will prevail. Or in other words, hedgehogs rule. All right, <laughs> like we didn't know that. <laughs> Mummy Dearest reminds me a lot of Artifact. That episode had a really strong setup, but completely fumbled it in the third act. This episode is different in that they didn't even wait that long. They had a decent, if brief, bout of tension getting the book from Robotnik, and then all stakes were dropped right after the first commercial break. Anything that could theoretically test the triplets, including the actual trials inside the pyramid, breeze by so fast you wonder if they even had to breathe. Sonya has a computer that gives them all the info they need, and Sonic wins everything without struggle, and Manic doesn't do shit. Except take part in the second pain full white people rap of this show, I wish that would stop happening. And of course, yet more flagrant disrespect of actual real-life cultures. A lot of us in North America grew up with this image of ancient Egypt, painted by Hollywood and animation, and it's all very distant and fantastical in our minds. But it was a real place where real people lived, and where real people still live, it's not fucking Narnia. I think we can leave walking mummies and Pharaoh's curses in the past, where everyone else seems to have left this show. Just an episode that leaves me with my face in my hands. D minus. Episode 23, The Hedgehog in the Iron Mask, was written by Bob Forward in his only writing credit on the show. He worked on Beast Wars, you know. Behind the mask of our everyday faces are secret fears and ambitions we try to hide from others. It takes courage to come out from behind the mask and let the world see who we really are. Right away, this is the first episode of the show to grab me on its visuals. Set AM had fantastic background artwork, and this is the first time Underground has matched it in palette and creativity. Dude, this place gives me the creeps. Yeah, especially since it's nice everywhere else. You gotta hand it to Butnik. He knows how to set a move. Come on, if Mom was in prison here, the records might hold a clue to where she went. Showtime! As the triplets approach, someone gives a dramatic monologue from high in the tower. They're confused because Robotnik doesn't usually take prisoners, preferring to roboticize people. Oh, why, why have I been so unjustly imprisoned? Unmask my face and let me look upon. Uh, let me out! There's something familiar about that voice. Yeah, sounds like Sonic's off-key singing. Very funny. Remember that. The familiar voice, not the singing, we already know that. Inside is yet another goddamn orange thing, which Manic tries to hack, which only tickles Dingo, and Sleet appears to change him back for a very brief, very sad fight scene. Where's the records about our mom? There aren't any. The tip was a fake, part of the trap. And the prisoner in the tower, what did he do? Nothing. Robotnik didn't roboticize him because he's important, but, but nobody knows who he is. The SWAT bots arrive and the triplets break out, but of course, this was all part of Robotnik's plan. 
the hedgehogs got away. Of course they did. I planned that. Yes, of course you did. Oh, great idea, Robotnik. Can it, Sleet? I told him the stuff you said to tell him, Robotnik, sir. Excellent. I have a plan we could use to eliminate them permanently. Permanently! The triplets ask around in the nearby village, but no one wants to say anything. Cue this episode's song, Part of the Problem, a new wave ska track where Sonya berates people who don't take action as being part of the problem. This is like being lectured on the importance of protest by the fucking Kardashians. You've spent this whole show pissing and moaning about your hair, Sonya. Suddenly being a beacon of wokeness sounds so hollow coming from you. It's too bad because I really like the song musically. It's probably Luis Valence's best performance yet, and she really sells that chorus. And the energy reminds me of the Go-Go's, B-52s, or even early XTC. It's been so long since this show had a song that sounded like real music an actual band would play. It makes the list on that alone because subject-wise, I feel insulted by it personally. Sit the fuck down, rich bitch. Maybe now they'll tell us who the prisoner is. Looks like the only way to find out who that prisoner is is to rescue him ourselves. So back to the tower they go. Inside, the prisoner continues his soliloquy as they break into his cell, and we fade to commercial on... Someone completely unrecognizable. SWAT bots arrive to fail to stop them, and Sleet sends Dingo up as well. In Sputnik's world, there is no justice. Yeah, they're just us. Really wanted that in the script, didn't you, Bob? As they escape down a rope, they send Dingo falling to his death, and then a cage rises up and impales him and then crushes him against the ceiling. They land on Sleet, and then so does Dingo in the cage. Congratulations, my man. You have just experienced a righteous resistance rescue. Now let's bust your noggin out of that loser headgear. It'll only take a sec. No, don't. The mask, it's booby trapped. If you unlock it, boom, <gasps> hedgehog hash. Phew, now that's a visual I didn't need. Sonya asks who the man is, and he returns the question. They proudly introduce themselves as the Sonic Underground. Manic, Sonya, and me, Sonic. We're the children of Mobius's rightful ruler, Queen Alina. <gasps> Can it really be you? I can't believe it. Why, I haven't seen you since you were little hedgehoglets. Clarification is in order, man. I couldn't expect you to remember me. But I am your uncle, your mother's twin brother. Alina's twin, huh? Explains why you're so overdramatic and roundabout with everything. The triplets are dubious that he's their uncle, but Sonya still thinks his voice sounds familiar. He gives them each rings, bearing the family crest. Wear them always. Sonic asks why he's in a mask and why they've never heard of him. His answer, it's the law. There can be only one ruler of Mobius. I was forced into exile, and then when your mother vanished, Robotnik imprisoned me, afraid that I would claim the throne. Ah, oh, bummer. Major drawback to royalty. Don't worry, bro. When I'm ruler, you won't have to vanish. You? Ha! A ruler needs some culture and sophistication. You can't serve chili dogs at a royal banquet. The triplets immediately descend into petty asshole mode and start bickering about which of them is going to be the rightful ruler. Now, being a kid's show, where it seems only Hearst and Ali care that much about continuity, I don't want to act all aggrieved about this detail. But they should know this is bullshit. This is episode 23. Even discounting beginnings, which technically hasn't aired yet, they've all met the Oracle and been told that their destiny is to reunite with their mother and rule together as the Council of Four. None of them is going to be the rightful ruler because all of them are. Knowing that one core detail of the goddamn show makes this entire episode pointless and so frustrating to sit through. Also, Manic's the only one of these idiots who should rule because he's the only one not motivated entirely by selfishness. As they continue sniping at each other, more SWAT bots turn up and they make a break for it. They then continue bitching at each other while Robotnik listens in. Just because I've lived on the streets all my life doesn't mean I can't handle a crown. Dream on! I'll be wearing the crown! You, I'd look much better on a crown. Diamonds go with my eyes. 
<laughs> ah, yes. Already the breakup has started, just as I planned. And all it needs is one more little hood. The van spins out, and as they argue more, the tedious inevitability of this setup finally arrives. If you want to steer Mobius the way you steer a van, then we all be on the road to disaster! Yeah? Well, if you become ruler, I'll vanish on purpose, ah. just so I don't have to listen to you. Well, if that's how you feel, then I'll just leave. Go off by myself. Yeah, this hedgehog never needed anyone before, and he does it now. Like Uncle Chuck, you little fuck. As of now, the Sonic Underground is through. We each go our own way, and may the best ruler win. Fine. Let there be the rule of cool. Mind if I accompany you? Hike along, Unc. The further along the show goes, the more often I find myself sighing heavily. We come back from commercial to Manic bringing the uncle to a locksmith he knows to get the helmet off. And there's another orange thing. Dingo grabs Manic, who tells the uncle to run for it as he's captured. We cut to Sonya with another orange thing as she monologues about how much better she is when the uncle arrives and eggs her on more, allowing Dingo to capture her too. You're right. Mother would want us to work together. Sonya! Huh? <gasps> In my arms at last! If this feels extra incongruous with the song we just heard, is because the songs were made before the scripts are finished. They probably didn't know that she sucked. Cut to Sonic looking for a mechanic to fix the van, and how do you guys not just fear the color orange now? Uncle shows up and sows further discord, but for once, Sonic doesn't buy it and immediately distrusts him because this episode is bad. He figures out the rings must have been how the uncle was tracking them, just in time for him to evade capture. However, Robotnik orders the uncle to get involved, which allows them to catch him too. Sonic wakes up chained in the tower with his siblings. Imagine us getting sucked into Butnik's plan like that. He was trying to split us up. And it worked too, thanks to- The so-called uncle gets thrown in with them, and Sonya realizes how she knows his voice. He's the famous actor, Luke Periwinkle. We've never seen him before. I think they thought Sonya saying she recognizes his voice was supposed to be good enough setup. I hate this episode more every minute. The mask, it's booby trapped. It won't explode. It was just a surveillance camera. Robotnik forced me to play this role to trick you. He said he'd roboticize me if I didn't do it. But after he caught you, he imprisoned me anyway. Whoa! It was booby-trapped! You mean... my head? Boom? <gasps> Fuck stakes! Now's our chance! Manic, can you shed these shackles? There's only one king on this fucking show. They see a squad of bots arriving, so they arm themselves with swords, except the good character using a drumstick. And another action scene free of all impact occurs. Drum roll, please. Manic, you're not saving this episode. You can stop. Sleet tries to run over Sonic, but they use the swords to cut down a flag and blind him. He crashes, and the tower collapses. They use Sleet and Dingo's heads to get across the water. The foundation collapses as well, and the sky clears. Now that I'm free, I'm giving up acting. I am going to join the resistance. You do that, guy. Even Manic is done with this. If we ever rule, we do it together. In the Council of Four, like you were told you would be! Ahem. But first, we gotta get the van out of the ditch where Sonic crashed it. Me? Now wait a Sonic second. Well, you are driving. Yeah, but you were supposed to be watching the road. This is another case of an episode being aired too late for its premise to work. Under better circumstances, this would be the most believable episode of the show. These three met like a month ago, were told they were siblings with a shared destiny, and to go off and find a mother they don't know. They have no connection to each other beyond what they were told, and they don't often feel like actual siblings. A petty squabble like this would make more sense if it didn't happen in the second half of the season, especially since we already know its entire setup is bullshit. It's a frustratingly tedious setup to begin with, but it'd be easier to swallow. I wouldn't be surprised if Bob Forward pitched it early in production during those cattle calls and it got saved until it was too late to work, because at this point in the show, it makes the triplets look especially gullible. 
And that's never been any of their character flaws. Usually they're portrayed as clever, or at least one of them is per episode. They have one collective brain cell that they don't always remember to bring with them. You could mitigate a lot of the bullshit just by having one of them notice the inconsistency in this supposed sibling law. Most likely Sonya, who would know a thing or two about the nobility, considering she was raised in it, and that starts unraveling Robotnik's plan. Or just have one of them try to calm the arguing down. Like Manic, the good one. But they don't. And we just get a pretty bad episode that gets worse on rewatch. I recommend you skip it. F. Episode 24, Six is a Crowd, was written by Len Jansen, and it does not open with Alina narrating. Sonic takes his siblings through a snowy region on the way to the Oracle, accidentally running into a Yeti on the way, but they find the cave quickly. <laughs> Ah, you're just in time. For lunch! The triplets show him the snow globe from the last time they saw him. You gave us the globe and told us to look deeply. Did you mean that this is where we could find Mom? That is for you to discover. Do you ever just give a straight answer? What do you think? <sighs> he sends them on their next trial, teleporting them into a cave network. They hear an ethereal sound coming from down one of the caves, and they pass through a dimensional warp, ending up in a beautiful, futuristic city. <gasps> Look out! Sonic stands around like a dipshit as he notices a statue of himself. A local walks up, gasps when she sees him, and bows as she walks away. What's with her? And why do they have a statue of you? Maybe the pigeons needed a place to sit. Uh, I guess my coolness precedes me. Ever think of that? No. no. Jealousy is not attractive. Oh my gosh! Ditto. There goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Where's a pigeon when you need one? They see a chili dog food truck pass by, and Sonic activates one of his two personality traits. The owner also bows, calling him Sire and giving him the food free of charge. But somebody is watching. All three hedgehogs without their bodyguards ripe for the picking. Tell Jacob to go. Nice rooster comb, Robotnik. He looks like Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog Robotnik disguised as Von Schlemmer. The triplets look around and see a much more dilapidated section of the city that reminds them of Robotropolis, but the SWAT bots and the vendor attack. A smiling SWAT bot? You can tell. The vendor binds Sonic's feet to keep him from running, leaving his siblings to do something without him for once, but they free him and make a break for it as more ships fly in. They run in the sewers, right into Robotnik's hands. We return from commercial with Robotnik confronting the triplets about their supposed crimes. What do you know? Ball Boy got a rug and some new duds. Very amusing, sire. Sire? But even more amusing is the fact that as of right now, the revolution is over. Way too strange. Ooh. You took away our money. You took away our freedom. And you even took away our music. Huh? But from this day forward, my freedom fighters shall live free. Your freedom fighters? Sonya pieces together what's happened. The Oracle has sent them to another dimension where Robotnik is the good guy and they are the bad guys. Cut to the palace where we see this dimension's triplets being cartoonishly evil, yet also bored and lazy. They don't look like they actually enjoy their tyranny like evil Robotnik does. Music heard in Sector 3, Tax Collector mugged in Sector 9. Hmm. Destroy Sector 3. Double the taxes in Sector 9. Jeweler unable to deliver diamond necklace for Princess Sonya. Throw him in the dungeon! And his family, too. Each of their vices has been magnified until it overtakes their personality. Sonic's obsession with chili dogs, his other personality trait. Sonya's spoiled vanity, her only personality trait. And Manic's thievery, which tends to be pretty subdued, actually. I would argue Sonic's monstrous ego would be a better trait to distort, but Deke shows never seem to think that was a negative, so fine. Gluttony and chili dogs. The heroes observe the evil counterparts, and Robotnik is confused. My spy bot is broadcasting live! How are you doing this? That's not us, and we can prove it. They hate music, right? So? Rip it, Sibs. Cue of this episode's song, I Can Do That For You. Another upbeat kids TV bubblegum pop piece. If there's something that you hunger for and you need to satisfy your appetite, I can do that for you. If you need a little sunshine in your life, I'll be your ray of light. 
I kind of wish I didn't like this one, but I do. It manages to be cute and charming, where a lot of these songs are lazy or embarrassing. And Tyler Ross does not need to hit his line as good as he does, but boy does he. When you need that something special only I can provide, just call my name, I'll be right by your side, cause... So yeah. Two songs I've liked in a row, and three out of the last four episodes. Not the best stretch of episodes, but best track record for songs yet. Also, I have to point out this SWAT bot passing by with a goddamn dump truck ass. I saw it, and now so do you. Thank you for the art, Brenna. Welcome to the Freedom Fighters. What can we do for you, bud? I like that. No hard feelings or anything. That's very Sonic. The triplets make their way to the palace gates, where they pretend to be nasty like their counterparts to sneak in. Yo, Tin Heads, open the gates! Don't stand there gawking, you idiots! Open the gate! Oh, and by the way, you're all fired! <laughs> We see the evil triplets being evil some more, throwing people into the streets or into jail for the tiniest thing. My favorite is Sonic and the Chef. Here's my live reaction. Those were the worst chili dogs I've ever tasted! Whoa! Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a damn minute. <laughs> Those were the worst chili dogs I've ever tasted. <laughs> what <in> the fucking hell? <laughs> <laughs> I hope that was written into the script. <laughs> uh, I can't touch my ass because I'll ruin my eyeliner. Ugh. Damn, that gave, that gave this episode like five points just right, straight away. The good triplets see the chef as he's about to be thrown out, and Sonic lets him go. They split up to take care of their respective counterparts. Meet back here in 30 minutes. How about 30 seconds? <laughs> Oh, by the way, you're fired! And tell all the other guards they're fired, too! As all of the guard bots march out of the palace, the animation starts looking like it was smoothed out by AI to be 60 frames per second. It's pretty distracting, and it's only for this scene. Who, who are you? I'm what you should have been instead of what you are. Guards! 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 Sonic challenges his evil self to a race, unaware of the capture gun he has behind his back. It's Sonic with a gun. Tell you what, sport. Just to make it fair, I'll even give you a head start. Ready, set, go! Good Sonic handily overtakes the other without even trying, but he gets his feet bound before we fade to commercial. We return to evil Manic counting his money, when good Manic breaks in with a giant vacuum and sucks it all up. Guard. Where are my guards? Guards! I sent them home. You! You look- oh, oh, you, you! Just like you. Yeah, I may look like you, but I don't steal from the poor. I don't steal. I tax. Not anymore. Manic captures his evil self in the hose of the vacuum, and we cut to evil Sonya demanding her mirror. Good Sonya arrives with an empty frame, and we get a cute little Marx Brothers Looney Tunes mirror gag. I especially like how it ends. I'm you, but way better, girlfriend. You're the same character, don't bullshit me. The two Manics arrive, and Evil Sonya faints. Back with the Sonics, Evil Sonic has recalled his guards, except Robotnik arrives instead. Never thought I'd be saying this, but thanks, Robotnik. <laughs> May I? Be my guest. Sonic stops his counterpart, and the triplets figure out what to do with their evil selves. Too bad we can't take them back to Robotropolis and show them what it's like to live underground. 
You know, they're so arrogant. They haven't left the palace for years. They have no idea. I think you've got something there, Robotnik. What? Sorry, big guy. Hard habit to break. Aw, he's so genuinely offended. Sonic hatches a plan. Take the evil triplets on a tour of the kingdom to see what their tyranny has done to it. It works a little too quickly and easily, considering how over-the-top one-note evil they were acting, but fine. It's one concession I'll give to them as a kid show. Robotnik takes them to a place where everyone who wants to learn music is taught. There was a time when I was very young that I played and sang, and so did my brothers. Oh, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> you were the worst. <laughs> Even I was surprised by how I read that. From this time forward, my citizens, we shall have a kingdom of peace. Prosperity, music, and chili dogs for all. Huh? Mission accomplished, the triplets return to their world, and the unexpected happens. My children. What's up, sis? I heard a woman's voice. Mom? Shh. <gasps> mother? Oh my god, they actually meet their mother! 24 fucking episodes and they finally see her real fucking face! They made a vow, we found her! I am so proud of what you did. You saw what happened when power corrupts, and you saw what happens when good triumphs over evil. I promise you that one day soon, this too will happen. I love you. Come on! <laughs> Let's juice and jam, guys. We've got work to do. Sis, you okay? <laughs> I could use a hug here. <laughs> Come here, sis. Group hug. Oh, you guys. <laughs> You're right, Sonic. We've got work to do. Then let's do it to him. Aw, that's actually a really sweet ending. You would think an episode by Len Jansen with twice the triplets would be three times as annoying, but no, I actually really like this one. It's clunky as ever, and my impression of Jansen's writing still holds true. His ideas for the show are still pretty stock, and Evil Selves is a well-worn idea. The Archie comics had already trod that path, but I think it works here. These three are going to rule Mobotropolis someday, so it makes perfect sense to have them face the funhouse mirror distortions of themselves, where their rule has been corrupted by their vices. It's not just evil Sonic. It's what Sonic could become if he loses sight of what's important. And it's a fun episode in general. It got quite a few laughs out of me, intentionally or not. What the fucking hell? <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> this episode just... Ugh, just keeps on giving. One of the show's better episodes and a surprising B. <laughs> Fantastic. We're in the latter half of the show's run now, and a very brief period where Len Jansen's scripts really worked. But that actually started four episodes earlier, with the one I skipped. So I think it's time. Episode 20, Three Hedgehogs and a Baby. I skipped it for one reason. I streamed the show to my super patrons, and episode 20 was where we took a break for a few weeks so I could write the first half of this script. I'd planned that in advance. It made sense. It's the midpoint of the show, and this episode. If we were lucky, we'd go on that break on a high note. I was not prepared for how good of an idea that was. This is an episode that you walk away from and think about your life. The most difficult thing a mother has to do is to let go of her children. For some, it happens when the children no longer need them. They are the lucky ones. We open with the triplets scouting out Robotnik's base, and he, Sleet, and Dingo see them approach. Good. What about the bait? Oh my god, it's the episode? It looks so bad! <laughs> Robotnik has prepared bait for them, a realistic robotic hedgehog baby that is actually a spy camera. The plan? 
get the triplets to take the baby to Sanctuary, the secret location we saw back in Tangled Webs where Resistance members hide their children. Once Robotnik knows where it is, he's going to destroy it and roboticize them. I did not expect actual stakes, but here we are. The problem... It's the most lifelike robot ever made. It sure is, Robotnik! It looks like you glued Sonic's scalp and a rock onto a human baby! We know what hedgehog babies look like in this show, we see them every title sequence. Why did they draw this baby so human-like? Was it to make the audience more attached to him? Or was it purposefully to set off our Uncanny Valley response so we're always aware that he's not real, even within the universe? Cause either way, they slam dunked him down that valley. Dingo gets transformed into the baby's basket, and we cut to the triplets approaching from a manhole. They break into a safe room where they find plans for a micro-roboticizer. They escape with the disc, but it seems this was all part of the plan. Excellent. <laughs> okay, they're gone. Let's blow this dump. Activate the brat. <gasps> What was that? It sounded like a baby. They find him nearby and say he's cute, instead of, ugh. Cute little guy. Kind of reminds me of me, when I was a baby. You mean the smelly part? They can't just leave a baby behind, so they take him with them. Excellent. Take the little brat and lead me to sanctuary. <laughs> Sonya feeds the baby and makes her brothers change his diaper. Manic is not pleased, but Sonic takes care of it. <sighs> The fake baby seems happy and falls asleep, but of course, he's not really. Got a fix on the house. Let's pick them up now. No, we'll wait. They'll lead us to Sanctuary, then we'll destroy them all! Sleet tells Dingo to move to the door so they can see the triplets, and it's up there with the baby himself in terms of body horror. It's like something out of all real monsters. No way, no how, nuh uh. I do not babysit. Hey, bro, look at it this way. The sooner we find the kid's parents, the sooner he's out of here, and you'll never have to babysit again. And while Sonic checks the underground, I'll check with all my society friends. Besides, he'll probably sleep till we get back. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Great. Despite knowing how to change a diaper, Sonic is apparently brand new to babies. Manic tries to figure out how to get the kid to stop crying, clearly not enjoying babysitting. Dude, I fed you, changed your yucky diapers. What else is wrong, huh? Huh? Ah, that's it. You got a burp, right? Way to go, guy! <laughs> it's actually a cute scene. You can tell Manic is slowly warming up to the kid. But then this happens. Oh, you are kinda cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are kinda cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> that's the face this is i just stole your wallet bitch he takes the baby out for a ride on his hoverboard and oh my god is this where it happens no no it's not okay jesus but it is another cute moment of the kid having fun and dingo gets motion sickness <laughs> Yeah, ooh, like that, didn't you? Didn't you? Well, maybe we'll take a little wide again, huh? Maybe I'm just used to the baby at this point, but this whole sequence is adorable as fuck, and I told you all Manic was the best character. Huh? Hey, little dude, who got him tummy ache? Hey, does the good boy like music? Get ready, kid. Here it comes.
We jump ahead to them playing the drums together, annoying the hell out of Dingo, which only makes it better. Then we cut to Sonic and Sonya, who weren't able to find the parents. We return to the baby sleeping with one of Manic's drumsticks and- Ugh, why is this show adorable now? You're pretty cool, kid. You know what? You need a name. Ed? Uh, Bertram? Chauncey? Nah. Hip! Hip Hedgehog! <laughs> Check you later, Hip. Look how happy and content and dadly he is, and oh my god, I forgot this is a spy robot! This is gonna break his heart now, I hate it! Sonic and Sonya return, and Dingo spies on them. Oh, we had a great time. He cried, I fed him, he cried, I burped him, then I cried when he ralphed on my vest. Fuck, this is my new favorite episode! How did that happen? Point is, Manic has gotten very attached to Hip, which Sonic does not believe, but that means he can babysit some more while the others search for the new roboticizer. Hip? Well, he needed a name. Hip Hedgehog. Way cool. So we got tonight covered, but what about after that? We should take him to Sanctuary. Yes! <laughs> Show me Sanctuary. Now we can. <gasps> Too many things to do. Sonya suggests they leave Hip at one of the underground shelters, but Manic insists he go to Sanctuary. They argue about this for a moment until Hip starts crying again. Sonic tries to feed a baby a chili dog, but what Hip really needs is some music. Cue this episode's song, Being a Kid is Cool. The most TV-mandated children's music-ass bubblegum pop song this show has done yet. <laughs> At least it's not the abductor van of a song they did at Sanctuary. Poor Sam Vincent is trying to sell it so hard, but the triplets all put on baby bonnets and it just goes too far while being nothing at once. It is kind of cute that their child selves are part of the video, but knowing their childhoods were not like this at all, and they certainly didn't get to spend them together, there's an accidental sad undercurrent to this. I wish an episode actually looked a little into this lost childhood the siblings could have spent together, but it never happens. Also, Sonic's whole head is his eyes. Still not as creepy as the baby. Sonic and Sonya head out to find the prototype. Bye-bye, baby! <laughs> There's no way I'm letting you hang in some crummy shelter. We're gonna go to Sanctuary, Hip. That's it, Sleet! Mobilize the SWAT bots! <laughs> Manic takes off with Hip, while Sonic and Sonya notice the large fleet of SWAT bots going after them. Oh my gosh! I've never seen so many! Yeah, wonder what's up. Well, let's just be happy they're not following us! Sleet approaches and switches to stealth mode. Sonya discovers that the plans for the prototype are empty. It's a fake. Huh? <laughs> Isn't it annoying when they won't stop crying? Fortunately, like those roboticizer plans, this baby <gasps> is fake, too! He locks them in place with electronic shackles. Electronic shackles? Thank you for saying it aloud so I could tell that's what it was, and forces them to watch as Manic leads them right to Sanctuary. Sonya tries to escape with her keyboard, but the shackles can take the laser but not the computer and generator, which feels like a cop-out, and they make their escape. We cut to Manic approaching Sanctuary, and his siblings are already close behind, which if it was Sonic running on foot, maybe I'd believe it, but on a hoverboard, come on. If Sonic ran on foot, he'd win! Sleet sees them and calls in to Robotnik, who orders them shot down. Sleet tells Dingo to grab Manic, and the SWAT bots come out of stealth mode to attack. Sonya fights back with her key gun, but while Manic is struggling, Hip falls out of Dingo. <laughs> Manic breaks free and dives after. Dingo also falls, but Sleet saves him by turning him into a bird. Manic reaches out and tries so hard, and he looks so kind, but alas. Robotnik for this. 
You know, for such an absurd meme as this scene, when you watch the whole episode, it's even more fucked up. Manic got attached to a cute little baby, tried to take him somewhere safe, and watched him fall to his death. If Hip was not a robot, what a dark fucking show this would be. I'll give you this, Sonic Underground. This is the first time one of your characters has cried and I bought it. Holy fuck. Manic is genuinely pissed, so the triplets take out the SWAT bots by kiting them into the tall rocks and making them collide into each other in a convenient cloud. The episode ends with Manic playing drums for the kids at Sanctuary. Now if you want to learn that, you need to find some sticks and some flat rocks. <laughs> To think, I almost led those guys here. You were just trying to do the right thing. You okay, bro? <laughs> I am now. Who expected this Boom, baby! to be a good episode? I've vocally not been a fan of Len Jansen's writing for this show. Babysitting episode. Also kind of stock. But this one did a great job with something that's been a constant complaint of mine. The lack of tension. We know from the start that this baby is actually Robotnik's spying device. We see Manic get attached to the baby and want to bring it to Sanctuary, which was actually established in an earlier episode as where the Freedom Fighters hide their children. But Manic is either going to learn the truth about Hip, or he's going to bring Robotnik right to those kids. And despite how the baby looks, Robotnik did make it act pretty realistic, so... Almost in spite of yourself, you get kind of attached to Hip too. You can feel the approaching tragedy, and when Manic does learn the truth, need I remind you how... I threw it on the ground! His resulting anger is earned, and him closing the episode by playing with the kids in Sanctuary feels even sweeter and sadder. It helps that it's a Manic-centric episode. He's always been the best character, and him being so sweet and caring to a child is just endlessly charming. I'm honestly shocked at how this idea, which should fail as soon as the baby appears on screen, worked so well. But... Here's the thing about tension. This episode has been memed on to death. It was the first thing I and several people ever saw about this show. Everyone watching when I streamed it knew how it was going to go. I literally opened this video with this exact clip. And, folks, waiting for this butt-fucking ugly baby to fall from the sky and explode creates a whole new layer of tension that I was not prepared for. Manic takes Hip up in the air on his hoverboard halfway through the episode, and all of us watching were ready for it to happen, and it didn't. And we were just balls of anxiety the entire rest of the way. We not only knew that Manic would learn the truth, we knew how. And we could not deal with waiting for it to happen. This is one case where I can say being spoiled on the ending definitively makes watching this better. The most difficult thing a mother has to do is to let go of her children. Let it go! Wow, that's up there with Gwen Stacy. R.I.P. Hip. B+. The show is like a case study in tension and continuity. We see so many episodes that don't bother with one or both, and the results are at best a fun time, at worst, deadening to sit through. You can argue continuity doesn't matter nearly as much as internet douchebags have made in the last few decades, but when you care about it in your story, it creates investment in your viewers, and it creates opportunities for you, like we saw here. If we hadn't learned about Sanctuary and been there in a previous episode, episode, it would not matter nearly as much that Manic is going to unwittingly bring Robotnik there, and you totally understand and empathize with why he's going to. There are real stakes involved. And tension is also a form of investment. Going back to when in Rome, I expected that Sonic and the Minotaur were going to save Sonya and Manic from the lions, because how the hell is Manic going to lockpick with a spear? Answer, he just does, so who fucking cares? I have no reason to be invested. That episode also emphasizes why you need to actually do something with your content Continuity for it to matter, because it's cool to see the Oracle again, I guess, but it doesn't amount to anything. It's just a bare episode setup. Go to the Oracle, get sent somewhere else. It could have been episode two and nothing would have really changed. And judging by what Ben Hurst said, I feel like the writers really wanted to cultivate an ongoing story, because this is where we hit something brand new for the show. Three-part story arcs. But only two of them. 
And in English, they aired one of the parts already. The annoying thing about the three-parters, along with beginnings being moved to episode one, is that they were aired alongside each other. Not as in all of Chaos Emerald Crisis, then all of Origins. They aired part one of Emerald Crisis, part one of Origins, part two of Emerald Crisis, and so on and so forth. How stupid was this? Let's find out. Beginning should not have been the first episode, so my hopes are not high. We start with episode 25 and part one of Chaos Emerald Crisis, Flying Fortress, written by Mark Edens. When the sun is shining and the day is beautiful, even the bravest of us need to get away from our troubles. But we must never forget that doom hangs above our heads. We open on Sonya enjoying the beach until Sonic disrupts her by playing frisbee with himself. Manic does some treasure hunting and finds two mobiums, and Sonic stops to appreciate his sandcastle. Fancy! Hey, who's the wise guy? Oh yeah, I'm the wise guy. Unfortunately, the titular Flying Fortress makes its appearance, looking like a very rough reference to the Death Egg, opening fire and blasting them into the sand. Blast Sonic and his siblings back to the Primobian Age! <laughs> Sleet offers to grab the hedgehogs, but Robotnik shoots him down too, visibly surprising him. The triplets make a break for it, the fortress in hot pursuit. They try to hide in a forest, but Robotnik starts shooting down the trees, where we learn that Sonya, of all people, is the one who actually cares about nature. Nobody messes with the forest! <laughs> The triplets just unload on the fortress. In fact, I think this is one of the few times Manix lasers are shown, but it's a no-sell. Whoa! The armor on that thing must be solid Moby Bindum. Moby Bindum? That weighs a ton. How could Buttnik make it fly? Maybe it's time we find out just what makes that Buttnik ugly thing tick. They catapult Sonic up to the fortress, and this is my reaction to it. Blast off! Oh no! Oh no! Okay. <laughs> Wait the... Wait the fuck. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's amazing. Kind of brutal, but also amazing. Yeah, put a pin in that. Sonic searches the fortress for the energy reactor, but ends up in a Scooby-Doo cartoon. What is that blurry camera on deck 212? Hey! Maybe it's busted. Maybe you're defective. My fortress is perfect. It must be. I designed it myself. I designed my fortress with an invincible defense system. Watch and learn. <gasps> He's doing a lot of pointing this episode. <gasps> that That's doesn't hardcore. Sound friendly. These episodes are making me actually feel bad for the SWAT bots. Another bot gets vaporized, and then the force field is on Sonic. He tries to fight it, but the best he can do is get blasted out the wall. Ah! Manic hops on his hoverboard and catches him in the most gloriously unceremonious way. And the fortress sends some stealth bots after them. Sonya opens fire, looking about as badass as one could in a bikini. But one of the bots knocks Sonic loose. They return to Sonya, who takes out a couple more bots. What did she turn into a Terminator? Unfortunately, the forest is toast, and they dive into a cave for cover. Satisfied that they're gone, Robotnik retreats to the skies. But of course, the siblings are alive. This is horrible. That Budnik's destroyed everything. Yeah, all we got now is a lifetime supply of toothpicks. The Resistance won't stand a chance unless we knock Budnik's flying fortress out of the sky. Okay, but how? You were up there and you couldn't stop him. I know, but we gotta crash that flying fortress before Mobius is trashed! I forgot, what's this episode called? Yeah, but man, we don't even know what makes that thing fly. Manic, you're already my favorite, you can stop. Sonic realizes that the force field on the flying fortress was emerald green, and conjectures that Robotnik's gotten his hands on a chaos emerald. But if that's true, Knuckles' floating island would have fallen and been destroyed, meaning that there must be more than one. We'll need help getting to that fortress's engine room. And there's only one person I know who can handle a chaos emerald. 
Shadow the Hedge. Wait, cut to the floating island where Knuckles radios in to the triplets approaching aircraft. A broken stealth bot. This image is hilarious. They don't have a radio to reply to Knuckles, but Sonic figures as long as they're not hostile, he won't attack them. I don't think they know that. This is a great episode if you like Sonic being a little shit. Sure enough, they get shot out of the sky, but Sonic manages to skyright with the bot Smoke to let Knuckles know it's them. They fill him in on the flying fortress, and we think it may be powered by a Chaos Emerald. A Chaos Emerald? He says there are indeed other emeralds, but he can't help them when he's needed to protect the island. It's still the 90s, so that's still plausible. The triplets try to convince him to change his mind with the power of- Oh no, it's reggae again. Please don't do an accent. Please fu- No one will ever Phew, okay. It's very plainly boring cod reggae. This episode's song, No One Is An Island, features Manic going apeshit on the drums and the band playing in a log. Those are the only good things about it. Sam Vincent's really struggling to hit the notes on this one. But again, no fake Jamaican accent, so it's nowhere the worst song this show is shat. And it's kind of a cute reference to Knuckles being coded Jamaican early on. His quills are styled like dreadlocks. Song still sucks, but it's almost worth it because they diegetically annoyed Knuckles into helping them with their shitty music. That's accidentally genius. Knuckles goes through the checklist before takeoff when a mysterious voice comes to him. Knuckles. In a minute. Extra little bags of in-flight peanuts? Check. Knuckles, listen to me. All right already. I'm all ears. Great Grandpa Affair! I is that you? Meet a Thayer, a rare character, <clears throat> a rare character crossing over from the Archie comics, and a second echidna and ancestor of Knuckles at that. If you too suddenly shuddered in terror, don't worry, a Thayer was actually created by the comics' first lead writer, Michael Gallagher. Not the other one. I don't think Gallagher meant for him to be a death of comedy Sean Connery impression, but here we are. If you leave the floating island, all of Mobius could be destroyed. The fate of Mobius is in your hands. I will say he's not sonically irritating like Dunkle Fuck is, <laughs> but it is so distracting and out of place on this show. We return from commercial to a Thayer being cryptic and not remotely helpful, which is par for the course for ancient echidnas, and then he leaves. The triplets arrive and look like they're going to beat him up, and they all hop into the X tornado to face the flying fortress. Said orb arrives over Port Mobius from the deepest sphere, which Robotnik intends to obliterate as retribution for them changing sides. Sadly, no squeege, but that also means he won't die, and no one wants that. You know, this Port Mobian's only sided with you because of us. Yeah, we rigged up that fake sea monster. You two have had so many failures, it's hard to keep them all straight. Interrupt my work again, and I'll have you tossed off the fortress while we're still in the air! Sleet realizes that Robotnik doesn't need them anymore, meaning they're at risk of being roboticized. It's time for us to act. Okay, but I won't wear a girly costume. Come on, you flea paradise. The plane approaches the fortress and seemingly requests emergency landing. Cut to inside the plane where we see a Knuckles cutout. This image is also hilarious. What are you doing, Knuckles? Oh, it is. I thought he was piloting with his dick. Robotnik, of course, blows the plane out of the sky, but the heroes secretly parachute down to the fortress, where Knuckles drills through the thick, heavy Moby Dendum like it was dirt. I'd prefer if it took some effort, but fuck it, it's Knuckles. He takes out a KO meter to find the Chaos Emerald, but Robotnik catches them on surveillance. The KO meter goes crazy, signaling that they're about to get vaporized, but Knuckles digs them a safe spot just in time. They start digging down to the reactor, but at that same time... I never knew blowing up SWAT bots could be so much fun. With the Chaos Emerald in our hands, Robotnik won't dare try to get rid of us. Good thinking, Sleep. If nothing else, he won't have his precious fortress anymore, and he'll need our help again. They escape with the emerald right as the heroes arrive. Knuckles sees that someone just beat them to the emerald, and the fortress begins falling into the Mobian Sea. Into the... sea? Those hedgehogs must have stolen my Chaos Emerald! SWATBOTS, RIP FOR A CRASH LANDING! 
Boo, those rats deserting the sinking ship! The fortress hits the water, though luckily no one dies instantly from the impact, and the team is left to wonder who exactly took the emerald first. Now we've got the power instead of Robotnik. Yeah, just wait till we're in charge. <laughs> this episode is kind of metal. It starts out that way, at least. They waste no time jumping into action, and that force field vaporizing robots is pretty brutal for this show. It's also one of the few episodes that feels like it's having fun with itself and embracing its cartoony goofiness. Unfortunately, part of that is a fair, and I cannot stress enough how off-putting I find his voice, but he's used much less than he will be in the following episodes. This also ends off on a pretty good cliffhanger, and I was genuinely invested in where the story would go from here. No telling yet how the rest of the arc will go, but this is a pretty good start. A solid B. We reach episode 26, and reminder, this is where Beginnings originally aired in French. In the English airing, they swapped it with the original episode 1, Wedding Bell Blues. My patrons and I stepped back and rewatched both of them to see whether swapping them was a good idea or not. It wasn't at the start of the show, but maybe one of them works better as an episode 26. Neither of them do. If you think of Beginnings as episode 26 and the first part of an origin story, you're gonna be pissed at how bad of a beginning it is. We've spent so much time with these three, so we know how they are now. Theoretically, you wanna see what they were like growing up and how they became that way, leading up to them finally reuniting. All of that blows by so fast you don't get to enjoy it or even learn anything. An apparently important part of Manic's childhood is that he felt like he never had a home, yet you only ever see him in fractions of a minute in a loving environment with Cockroach Dad! By the way, even giving these three foster parents only makes this show worse. These people raise these kids from infancy, yet they disappear from the show and their hearts the second this arc is over. I must remind you, because this episode really drives it home, the end of episode 24 was the first time any of them ever met their birth mother. They never met each other until the end of this episode when they're teenagers. But the second they're told they have blood relatives, their adoptive families cease to exist. If you're adopted, if you're in the foster system, if you formed a found family from your own personal situation, this show says, fuck those people, they're not who matters. And you know what, Sonic Underground? Fuck yourself first. And if you think of Wedding Bell Blues as episode 26, you'll be pissed because you don't know what the fuck they're saying. I will say on rewatch, I do like both episodes a little bit more. I have a better handle on their energy, and since I already know what's happening, they're easier to follow, but neither of them are especially good. I will at least bump up Wedding Bell Blues to a D+. However, they do drive home what I was already saying first time around. This show really doesn't need an origin story. The theme song kind of says everything you need to know, and the pilot sets up the status quo just fine. It's going to be up to the rest of Origins to change my mind. Episode 27 brings us back to Chaos Emerald Crisis with Part 2, No Hedgehog is an Island, written by Matt Edens, the third Edens brother and his only credit for the show. It picks up immediately after the first part, and I want to reiterate that photosensitivity warning because this episode is horribly stroby. We do not know what we would do when faced with an impossible situation. How much would we be willing to risk to save the world from chaos? Sleet and Dingo celebrate pulling one over on Robotnik while he escapes the fortress. The heroes are still inside and have to deal with the rising water. Water! We landed in the sea! Let's all punch! This way! Uh, maybe not. Ah! Man! Why's it always gotta be water? Quick! In here! But this is a garbage disposal! No way I'm gonna be diced up like a plate of leftovers! Robotnik would never recycle his garbage. He just dump it. Now go! Sonic immediately starts drowning, but Knuckles saves him and everyone with the rope he took from the wreckage. Cue a bit of impromptu water skiing that Manic enjoys and Sonic doesn't because Manic is still a better Sonic than Sonic, and cut to the heroes drying off by a campfire. Ah, that's much better. The wet look is definitely overrated. Ah! Well, bro, hope there's not a fish in there. <laughs> Knuckles wants to find who has the Chaos Emerald, and Sonic runs off to get the van. Cut to Sleet and Dingo, where the former reveals his real plan, using the Emerald to become the ruler of Mobius himself. Dingo decides he should be the ruler and takes the Emerald from him. You? Ruler of Mobius? 
You can't even drink a glass of water without using two hands. Yeah, but I don't spill as much as I used to. So long, sleep. God damn it, Dingo. I wish I liked you. When I'm ruler of Mobius, Sonya can be my queen. But not that much. He pulls his parachute, and the force causes him to lose his grip on the emerald, and it smashes in half on the ground. This caused me to do something I've never done watching Sonic Underground. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh -oh. That's right. I flinched in surprise. Get ready for a ride, people. Sonic makes it to the van in the blown-out forest, but its battery is out. At that same moment, the broken Chaos Emerald starts reacting and discharges a huge burst of energy. Whoa! Talk about a jump start! Let's go! He then gets caught in a tree. What a dumb shit. Cut back to Manic fucking drumming in his sleep. I love him so much. How it's so peaceful out here. You can almost forget about Budnick, about everything. I can't forget about the Chaos Emerald. We've got to find it. Don't worry, we'll find it. Maybe I should have stayed on the floating island. Great Grandfather Athair warned me that something bad would happen if I left the island. It's not your fault we didn't get the Chaos Emerald. I know, but Athair's never wrong. Huh? Hey, energy. Whoa! The chaos energy hits the beach and causes the ground to split from underneath Sonya, and we fade to commercial as she falls into a chasm. I have to mention here, when I first read the DVDs for this show, I checked the episodes very briefly to make sure nothing went wrong. My first impression of this show for this project was this moment entirely out of context. <laughs> I was howling, and I hope you are too. We come back from commercial to the exact same scream, and she lands on a ledge. Knuckles digs down and saves her before she can fall or get crushed under more debris. Going up? What took you so long? Manic finally wakes up, and another earthquake closes the chasm. Knuckles thinks he knows what's happening. Oh, something must have released the chaos energy inside the emerald. But the emerald makes things fly. Yeah, man. It doesn't shake them apart like a pair of crazy maracas. The Chaos Emerald is a source of power. You can harness it for all kinds of things, like levitating the floating island or Robotnik's fortress. But if the energy is released without any controls, the result is... Chaos. All over Mobius. We cut to Slate angrily looking for Dingo and the Emerald, but his search gets disrupted by chaos lasers and trees firing out of the ground like rockets. He realizes Dingo must have used the Emerald, and he resigns himself to asking Robotnik for help getting things under control. Robotropolis then gets hit by the chaos energy and starts collapsing, and Robotnik mourns his flying fortress. My fortress of altitude, I could have devastated all of Mobius, but now it's ruined! All my plans, all my dreams. <sighs> How's a tyrant supposed to tyrannize without his most powerful weapon? <sighs> it's just... <laughs> 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 but then his base starts glowing and quaking like a Rush concert, and he realizes that it might not have been Sonic who took the Emerald, but Sleet and Dingo. Oh, if they did, I'll make those rats wish they'd gone down with the ship! Cut back to Dingo, who tries to figure out how he can fix it. He tries just putting the two halves together, massive seizure warning for this scene especially, and the whole of Mobius lights up. I do another thing I have never done with this show. Oh my god. Yes, a surprised oh my god. It's happening, people. <gasps> oh, oh, get, no. Matt, I think this episode's a little too badass for the show. Cut back to Sonic while the world keeps exploding around him and trees blast off their roots. That's one of the best things the show has ever done. More of this, please. And then a chaos tornado appears. Cut back to Robotropolis, where Sleet has returned and been immediately captured to be roboticized. Gary Chalk really plays up Robotnik this scene, and he starts feeling like the later Eggmans, like Dean Bristow or Mike Pollock in his angrier moments. Oh, you flea-infested overachiever! You've got a lot of nerve coming back here! Those hedgehogs didn't steal the Chaos Emerald! You did, didn't you? It was Dingo's idea. Oh, yeah, right, like Dingo's ever had an idea. Take him away and roboticize him twice. You need help to get the emeralds back. 
Luckily for Sleep, he's needed to find Dingo and the Emerald, so he's released. The previously mentioned tornado reaches the beach and narrowly misses the heroes. Manic and Knuckles celebrate with the worst low five of all time. <sighs> But unfortunately, the tornado then heads straight for Port Mobius. Everyone, I need you to take a deep breath and prepare yourself for what happens next. You are not ready for what happens next. We return from commercial to Manic getting an idea, and he brings out his drums. He then proceeds to fight the tornado with a drum solo. He drums his fucking heart out to destabilize the thing or cause an earthquake or whatever the fuck he's doing, but the point is he's fighting a tornado with drums, and he wins! And the tornado turns into fireworks! Do I love this show now? He's Hot damn, and here I thought Manic was the weak one. Shit, he's a thunder god. That should do it. Sonic finally makes it back and berates his siblings because he's the worst character on the show, and Manic tells him that someone released the energy from the Emerald. No wonder things have been so, uh... Chaotic? Yeah. Thanks, sis. Knuckles looks sad, so Sonic immediately jumps into this episode's song, Learn to Overcome a pretty corporate punk rock song that the video actively tries to ruin with that awful strobe effect. God damn it, even the song is good! I did it! What is with this episode? Punk rock is like the plasma of my blood, so I should hate this. But damn it, it taps into what I love about punk. You don't gotta be great at it. You don't even really need actual guitar tone. You just gotta have the energy and the attitude, and this song does. You don't even have to be a good singer, so it's not a bad fit for Sam Vincent's voice. Its lyrics are basic as fuck, but it's definitely sold by some pretty good hooks. We have to learn. I don't know that I would put it on a punk playlist, but it's better than most of the tracks on Cut the Crap, and that's my baseline for bad punk rock, so well done not tripping on the low bar, Sonic Underground. It's like I say, when faced with disaster, just move a little faster. You're right, we're not beaten yet. There's one person who might be able to help us now, my great-grandfather Athair, the ancient sage of the Echidnas. The heroes drive to Athera's place at the same time that Sleet and Dingo arrive to search for Dingo. Okay. At the same time that Sleet and Robotnik arrive to search for Dingo. Athera lives at the top of a mountain of stairs, and Sleet spots them from nearby. Well, well. Dingo can wait. <laughs> Robotnik, I found the hedgehogs. Ooh. <laughs> this is turning into a good day after all. The heroes finally reach Athair's place. Oh, man. <sighs> like this Athair dude could really use <sighs> an elevator. He's a hermit. He doesn't have many visitors. Huh, <laughs> no surprise there. We're reintroduced to the most distracting Sean Connery impression. I won't linger on it anymore. Athair reveals that the emerald has been broken, and he gives Knuckles a container to store it in. There is only one way to stop the chaos from destroying Mobius. You must make an alliance with Robotnik. Oh no! Robotnik? Oh, seriously bad news, dude. The triplets are not happy with that idea, but Knuckles is ready and willing if needs be. However, he concedes that he's been outvoted, only for Sleet and the SWAT bots to get the drop on them. Before he can capture them, Sonic just locks them in the van, and Knuckles digs them an escape tunnel. They sneak back into the van and make a break for it. All seems well. Except... Hey, where's Knuckles? He was right behind me. Out of my way! You! But... What are you doing here? I need Robotnik's help to find the Chaos Emerald and save Mobius. Take me to Robotnik.
Holy shit, this episode rules. Matt Eden's one contribution injects so much absurd, wanton destruction into a show that has been begging for real stakes. And even after the set pieces are over and we have to listen to a there for a minute, it mostly sticks the landing with an intriguing cliffhanger. Never have I ever wanted to see what happens next in Sonic Underground like I have after this. That said, most of this episode's strength comes from how much of a spectacle it is after 20-odd episodes of slapdash mediocrity, and that magic does fade some on repeat viewings, especially since the downtime is as clunky and hastily written as ever. <sighs> But it's still a shockingly fun episode with several great moments. Manic fought a tornado with drums and won! I wish the rest of the show was like this, and I wish Matt Edens wrote more. B+. I did it! Episode 28 takes us back to Origins with Part 2, Getting to Know You. Kirsten Ali wrote the whole arc for the record. After seeing Beginnings weeks ago, we're finally continuing that story and hopefully filling in important gaps. Now that Robotnik had identified my children, he would not rest until he found them. Find those hedgehogs! Or you'll get to inspect my prison personally! Robotnik orders Sleet and Dingo to find the triplets, since, remember, the Oracle told him exactly what would happen and caused this whole mess. He's the real villain of the show. What are you doing, you oaf? She's pretty. And you're ugly. Now let's get to work. We cut to the hedgehogs, where Sonya screams at a mouse and then asks where the maid is. Every force in Robotropolis is on our butts, and you're wigging out over a mouse? We're, we're in, in trouble. trouble. Wait! Uh, where's the maid? I'd like my breakfast now. Definitely trouble. This concludes the getting to know you portion of getting to know you. I wish I was kidding. Sleet and Dingo find the triplets' location while they're checking a map to their next goal. Sonya's spoiled princess bit continues for a moment. This is episode 28, it's not fresh anymore. Until a SWAT bot breaks in and opens fire, burning the map. Sonic gets backhanded, and Manic jumps in to help, immediately getting grabbed. Oh, nice diversion, bro. Outside, Sleet tells Dingo to go in and get them himself. Y you mean through the door there? No, through the wall, genius. Okie dokie. Slingo hint number three, that affectionate head shake. God damn it, Dingo, I wish you were a good character. Ah. <laughs> Case in point. Sonic finally does something to help, Manic shuts off the bot with the panel on its arm, and Sonya uses Dingo's crush against him and pushes him down the stairs. Ice goddamn cold. Unfortunately, it was down their escape route, and the new one he made for them has sleet in it. Move back. Move back, please. I'm afraid you will have to come along with me. I couldn't find your coat, Sonya. Well, that worked out. Sonic grabs the others and makes a break for it. Bye, Sonya. Side note, credit to Maurice LaMarche in this latter half of the show. He feels a lot more into his role and comfortable with Sleet's voice than he used to be. He's not murmuring or whisper screaming anymore. Like I said, not miscast, just misdirected. And he works a lot better from here on out. The triplets walk down a sewer where Sonya complains some more, and Sonic asks for the scroll, but it got left behind after it was burned. Sonya doesn't want to go back, and Manic does this. No, we don't. Hey, hey, let me go! Sorry, we gotta have the scroll. What's the matter? Is the Duchess afraid to get her feet dirty? Little fucking gremlin, I swear. If you wouldn't let me finish, we've got the scroll. Right here, huh? I have a photographic memory. Photographic memory? Ooh. Now give me a break. It's been a while since I've said this, but, well, that's convenient. This was never in any of the previous episodes, it's never in any later episodes, and it doesn't amount to shit, but that's convenient. Robotnik chews out the mercs, but they at least found the map, and Slate thinks he knows where they're going. We return from commercial to the triplets walking through a forest. I'm gonna play this next interaction in its entirety. <gasps> yeah, what was that? It's a bird. Just like the bird yesterday, and the bird the day before. Sheesh. Hey, I'm a city boy, okay? More bread? How gourmet. So what did you do in the city, Manic? I was, uh, in the family business. We, uh, moved things. Like import-export? No, <gasps> like a thief. <gasps> a thief? Oh. How'd you know? Resistance. We gotta know about everybody. <laughs> hey, don't worry, Princess. 
I don't steal from family. Oh, I, I, I didn't mean. We were all born with silver spoons in our mouths, Sonya. You just got to keep yours. Yeah, I had to steal mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to remind you again, this episode is literally called Getting to Know You, and they have apparently already spent days together. Sonic knows everything about them anyway, and they learned about their mother and their past as royalty off screen. So what the fuck is the point of this origin story? My rant is disrupted by a green lion elf Conan the Barbarian named Gandar, who was sent by the Oracle to train the triplets. I hate looking at him. <laughs> Here you will develop your natural abilities and find talents hidden within you. Could we get this show on the road while I'm still young? Wow, wouldn't it be ironic if your hidden talent was patience? What makes you say that? Huh? I think now is a good time to start. The next few minutes are of him teaching the triplets skills like the spin. <laughs> testing Sonic's speed and precision, and Manic spinning his drumsticks like a boomerang and using them like arrows. Why doesn't that come back? That rules! He's bard class! We cut back to Robotnik using the scroll to find their exact location. Luckily, that shitty map is apparently photo accurate. Excellent! And he sends the mercs after them. Back in training, Sonic and Sonya show off their skills, but Manic's feeling like he doesn't measure up in comparison. I've been thinking maybe they could do better without me. I mean, my talents just don't exactly measure up. Leaving would be a mistake, young friend. Soon you will find a talent that has been hidden. Use it to help your cause. Really? What is it? When the time comes, you will know. Oh, that's an interesting development. Never mind that we saw him win in a fight with a tornado. Manic has always been the least powerful of the triplets. I would actually like an episode addressing this and letting him prove that he has a place in the team like this. Just wish it wasn't in this arc. For now, Gandar says their training with him is complete, only for the mercs and SWAT bots to arrive. They start destroying the forest, only for Gandar to tease. Obviously, you haven't heard about our trees. The plants proceed to spit acid on the ships and send them crashing to the ground. Gandar gives the triplets a scroll, which teleports them to their next teacher in the mystical, monk-inhabited Tralaset. It has an invisible staircase. Because why the hell not? They meet a monk who doesn't speak, and he guides them up the stairs. Way past cool. Impressive. He leads them into a room in a very suspicious manner, which turns out to be their bedroom. So, do you talk or what? Sonic, huh? he's a monk. I do indeed speak. Whoa, thought we were gonna have to become mimes. This is Thelonious, their next teacher. His voice is really grating. Your medallions, they are a source of great power. Huh? Just like the night we met at the club. But to use the power, you must find harmony among yourselves. Their first power is, what else? Music. They summon their signature instruments for the first time, and he says they have other uses, you know, guns, as long as the three are in harmony. He then sends them to their first test, a fight with a big old beast. Former boyfriend? Cute. Unfortunately, Harmony is not in the cards. As Sonic rushes in to fight it himself, Sonya stands there, chewing on her gloves, and Manic finds a door he knows how to lockpick. Sonic and Sonya almost get eaten. Ah! You have failed your first test. There will be no more training. Your heart was good, but you used poor judgment. Your actions were correct. Had you all worked together, your escape would have been a simple one. Oh, it was me. I got us killed. Yes. Thank you, Sonic Underground. Thank you for saying canonically that Manic is correct and Sonic is the worst. Thank you. Thelonious dresses Sonic down, but his siblings jump in to defend him. It rings supremely hollow because... Sonic may be impatient and impulsive, but he's braver than anyone I've ever met. One, he has nothing to fear. He's overpowered and throws out the balance of your entire team. He saved my butt a couple of times. And two, the show skipped over that. So as far as we're concerned, you still don't know each other. Ah, oh, you defend your brother. Now, that is harmony. And you're ugly. Wow, you guys really stood up for me. Well, you've saved me more than once. And besides, you are my brother. You're not going to kiss me, are you? No way, but you are kind of cute. 
Okay, you get a point back. That was cute. It was a very sibling way of messing with each other. And now that they've found their harmony, it's time for this episode's song, Working Together in Harmony. It's got monk chanting, which sounds pretty nice. And it's funny that the triplets are the ones making it. It's got Tylee Ross doing falsetto vocalizing, which also sounds nice. <laughs> and one of the monks starts dancing, which is pretty funny. That's all I like about it. It's as preachy and in your face with a moral as a latter day yes song. Group hug. I think this is the start of something way past cool. This episode isn't as bad as beginnings, but what was really accomplished? I know we still have a third part to this, but just in this one episode, what actually happened? Anything worth knowing about these characters and their relationship with each other, with their mother, their ultimate goal, and anything else you might want from an origin story is glossed over even harder than it is in beginnings. At least in that episode you saw some things, brief as they were. This time they don't even bother with that. Never once do these siblings actually, you know, get to know each other, and instead they just tell you shit happened off screen. I know I'm down on this show a lot, but it's not because I have no investment in these characters. I do, and their dynamic and interactions are the main reason to watch. But I would have a lot more investment if the show acted like it wanted me to. A flat D. And it focuses so much on Sonic, who is, frankly, the least interesting of the trio. Sonia's a little more interesting, though she's hampered by how much of her character is just a feminine stereotype. Like, partially, you know, it is also, like, it tracks with her upbringing. She would be spoiled. But it also feels like because she is the girl, that's the reason she's also the spoiled character. Like, wouldn't it be interesting if one of the boys was the rich one? Yeah, because, like, even if this... Um, if this wasn't a dystopian cyberpunk kind of setting, like, if this was a high school setting, Sonya could be the same character and nothing would change. And the other two, their characters would have to adapt in some way. Sonia, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have to change anything. Episode 29 concludes Chaos Emerald Crisis with part three, New Echidna in Town, written once again by Mark Edens. My children still have many lessons to learn, but some lessons are so big, it takes a whole world to discover them. Now Mobius is learning the greatest lesson of all. How to die. Dingo continues trying to put the two halves of the Emerald back together, only to get caught in another blast that also reaches the triplets. They return to Athera's place to try to find Knuckles. Yo, the kid did it. Knuckles wouldn't have surrendered without a fight. He could be hurt. Or worse. By the way, Sonya's into Knuckles now. It's only for this episode, but at least it's with someone she met before. We cut to Sleet taking Knuckles to Robotnik. Good work, Sleet. I didn't think you had it in you. He doesn't. Damn, Knuckles. This arc has made me turn around on him so hard. He suggests they cooperate to save everyone, including the Empire, but Robotnik will only agree in exchange for the hedgehogs. I'd never betray my friends. Then I guess the destruction of Mobius will be your fault. <laughs> Too bad. Knuckles doesn't believe him, but it looks like he's out of options. If you do capture them, Sonic, Manic, Sonya... Would you roboticize them? Roboticize them? Of course not. I'd keep them prisoners so I could taunt them with my victory. But I... I can't betray my friends. But I can't let Mobius be destroyed. All right, I'll do it. For the good of Mobius. I knew you'd make the right decision. Someday, all of Mobius will thank you. Well, almost all. <laughs> we return to our heroes, sitting on their asses, unsure of what to do next, as they need Knuckles and his canister to do anything. At that moment, another wave of chaos passes, and they float under the van one at a time like paper. But then Knuckles catches up to them. We thought you were a Budnick prisoner. Oh, I thought we'd never see you again. Well, I... 
I managed to get away from Sleek. I'm... I'm glad you're back. Blush. Says Blush. You know, Knuckles, Sonya was ready to give up Mobius to rescue you. Haha. <laughs> I was not. You just keep your mind on finding that emerald. Yeah, Manic. Nothing's more important than saving Mobius, no matter what it takes. I feel like I should have started a counter of times Manic is a little shit goblin, one of the most sibling things any of them has done this series. We return from commercial to the van driving into Robotnik's trap. If you remember the uncomfortable goo gun from Mummy Dearest, there's a lot of that this episode too, and it's extra white so it's extra awkward. The hedgehogs get gacked, and Knuckles' betrayal is revealed. No! I don't believe it! I had to! I kept my part of the bargain, Robotnik. Now we find the emerald. Yes, the emerald. But first things first, bring up the portable roboticizing chamber. Huh? A perfect ending, your roundness. Only you could trick Knuckles into betraying the hedgehogs. Knuckles hasn't seen the previous episodes, so he's surprised that Robotnik went back on his word. He makes the mistake of starting with Sonya. Don't touch me, you butthead! And Knuckles jumps in to save her. No! He slimes the SWAT bot, which falls into the roboticizer, overloading and exploding it. Knuckles unslimes the hedgehogs. Good to have you back, dude. And then the van, and they leave the villains in the dust. Manic hits the gas, and his angry sneer is the stuff of miracles. The Manic Man stops for no bot. He nearly drives into a lava flow, which Sonic figures came from the last Chaos Wave, so Knuckles hops out and digs them a new path, leaving the baddies to nearly get stuck in it themselves. I really dug what you did. <laughs> Good one, Sonic. I never should have trusted Robotnik. You were desperate to save Mobius. I might have done the same thing in your place. And after that joke, Sonic, don't rule it out. With water quickly under the bridge, they find the epicenter of the chaos, and Sonic takes the canister to investigate. Sleet and some SWAT bots are right behind him, though, and they take the emerald. Uh, Sleet? <laughs> Am I glad to see you? You traitor! I'll deal with you later. Dingo gets transformed into a safe to hold the emerald, but Sonic tells them that only the canister can contain the chaos energy. To wit, this episode becomes a horror, and we fade to commercial as Dingo becomes John Carpenter's The Thing. I'll admit I was worried this arc was pulling an artifact and was just dropping its setup in the third act, but nope, it's still got some legs. Sleet tries to transform Dingo, but it doesn't work, and Sonic leaves to get help, but probably also to leave him to die. Dingo, old pal, partner. <laughs> you don't look so good. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything you... You want? I want... Chaos! Dingo stomps around, destroying the landscape with his new powers and setting off volcanoes. Sonic tickles his guitar at him, but it's a no-go, and unfortunately so is Manic's drum earthquake. You call that an earthquake? This is an earthquake! Huh? Whoa, dude. Dingo stomps off to destroy Robotropolis, just in time for Robotnik to arrive. The triplets try to reason with him, which he isn't having, until Sonic plays into his ego in how Dingo stole the emerald from him. But Dingo stole the emerald from you! You gonna let him get away with that? You're the man! The Buttnik! The Buttmeister! You're gonna let Dingo make a monkey out of you? You'll be the laughingstock of Mobius! Nobody steals from Robotnik and gets away with it. I do all the stealing around here. That's the old Butnik I know and don't love. And against all odds, the triplets manage to team up with Robotnik as was prophesized. Meanwhile, Dingo gets ready to fuck up Robotropolis until Manic distracts him with a very janky drum solo. Cue his siblings joining in and we get this episode's song, The Mobius Stomp. We're gonna tear down the house, rip up the joint, doing the Mobius Stomp. It's a kind of yuppie, arena rock, dance craze song about destroying shit. I don't know if I'd say I like it, but it's one of the first songs that seems to be at the right level for this show, you know what I mean? It's not embarrassing for everyone involved, nor is it surprisingly good. It's more what I expected from Underground, and frankly, I'll take it. You parred the hole. Dingo stands around like a dipshit, giving Robotnik time to slime his feet. 
but then Sonic pushes him closer so that Dingo could fall on him, causing him to cough up the emerald pieces. Knuckles catches them in the canister, and the day is saved. I don't know how you thought that would work, Sonic, but I like it. This arc has been good for gloriously stupid moments. Dingo slowly squitters back to normal. Do not show this clip out of context, and he ends up having to face the consequences. Dingo! I'm gonna roboticize you. First for stealing the Chaos Emerald, again for letting Sonic escape, and a third time of flattening me, and then no more Mr. Nice Guy. The heroes return to Athair to have him guard the emerald, but he says Knuckles must guard it on the floating island instead. But you'll be coming with us, won't you? To join the resistance? Knuckles' duty lies on the floating island, just as your duty lies with the resistance. And finding Mom. Huh? But if you ever need a break from fighting Butnik, there's always room on the floating island. And you're welcome to sit in with the band anytime. You know what? Fuck it. I ship them. It's not a perfect ship, but they're cute. What a strange ending to this miniseries. The arc on the whole did a good job of making me invested, in part because of the intriguing cliffhangers. It felt like this episode dropped its setup awfully quickly. Knuckles goes back on his betrayal just minutes after the first commercial break. Not that I probably would have wanted that dragged out, but it felt like that could be something they resolve right at the third act. And then Dingo becomes a sludge monster, and it's like, okay, you haven't lost me. This episode, and the arc on the whole, did a lot to explore the dangerous side of Chaos Emeralds. The worst thing that happens to them in most Sonic games is they get drained of power, or the wrong person gets their hands on them. The Master Emerald has even been shattered, but aside from Angel Island falling and Chaos escaping his prison, nothing catastrophic happens because of the shattering specifically. These episodes ask the question, what if an emerald broke, and all of that power was released out into the world? Their answer, actual chaos. And they showed it in gloriously inventive and over-the-top ways. In fact, I wonder if Chaos Dingo was a reference to chaos. Except this was written before, so probably not. And while this episode isn't as good as the first two parts, since it feels more like it's hurrying to the finish line, it's a solid ending to an arc that's been one of the series' high points. B-. minus. That brings the whole of Chaos Emerald Crisis to an average rating of B. Good work, Sonic Underground. And good work, Eden's Brothers. This is a good showcase for how well they knew how to pace out their episodes. Even if it felt a bit hurried near the end, I think each part of the trilogy knew what it wanted to accomplish and allowed itself to have fun with that ride. We are not counting the first Knuckles episode. They didn't write it. Let me have this. But now we conclude Origins with Part 3, Episode 30, Harmony or Something. What a shit post of a title. I think Mana came up with that one. Quick note beforehand, I wrote this review when I was very tired and I just started wearing my glasses, which was giving me a slight headache. So I got pretty surly. It's still apropos, so I'm keeping it that way. My children were training, learning to master their powers, in spite of Robotnik's efforts to capture them. Robotnik has enough of Sleet and Dingo's failures and orders them roboticized. They weasel out of it by giving footage of the Hedgehog's training from a disc they recovered from the ship. They're given one last chance, and they're sent to capture the Oracle. Meanwhile, the Hedgehogs are fighting a dragon. Dulcie, good to see you again. They try their instruments once more, with Sonya reminding them that they only work as weapons when they're in harmony. The lasers stun the dragon briefly, but all Manic can do is his earthquake, which sends a rock into the air. Yo, Manic! What's the matter with you? What good's an earthquake when that thing's flying? Well, so much for harmony. Oh boy, I blew it. Sorry, Manic. It's okay, just get us into the castle really quick. Sonya notices that the dragon never lands, and it surprises her that it dodged a boulder flung at it. I think it's an air elemental. Yeah, that'd be my guess. What the heck is that? It's a creature of the air. If it touches the earth, it will be destroyed. Where do you get this stuff? We like to call it school. Sonya, honey, it's pronounced horse shit. Manic drum rolls another rock into the dragon, and sure enough, it explodes. This has never happened before, it never happens after this episode, they don't even say the phrase air elemental anywhere else in the show. Hope you're satisfied with Manic's special place in the team, because that was it, the story moves on. Ben and Pat wrote Sonic and Sally, what happened? Thelonious warps them back and tells them that Manic's earth powers are the most powerful gift of all, and yes, Sonic the win button is still in the room, when he gets a sudden headache. There's been an attack in Robotropolis, and Trevor, one of Sonic's friends in the Resistance, who we did see back when we met Cyrus, has been captured. Their training is incomplete, but Sonic insists on going to save him. Sonic, can we talk about this? Okay, let's talk. Look, guys, you can stay, but... Sonic Hedgehog, you may be the most impatient, aggravating, annoying, impulsive... Gee, I wish I had time for this flattery, but... 
But I have also learned that you have the biggest heart in the world. I learned that from all of the getting to know you I did. Thelonious relents and warps them back to the city. They need a way into Robotnik's headquarters, and Manic suggests the Mouse Patrol. Commercial. This episode gives me a headache. So yeah, I even wrote it in the script. There's a special passageway here. Mouse Patrol is the first job the Thieves Guild assigns to kids. Stealing food and stuff from Robotnik. I think it's disgusting, teaching kids to steal. Could we debate this later? Let's not forget about Trevor. We cut to Beetlebum being interrogated by Robotnik on Sonya's location. He doesn't give her up, but he's as smarmy and slimy as ever. Then the unexpected happens. Barfleby. Oh my god, she's back! Hi. I see you recognize the latest addition to my staff. <gasps> Lady Windermere! She opposed me. That's in such poor taste. Ah. Don't you agree, Bartleby? Ah, uh, yes, sir, I do. Yes. Well, you may go now, Bartleby. If it weren't specifically to scare Bartleby, I'd be annoyed that we only see one of the rich parents, because Cockroach Dad is still dead forever, but I'll let it go. It's actually effectively menacing. We then see what he's doing to Trevor, digging through his brain for resistance secrets. Sonya wants to go save Lady Windermere, but the boys know there's nothing they can do for her now. We cut to Sleet in the snowy region that we know leads to the Oracle's cave. He sends out camera bots, and Dingo continues to be gross. Back to the triplets where Sonya hacks the computer, Manic considers more thieving, and Sonic whines. Sonya finds a map to Trevor, but then they catch Sleet calling into Robotnik. They've found the cave. The triplets hurry to Trevor so they can save the Oracle next. We cut to Robotnik and see that they've done it off screen. Officially, they don't care anymore. Yeah, he's gonna seal every entrance. So why don't we just go out and exit, uh-huh? This bit is really annoying when a potentially cool thing was skipped, but they spend a fucking minute dribbling on about how they're going to escape while they just sit around an event. I did an entire series rewatch of Sat AM after this show because I needed to cleanse people. They decide to steal a ship with Trevor stealing another. I don't have a clue! That's Robotnik security panel. Only way past it is with the frequency harmonizer. Oh, look what I borrowed from Robotnik! A frequency harmonizer! Handy, huh? <laughs> Never laugh like that again. Trevor's ready, so they take off and hide as part of a small squad. Trevor successfully leads the SWAT bots away and abandons his ship to make them think the triplets got away. You know what? For a character I don't care about who's not in much, Trevor does some cool things. The triplets fly to the snowy region and snip at each other, but Robotnik's surveillance catches them anyway. He locks their controls and doors and activates the self-destruct. We fade to commercial, and I literally said out loud, The writing in this episode sucks. We do come back to another I love Manic moment, at least. Well, I was gonna take the master override key, but nice. you told me it was no time to be stealing stuff. Are you nuts? Why'd you listen to me? Seven. I didn't. <laughs> Manic's special place on the team is the good one. Manic saves them and they plummet safely into the snow. SWAT bots attack and Sonic rushes them to the cave. They get stuck on a rope bridge that breaks twice and they narrowly survive. Sonic and Sonya keep bitching, but then Manic sees their- Why is their mother here? Fuck off, show! Fuck off right now! Okay, I kind of love that awful Oracle animation, but fuck off forever! Oh, and song time! Fuck off more! This is We're All In This Together, and it's terrible. This show is my hell. Anyway, their mother convinced them to remember their training and work together. Basically, stop fighting, you annoying little bitches. Then Slade and Dingo catch them, they shoot the weapons out of their hands. Nice shot, Sonya! Then Manic buries the SWAT bots. He then does another big drum roll to take out their ships. Sleet tries to bury them with a mega laser, and Manic hits them with a rock. The Oracle appears and tells them their training is complete, they can do powers whenever, and yada yada. Sonic drags them away, and there's the Queen again. Robotnik couldn't have destroyed you. But your children didn't know that. And through their willingness to help others, they have gained their powers. And so it begins. Off, they may fuck. I've never seen an origin story that so did not deserve to exist. There's ruining your origin with bullshit that makes your story worse, but then there's this, three episodes of fucking nothing. As I mentioned before, and as my patrons and I frequently discussed while watching these, beginnings alone should have been the multi-part story arc. Everything you could have possibly wanted to know about the origins of these characters was ostensibly in that episode, minus a few key details like them learning about their mother and actually getting to know each other! Spread that one episode out and you could have covered it, plus much smoother pacing and more opportunities to live with 
with these characters as they grow up. Instead, this supposed origin story glosses over everything and wastes its time on irrelevant bullshit that matters neither to the plot of the show nor the characters themselves. Even the one thing I could have cared about, Manic's special place in the dynamic of this team, which I have pointed out before as being an important detail worth looking into, gets dropped like a road apple five minutes into this episode. I actually buy the triplets' relationship even less now. Hard F. And being generous, that brings the average rating of the entire arc to an F+. But I'm not feeling generous, so it's an F. In a way, these two three-parters say everything about the show. They are that dichotomy between the good ideas you can follow and the bad ideas that blow by so fast you forget about them the next episode. Some ideas make for interesting episodes that grab my attention and have some amazing moments. Manic fought a chaos tornado with drums and one, and some ideas are interesting if you care about continuity and world building, but are crammed together into one episode that just squanders their potential. They also drive home how the Edens brothers really seem to get this show and consistently write some of its better episodes, as long as racial caricatures aren't involved, and Hurst and Ali, who more than proved themselves on Sat AM, consistently write some of its worst. We're now in the final 10 episode stretch of the show's run, and they haven't written a single episode I liked. The highest I've ranked any of them is D+. They write the most to the rest of the show, and the Edens didn't write anything else. Shit. That said, I do want to emphasize that, as writers, there was only so much any of these people could do. They had very little time to put a script together, Two episodes a week, nobody was allowed serious creative direction, and me pointing out who wrote which episodes is more like an experiment. I wanted to see if any of these writers could smooth out this show's crappy foundation and make something good out of it, and a few of them have. The last thing I want to do is point fingers at any of these writers and blame them for underground shortcomings, especially since they could be rescues by Hurst and Ali. It's the same deal with the clunky animation. If the animators and directors were allowed more time and resources, it would would look better, significantly. If there's anything I've learned about animation and licensed products, especially Sonic, it's that failure starts at the top. This show sucks as an executive decision. And just the weird-ass episode ordering is proof of that. Weaving these two arcs together, swapping beginnings in Wedding Bell Blues, might as well mention that for the hundredth time. And of course, the very reason the show exists, the songs. Underground only exists to make money for Deke, and any good episode that comes out of that is a hard-earned victory for everyone involved. I will continue to be very critical of this show, but I wanted to make that clear. Aside from this shit, my fingers are pointed at Deke, not the staff. Writers, animators, directors, voice actors, you all deserved so much better than you were allowed. <sighs> but we've gotten this far. We reached the final ten episodes, the final quarter of the show's run, its last two weeks on air. I'm very tired. Let's get this over with. Episode 31, Country Crisis, was written by Laren Bright in one of two credits on the show. Sometimes there are problems, even among the freedom fighters, and Robotnik is always ready to exploit them. We open with the animation back to looking terrible as the triplets race down the streets of Robotropolis, their pupils as tiny as they could manage. And in three, two, one! Huh? Are you sure you activated those fuses? Ah! Hmm, I can't remember. Do you want me to go back and check? <laughs> yeah, you do that. They make a break as SWAT bots arrive and continue celebrating with each other. Are we good or are we good? Oh, we're good. Are your arms getting tired from all that congratulating? No. No, I never tired, no. Oh, no. Sonya notices that the pebbles they left in front of their hideout have been moved, so Sonic goes in prepared to fight. Manic's melee stance is apparently, I forgot I don't have a gun. In actuality, their mother has left them a note. She tells them about a feud in the valley between two groups of freedom fighters. They also have a big boy to deal with. It's up to the triplets to resolve the feud before Robotnik destroys the valley. They take a scenic drive to the farmland, where Manic appreciates the nature, which Sonya notes won't last if Robotnik gets his way. Or Sonic, we know this, Sonya. A big-ass cannon stops them as they reach the valley. The old guy thinks the triplets are more of Robotnik's goons, and yes, he sounds exactly like you think he does, but they clarify that they're the Sonic Underground, 
To prove that Sonic is the real deal, Old Man South Farmer pits him in a race against Jared, the fastest confused red panda in the valley. Sonic is of course a total showboat about it, waiting to kill some flowers first, told ya, and then finishes the race as Jared is running back. You're the real McCoy, all right. <laughs> Now that the deal is real, Jared offers to show them around, while Sleet and Dingo spy on them through a nearby robot. Sleet schemes to capture the hedgehogs and hold them ransom to Robotnik so they can make some cash off him. Considering Sleet so often just acts like a plain old kiss-ass to Robotnik, it's refreshing when he plots behind his back some more. Retire? Yes, retire. You can spend the rest of your life waiting on me hand and foot. Oh boy, wow, thanks! Jared tells the hedgehogs that the feud started all the way back when Queen Alina visited the valley. She left them and the mountain folk medallions to prove that the land belonged to them, but the mountain folks lost their medallion during a hoedown and blamed the valley folks. It will not shock you why they zoom in on the jar, don't hold your breath for the resolution. They arrive at the dam and see the big boy, who fires at a bird, so you know he's a jerk. Sonic awkwardly throws rocks to get his attention, and he just shoots them out of the sky. They'll need to talk to the mountain folk, and Jared reluctantly agrees to take them. Commercial. Jared points them to the mountains, then dips. It looks like someone is waiting for them, and Sonic goes to grab them. But it turns out to be a girl named Sarah. She seems to know what's going on and knows Jared personally, and she takes them to Granny. Old woman, South Farmer. How'd she know who we were? Good job asking yourself and not your brothers. They explain the situation to Granny, but she's fine with the dam if it means the valley folk all die horribly. Them valley folk stole our medallion. You'll lose a lot more if you don't join forces with the valley folk. What you mean? If you don't help us destroy the dam, this whole area will be underwater, including your place. Yeah, so. Well, I guess talking with them varmints couldn't hurt. But I ain't making up! The show can't not be incredibly ugly, can it? The old pair reluctantly agree to work together until the dam is destroyed, but then Granny sees Sarah and Jared hold hands, and the deal is off with guns out. Stop! Oh, this is Mondo uncool! Mondo? What in tarnation is Mondo? He means fighting's not the way to settle this. I do? Oh, yeah! I do! Sonya suggests settling their differences with music instead. This results in Sonic being forced to play for the mountain folk, and Sonya for the valley folk. Cue this episode's song, How You Play the Game. A weird take on a country rock or electric bluegrass, if that's even a thing. We worry too much about winning, and that's a shame. It's not who wins or loses, it's how we play the game. Working as a team, we've got so much on the ball. I know that we can surely beat them all. It's too cornball and self-amused to make the list, but it could have been so much worse. Luckily it works, and the two factions agree to work together. Well, maybe we can work together. Least ways long enough to stop this dam. Well, now that we have them working together, time to take out the big guy. You know the plan. When Sonic lures the Guardian bot away, we strike. Go, bro. Sonic gets his attention and gets shot in the ass, so the episode gets one extra point, and he leads the big guy far away from the dam. With the way cleared, the six remaining actual characters charge and take out the robots. The bots are kinda cute, it's sad. It's Manic's cue to drumroll the dam to pieces, but Sleet arrives to stop them. Commercial. It's at this point I realized the episode has just gone in one ear and out the other. Yes, I was watching it and it went in out my ears. I've been writing this script for too long. Wish we had a robot to fight them fellers with. That's an idea. If only I could get a message to Sonic! It won't be hard to find him. That's for sure. Jared volunteers to enter the fray, and despite being a thousandth as fast as Sonic, manages to catch up in time to relay the plan. They lead Big Boy back to the dam. Sleet and Dingo nearly shoot Sonia and Manic. Dingo drones Sonia again, and the Big Boy arrives to shoot them down. down. Hey, doesn't he know we're on his side? Does it look like he knows we're on his side? Sleet transforms Dingo into a glider, which is a stroke of genius, and their ship gets destroyed. This allows Manic to drumroll the dam and the big boy into oblivion, and he is having the time of his life. The dam goes down, and the water trips and short circuits the big boy, finishing the job. The old folks make up, the two factions have a party, and Granny calls over the hedgehogs. No points for guessing what happens. I want you to thank y'all for what you've done. And since y'all likes music so much... She ain't touched that thing since the feud started. 
I want you to have my music jug. Tarnation! What's in my jug? Hooch my possum. <gasps> the medallion! It was all her fault. She suddenly remembers putting the medallion in the jug in the first place, but Granny horny, so she forgot. Also, how old is Queen Alina that she gave those medallions when these two were still young? Mom's aging incredibly well. The two coots decide to pick up where they left off, and they give the medallions to the triplets. I'm thinking this ought to go to you youngins. You helped us save our homes and something even more important. Gee, Granny, I don't know. Granny's right. These are from your ma. You ought to have them. I... I don't know what to say. Hey, sis, look. This was last week. We age really fast. It's a map. Well, look at that. We're, we're also we're brother next. and sister. Cue the dancing, and the episode ends on an actually good gag. Wanna dance? Feel it. Maybe next time, sis. Huh? <laughs> ah. That episode was crap. This was another one that had potential, but it was let down by the almost apathetic animation. Hillbilly faction wars is not a new concept, but it works for this show because the triplets are going to have to resolve petty disputes like this when they're rulers. It just plays out really boring and predictable. The writing does a good job at staying focused on the task at hand, but the framing of the animation doesn't seem to care. This has never been a lovingly animated show, but this one's at friend or foe levels of cheap and ugly. Could have made it to a last resort level of good, but wasn't given the chance to be. D. Episode 32, Haircraft in Space, was written by Tracy Berna in her only credit on the show. Sometimes the struggle of a freedom fighter wears on the spirit. But as Sonya would soon learn, relaxing one's guard for even a second leaves room for unscrupulous attack. We are introduced to Dubot, a hairdresser robot who sounds like Harley Quinn and or Fran Drescher. Oh dear, now that is an emergency. Will you just get your frizzy little self down here? She gets to work on a rich lady when, in a rarity for this show, something interesting happens. That's so typical. I told her not to trust anybody but you. Really? What else did you tell her? That I think Dr. Robotnik is a ridiculous, conceited, Buffoon. You don't say. Okay, sweetie, that's it. You're done. Dubot slips into the back and Sleet and Dingo arrive. They follow her and manhandle her in a very uncomfortable scene, but it turns out it's to recover a tape from her. They swap it out with a blank, reactivate her, and she gets back to work none the wiser. Cut to the triplets celebrating another win over Robotnik while Sonya laments her unentertained vanity. Oh, Manic, would you keep it down? Sure. Man, everybody's a critic. Sonic left an open can of soda in the living room that Sonya poured all over herself, and she complains. Ah! She looks for her hair dryer, but Sonic is using it to heat up a chili dog that he then makes explode. Uh, is this gonna turn into that god-awful Antoine short? Sonic! It looks like she's about to blow as well, when she notices an ad for Dubot's parlor. Oh, I deserve this. I so deserve this. She sneaks to the parlor in true I'm secretly a celebrity fashion, and nearly runs into Bartleby. Keep walking, bitch. Dubot gets to work on her, and before long, she really gets to work on her. Just tell me all about it. Well, our last mission was just really hard, and the new rebel base is so cramped and dirty. Rebel base? Yeah. The command center is located right under Robotnik's backyard. We cut to Robotnik listening to one of her tapes, which just so happens to be Bartleby talking shit. Every time Robotnik says, excellent, I can hardly keep from laughing. I think it's the only superlative he knows. <laughs> Judging by the tone of his voice, he's not even hypnotized. Of course, Robotnik made the Dubot to keep surveillance on his wealthy allies, and if any of them dare to commit thought crimes, he'll have them roboticized. It's a more clever and covert scheme from him than usual, and probably quite effective considering all the nobles are vain dandies. Perhaps too effective. There's no way any of them respect him. He will run out of money. He orders Sleet and Dingo to grab her latest tape, which, as we saw, was just filled up by Sonya. It would be a pleasure, sir. Excellent. <clears throat> um, good. Sonya's just finished her spa day when they burst in and attempt to take Dubot. Guess what Dingo does? Sonya. 
I'm officially sick of this guy. Sonya just tries to run away, forgetting that she's literally super strong, but she sees Dingo and decides to actually do something. Dubot does the cool part, though. What did he want with you? Oh, I have no idea, sweetie. Emergency facial, perhaps? Sonya continues just getting the salon trashed, though this animation is amazing. <laughs> But Sleet gets in her way, and we fade to commercial like she has any reason to be afraid of this twit. This fight scene felt extremely obligatory. Why is that your only Haya move? Oh, yes, because she's got a gun. Sonya realizes the Dubot has escaped, so she pays a visit to no one's favorite Bartleby, where she sees that Sleet has set a public bounty on the bot's head. Buttlebutt has figured out that Dubot seems to encourage her customers to talk more about Robotnik, which Sonya subconsciously noticed herself. Sonya, people are disappearing, and I saw the Dubot today, and I dumped on Robotnik like mad. Bartleby's best line, easily. I'm sure he'll think I'm a traitor. Yeah. What did I say? Chili shampoo, massage. Mm. <gasps> oh no! Now it's her job to find that bot. And I guess save Bartleby. The scene transitions before she can finish her line. If Sonic and Manic find out what I gave away, they'll never forgive me for putting Freedom Fighters. And we cut to the brothers looking smug as all fuck at the rich getting killed. Sonya conspicuously leaves out what she did. The brothers aren't concerned though. I know those Arista butts are close friends of yours. But they're getting what they deserve, and gossip always comes back to bite you, just like the song says. What song? The one I'm making up, dude. Cue today's moral slash song. What a transition, Manic. You don't even sing this one. Don't be a backstabber, cause words can come back to bite ya. Don't be a bad rapper, cause nobody's gonna like ya. Wherever there's a will, we can find a way. Together we'll overcome and win, come what may. This is Don't Be a Backstabber, a very 80s midi pop thing about spreading rumors. But I think this is the point where Sam Vincent stops sounding awful by default. When it comes to your friends, mind your business. Sonya's mind doesn't change, so the boys will help anyway. Luckily, Dubot herself arrives tasked for protection. Oh, it's you! Thank goodness. It's so nice to be here, safe at last. They were chasing me, can you imagine that? And then I was wandering around the city when I thought I smelled a familiar cream rinse. The nose knows, you know? <laughs> Can you help me find out why they were chasing me, huh? <laughs> and then she sees the good character and instantly gets some of that. <laughs> Who is this huh? handsome young dog? I'm, a uh, Manic. What's your story? Morning Glory. I'm Sonya's brother, son of Queen Lena, uh -huh. separated at birth. Hey, what's with you, bro? Sorry, he gets dropped on his head a lot. She also tries this on Sonic, and all he says is he's fast and impatient. Even Sonic knows he's barely a character. Sonya puts a stop to it and checks Dubot, where she finds the tape recorder. Didn't know I had it in me. <laughs> Fuck it, I like her. Sonya can't get through the security bars, and sadly neither can Manic. Sonya decides to take Dubot to Bartleby for help, and the boys plot behind Sonya's back to return Dubot to Robotnik, unafraid of Bartleby getting roboticized. Hold up, what happened to Don't Be a Backstabber? I know they don't know that Sonya blabbed, and the songs were actually made before the episode scripts were even finished, but considering they just lectured to me musically, it's genuinely the biggest douchebag move Sonic has made in this whole show, and he only gets less likable from here to the finale. And they dragged Manic into it too- Oh, this episode just lost so many points. The triplets stop off at a gas station, and the boys enact their plot to betray their sister. Excellent. Um, very, very good. The Dubot is with the hedgehogs. Deploy more surveillance bots, then follow them! I want that bot! They make it to Bartleby's right as the SWAT bots arrive. Sonya puts up much more of a fight than her brothers, but one of them gets Dubot. I'll just let this next bit play out. Mission accomplished, my man. Oh, we're too late! Aw, too bad. They got the Dubot. Whoa. Not good. Look! You, my friend, have a date with Robotnik. No! No way, they can't be serious. Aw, oh, man, we should have never tipped them off. Whoops. You what? No, it's my fault. I should have leveled with you. 
There's more than gossip on that Dubots tape. When I was at the salon, I blabbed the location of the new secret base. No! What? It's okay, sis, but you should have told us. Well, I'm sorry, but what do we do now? Maybe we can address that you betrayed the resistance under hypnosis while your brothers betrayed you because Sonic is the worst part of his own show. Leave a comment saying what you think this episode's moral is because I don't think it knows. Luckily, all is forgiven, so they race off to save Bartleby and the bot. Bartleby. Don't worry, all. If there's one thing you can count on, it's... My Sonia. Sonia breaks out him and a few other nobles, while the boys break in before the mercs can deliver the tape. Yet another bizarrely slow action scene occurs, with it looking like the SWAT bots will get the upper hand. But Dubot gets her hands on Sleet's gun and saves the day. Oh! Just like using a blow dryer! <laughs> You've got the tape. Get out of here. We're not leaving you behind. Let's go. You, you're taking me with you? I, I, I'm speechless. Whoa, that's an opposite. They make their escape, and Sonic now likes Dubot because she, like him, uses guns. Sonya allows Bartleby to be the one who destroys the tape, but there's still the issue of Robotnik knowing what a goob everyone thinks he is. Sonya has a plan. Cut to Sleet finding the Dubot in the trash and bringing her right to Robotnik. You rebellious hunk of junk! What do you have to say for yourself? You will remember nothing about the tape you heard or anything that happened today. We will remember nothing. We will remember nothing. Sweet! <laughs> that would have been an enjoyable episode if Sonic didn't suck. I appreciate the light camp factor that Dubot brought to this show. There is being too camp or not camp enough for a Sonic property, and Fran Drescher hairdresser Hypnobot is right there with Formula One racing cops as just camp enough. It's on Sonic's level, and she's a fun character anyway. But man, what a mixed message. If the point of this episode was explicitly to say, don't be a backstabber, maybe don't immediately have your title hero stab his sister's back and face no real repercussions while she's the one who goes through the emotional torment. The entire moral of the episode seems to be centered around Sonya when she had resistance secrets forced out of her by hypnosis. It doesn't look like she had control over it, whereas Sonic happily betrays her so that people will get roboticized entirely with malice aforethought. This is like textbook broken Aesop. Sure, eat the rich, but Sonic's never exactly thought that very hard, seeing as so many of their allies have been the wealthy. It's only now, when it reflects on him the worst, that he's happy to sit back and let Robotnik have them. Easily the biggest dick move he's made on this show, and the first dick move Manic ever made. Don't touch my boy, he's a little shit angel. C minus. Episode 33, Healer, was written by Hurston Ali, who will write the grand majority of the remaining episodes. As the fight against Robotnik's tyranny continued, my children used their many skills and powers to further our cause. We open on the trio in disguise as a worker bot and a dumpster. Sonic and Sonia get trashed, and refreshingly, Sonia doesn't linger on it or complain about her hair. Who came up with this stupid janitor card idea? Uh, that would be you. Next time I come up with an idea like this, lock me up until it passes. Character growth? Probably not. I wouldn't blame her this time, though. Manic uses one of Cyrus's deactivation codes to sneak into where they can redirect Robotnik's supply ships to the Resistance. Then they hop right back into the trash. We cut to Bartleby, who has received a holographic cube. Oh goody, a holographic cube! It appears to be from Jesus. This guy has invented a de-roboticizer. And pride! And he gives a location for a live demonstration. That's significant. Not that, the de-roboticizer. Just like in Sat AM, Robotnik's tyranny is almost centralized around roboticizing the populace, and this one specifically uses it as a threat to keep people in line. A de-roboticizer is huge. The Freedom Fighters even tried building one in Sat AM Season 2, which ran into a few hiccups. In Sonic Underground, a cult leader built it. This is going to be regrettable. Astounding! Sleet and Dingo also show the message to Robotnik, who orders them to go to the demonstration and see what's going on. He also sends them to check out what he thinks is a malfunctioning janitor bot, but we know it's really the triplets. We cut to them getting ready to reprogram the last of the supply ships when the mercs arrive. Hey you! Hey you! I'll handle this. Meet you back in the main air vent. Yes sir! Shall we dance? Hey! 
Release me, you stupid hunk of metal! <laughs> These guys deserve a better show. Sonic and Sonya escape, and I want to play my live reaction to what happens next. <gasps> oh my gosh, Lady Windermere. She's back again? It's brief, but yes, the roboticized parent I care about the least gets trotted back out to remind us of the stakes. I'm gonna assume the implication is Sonic doesn't care about his parents. Manic passes off Sleet to Dingo for more dancing, which at least Dingo is up for. And he spins away in the robot before making his own escape. I love this fucking dork. The triplets reconvene at their hideout, where Babblebrook has left Sonya a message about the de-roboticizer. The days of the roboticizer are over! Ah. Sonya's hopeful that this means they can save Lady Windermere, but Sonic's skeptical. Skeptical? But Sonic's skeptical, so they go to meet the inventor himself at Blah Blah Blah's place, Titus. He is a blatant con artist. Oh yeah, that's what I call a scientist. Sonic Hedgehog, you behave yourself. Sorry. Very nice to meet you. Oh, your life force is strong. Oh, this ought to be good. Like, it's not even remotely hidden. If it wasn't a de-roboticizer, it'd be NFTs or anti-vaxxing. I just look at this guy and get no good feelings. And not just because he's unconscionably ugly. Everything about him says, I will kill someone someday. Sonic confronts Titus while Manic swipes stuff in full view of everyone. By this point, just let him rob Bartleby. What's the real harm in it? Sonic makes him put it back, and they leave for commercial. The crew sashay into Resistance headquarters, where Cyrus gives them something for their music performance. Cue this episode's song, We're the Sonic Underground, a riffy 80s rock song that I can't help but speculate was a rejected theme for the show, but it was too white bread. Come in, my friend, welcome to the party. But only if you're one of our kind. That's not very inclusive, Sonic. We're the Sonic Underground. I don't hate it, but only because it's too blandly shit to hate. After the song, Cyrus fills them in on the progress with the hijacked cargo ships. Every week, we'll redirect the ships into this building and unload a portion of the food and supplies. And if we're careful, Robotnik will never know we're plugged into his supply line. So from now on, dinner's on Robotnik. One thing, though. When the supply ships come through, we're gonna need a diversion. No problem, old Cy. Si. Diversion's my middle name. I thought your middle name was The. Cut to Sleet and Dingo, where Dingo says 80% of all of his dialogue at this point in the show. Sonya! Yeah, you thought I was joking. Trust me, it somehow gets worse. Sleet gives him a headset, then transforms him into a fly so they can spy on the demonstration. We cut to it, where Manic and Sonic are deathly bored, and, I can't believe I'm saying this, content warning, sexual assault on a scalp. Dingo flies into Sonya's hair and starts hugging it. I used to like this character, why are you doing this? Titus activates his machine, and a roboticized land octopus gets put inside. He is graced with the power of gay, and he is revealed to be cured. Can confirm, it works that way. Everyone looks both surprised and angry, and Octodad thanks Titus, who tells him, Go home to your family and spread the word. The triplets decide to get a closer look, with Dingo regrettably still in tow. Titus says he's worked too hard on this technology to just give it away. So just helping people doesn't do it for you, huh? Sonic, if this works, he deserves to make money. Go to hell! Sonya finally scratches Dingo out of her hair, and Titus reveals that he's made an enhancement to his machine that immunizes the user against roboticization. Sleet radios in Robotnik so he can hear it, and he orders the attack on the mansion. Call me silly, but the Freedom Fighters making their own de-roboticizer over the course of multiple episodes in Sat AM was a much more compelling story. Having shit cartoon Simpsons reject cult leader Jesus just invent one. And we all know it's a scam. It's like, this is so unbelievably boring. <laughs> the faces somehow get worse, and the triplets fight off the SWAT bots, while Titus does that to his machine. Call me crazy, Manic, but you might not be helping. They make their escape, and Robotnik yells at Sleep for losing them. But Dingo is still with them, just in Titus's hair this time. Still gross. In the hideout, Sonic is still dubious, and decides to investigate the inventor some more. Oh, man. I hate having to think. Explains a lot. Do what you gotta do, but Sonya's bought into this big time. I know, so don't tell her. Yeah, because that's worked so well for you. Sonic incredibly suspiciously offers to give Bartleby a ride back to his mansion, and Sonya asks to be immunized so she can more easily save Lady Windermere. She leaves to get some money and allow Titus time to prepare the machine, and this reveal will not surprise you. <laughs> 
a fool in their money. Well, better make the adjustments. He nearly kills Dingo, but he transforms back to normal right as Slate arrives to arrest him. Hello, there's someone who wants to meet you. Cut to Sonic doing his investigating. Cockroach bro? And then to Robotnik interrogating Titus. Just as I told you, I'm sorry, I'll never- Nothing to apologize for, my friend. Here it is, sir. For friend Oh, yes. And you'll remain my friend, if you cooperate. I'll do anything. Good, because I think your immunizer would make a marvelous roboticizer, don't you? <laughs> Cut to Sonic catching up with Octoman, where he also learns that the whole thing is a hoax. Titus then calls in at that moment and explains his situation. Ran into a little problem. Robotnik grabbed me. What? It's okay. I made a deal. He's gonna let me off if I roboticize one of the hedgehogs. As soon as it's done, I'm gone. Hey, wait a minute. Fleecing the aristocrats for cash is one thing, but- Just meet me in Tyran, like we planned. If anything happens to my family, I'll find you. Do take note of Titus's attitude here. It will be important later. Not much later, there's only a few minutes left, and the show is yet again careening to its ending too fast. Sonya and Manic head back to Titus's hideout, with her ready and determined, but they just miss a call from Cyrus. Robotnik and his forces stand by, ready to capture them once Sonya is roboticized. Once she's in the machine and starts feeling the effects, Mr. <laughs> A fool in their money. It's okay. I made a deal. As soon as it's done, I'm gone. Gets an out of nowhere attack of conscience, pushes her out of the machine, and gets roboticized himself. Of course, that's how it was going to go. This show is shit with tension. There's only two minutes left, and Hurst and Ollie's episodes can't earn a resolution to save their lives. Sonic arrives at that moment, Titus turns into a wheelie bot, and they begin attacking the SWAT bots outside. Interestingly, Manic does his new rock launch attack now that Hurst and Ollie actually came up with the idea. I guess those ships were air elementals. Sonic and Sonya do a kind of rad super tornado thing. Thing. And then Titus just grabs Manic, Sonya kicks him away, and they make their escape. The next morning, Sonya apologizes for being so hasty. Hey, we all go off sometimes. Heck, Sonic lives there. And then Cyrus calls in to congratulate them on a diversion well done. How'd you know? <laughs> Are you kidding? It was a great diversion. We emptied the cargo ships without a hitch. Oh yeah, the diversion for the cargo ships. <laughs> <laughs> That sucked. This episode doesn't start out feeling like it'll be one of the absolute worst of the show. It's more of a creeping dread the longer it goes on until anything good has been chewed away like Sonya's scalp by Dingo. You would think Uncanny Valley Baby would be the worst character design on the show, but Titus makes my skin crawl every time he's on screen. And his whole bit is generic and boring, and his comeuppance is so unearned that he sinks the whole episode on his own. There is a good setup in there somewhere, not just with the potential of a de-roboticized are in a better plot, but with how the episode sets up Sonya seeing Lady Windermere and wanting to find a way to save her, which makes her so susceptible to the con. Teaching kids to be wary of hucksters preying on their wants and needs is a good lesson. Note that Titus says his homeopathy lamp can immunize you, I see what you're doing. It even folds in the B-plot about the transport ships in a way that, for once, doesn't feel like it's fighting for attention. But how it plays out makes the whole idea sink like a rock, and one of the biggest fumblings of tension in the whole show. I could damn this episode entirely on what it's not, but I'd rather not. It's awful enough on its own. But it is striking how a de-roboticizer was so important in Sat AM as to be an ongoing goal of the Freedom Fighters in Season 2, whereas in Underground, where roboticization is even more prevalent because of its use as a threat to maintain obedience, it's a generic one-off story about a con artist. It is treated as so unimportant that it highlights how much the triplets' search for their mother undermines the show. Finding her is both the last thing the show ever wants to advance, and the only long-term goal the triplets seem to have. Any other ideas for fighting Robotnik comes from outside them, usually Cyrus. Maybe it would have been a thing in a hypothetical season 2, like Sat AM, but they already did a direct revisit of one of that show's old ideas. I don't think it mattered. Hard F. Easily one of the worst episodes. It's sad because, uh, along with the episodes, I ripped the special features for the Sat AM DVDs, and there's an extended interview with Ben Hurst, and he talked about 
what such a positive and enthusiastic work environment it was working and leading editing story editing and writing on sat am where you could tell there was so much love put into that show and he, when he talks later about how he was just was not happy with sonic underground i can really feel it watching his episodes especially his and ali's their episodes feel like a struggle oh ho, ho. breathe slowly and deeply my viewers we've only begun the struggle Episode 34, Sonia's Choice, was also written by Hurst and Ali. Perhaps the worst things in a freedom fighter's life are the choices that must be made. Softballing this one too, huh? We open in the city of Anais, which has some of the most wild background character designs of this whole show, including Lightning Rod Chicken and the Dog Woman that is Africa. I think these are supposed to be more aristocrats, and you could have fun with making them look ridiculous a la The Hunger Games, but everyone looks ridiculous because this show is so ugly. Robotnik appears with Sleet and Dingo in tow. He reveals that he has a plan to bring the hedgehogs to Anais, where he will get rid of them for good. How can you be sure the hedgehogs aren't here already? because I'm keeping them very busy. We cut to the triplets mid-fight with one of Robotnik's pods, and judging by all the mud and crud, it's doing a number on them. <laughs> we get a solid minute of them dodging gunfire and falling trees, which does a good job of establishing the threat of these ships. This will come back later. But then we're back to Anais and Robotnik's personal art museum. This painting is magic. I want a print of it. Robotnik locks up the vault he intends to use as the trap with steel doors and lasers. Then Dingo gets transformed into a test dummy to get shot at by the security system. Now comes the fun part. I can hardly wait, sir. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> Yikes! I can't tell if these are real lion lizards or robots, but they fuck him up regardless, and the trap is set. We cut back to the triplets dodging more falling trees, when they realize they have literal laser guns as instruments. Sonic and Sonya fire at the ship, while Manic drums up a dirt tidal wave that buries it. Damn, I want Manic to just get increasingly improbable uses of his powers. This is glorious. Unfortunately, it's not enough as the pod breaks free. However, Manic is able to use one of his symbols as a mirror shield and reflect its gunfire back at it to take it down. Hell yes, that is brilliantly stupid. More of this, please. What if Robotnik has more of these things? He does! Trevor! Good old Trevor actually returns. These last several episodes are actually pretty good about bringing back side characters and having them do things. Probably because they're written by Hurst and Ali. But it's nice to see. Trevor and his new friend Rene, leader of the Anais Resistance, have found the factory where Robotnik is building these new super ships. But more than that, Rene has discovered that Robotnik possesses the four royal goblets of the Hedgehog Dynasty and plans to auction them off. Because stopping Robotnik will forever come second to their blood relatives. Dick knows of destiny said so. Ready? Yes, it's the bait the hedgehogs can't resist. But sir, suppose they get through all the traps we've set. Oh, I hope they do. Then they can find the other little surprise I have for them. <laughs> So what do you think will be Sonya's choice? Stopping the factory versus saving her mom's wine glass? Having to choose one over-designed, overpriced goblet over the other? Oh, prepare yourselves. This first third makes the whole episode look way better than it is. How dare Robotnik sell off our family treasures? Sonya, you're still dirty and not complaining. I'm proud of you. He was going to display them in his museum. No, Biggie. We'll get him back. Besides, we got a master thief on our team. Oh, you want him to steal now, huh, Sonic? You're going to need one. His museum has incredible security. I thought Anna's was just a rich and shameless resort. It is, and it's beautiful and very fashionable. I hope your whole wardrobe catches fire. Which means we've got a serious appearance problem. Oh, Manic, we have an appearance problem. Sonic, we have to fit in. So what do you want us to do, dress in berets and little smocks? Bummer may Horace. We look stupid. <laughs> okay, that's great. I like that. Also, Manic actually looks cute. Interesting. So far, so good. Looks like our cover's working. Let's move on. Out of here. Sonic, you go speeding around, you'll blow our cover. 
Double bummer me, Horace. As this episode goes on, I get really tired of the empty quipping that's all over this script. Some characters have their shtick. Sonic feels like his tedious catchphrases are 80% of all his dialogue now. They sneak into the museum, with a camera hidden in Sonya's palette to look for traps. Back at the hideout, they're able to tell that the whole room is a death trap, especially the vault with the goblets. Renee thinks they should cancel, but Sonic doesn't back down. They sneak back in after hours, taking advantage of Sonic's anti-gravity sneakers. Remember those from the Haunted Castle? Here's the only other time he uses them. They make it right above the vault, where Sonic pops a rope dildo onto the ceiling for them to climb down, and Sonya temporarily deactivates the force field so Manic can do his thing. Meanwhile, Sonic does his thing of being a dick. Think those are Butniks, kids? They're ugly enough. Uh, Sonic, you wanna keep your mind on what we're doing, please? All right, all right. Sorry, guy. Didn't mean to insult you. Uh-oh. Hope it's not beam time. Luckily, Manic breaks in just in time and recovers the goblet, plus stealing a giant rupee for himself. Attaboy. Before Sonic can get his butt bitten off again. A bit of quick thinking, and the lizard gets trapped in the vault itself. But once again, thanks to Sonic, the traps get triggered regardless. Three of those super pods fly in, killing the second lizard to show just how dangerous they are. And Manic easily saves the day again, first by reflecting the lasers, then destroying the wall so they can escape. Hey, bro. Nice work. We're not out of here yet! We need a shortcut. <laughs> it looks like the mission was a success, so the triplets split up to meet back at the rendezvous point. I'm so sorry, sir. They got away, and now- It's not a problem, Sleet. You see, they fell for my trap! Uh, I don't understand. Oh, that's ingenious, sir. They can run, but they can't hide! We fade to commercial as Manic gets tracked and captured. We return to see that Sonic and Sonya have escaped, albeit in ways where they could still be found. Reblo 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 Robotnik deploys some mega muck into the sewer. It's a semi-recurring thing in the Deke cartoons, which slows Sonic down so that he too gets captured. Swatbots also find Sonya and Renee on a boat, but they're able to jump into the river and swim five yards away and sit on the bank for a whole minute, so of course the Swatbots lose them. Trevor calls in and says that they've taken out the factory, everything exciting in this show happens off screen, and that they've taken control of one of the pods. We could sure use that pod. It might help us get out of here. You got it. Good luck. Better get moving. Hmm. I wonder how the guys did. Huh? Hmm. Not a bad night's work if I say so myself. Too bad we couldn't make it a clean sweep. Ah, Sleet. You just have to know the right recipe for success. Sonya and Renee can't seem to find the boys, but Robotnik makes an announcement to tell them exactly where they are. Attention, citizens of Anais! Oh, let's abandon pretense. Attention, Princess Sonya! This can't be good. Robotnik has set Manic and Sonic on opposite sides of the city, each underneath a portable roboticizer, and only a short amount of time before they're transformed. This is Sonya's choice, a classic sadistic choice, which is a tried and true way to show either a character's priorities or their cunning in being able to save both. Considering Sonya is supposed to be the photographic memory genius of the group, this should be interesting. Oh, what do I do? I have four minutes left. Oh. Three minutes left. Cue this episode's song at just the worst time, Never Easy, a soft rock piano ballad that would have been bland in 1989. There's no easy choices, never clear cut. Oh, why tell me why is it never easy for us? It's Sonya lamenting the struggle she and her brothers go through all the time, which still rings pretty hollow coming from the spoiled rich kid, but it's at least only framed in the context of wanting to save her brothers. Could be worse, if only because the middle of the road has so much real estate on both ends. Anyway, she's going to save both of them. Robotnik actually correctly predicts that she will go to Sonic, but Renee then shuts down the city's power, allowing Sonya to take down the force field. However, backup generators kick in, so the two waste their time taking out a couple SWAT bots before Sonic finally uses his super speed to go help Manic. Renee tries to help Manic the same way, but it doesn't work, and she gets dragged away by a SWAT bot. Luckily, a mysterious hijacked pod flies in to save the day, taking out the SWAT bots and the roboticizer ship. How is that still floating? That's our color. Yes, indeed it is. I'm getting out of here. What? 
Fuck right off! Future screenwriters, take note. This is not how you play with expectations. You don't just give deadbeat mom of the year Trevor's payoff for destroying the factory. Anyway, the triplets drink out of their blood diamond cups and toast their mother that they've only met twice for a total of 20 seconds for once again showing up and winning the episode for them. And a special toast to mother. And here's to the day when we can all toast to freedom, together. Man, didn't that start out seeming like it would be a good episode? This is a lot like Artifact, which dropped the ball on a really good setup in its third act, whereas this one punted its setup into a river and proceeded to squeeze out just a nothing burger with rancid relish. Sonya being forced to make an important choice is such a basic idea that could really go anywhere, but this is such a consequent free choice. Which brother do I save is not given much time or weight, and it functions entirely on both brothers holding the useless ball and forgetting the absurd of their respective powers. Also, you choose Manic because Sonic is the worst, but family whatever. Thing is, there was already a much more meaningful choice dropped into the viewer's face right at the start, destroying the pod factory versus recovering the goblets. So much of Sonya's character is her vanity and grip on her wealthy aristocrat upbringing. Making her choose between stopping Robotnik and recovering royal family jewels would be so much more meaningful and indicative of her priorities after living so long as a freedom fighter. But that would require showing some real action, and the show was made on peanuts. Ignore that the answer would still be the goblets, because the show is both slavishly monarchist and thinks that only blood relatives matter. Regardless, this titular choice and resolution is rushed so hard that it takes the entire rest of the episode down with it. And the second Queen Alina appeared in that cockpit instead of Trevor, which would have been a real payoff, it sank to the bottom for good. Another hard F. But strap in. We're not done in the nadir of the underground. I think after Sonya's choice specifically, I was done giving this show chances. I was done hoping there would be more and more to this show that I could look forward to. Because they, they have officially no one cares anymore. The creatives behind this who had to just hurry to make a 40 episode show and squander all the potential it had me watching nobody cares anymore Episode 35, The Big Melt, was written by Len Jansen in his final credit on the show. We have another rare cold open without Queen Alina, instead with a set of Arctic freedom fighters spying on Sleet and Dingo. Sleet and Dingo. Hi. They're up to something and you can bet it's gonna be bad. For them to come this far, it's worse than bad. We gotta get word to the others. My children had few chances to simply enjoy themselves. So when the opportunity arose, they took full advantage. We zoom in on Sonic playing his one stock riff and enjoying the beachside shade. They then jump immediately into this episode's song, Fun in the Sun. If you expect a really rote Beach Boys homage, I have good news for you. Hey! And we're gonna have fun in the sun. Good points, though. For once, the video's gloriously ridiculous instead of unwatchable. The bad guys do this at the start. That's pretty funny. As an homage, it's serviceable, if only because they're sticking to the very middlest of the road. And Tylee Ross shows off his falsetto again, going full Brian Wilson. Tylee Ross still doing more than he needs to. So, podcast recommendation. The Beach Boys episode of Jukebox Zeros. That would be a song that would be on that album. With that mercifully done early, we get a regrettable shot of Sonic's feet. Manic does some surfing with his hoverboard. <laughs> and Sonya rides up on her bike in a panic. Oh, sis, slow down. All that movement is disturbing my cosmic tranquility. Whoa! That could shatter a coconut! Robotnik and his goons have been spotted around the ice caps, so it looks like their vacation is over before it even started. Ah! I knew this was too good to last! I knew it, knew it, knew it, knew it, knew it! Yeah, we just started our vacation this morning. I don't even have a tan yet. Oh, what are you guys? Freedom fighters or whips? 
Whoops. Feels like you mixed up the veteran freedom fighter and spoiled brat there, Len. We cut to the baddies, where Robotnik reveals his plan to melt the ice caps and cover Mobius in water. Reminds me of how Sad AM was incredibly subtle with its environmental message. Here, we are officially Captain Planet. In 48 hours, all of Mobius will be underwater. It's going to drive Sonic right out of his little rodent mind. <laughs> Won't that be fun? A submarine steam heater of some kind is activated, and the ice rapidly melts. The heroes arrive, and Sonic complains about his goosebumps multiple times, while Sonya notes that it's much warmer than it's supposed to be this time of year. Sonic, stop whining! I am really sick of it! What would Robotnik be doing in this freezer? Doesn't make sense! Well, maybe he wants, like, to melt the ice caps or something. Manic continues to have the one brain cell. They split up to investigate where Robotnik was last seen. Manic finds a steam vent and is really impressed by it. Steam! And the iceberg splits around them, separating them from Sonya, who falls into the crack as we fade to commercial. At this point, I said out loud, I think this is gonna be another shit one. We come back to Sonya safe on a disc of ice, which is at least a cool visual. Sonya! 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 Oh man, Titanic time! Stop, don't come back. The boys careen into another iceberg and barely hold on as they plummet down a waterfall. The art turns into pure speed lines at this point. I'm not used to the show changing art style intentionally. Sonya calls out to her brothers, but she gets swept away by a huge tidal wave and flung the completely opposite direction. A kind of cool moment happens where she snowboards on her block of ice and lasers herself a tunnel. Shit is just sort of happening without rhyme or reason, but it's action-packed shit for once, so I'll take it. She then slides down into a strange ice civilization, where she hears voices coming from directly underneath her. Enter Jeff, Marty, and Moe, aka the goddamn worst. I think they're a Three Stooges parody, and it sure is never charming. The screechy guy alone is too much for me to deal with. Just like you, Rodimus. I know you're watching! Fellas, we got company! Hey, you can come out now, little lady! I am not a little lady. My name is Your, Your Majesty. Majesty. Huh? We cut back to the boys, finally at the end of their log ride, where they run into a Yeti. <laughs> Yeti, my main monster. What's up, big guy? Uh oh. Back to Sonya. She tries to explain that she is not the Penguin's queen, Sauna, in part because she's a hedgehog. Turns out, so was Queen Sauna. The Penguin prophecy says that one day, our long-departed queen would return and bring a time of warmth and happiness to the frozen north. And since you've arrived, our weather has turned quite balmy, so you'll never convince us you're not Queen Sauna. They have a big ice statue of the Queen that does indeed look exactly like Sonya, but their prophecy doesn't say anything about her having brothers, and the camera zooms in on her like this will have any repercussions. Back with the boys, they're paddling their way along the water when Robotnik's sub accidentally picks them up and takes them to the hideout. <laughs> Gesundheit, sir. I didn't sneeze. Don't look at me. Well, someone sneezed. Come out, whoever you are. Surprise! We return from commercial to Sonya enjoying being pampered and dressed up like the queen, but she snaps out of it in time for Sneezy to call her for help. The city is also starting to melt, starting with Queen Sauna's head. Are you doing this because you're mad at us, or...? I'm not responsible for this. But you're the queen. You have to stop it. You're right. I do have to stop it. But I can't do it alone. I need my brothers. Cut back to the boys who are surrounded by baddies. Sonic grabs Manic and does a super spin. At first, it looks like they gave Manic the power to do this out of nowhere, but I like to think Sonic is just using him as a flail. Anyway, back to Sonya, who rides in I don't know what that is, with the three stools out to a location far away from anyone. With the coast clear, she starts playing her keyboard to call to her brothers, who are just able to hear her and start running in her direction. Cut back to Robotnik, berating the mercs and ordering the hedgehogs caught. Quiet! I want those rodents caught and hung out and dry. Is that clear? Yes, sir. If you fail, you will rue the miserable day you were born. What's rude?
This episode got so tedious so fast. Cut back to Sonya playing her one stock keyboard riff as the boys arrive. They all hug, babble, and slap, and the penguins realize she really isn't their queen. But duty calls, and they go sliding crotch first into the camera, I mean down into a cave, where Sonic thinks he's found the heater. While I was watching this with my patrons, one literally asked at this moment how much longer we had to go. Of course, Sonic was off and gets blasted with water, and we get one cute visual gag of his many other attempts, until they finally find the right one. The whole factory is lined with laser guns, and Sonic uses them to destroy everything inside. They set explosives around the factory, Let's signal Sonic and bail! And Sonic warns Sleet and Dingo that the place is about to blow. They haul ass out of there on the submarine, we get a visual of the timer as it counts down, and we get the cheapest visual of an explosion they could afford. You know, if this episode just wants to wrap up too, I won't blame it. The episode ends with the triplets and penguins enjoying their vacation at last. Show please stop in a hot spring formed by the heater factory. I've had all the water I need on this trip. I wouldn't be too sure about that. What do you mean? Cannonball! Oh! So speaking of nothing burger episodes, what a simultaneously boring and annoying waste of time, to the point that there's very little detail I can go into. It's fun to have some kind of peril at last, pointless as it is, but the key to this episode is how much you love tedious Three Stooges impressions because there's not a lot else. A third hard F in a row, and also in the bottom 10 of worst episodes. And no, we're not out of this pit yet. Episode 36, Sleepers, was written by Hurston Ali, who despite having it very rough so far, can get rougher. Robotnik's reach was wild, but with so many operations, it also made him vulnerable in the most distant areas. Or so my children thought. We open with a pair of anonymous freedom fighters attempting to take out one of Robotnik's power plants when they're quickly caught. We see the triplets with Sonic impatiently waiting for the plant to blow when Manic notices that nothing has happened. Yes, this is almost exactly the same setup as the Sad AM episode, Blast to the Past Part 1. Don't get hopeful, this is not another winner fakes all. They're then spotted by the SWAT bots. Quack, quack. Manic, you dipshit, I love you so much. Sonya tornadoes the ship into the ground, and they bail as reinforcements arrive. I can't figure why they just left us hanging. Chill, Sonic. Let's hear what they have to say. I'm afraid they won't have much to say. Huh? They were captured. Sonic is sad, remember that for later, and Cyrus says that the two nobodies are going to be roboticized that day, but Sonic runs off to save them. <gasps> I hate it when he does that! Wait, there's more! Something very strange is going on. Two more Freedom Fighters disappeared this morning. Disappeared? <gasps> How, Cyrus? We don't know. We cut to Sonic in a rage as he blasts around Robotnik's base and obliterates some SWAT bots. He must really love those two guys who are named once and I immediately forgot. I think one of them was named Cat. The little blue fiend is in a hurry. Perhaps he wants to see his friends. Let's oblige him, shall we? Open all entrances! Gary Chalk's voice is extra deep this episode. Maybe he had laryngitis. Sonic can see the trap a mile away, but he runs in anyway because he's a dipshit I don't love, and Robotnik shows him the roboticized freedom fighters. He then backs up onto a trap door and falls into a special room where he's shot at constantly. Instead of heir to the throne, you're going to become the air that we breathe! <laughs> Yeah, yeah, whatever, round boy. Sonic gets out immediately because I made the mistake of giving the entire rest of the show a chance when I should have stopped after Chaos Emerald Crisis. I blame myself, let's move on. Sonic returns to base with no more answers than before. And Cyrus still needs a diversion before they can hit the supply ships at night. Thanks for reminding me Healer happened. Okay, once I stir up the hornet's nest, I'll lead them into the street and you guys pick them up. Let's rip it! Manic is the only thing keeping me here, y'all. He is a bundle of positive energy. The hedgehogs split up and distract different sets of SWAT bots and commercial. Return to Sonic being shot at and taunting the bot. Sonya slides under a ship in a maneuver that would be cool if it didn't play out so slowly. Her bike gets wrecked and she's surrounded. Sonic makes it back before his siblings and goes to find them, just barely missing a strange orange missile that tries to spray him with gas. No, it's not Dingo for once. That would be gross. Manic is okay, but Sonya gets girled again. Bummer me, Horace. And they blast off to save her while Robotnik readies the roboticizer. Manic breaks into the ship so Sonic can beat up the robots. 
and Sonya is free. <sighs> At least the ship crashes into the docking bay. Not that we see it. Later, Robotnik celebrates all of the captured freedom fighters, and we learn what that strange orange missile was. It's a sleeper. Interestingly, a name shared with Cyrus's invention from several episodes ago. Possibly no relation. These are powered by a mineral called Tritarium, which the Sonic Wiki thought was spelled Tritranium, and I'm really glad it's not. That can be easily compressed into long-lasting fuel. However, their supply is nearly out, and they need to dig up more from the mines. Robotnik decides to oversee the mining operation himself. I'm gonna let this next scene play out. No one heard or saw anything. They just disappeared. I've got a plan. We can use this transceiver. Boring. How about a plan that involves chili dogs? Sonic officially no longer cares about the Lost Freedom Fighters. I hate this little bitch. Anyway, chili dogs. He and Manic hit a bunch of stands where Sonic is having a great time because he's a one-note sociopath. What if it's a trap? There hasn't been a trap made that can hold me. Be right back. He's getting cocky again. Manic is then, of course, sprayed by a sleeper, and another cylindrical ship captures him like a coffin. At least Sonic notices and stops it, sending a signal to Sonya and Cyrus. We fade to commercial as he's about to get shot with a missile! Nope, it's just another sleeper, damn it. The others chase after Manic while Sonic grabs the sleeper, but it takes off with him. Let go, Cyrus. What about Manic? He's dead to us, Cyrus. Leave him. She manages to cut the coffin without splitting him in half. You got very lucky there, girl. And Sonic finally stops the sleeper, only to get gassed himself, just like I hoped would happen. Two doggies with the works, pal. The boys wake up, and Cyrus figures out what's up with the sleeper while the boys yawn loudly. Luckily, Tritarium can only be found in one place, so off they go to take out Robotnik's mining operation. Cyrus breaks inside with a hacking device, earning him Manic's respect, which actually means something in this world, and they find Cyrus's roboticized father, Lionel, who we first heard about all the way back in Tangled Webs. He finally makes a real appearance. The triplets blast him with their medallions to temporarily restore his mind, which we haven't seen them do since Argus. Back in episode two, I don't think you needed to sit on that one. What? Uh, Cyrus? Son! Go to hell. With his help and a key card with complete access to the mine, they prepare to destroy the place. I like that Lionel, like Uncle Chuck back in Sat AM, is immediately down with destruction once he gets his mind back. Real freedom fighters, those old boys. Cue this episode's song, Have It All Again, a beachy bubblegum rock number. Someday we'll have it all again. Not quite Beach Boys like last time, but definitely something I could hear piped over a boardwalk in the 80s. Also, the hedgehogs look like they're gonna kick someone's shit in, and it's hilarious. The song itself isn't great. I'd take a bit of Buddy Holly over this easily, but it's decent enough to make the list. I did it! There will never be another song on this list again. Savor it. With two more minutes left before Lionel reverts, it's time to leave. Sonic quickly takes the key card, and Cyrus leaves with a tragic hug. Sonic uses the card to stop some SWAT bots and slip into Robotnik's ship. Sleet shows off some of the tri-tip they dug up, but then Sonic. Enough triterium to fuel a thousand sleepers, sir. Too huh? bad you won't be able to use it. <laughs> What's going on? Just some house cleaning. My sister Sonya thought you had too much Triterium. Sonic grabs Sleet's nugget and escapes, and once again, the cool thing happens off screen. But at least Manic gets to blast beat the mind to oblivion. <laughs> yep, you just gotta love that. Yep, gotta love an episode resolving itself in one minute. That was awful. This feels like the definitive Hurston Ali Sonic Underground episode. All of the problems that seem to rise to the forefront with them specifically are firmly on display here. It actually gets worse on rewatch, and it's easily the new second worst episode of the whole show. The fourth hard F in a row. But thankfully, the final F of the run. This last stretch has been draining, but we're finally out of this pit. The last four episodes are nowhere near this bad. And you'll never guess who pulls us out. Episode 37, Bartleby the Prisoner, written by Eleanor Burry and Moore and Terrence Taylor and their only credits on the show. I'm full of undeserved hope. At the very least, that something will happen. Because I've been saying this whole time, Bartleby just seems to be towing the line between actually helping the Freedom Fighters and helping Robotnik. And whatever happens here, I feel like if I'm right, he might actually be forced to pick a side. 
While my children fought for our cause, others lived in comfort, but they would quickly discover that no one was safe from Robotnik's evil grasp. We open on Bartleby's estate as he vocally celebrates his wealth. Rosebud Tea, one of the many pleasures of being a wealthy aristocrat. Who on Mobius could it be at this hour? Oh, drat, I'll have to get it myself. Who else but a SWAT bot arrives to arrest him for being a rebel, and he's dragged away to face the court. We cut to some pretty nice background art as the triplets find the location of Robotnik's ruby mine. Yeah, this is Robotnik's ruby mine, and I'm a SWAT bot's granny. As I have tried over and over to explain, not everything is what it appears to be. It should be right about... Is she good or what? Been a while since you appreciated your siblings, Sonic. These rubies are apparently extra useful for Robotnik in weaponry, so Manic sets a rope and down they go to suss the place out. We've got to map out the mine. To establish its perimeters. Inventory its mining equipment. Analyze the strength of its defenses. And check the quantity and size of the rubies. All done. What's for dinner? Okay, that's cute. Sonia realizes that these are ultra-high-grade rubies, the kind used for lasers. Manic doesn't see what's uniquely dangerous about that, so they take a sample back to Cyrus, making a rare appearance in an episode not written by Hurston Ali. With the ruby, he's able to melt right through solid titanium. Cyrus has a solution in the form of a laser driller they can use. Got anything in blue to match my skin? Skin? The triplets dick around with the machine while Cyrus tries to explain how to use it, but after a bit they get the hang of it, dodge a dinosaur skeleton, and make their way back to the mine. We cut to Robotropolis, where Bartleby gets dragged into court, with Sleet serving as prosecutor and Robotnik as judge. This is outrageous! I'm a nobleman, a supporter of you, your empire! How do you plead? I donate money to your causes. I entertain you in my home. And your plea? Don't I even get an attorney? Your attorney. Now then, how do you plead? We return to the triplets in the mine, who at this point are still unaware that anything is even happening with Bartleby. While her brothers dick around making chili dogs, Sonya lays out her plan to take out the mining stations and nab one of the rubies to enhance her keyboard gun to destroy the rest. We use the ruby to amplify my laser power to knock out the rest of the ships. Or as she says laser powers, honey, it's a gun. I know it's from your magic necklace, but it's a gun. How you coming with that chili, bro? Needs a touch more heat. Yeah, that should do it. Oops, so sorry. That's okay, Trevor. Finally, Sonya learns about Bartleby's trial over a TV as Slate gives his opening arguments. Get on with it, you fool! Oh, yes, sir. So anyway, when, um, if we find him guilty, you know what to do. He says he's innocent. But if he lies, you must roboticize! If he fits, he sits! Wait, we return from commercial to Dingo's opening arguments. My client is innocent, even though he looks like a guilty traitor to me. With a defense like Dingo, who needs a prosecutor? Sonya slips away to Bartleby's cell so she can talk to him directly. What is to become of me? You have a visitor? A visitor? Who? It's your Aunt Sophie! But I don't have. I'll be. Sonia, what are you doing here? Robotnik's guards. Never mind them. We have to get you out of here. No, go quickly. I can't let you be captured because of me. And I can't see you condemned for something you didn't do, even if it was something you should have been doing. Sonia, can you honestly say you're happier in the resistance? I'm happy that I'm making my life count for something. But I'm here to help you. This is an honestly really nice exchange between these two, and exactly what I wanted from Bartleby, him being forced to face his fence sitting. And this feels like the right context for Sonya to finally get through to him, when it looks like he can't fall back on his wealth anymore. We then see that Robotnik and Slingo are listening in. Turns out Bartleby isn't guilty of anything. This trial is only a trap for Sonya and her brothers, and the next time she turns up to save him, Robotnik will grab all three. On the plus side, Dingo keeps running into walls,
That's kind of funny. Back at the mine, Manic and Trevor check the drill, and Sonic returns after being unable to find Sonya, but she's not far behind him. She doesn't tell them where she was, not that Sonic hasn't already guessed, and they hop in the drill to begin the operation. Cut back to Bartleby and Dingo entering the court. I do hope you do a better job in court today. Ah, uh, no worries. You're getting off anyway. I beg your pardon, but I'm on trial. Duh, yeah. Thought you don't know this is all a trap for Sonya and her brothers. Huh? So that's it. Sonia! Sonia? That's it! I know how to save Sonia. Yeah, but what about my cabin? I like that bit. But I don't like this twist. Bartleby has helped the resistance a few times, usually as a favor to Sonia, and that alone should put him on the actual chopping block. I really like him starting to realize that he maybe should join them for real, but by having everything he's done be irrelevant to Robotnik's plan, it takes away the need for him to make that choice. He's not facing any real consequences, nor is he facing any harsh realities about the system he benefits from, except that Robotnik is an unpredictable tyrant who wants to capture his ex fiance which is not news to anyone. If it feels like I'm jumping the gun and that this will maybe come together near the end, Oh, honey, you're not ready. Back to the mines where the heroes are being pursued and attacked by security. Trevor even gets to take out a ship in his big paper plane. Meanwhile, Sonic is watching the trial on the mining helmet. It makes sense in context. And he hands it to Sonya so she can watch Bartleby plead guilty. As disappointed as I am where this episode is going with the trial, that's a cool moment. You did a cool thing, Scuttlebutt. They need to hurry up, so Manic blasts three ships with one laser. I think because the rest just got flung up balance. Either way, Manic still rules. They celebrate, but there are reinforcements on the way, one of which takes out Trevor's ship. We've lost Trevor! Oh, uh, not good. We're going down. Maybe we can spot him if we... Whoa! Emergency rescue signal! The escape pod! So, are you gonna leave me here all night? We've got a mission to finish. Yeah, it's almost like it should have been an episode separate have from no Bartleby. Fear. The hedgehog's here. But then Sinking so it's new. Fast, bro. Sonic has to save Trevor from sinking, so I'm glad the Aquaphobe stepped forward to do it, and he's recovered just fine and is accidentally lip synced to Manic's line, I think. Oh yeah, stretch out, Trev. Make yourself comfortable. Hey, I'm just happy to be anywhere. Back to work, guys. Well, we've either found the heart of Robotnik's evil plan or a disco party room. Hmm. Disco? I vote for the evil plan. Good commercial break. We return to them arriving at the giant ruby. Look, it's just my size. And Sonya promptly installs it in her gun and destroys the mine. Also a pretty cool moment. They make their escape as the mine collapses around them. Correction, they hit a geyser? Whatever, the mission is successful. Encore, anyone? All oh, right! right. <laughs> All right! Way to go! Sonya is so deeply embarrassed by their dancing that she steals the drill and drives back to Bartleby. The boys aren't far behind, leaving Trevor stranded. We return to Robotnik, finally giving Bartleby's sentence, right as the brothers break in to save Sonya. Don't worry, Sonya! We're here to... Wait for you to get here? Oh, great! Now we have to rescue Bartleby! Robotnik's genius trap turns out to just be Slingo and a handful of SWAT bots as usual. So the boys get to work knocking heads and fondling SWAT booty. Sonya finally arrives, outfits her keyboard with a ruby, and the boys ready their own instruments. Cue this episode's song, Justice Colin, a very stiff, bland 80s butt rocker of sorts. You know what? Sam Vincent sounds all right, and it's the kind of butt rock that fits Sonic. If Crush 40 ever did a cover, maybe it'd make the list, but I wouldn't listen to it voluntarily. It's also another case of the show putting its climax in the song so it breezes by in a minute, but not a lot actually happens in this fight. If you pay attention, you can see Bartleby trying to help. I appreciate that. Sonya shoots them away out, and the four of them escape. Now for the resolution. Citizens! New evidence has come to light proving that prisoner Bartleby is innocent of all charges. I am sure that there are no hard feelings over this unfortunate misunderstanding, and that Bartleby will continue his generous support of my, uh, the regime. I hate this. I hate that he faces no consequences for anything. I'm not very good at being noble, Sonia. Well, actually I am because, well, 
I'm nobility, but well, it doesn't take much to see that the problems of two little people don't amount to a hill of chili dogs compared to protecting this planet. Yeah, well, the hovercraft's waiting, but we'll always have Mobius then. Here's looking at you, kid. Yeah, so instead of an actual resolution, they do a trite Casablanca homage and the bottle brat pisses off forever. Did y'all just give up at the end? Hey sis, uh, are you sorry you don't live in that world anymore? Manic, I'm right where I wanna be. You're a real freedom fighter, sis. One of the best. Sonic, Manic, I think this is the continuation of a beautiful friendship. Judging by that weird art perspective, probably. Heck of a way to completely undermine any heart this story had. Once again, we have an almost good episode, but it feels confused. Most of the plot isn't even about Bartleby, it's about the ruby mine. The trial and the testing of his allegiance is like 30% of everything that happens when it needed to be like 80. It's Sonya's choice all over again. The title event's not as important as it should be. Feels weird to say in this context, but Bartleby himself might be the saving grace, as the bits of character growth we do get with him help to elevate what's otherwise an average episode. Look, Bartleby is this show's defining centrist. He neither totally joins the Resistance nor totally joins Robotnik because he's privileged enough that he doesn't have to. No real problems affect him and he never thinks they could, so he plays both sides to stay in everyone's good graces. What do you do with that kind of character? You make those problems actually affect them and force them to face what their fence-sitting actually accomplishes. This isn't Pepsi versus Coke, this is life and death under a fascist regime. And what we get is a mock trial with no consequences that has nothing to actually do with Bartleby. And he's basically let off the hook at the end because no one makes him face anything he's actually done. Thing is, I thought he could easily join either side for real. Episodes like Winner Fakes All and Head Games treated him like he's not really supposed to be an ally of the triplets. Not outside of convenience, anyway. And while it's nice that he does ultimately choose to leave the aristocracy and his support for Robotnik, and I do like him taking initiative and pleading guilty to throw off the plan, I think that's part of why it feels so unearned. Just like the wealthy and their money. Same for Sonya, actually. I like that she seems to have evolved beyond her spoiled brat roots into someone who's all business and always chooses the resistance first. But that evolution was so granular that if you weren't paying attention for it, it feels like it came out of nowhere. The episode feels more concerned with her growth and her side of the story. She's a main character, fine. But again, it's just not earned. I think for both character arcs to work, there needed to be a lot less of that ruby mine and a lot more of them setting shit straight with themselves and each other. That evolution in her priorities probably should have been addressed a lot more this time. It's a disappointing episode, but to be fair, it's for reasons that are mostly damning it for what could have been, when, unlike Healer, there was at least an enjoyable episode underneath it. But like the de-roboticizer, this is the one shot they had at a subject with some real weight and consequences behind it, and they just didn't take advantage of it. C-. minus. Episode 38, The Art of Destruction, was written by Laren Bright in his second and final credit. The fight for freedom seemed never ending. And it was not surprising that sometimes my children could get discouraged. Let's do it to it! We open outside of another one of Robotnik's factories where Sonic and Sonya pull the guards away in the silliest game of tag fashion, which ends in just the dumbest way. Meanwhile, Manic does his earthquake thing and sinks the factory under a mountain. Sleet and Dingo turn up, with Sleet looking his most stretched yet, and seemingly take them out. No dice, and the triplets bury them as well. Hey Sonic, what do you call Sleet and Dingo buried up to their necks? Not enough rocks? <laughs> 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 Slingo grovel before Robotnik once more, and he has built a new weapon. It's a little amazing. I've named it Artificial Robot Thought Technology, but you may call it Art. Behold the future. Powerful, deadly, unstoppable. <laughs> Art demonstrates his real power on his container, absorbing metal to build his own body. He also has the power to learn and think, making him truly unique in this universe. Robotnik gives him a hug. When do you want us to start using, um, Art? Oh no, Art works alone, but I do have some dirty business for you. Dirty business? Oh, that's right up our alley. <laughs> Allie. Why did I have to say Ali? Yes, that is Dingo. Yes, that is disgusting. Thanks for that visual. Cut to the triplets where Manic is frustrated. It's just, well... Oh. 
I've been thinking. We raid, Budnick rebuilds. What's the point? Hey, we just munched his solid fuel installation. That's not too shabby. Yeah, I guess. <sighs> but seems like nothing really changes. But things might have changed a little bit as Sonya shows surveillance of Art breaking into a Freedom Fighter hideout and taking prisoners. Take note of his little dodgy dance. I am Art. You are next, hedgehogs. I'll give him this. The cold Hal voice works for the creepiness factor. Manic is still frustrated because he knows that when they destroy Art, Robotnik will just make something else. But Sonic has noticed something. This thing always dodges to the right. Probably should have told the animators. They drive around in, I think, a resistance truck? For a second, I thought the van turned into a box, and Art finds them first. Sonic yells at Manic for doing fucking nothing, but it does allow him to avoid getting pipes in his brain, and they escape out the back while Art is briefly stuck. Sonic stays behind to fight him, being reminded that he always dodges to the right, and the exact same thing happens. Whoa! What happened to going to the right? This show had three directors. Sonic tries it again and ends up getting grabbed, but he escapes with a spin. Hey, how you get away? <laughs> you figure it out, bull boy. Art will learn. Fade to commercial. Place your bets on where we go from here. You might be more wrong than you think. We return to more of Dingo sucking mud, which he sneezes onto Sleet and sticks him to the wall. Hope you enjoy knowing that for the rest of your life. Robotnik arrives to give them a new job. The bathrooms. Haven't been cleaned in months. <laughs> anyway, cut to the triplets scoping out another factory. Let's take this place down. Like it does any good. Who's the toot, bro? I can't believe Sonic said that in the 90s. Art isn't far behind and begins shooting, knocking Sonya and Manic down. Sonic takes off his arm, but he rebuilds it immediately. Bummer me, Horus. Sonic fires a laser that the animators just forgot, and then he and Art do that double laser tug of war thing. Sonic slides under Art, making him shoot out the catwalk from underneath himself, and he falls into glowing acid to do the Terminator 2 thing with a gun. The boys' mouths look weird for a bit, and they haul ass just before the skeletal form of Art pulls himself out of the acid. Destroy hedgehogs. No problemo. I almost said that was kinda rad. I still regret it. Cut to the triplets getting ready to perform. We really kick some bot butt. Yeah, but I bet Budnick's already working on something better. Oh, get over it, Manic! Come on, let the music move ya! Considering Laren Bright also wrote Country Crisis, which wasn't the worst episode and had the triplets generally feeling right, it's impressive how they don't this time. Yeah, you're right, sis. <laughs> Oh yeah, that'll get everyone on track. Whenever I hear this music, my brain sure resets. Art sneaks into the room using his tentacles, and then he morphs back to normal, looking incredibly unimpressed. It is easily the best part of this whole episode. It's like he walked in on his parents. He sneaks his snakes around the triplets. Manic looks like he knows and is up for it. But surprisingly, he doesn't capture them. No spin. I told you I would learn. <laughs> okay, you got it, so go ahead and take us in. First, Make more of that noise. Uh, uh, noise? The noise you were making. That noise is music! Technically, I guess. Uh, uh, but you wouldn't know about music because Butnik outlawed it. Butnik? Butnik. Oh, Robotnik. Robotnik. Butnik. Ha, 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 ha. That is very funny. Now play the no- the music. Well, since we got no choice, Sonya does the worst count-in in music history. One, two, one, two, three, four! And it's actual song time, The Sound of Freedom, another 80s flash dance rocker in the vein of something from one of the Rocky movies. Wake up! What's going down? That's the sound of freedom. Check out this thing we found. That's the sound of freedom. 
I do think more of the show could have stood to embrace an 80s rock nostalgia since it works with the aesthetic of the show, but this is as bland white bread as underground gets. Probably would be better if the guitar was audible, since here it sounds more like a vacuum cleaner in the next room. It is funny how Art grows his own keyboard to join in, though. Okay, Art, do what you gotta do. Another weird commercial break. We come back to a surprising development. You're actually letting us go? Yes, I have learned about freedom and friendship. Thank God for that. Dude, come on, before it changes his mind. Wait, please. Oh, right. I knew it was too good to be true. No, you may go. I just want to be a freedom fighter. I can hear first draft rock music every day. Robotnik taught me to capture freedom fighters. That was wrong. I must fix that. He's a fast learner. So what do you guys think? I vote we bring him on board. He smells better than either of you. How do we know we can trust him? Because we're the priority one hedgehogs, and he's not dragging our butts to Robarfnik. Right, big guy? Right, Sonic. You do not trust me? Suspicion is good when you're on the run, guy. <sighs> but you gotta trust somebody sometime. Okay, you're in. Manic doesn't want to get chucked into a desert again. That makes me feel... something. Feelings, too? Getting better and better. Now, if you can make chili dogs, you'd be perfect. Uh, why is this one episode? Holy crap, you guys just speed ran an entire character arc in two minutes. Art's abilities are pretty cool, and Robot Learning to Love is a fair concept for a story relating to Robotnik in some way. It's sort of why Gamma was such an effective character in Sonic Adventure, and it's literally Sage's character arc in Frontiers. Spoilers. You could easily spread all of that out a bit more, even into another three-parter. I think you could make a really good mini-arc with Art, but this is up there as one of the most rushed concepts on the whole show. It's amazing how this started out looking like it'd just be another garbage episode, and now it's like it's farting its potential at me. We cut to Robotnik watching Art and the triplets freeing the two people Art had previously captured, which is at least a good callback. Sleet, get in here! Yes, sir. Destroy that bot! Yes, sir. Art obliterates an installation, cut again to the hideout, and they tell him about the prophecy. Prophecy? What is that? It's a foretelling of the future. This prophecy says that someday we'll reunite with our mother and defeat Robotnik. That would be good? Yes, but my question is when? For all we know, it could happen 20 years from now. Why bother? Oh damn, I think Manic also suspects the Oracle. They get a message from Cyrus that Robotnik has captured their mother. Cut to another base, with the triplets spending extra long getting out of events because this show has no economy of storytelling. Art disrupts a force field using his own hand, and I do actually like this. Nice work, dude. Aw, he's so cute. I hate this more now. They find Alina's cell with two guards outside. Swat bottoms up. Art opens the cell, but of course it's just a hologram. It's a trick! Sorry, hedgehogs. Time to kiss your hologram mom and each other goodbye. What is this? What is this? Hey, what's going on? Hey, no way! I will deal with this. Let's just let this shot sink in for a minute. Or not. Sorry, Art. The door is made from composite materials. You'll never get through them. Nice try, but those hydraulics are much stronger than you. You are about to become a hunk of useless metal. <laughs> Art scans the room and sees that the back wall is the weak point, so they shoot it, but it's not enough. I shall blast too. Try. You sure you can control it? We could all get smashed. And if I don't try? Hmm, good point. Manic does his thing, which reveals a weak spot that they're able to open. Get out. Come on, Art, let's go. I will stay. As you say, why bother? My actions will not defeat Robotnik. Maybe not this time, but you gotta try. Okay, I get it. Yes, Manic. Art is not the only one who learns. Considering how quickly I came around on you, Art, I beg you to learn self-preservation. Now go. Come on, man. I learned my lesson. Let's get out of here. It is too late. 
If I try to leave, I will be smashed. But it is all right. I have fought for freedom. And I have made music. Please leave a comment. What that is a euphemism for. I'm sitting here giggling like an idiot instead of writing the script. Thanks to you hedgehogs, my life had value. Now, go. Later, man. Manic reluctantly leaves, except he gets hit by a rock off screen, I think. Sonic grabs him and he makes it out anyway, and Art shoots them an escape route and dies off screen. This is a kid show, I'm okay with them not showing that. Time to juice and jam! <laughs> Where is he? The supply depot's just around the corner. It shouldn't have taken Manic this long to set those explosives. Maybe we should... Finished! What took you so long? I added 50 kilos to the load. 50? That's gonna vaporize the place! Just thought I'd put on a little light show. <laughs> In memory of art. In memory, In memory of, of art. art. Not Since Beginnings has one episode felt so much like three playing together in Fast Forward. The funny part is how dreadfully dull and dreary it starts out. Once Art becomes more of a presence, it starts picking up, even though his entire character arc was so hastily written as to feel like an accident. There was a rumor for a while that the show was originally commissioned for 65 episodes, though Ben Hurst confirmed that wasn't true. But with how much of the show feels like multiple plots crushed together, I wouldn't be surprised if Laren Bright wanted to tell a longer story and just had to make do with a one-off. 500th verse, same as the first. This could have been good. D plus. Episode 39, The Pendant, was the last with Ben Hurst in the lead credit. Pat Ali is the lead writer for the 40th. With all the technology employed by Robotnik, it was easy for my children to forget about the powers of magic. Oh man, she's bringing back the some fucking wizard guy. Sonya and Cyrus are waiting for Sonic to do his part during a mission. They make the mistake of trusting him. Maybe Sonic found a chili dog stand. No, Sonic knows better than that. Besides, Manic wouldn't let him stop while he's on a mission. Sonic, don't you think we should get moving? No biggie. I can cut the power in a Sonic second. As soon as I finish my other two dogs, I'm out of here. Yo, Sonic, wait for me. How do you like that? I am faster than life. Give me a break. Then again... But remember, he wasn't fast enough to save Manic. With the power out, Sonya hurries up the radio tower and plants a bug. She makes it down before the power returns, and Sonic pulls them out of there before they can be captured. Later, Slingo are idiots, and Robotnik reveals that Robotropolis's pollution has cleared the clouds around the once-hidden Emerald Peninsula. He orders them to gather the inhabitants for roboticization, and to do that, they need... A buggin. What is it? It's a mythical creature, but the people there believe in them. They think that if they catch one, it will bring them wealth. So while they are chasing the bargain, we scoop them up. That is brilliant, yeah, sir. Yeah, but uh, where do we get one of those uh, things? I had to ask. For the record, the Boggin seems mostly a riff on a leprechaun, and we'll see why that matters soon. We cut to the triplets practicing for a Liberty Day performance. Cue this episode's song, Lady Liberty, a comically out of place, skin crawlingly awful, war drum and fife marching band song to indoctrinate young Sonic fans into saluting the flag in school. I assume in France, they'd already stopped watching. Each character gets their own bit. This is, regrettably, the last we'll hear of Tylee Ross. When Liberty drums Robotnik out of town. I weep. It is hilarious how Cyrus just stands there blankly the whole time, like he walked in on something he shouldn't have. He fills them in on an intercepted message about the Emerald Peninsula. I thought he didn't know about it. He does now. And if you guys don't spread the word, everybody there is going to end up back here, roboticized. <gasps> Ain't gonna happen. Down the hatch. So they have these things called Boggins. Boggin? What's that? It's a mythical creature that guards a treasure chest of money and jewels. You mean like a banker? Ha ha. According to legend, if you catch one, you get the treasure chest. Nope. Definitely not a banker. 
I'm sick of this kid. The van starts breaking down out of nowhere, and Sonic gives Manic shit for it. I thought you checked the engine. I did. It looked fine to me. Huh. It looked fine. Yeah, the compression ratio was 12 to 1. I advanced the timing, cleaned, and recapped the plugs. And I torqued down the valve covers to exactly 16.8 pressure pounds. It looked fine. I think Manic is sick of him, too. While they check the engine, a pink spirit barrels down on them. Commercial. We come back and it knocks them down, then keeps moving. They hear Maniacal laughing in the distance, and oops, the van was Sonic's fault. Chili dogs? Huh? Don't mind if I do. Hey, it worked! It's still warm! Sonic Hedgehog! Add Sonic Underground to the list of shows that would be better without their title character. The triplets wander through the cold night air when they come across a house with the light on. The pink thing knocks Sonic on his ass again, and the owner of the house appears, Maeve, a kindly old lady with an Irish accent. Irish folklore-themed episode of sorts. I can dig it. They go to her house, and cut to Dingo. He's being chased by a dinosaur and a giant cockroach. Cockroach cousin. They get captured by Sleet. Nice job. Thanks, Dad. Cut back to the house. What'd you say that thing was? Oh, we call them bog beasties. They mean you no harm. They just like knocking into people. No kidding. Sonya warns her about roboticization. Cut away again to Slingo telling Robotnik about how well it's going. They're about to kidnap more people, but they get smacked by the bog beastie. Cut back to the house, where Maeve reads Sonya's palm. In your battle tomorrow, you will find an object of great value. It will give you great power against your enemy, and it will help you in your quest to find your mother. My quest? That's not the weird part of what she said, Sonya. The van is fixed, scene transition again, and Sonya is distracted by what Maeve said. Maeve said I'd find something to help us fight Robotnik. Something that would give me great power over him. Oh, I don't believe in all that fortune-telling mumbo-jumbo. Be sure to tell the Oracle, you little bitch. They find Slick and Dingbat. And see them capture another person through the heinous means of motion tweening. Dingo's tired and they take a break. Bummer, may Horus. That ship's gotta come down. Think you can get me up there, bro? SWAT bots appear out of nowhere to stop them, but Sonic pulls them up to a mountain. While Sonic distracts them, Sonya sees a shiny and bails. Then the bog beastie appears. Not now! Then again, now's good. Sonic and Manic shut the bots off, but the mercs show up to capture them anyway. Meanwhile, Sonya investigates the glow and comes across the titular pendant. <laughs> But where is the girl? Don't worry, sir. We'll find her. But you must admit, two out of three isn't bad. <laughs> oh my gosh! She goes back outside, sees Manic's abandoned board, and Slingo preparing to capture more civilians. She hops on the board and lasers one of the bots, slips into the awaiting ship, and makes the other bot fly into the door. Such a satisfying sound. Commercial. Not back when she went. Oh my gosh. But here at Even when I enjoy an episode, there's always something to make me sigh. We return to Sonya finding and freeing her brothers. Ah! Oh. Hi guys. Did you miss me? What happened to you? You just disappeared. What do you think you are? Me? Uh, wanna talk about this later? Oh my god, he's so roly-poly in this shot. And he just lies there. He's so goddamn cute. Okay, I'm better now. He takes control of the ship while Sonic powers down the suspended animation units that were holding all the locals. How long before those people wake up? About an hour. But don't worry. Without the locator, Sleet and Bingo won't stand a chance of tracking them down. Wonder what Putnik's thinking right now. Funny you should ask. Sonya uses her new pendant to spy on him as he yells at the mercs when she suddenly drops it. Her arm is starting to fade away. Not to spoil it, but this is the point where this wackadoo episode starts to turn around. The pendant? It made me feel tingly, and now I can't feel my arm at all! So, this is what the fortune teller was talking about? Yeah, and she's gonna be doing a lot more talking. Sorry, sis. <laughs> 
We cut back to the Mercs, where Slate's head continues to look so weird, and Dingo sees the triplet's van. They return to Maeve's place with a spy drone watching nearby, and she confesses about the pendant. And the other half of the pendant is somewhere near where you found this. Take it! Change sign your back! No! I cannot touch the pendant until the two halves are once again whole. I'm sorry I used you, but I needed your help to save my land and my people. How about saving my sister? There's only one way to do that. Sonya must use the pendant one more time to find the location of the other half. <gasps> but what if I disappear? I'm sorry, but if you do not act, you will disappear anyway. Look. There's not much time. This is what I meant. It's weird to say about the Irish bog episode, but we've got some decent stakes this time. Sonya reluctantly uses the pendant once more and sees a fairy open a passageway in the cave where she first found it. Sonya has now half disappeared and Sonic rushes them back. Oh, Sonya. Come on, Manic. Let's do it to it. <laughs> Sonya stays behind while her brothers investigate. Unfortunately, the mercs and some SWAT bots have beaten them. Perhaps we could arrange a little trade. Where is my transport ship? It's 70 kilometers north. Now hand the pendant over. Well, you see, there's a problem with that because I rarely keep my word. <laughs> oh my god, Slate's cool again. Welcome back, buddy. I don't see you enough. The boys take them all out, and Manic nabs the pendant from Slate. Do I know how to throw a party or what? What? I guess that's my answer. What? Manic brings the second half to Sonya in the nick of time, as she's almost completely disappeared. A fabulous flash of green, and she's all good again. Suddenly, Maeve appears in more flashing. My patron Sonic Fiend thought she was the Oracle, probably because of the magic and all the green, but nope, she's the fairy we saw in the projection. Frankly, I'm glad she's not the Oracle. I don't want to see that fucker anymore. Thank you, my friends. Now I am free to restore the clouds that protect our land and erase this place from the minds of those who would seek to harm us. Wow, you can do that? She demonstrates by tossing the mercs out in a pretty pink tornado all the way back to Robotropolis. I am sorry I put you in such danger, but I had no choice. The pendant may be used once more without danger. Use it as you will. Thank you. We'll save it until we need it. This never happens. Before Maeve can send them back, Sonic requests one small favor. We then cut to Robotnik, being attacked for eternity by the Bog Beastie. It's, a uh, horrifying. No, it can't be impossible! <laughs> that did not go how I expected at all. You know, for an episode that is as erratically paced and messy as usual from Hurst and Ali, this is pretty fun. It's like the opposite of episodes like Healer or Sonya's Choice, where everything falls apart in the final third. The pendant only really comes into play in the last seven minutes, and once again, the resolving fight is over and done with in a sneeze. But there are finally serious stakes that they don't get to convenience themselves out of. If anything, the convenience is the threat this time. And despite a rocky first half, especially with Sonic, there's a lot more charm than usual. It feels imaginative and fresh, in ways most of Hurston Ali's episodes feel tired and frustrated. Finally, they wrote a story I genuinely liked. B minus. I wish it wasn't the second to last episode! At this point, I feel like I might need to set expectations. We already know that the show does not actually resolve in its finale. They don't reunite with their mother, they don't depose Robotnik. However, the last 20th episode was a wonderland for sure, and the 40th being the finale, I know there's at least the hope that it will be special. If not conclusive, then at least a fun send-off for the show. I can only apologize in advance for... just more Sonic Underground. 
but it's time for the end. Episode 40, Virtual Danger. This was written by Pat Ali and Ben Hurst in a rare lead credit switch. We open on a prolonged shot of a beautiful bird with no narration from Alina until we see the boys playing a VR game. Inside, it looks like Castlevania by way of Descent, and there's a pretty good gag with another player, Destructo, who looks like a baron of hell, but sounds like this. I've got you in my sights, hedgehogs. But Sonia walks up and pulls the plug. What'd you do that for? We were just about to toast Destructo. I called you 15 minutes ago. I called you five minutes ago. And now it's time to go. We didn't hear you. Exactly! Sonic justifies it by saying that the game is helping them learn skills. And then Alina shows up. Even when things were going well for the Freedom Fighters, my children could not afford to let down their guard. Because Robotnik was always looking for a new way to destroy them. Inside the Resistance base, we get a recap of the flight training from Episode 10, Come Out Wherever You Are, where Sonic killed everyone. Well, the Predator itself didn't come back, but the VR cockpit does, so I'll take it. You guys sure you want to do this again? Well, I know I'm not so good. <laughs> but since you're really desperate for pilots, I figured I'd give it another shot. Okay. Let's do it. Sonic and Manic both hop into VR, and this time it goes much more smoothly. I went back and checked, and they are not just reusing Sonya's footage. Hard to believe. I wouldn't put it past them. That was great, guys. So, what's going on? How'd you get so good? Castle Conquest! Sonya confirms that Robotnik is about to find out just how much they've been taking from his supply ships. So it's time to take everything. Now we're really gonna need pilots. Hedgehog pilots <laughs> reporting for duty. <laughs> the Crash Dummy Twins? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, it's hard to believe, but Manic and Sonic aced the simulator. You're right. That is hard to believe. Okay, how'd you do it? Castle, Castle Conquest. Conquest. The game you corrupted by unplugging it while we were saving. You've ruined the mission, sis. The heroes start hacking and stealing the ships, with Sonic taking the last one. Sonya's worried because it's the most likely to be chased. And Sonic may be a good pilot in a video game now, but that's not the same as real life. Cyrus wants to give him a shot, so Manic swipes his ship, and Sonya at least tells Sonic good luck before she takes hers. We cut to Robotnik, who is informed that his supply ships are non-responsive. He sends a surveillance bot after the ship that just so happens to have Sonic in it. Hi, Mom! We're number one! Tails did a cuter. Hi, Mom! Robotnik fires missiles at him, not that Sonic is concerned. Hey, Robotnik! This thing pulls a little to the right. Might want to get it in for a tuna. Huh? It's starting to make some funny noises, too. He takes another two missiles and agrees to return the ship to Robotnik. I.e., something that would be incredibly awkward only two years later and you could never get away with in a cartoon today. Kinda hardcore, though. He throws a pipe through the window and prepares to ram the bridge. Uh-oh. I hope I didn't cut this too close. We come back from commercial to Sonic timing his jump before the ship hits the building. Though it honestly just sort of lands and slides along the ground. Ugh. Hedgehog! Yeah, need a lift? Hedgehog! Think I got his attention? <laughs> the mission went off great, and now Robotnik needs to redirect his factories to build more supply ships. Sonya has to admit, the game sorta worked. She slips off for a makeover, Sonic for a chili dog, and Manic lies down for a nap. Sonic comes back immediately and wakes him up for more Castle Conquest. I'll put on the brakes and he'll fly right by! You're not gonna get me like that! Sonya? This game is so easy! You guys are such linear thinkers. You didn't realize you could do this! Ah! This is a fun little sequence of Sonya getting on their level for once. And it, like a lot of this episode, is actually animated pretty nicely and fluidly. And then it abruptly transitions into our final song, Don't Let Your Guard Down. Don't let your guard As an occasional connoisseur of 80s synth pop, I can confidently call this musical mayonnaise. They even seem to run out of lyrics before the end. But again, Sam Vincent is finally a decent singer, so it at least doesn't hurt to listen to. Then King Vocal Dissonance returns. Well, well, three hedgehogs all in a row. I take it back, this is an amazing final episode. Manny, let me 
go! We're about to be blasted! What? What are you talking about? Man, you must have been dreaming. Huh? I call bullshit. There's no way Manic doesn't dream in prog rock. Manic tells Sonic his dream, and Sonic's like, let's actually do it. So they hop back into the game. And yeah, the cute bit with Sonya joining them didn't happen. Damn. Destructo doesn't take long to find them, and they take on the gauntlet. But first... Hang on, I've, I've got something for you. Check this out. Whoa, I've never seen anything like that before. I wrote the software myself. I, I got something even bigger for you later, but download this first, if you want it. They download what turns out to be a new laser for their ship, which they immediately use to kill Destructo. I call dick move, but I'm a gamer. That and manic drumming all the time are the realest things in this show. I like it. Oh, <gasps> aha, very funny. Just for that, I don't think I'll share the rest of my new software with you. Ah, oh, come on! New software? What is it? Okay, I'll give you a clue. No more Lema Castle walls. I created a whole new level. Cool. But first, there's something I want to show you. Hey, great! From this, I can't tell if Pat Ali knows much about games, but she has definitely played Goldeneye. Destructo sends them the next download, in time for Sonya to pass by nonchalantly, and they log back into a whole new map. Nice shot, Destructo. And nice game background. Ah, oh, yeah. Killer software. Thanks. Word is you guys did some good work, too, on, on Robotnik's <gasps> cargo ships. Thanks. It's gonna be months before he gets back to chasing us. I wouldn't be too sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> you fell for it. Oh, this is rich. Honestly thought it was sleet, since I think it's Maurice LaMarche again. But it's cool Robotnik is doing something himself. We don't see the Mercs again, for the record. Do you guys want something to eat? Oh my gosh! It's Robotnik! Kidding. For real though, if the episode ended there, I would give it an A. Primo television. We return to Sonya, donning the gamer gear in surprise, but not entering the game herself. Meanwhile, Sonic and Manic get their ship deleted, and Robotnik says that if he kills them here, they're gone forever. Do you believe this guy? The boys haul some unserious haunch, and the Botnik gives chase. <laughs> this will be delicious. <laughs> Outside, a concerned Sonya has called Cyrus for help. Oh, oh, uh, oh, Cyrus, it just drew them inside. I feel weird for describing her worried whimpering as cute, but I don't know, I actually like her voice. I know people think she sounds weird. Maybe I'm just weird. Cyrus sees the last download and confirms everything Robotnik said, and that if they pull the plug, the brothers have no way back. He thinks he can reverse it, i.e. pull Robotnik into the game. I can put someone in the game, and if they get inside this control room, they can pull Robotnik inside. Of course, it'll take a good pilot. I'm in. While Cyrus works outside, Sonya hops in. It's a bit late to say, but I like how Cyrus has been so present. He felt like he would be another one-shot nobody back in Tangled Webs, but he's grown on me as part of the team himself. Inside the game, Robotnik is still in hot pursuit, and the boys narrowly avoid a concussion missile. I think we lost him. It's his game, Sonic. I don't think we can lose him. That's correct, <gasps> Hedgehogs. Well, that's not exactly fair, is it? Robotnik drops rocks in their way, and Manic suggests a super spin. Sonic, dude! Try a super spin! Side note, his personality has all but been flushed this episode. Everything he says is weirdly bland. The super spin just makes Sonic dizzy, and Robotnik traps them behind flames. But before he can take them out, Sonya arrives just in time. Robotnik bails, and Sonya picks up the boys. Meanwhile, Cyrus's mouth. Also, he finds Robotnik's satellite. I like that we actually see him doing espionage. They ignored Trevor doing that in Sonya's choice. Back inside, the triplets make their way to the control room, but their ship gets deleted. They reach the control room, a very 90s visual of cyberspace slash the inside of a motherboard, and their plan comes to fruition. Well, a variation, I guess. Game over, Robotnik. What happened? Cyrus must have found Robotnik's satellite dish. Oh, so close! Next time, hedgehogs! Wasn't Robotnik supposed to be sucked into the game? 
put a pin in that. The supply ships are emptied, and Sonic knows just what to do with them. We give them back. We'll call this Advantage Hedgehogs. Yep, they do the same thing Sonic did before, and let me tell ya, having multiple ships fly into the building is even worse. Butnik. I know. We'll talk about that in a minute. I like this quite a lot. This final quarter of the show was easily its worst, with a whole stretch of four of some of its very worst episodes. But, combined with the pendant, it at least managed to go out on an enjoyable note. Like how Winter Fakes All showed the more comedic potential a show had, Virtual Danger shows the more imaginative potential. They could have played a lot more with what the characters got up to outside of missions that didn't require weird side characters. And while it would probably also be a weird diversion like this, it could tap into that Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog DNA that I think would have benefited the show. Also, and I don't know if this is specifically Pat's influence, but this is the only episode by these two to be paced and focused well enough that it's not a chaotic mess. And with how both of these episodes were handily the best of the ones they wrote, and with how good their Sat AM episodes were, I'm inclined to think that something just went wrong before. I think they really wanted to cram in more of this world and more things for the Hedgehogs to do without divvying up those ideas right, and their writing suffered for it. Again, assuming the problem didn't come further down the pipeline, like in animating or editing. While they didn't give Manic much of anything to do or say, and the song was a puce rectangle of sound, they at least sent the show off with a fun pair of episodes. B? I did it! It's not the send-off the show needed or deserved, but again, keep that pin in there, we'll get to it. To close out the reviews, let's do a quick recap of my bottom five worst episodes, the five most disappointing, and finally, my top five favorites. First, a dishonorable mention to Beginnings. The backbone of this show is the connection and interaction between the triplets. How damning, then, is this episode, where they don't meet until the end, and are immediately thrust together without any chance to connect? Also, compared to the episode that it was switched with in English, it serves as proof that a show can begin just fine without an origin story. But the bottom five begins with number 36, A Hedgehog's Home is Her Castle. This is a microcosm of the show's issues with pacing and editing. Good luck enjoying the spooky, haunted house atmosphere when you can't see or follow what's happening. And Let's Do It To It is one of the most intolerable songs of the whole show. Number 37, Sonya's Choice. A great example of meaninglessness as cartoons. Title the episode after the part that matters the least, and just squitter away all potential around it without even trying. Sonya's Choice made me angry with how boring and inconsequential it was. Number 38, Healer. Speaking of inconsequential, a de-roboticizer. Perhaps one of the most significant things one could create in a world dominated by the threat of being turned into a robot. It's reduced from an entire subplot in Sat AM Season 2 to the world's most telegraphed one-off about a con artist that doesn't even bother to earn its resolution. Definitely the worst dingo has ever been, too. Just gross and unpleasant to sit through on multiple levels. Number 39, Sleepers. Alongside the utter boredom of The Big Melt, four of this show's worst episodes all aired alongside each other. I'm tempted to believe that everyone just started giving up near the end of production, or maybe I'm projecting because I sure gave up by the time of Sleepers. All of the worst parts of Hearst and Ollie's episodes in one. Terrible pacing, all stakes conveniently abandoned as soon as possible, and a potentially interesting idea squeezed of that potential. These two wrote Sonic and Sally and almost all of Sat AM Season 2, genuinely good television, and it is so disheartening watching their writing crumple to this. But they at least managed to not write the very worst episode. Number 40, Friend or Foe. No matter whether you're excited to see Knuckles or not, I can assure you this episode will disappoint you. Much of this show is very flawed, and despite all the positives I was able to dig up, its weaknesses and downsides are impossible to ignore. But I will give almost every other episode this silver lining. At least they're not this unconscionably boring and empty. It's only worthwhile as the mimetic poster child for everything wrong with this show. Next, the five most disappointing episodes. Episodes that should have been good, but in some way dropped the ball. 
or in some cases, threw it through a window screaming. Honorable mention to Sonya's choice for doing that so hard it ended up on the previous list. Wedding Bell Blues. This was almost a decent first episode for the show. All of the core elements are presented reasonably well, but it also introduces all of the show's problems. But it also has its own unique problem of awful sound quality. How two out of three of Jaleel White's characters, including the one he'd voiced for half a decade by that point, ended up sounding so artifacted will always baffle me. Speaking of which, Artifact. This was the first episode to have a strong setup in its first act, carry it well through the second, and then drop it completely in the third. A good example of how the songs only harm this show, never help it. Head Games. While I commend the show for tackling colonialism and the destruction of indigenous culture, and that ending with the villains getting javelin by a tree is pretty special, there's just no defending this shit. The good intentions almost make it worse somehow. Could be something you really like. Or maybe they don't. Bartleby the Prisoner. This one might annoy me the most because you can see the directions Bartleby's character could go, and this episode is desperate to do anything else. He's not actually facing consequences for his series-long fence-sitting, it's just a trap for Sonya. We're watching the heroes off somewhere else entirely for most of the episode when the focus should be on Bartleby, and instead of resolving his character arc with him being forced to pick a side for real, the episode shrugs, lets him completely off the hook with what's effectively a pardon, and then does a bland, distracting Casablanca homage like the writers just wanted to get it over with. The character is kind of at his best this episode, and he and Sonya have a good heart-to-heart, -heart, but it doesn't save it. And lastly, and perhaps mostly, the art of destruction. This episode did everything in its power to ruin a good idea. The show struggled from the beginning to tell one single, coherent story in an episode, often feeling like two or three ideas were shoved into one. Art manages to be that entire problem in one character. His arc alone should have been a three-parter, but by cramming his whole lifetime into this one episode, they also squeezed out any chance of it actually working. This is an episode that starts out looking like it has no potential whatsoever Whatsoever, and then waves its potential at you while running away with its ass hanging out. Fuck a dump truck. And finally, the five episodes I enjoyed the most and would happily recommend to anyone. Honorable mention to the whole of the Chaos Emerald Crisis for being a genuinely engaging and entertaining arc, but for the list, I want to stick to specifics. Number five, The Deepest Fear. The first episode of the show to really tap into its potential. Writers Michael and Mark Edens focus on one interesting character idea, Sonic being forced to face his fear of water, and stick to it, while the episode itself is paced calmly enough that you can follow it and enjoy it. Plus, my king, Captain Squeege, far more likable than he has any right to be. I rated another episode higher than this one, but he's why it made it to the list. <laughs> Number four, Six is a Crowd. Len Jansen's episodes are a real pendulum of quality, but he managed to turn pretty played out ideas into two of Underground's best, in this case, evil alternate versions of the heroes. This episode works because it understands the purpose of that idea, forcing the heroes to face their own vices and what they could potentially do wrong once they're in charge. It does highlight how two-dimensional the triplets really are, especially Sonic, and it does resolve itself a little too easily, but the charm and likability of the heroes come through a lot stronger than many of the other episodes. Whoa. Number three, No Hedgehog is an Island. Writer Matt Edens outshines his brothers with one of the most exciting and absurd episodes of the whole show, as the entire planet starts collapsing and exploding around our heroes. Trees fire out of the ground like lasers. Manic fights a chaos tornado with a drum solo and wins. The song is good, mass hysteria. It's held back a bit by its slower pace for once, and Athair's Sean Connery impression is like nails on a chalkboard to me, but its high points are magic. Sonya! Number two, Winner Fakes All. After a mostly messy first 10 episodes, Winner Fakes All shows the kind of loose, silly fun Underground could have been having. The humor is on point, the characters largely at their best, and Bartleby just gets owned left and right. Sonic not doing what everyone expects him to makes the whole plan collapse into a comedy of errors, and it's very entertaining to watch unfold. Now go get their tickets. And the number one best episode of Sonic Underground, Three Hedgehogs and a Baby. The second this kid shows up on screen, this shit should crash and burn. But instead, Len Jansen writes a genuinely tense and intriguing plot with some serious stakes, while amplifying all of Manic's charm, good nature, and good humor to make this the sweetest, most heartwarming, and comically tragic episodes of the show. Never has the Uncanny Valley been such a nice place to visit. He cried, I fed him, he cried, I burped him, then I cried, we ralphed on my vest. 
Give me all the time. This still leaves a couple elephants in the room, though. The average rating of the show, and the final list of songs I actually liked. On the whole, Underground has a very bad report card. The highest rating any episode got was a B+. There were no A's this whole show. And even Sad AM, which holds up well but not perfectly, still got a couple A's from me, including Sonic and Sally, like I mentioned. The single rating I gave the most was 10 Fs. D plus was second at 7, and the D range was the most overall at 14. There are 7 in the C range, but no C pluses, but at least the B range got 9. Averaging all those out, Sonic Underground gets an average rating of D. Yikes. It's lucky it got that high with so many Fs and no As. And I want to reiterate, those nine best episodes were hard-earned victories by a team you can tell are tired and frustrated with what they've been given, and are trying so hard to make something worthwhile out of it. Watching Sat AM first time through, I didn't appreciate it nearly as much as I did the second time after I'd watched all of Sonic Underground. There is so much love and passion that went into that show that is just absent here. The best thing Underground did, besides introduce me to my second favorite Sonic character, was make Sat AM look that much better in hindsight. And speaking of of nine good episodes, there were only nine songs that I actually liked. Most of the musical numbers were just bland and disposable, if they weren't actively embarrassing like the raps. But these nine songs passed the low bar of being decent enough for me to say I liked it. None of them were great music I would rate especially highly, but they had some kind of spark that made them okay to listen to. It could have been 10 if I found my home wasn't mixed like shit, since it's otherwise the only genuinely really good song on this show. I'm still pissed about this! But again, even if I gave it 10 out of 40, that's still the worst box set I've ever listened to. That's a hard F. But hey, it introduced us to Tylee Ross. Swings around about. I need to stop and really drive this home. The one thing everyone agrees on with Sonic's games, no matter their overall quality, the music is great. Sonic is a franchise that almost sustains itself on the talents of its composers and musicians. Even the bad games have some bangers in there. And when the game is really good, the music is phenomenal. Frontiers made me get metalcore, y'all. His TV shows haven't had that pedigree, aside from maybe like the theme songs, including this one. And a show centered entirely around a Sonic band sounds silly on his face. But under this lens, it almost sounds like a no-brainer. That could work and the songs are terrible. That's how you know you've truly failed. But we're here. The show's done. The songs are done. We're done. We have watched all of Sonic Underground. And unlike Sat AM, I never want to again. But the story does not end here. In part because it totally does. November 8th, 2022. Final day of filming. October 22nd, 1999. Final episode of Underground. The show does not get renewed for a second season, instead falling into syndication, where it continues to pop up from time to time. Deke executive Robbie London said that the reason they never found their mother was in case it got renewed, so that the writers wouldn't have to scramble for a new goal for them. This is, of course, hilariously optimistic in hindsight, because... Finding their mother is the only other thing anyone could have possibly wanted from this show. But you can see that in the final episode. Cyrus comes up with the idea of sucking Robotnik into the game, and they just don't do it. I think that was supposed to be how they finally defeat him, and then they'd reunite with their mother and that would be it. Show got cancelled. No suck. Ratings were poor. Reception was and continues to be mostly negative. Some blame has been placed on Sonic Adventure taking some of the wind out of its sails. Ben Hurst also mentioned that it wasn't marketed well or even scheduled sensibly, both things that took down Sat AM before it. Occam's Razor says the show was shit and no one wanted it, and the answer's probably a bit of all the above. But for all the people who managed to get attached and actually liked Sonic Underground, there was still that hanging question of, will their mother be goddamn found? Deke were never gonna answer that question. The show's done, and they're getting the residuals they wanted. But some people wanted to answer it for them in comic form. The Underground Trio made one major appearance in the Archie comics as part of its extensive multiverse. They helped Sonic and Zonic the Zone Cop stop evil Sonic in Super Special Number 10, the one that also crossed over with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. For those who don't know them, Zonic is Sonic's counterpart in an interdimensional police force, and evil Sonic is who Scourge was before he was an actual character anyone cared about. There are a lot of little lore details going on in this story, but all you need to know right now is evil Sonic is traveling between 
between dimensions to find the pieces of a robot called Giant Borg. Sonic and Zonic travel directly to the band, who seem to have met Evil Sonic, but they didn't have the piece of Giant Borg. Cool little detail, Underground Sonic has a different, swirling quill design to make him stand out better. He and Archie Sonic compare notes on their lives and such, and Sonya and Manic mock the names of Princess Sally and Tails, and it's like, guys, your names and designs are entirely Sonic, but sit down. Turns out Evil Sonic was captured by Slate and Dingo, whose over-designed ugliness actually works for this era of Archie, even though they've been miscolored. He hands over Giant Borg and tries to weasel into Robotnik's employ, and he gets sent directly to be roboticized instead. Robotnik now has control of the completed Giant Borg and starts smashing Robotropolis. All the heroes hatch a plan to stop him, with Underground Sonic leading him away from the city and distracting a missile, while the Dimensional Travelers warp right into the cockpit. With Robotnik thrown off by two separate Sonics, Undersonic leads the missile right back to Giant Borg, and they all, plus Robotnik, jump back into the warp ring as the missile takes out the robot. Sonya and Manic sneak past Sleet and Dingo to free Evil Sonic from prison, so that Zonic can capture him instead. The Travelers say goodbye and Manic wonders if they'll ever see him again. Only time and space will tell, bro. The answer is no. Interestingly, this comic released in July 1999, before Underground had even started airing in the US. So no, of course their story wasn't going to end there. But hey, it left the door open for them to show up in Archie again, right? Well, they did make a cameo in the mainline issue number 144, on a poster in Amy's room during a dreadful Dear Abby story. But no, they never came back or got any closure in the comics. However, future lead writer Ian Flynn did have the occasional plan to do just that. Initially, like he said in 2009, he felt like writing new underground stories would be stepping on the original creator's toes. But at New York Comic Con 2012, it was announced that Underground would conclude in Sonic Universe number 50. They even showed preview line art of the cover, drawn by Sonic art legend Patrick Spaziante. However, when the comic finally came out, it was instead about Metal Sonic. Flynn later said that the pitch was initially approved by everyone, and then was rejected by Sega right after the cover went in for approval. He also said that material from Underground was off-limits in the comic. When Archie Sonic was rebooted in 2013, Ian intended to release his original plan for the comic on his Lost Hedgehog Tales document, which would have revealed most of the team's plans that were cancelled by the reboot, but this never came about. 2017 saw the end of Sega's partnership with Archie, with the comic rights moving to IDW, whose comic series adheres almost entirely to the video games and itself. There's very little chance of the IDW Sonic doing anything with Underground. Archie's original run really was the best chance it had at a conclusion, and now it looks like that's never going to happen officially. But we've been here before. What do we do when we're disappointed in official Sonic? Look away. To the fans. Archie Sonic Online. That 2013 reboot left a bitter taste in the mouths of a lot of fans. People who grew up with the comics and were invested in its overstuffed cast and grandiose absurd nonsense. ASO is one of a few fan comics dedicated to continuing that original continuity, as if the Penders lawsuits never happened. I've read everything they've released so far, and there are some top quality writers and artists involved. Oh hey, who's one of the audio editors for their official comic dubs? I joined on long after I wrote this, for the record. <laughs> and what did they do for their continuity? Continuation of Sonic Universe? Number 50, Swan Song, the finale to Sonic Underground. I'm gonna just throw the whole credits panel on screen, since a lot of fans worked on it in different capacities, but I especially want to compliment the artists. They did a great job of finding a middle ground between the peculiar art style of the show and the more mainline Sonic designs, especially with the triplets. Though I wouldn't have given Manic the pointy, edgy eyes he has on the cover, he's way too laid back for that. And some of the characters like Mayor Winnieham probably couldn't be saved by Evan Stanley, but they did well regardless. The comic begins with Sleet and Dingo frustrated over something involving Robotnik, who has captured them. Queen Alina, of course, narrates over the scene, alluding to how the show never seemed to make any real strides to a resolution. When something major happens, the Scorpion ship is shot out of the sky by Robotnik, and the SWAT bots capture the mercs to be roboticized. But in an instant, things can be irrevocably changed forever. This was the moment when everything came to a head. This was when my children needed me, and I them, and this was to be the end of the Sonic Underground. Robotnik has finally captured all three triplets. Sonic and Sonya are convinced that, even if he roboticizes them, their mother will take their place and eventually free them. Butnik smugly leaves, but Manic doesn't seem as convinced as his siblings. They've needed their mother before, after all, and now he can't even remember her face. 
But finally, after 40 episodes and like two interactions that amounted to nothing, Queen Alina appears before her children for real, as the time has come to stop Robotnik once and for all. She literally descends from on high like the goddess she absolutely is not, but whatever, finale, go for gusto. She uses the royal scepter from episode 1 to free the triplets. Fun detail, it now clearly looks like a microphone, which goes nicely with the music motif. But conveniently, only she can teleport with it. Alina extremely suspiciously asks for their medallions, which if this weren't blood parents are everything world, would fly red flags in both hands, but Sonya buys it out of the gate and they give them over. The scene is very short, but there is a sweet moment between her and Manic. Ma, you will be back, right? My dear Manic, from today forward, nothing will keep us apart ever again. She teleports away, leaving her children for hopefully the last time, but also leaving them without their powers. But they've still got their freedom fighter instincts, so Sonya immediately hatches a plan to get them out. In a scene that makes good, fair use of each of the three skills, Sonic's speed and chaotic nature, Sonya's smarts and strength, and Manic's thieving and hacking skills. Unfortunately, Manic gets caught. We cut to fucking Mobodune from episode 3. Alina teleports in, shocking Mayor Winnieham, but she has a plan. She needs to supercharge her kids' medallions using the Power Stone, even though this will cause a power surge. Cut immediately back to Robotropolis. Glad this comic is maintaining the show's erratic pace. Sonya is looking for Robotnik, but can't seem to find him, and Sonic suggests using the pendant she got in episode 39 to find him. If this comic does anything right, it's bringing back goddamn everything from the show, and I love it. Sonya is worried because she can only use it safely safely one more time, but Sonic points out that today is the big day, so it's now or never. She decides he's right and uses it, but unfortunately, they see that Manic is with Robotnik, being led to the Roboticizer. Sonya figures out where they are and they hightail it through the base, when they're stopped by Bummer me, Horace. Sonic's parents, Drunkle Chuck, and Lady somehow more important than them. The comic remembered their adoptive parents, and Sonic actually calls them his mom and dad. Yes! You've earned so many points from me for doing the bare-ass minimum. You don't even know. The parents and a fleet of SWAT bots attack, but the siblings can't fight their parents, and without their medallions, they can't even temporarily return their minds. And then in the middle of the fight, Klong, Robo Sleet. This design fucking rips. Luckily, Queen Alina returns in time to help. They can't use the medallions without Manic, but she's got this covered. She sings into her scepter, which causes the SWAT bots to explode, show accurate, and the roboticized seem to snap out of it. Fun fact, this is kind of what Ian Flynn had planned for the original Archie Underground finale. Queen Alina would join her triplets on stage with a microphone as her medallion, and she would sing as the voice of the people, a queen being the voice of a people, lol. And that's when they would overthrow Robotnik. It's cool they integrated that idea in some way. But unfortunately, Sleet is still entirely out for himself, and with his mind restored, he steals Sonya's pendant to use it himself. Looks like Sleet for Brains wasn't affected. I see they also maintain Sonic's terrible quips. Good work. Au contraire, I simply think it's high time you hedgehogs were out of the way. Then I'll fix Robotnik. He uses the pendant and is immediately pulled inside. The kids are shocked. Alina looks sad. Sleet looks melty. We cut to Robotnik and Manic with Robo Dingo and holy shit, Cockroach Dad, fuck yes! This whole page is great. Robotnik monologues smugly about roboticizing Manic in front of his dad, and Manic never once gives him the satisfaction. How does that make you feel? I even brought out my personal roboticizer for the occasion. I suppose this wasn't the reunion you wanted to have, but... You're just mad because unlike me, you don't have a dad, or a family, or friends. For anyone. I have you! Any last words, rodent? I don't do Mondays. This comic won the whole series. But that was just this page. Next page, everyone else in the entire fucking show arrives to save the day. We got Knuckles, on model for the first time in his life. His stupid pet dinosaur, Cyrus and Trevor. Bartleby! There's Renee from episode 34, the Hillbilly Kids from 31, Dino Aussies from 14, Maeve the Fairy from 39, Sexy Tiger from 9, Mindy from 4. I can't believe how happy I am to see all of these stupid one-off characters. Though okay, I did actually like these ones for the most part. But then Robotnik calls in reinforcements, and we get a whole page of everyone else in a brawl. 
including all the worst ones. But hey, it's got my man Captain Squeege helping Manic with Cockroach Dad. And you know what? If that doesn't say everything about what I loved about Sonic Underground, I don't know what does. But things get worse for Robotnik from there. He gets mad and starts beating up on Dingo and yelling at him for being useless. And because he's a mutant, he wasn't fully roboticized. And finally, after a whole series of abuse and no appreciation, Dingo fights back. He picks up Robotnik and puts him into the Roboticizer. Like I've said, this isn't the story I would have given Dingo. There's a whole alternate universe where he wasn't a creep on Sonya and got to have real character development. But this is more or less the resolution I would have given. Him saying enough is enough and turning face. Primo ending for him and Robotnik. But it doesn't even stop there. This whole time, Queen Alina has been scouring the planet for the Chaos Emeralds. All seven of them. They tied the Chaos Emeralds into the rest of the franchise. That rules. And then, and then, the triplets go super. And we get these rad-ass designs for Sonya and Manic. They could have had them gold like Sonic and every other Super Hedgehog, but no, they went all out for this, and I love it. The Super Triplets begin singing the show's theme as this episode's song. Holy shit, they are not holding back. This is so much. The song carries across Mobius, destroying SWAT bots, freeing the roboticized citizens, including the awful ones, but hey, at least they weren't left out, and destroying the last of the Robotnik Empire once and for all. As the song plays, the kids power down and reunite with their mother for real. And then the fucker who caused all this shows up like, I'm proud of you, and not, I'm incredibly sorry. Piss off, dick nose. The Oracle narrates the ending as we get a montage. We see the establishment of the Council of Four, with Argus back as guard, and the actor dude apparently enlisted as well. Everyone is de-roboticized, and we get a lovely reunion shot with all the families, and even a non-cyborg designed for if you can. That's cool. Also, some mad genius snuck Big, Espio, Usagi Yojimbo, and Waldo in there. Great stuff. Life returned to normal. The aristocracy was restructured with the traitors stripped of their title. Good. And apparently Bartleby and Mindy hooked up. Sure, why not? I'd have also accepted her and Sonya. And of course, Dingo runs a chili dog stand with the robotic Robotnik. Look how happy he is. And Sleet is a stubborn dipshit, so he's stuck in the pendant forever. We end with the band practicing as their mother watches on from her throne. And so ends our tale. Though perhaps this is not the end? Yes, for this is clearly a beginning. Many more adventures are sure to follow, but those are adventures our royal family will experience, not separated, but together. And the worst thing I can say about this comic is that it feels like it's hurrying to its conclusion. It doesn't want to spend too much time reuniting the family and defeating Robotnik. It just wants to get there after 22 years. But like I said, the kids reuniting with Alina was really the only thing left the show could have possibly provided. And these fans delivered on that with a ton of fan service and a really fun conclusion that let absolutely everybody do something. They gave the show the kind of love and respect that it could never really have in its creation with its time and money restraints. And most most importantly, they let Manic shit talk Robotnik to his face. A minus. I did it! That is Sonic Underground. That is its creation, life, and lonely afterlife. But after experiencing everything, the lowest of its lows, and the highs that only reach so high, I'm more conflicted about it than I thought I'd be. We dug down into the details and saw that, yeah, the show's pretty crap. But when I step out of that hole and look over the bigger picture, I'm still kind of glad I watched it. Let's bring up that tally board again. It looks rough, but I went into this largely expecting that. The problem was, like with my first video on Sonic Freeriders, it was this thing in the franchise that everyone quietly agreed was bad, but never actually talked about. Things are rarely that clear cut, and I wanted to explore it myself and form my own thoughts on it. And as awful as Freeriders is, even I found positives. I never heard anything good about this show. It never seemed like something the larger Sonic fandom wanted to acknowledge, or even felt deserved a place in the franchise. But if we can still talk about 06 all these years later and advocate for its good parts, or even try to give it a second life in fan remakes or speedrunning, we can give Underground a chance. Frankly, this arduous archaeological dig was to find those bees, the diamonds in the rough, or at least the topaz in the trash, that make it stick out to people as something more, whether it's quietly their favorite cartoon, or just a fun little secret they have with those in the know. It doesn't take a lot for people to gain affection for something, and yeah, despite how exhausting and frustrating it could be to sit through, 
I did develop some affection for it. I was not playing up how excited I was reading the fan comic and seeing everyone and everything come back and how they tied everything together and finished the story. If I'd gotten nothing out of this show, I wouldn't have cared, but instead I was smiling the whole way through. Sonic Underground is bad in special ways that are upsetting to explore, but hiding in that sewer is a lovable little goblin who carries the whole thing on his own a loving, thieving cockroach dad, and a happy booger monster. Behind the comical gif of an exploding baby is a sincerely warm-hearted and tragic story of love and kindness. Past the memetically shit animation of Sonic saving Knuckles is a fun trilogy of villainous deception and worldwide pandemonium. Even a few episodes I couldn't stand had songs in them I liked. And even comparing tossed-off money-making dross there's a lot more to enjoy in watching Underground than there is in playing Free Riders. Going back to what I said about Sat AM, that its best friend in hindsight was what could have been, it feels like Underground is in a similar situation. Those good parts show the potential it had to be, if not the ideal successor to Sat AM, then at least a more acceptable one. There's a perfect universe out there where the two are spoken of in the same breath and not as a derisive comparison. Whatever you can say about its quality, and I have said a lot, Manic still fought a tornado with a drum solo, and won. And I will carry the ecstasy I felt watching that through the rest of my life. I started this project in May 2022. It's one of the longest videos I've ever worked on, both in final length and the amount of continuous time put into it. I doubt I'll ever do anything like this again. There aren't just as many things that have been lost to the fandom, like Sonic Underground, that interest me in such a way. Even Sonic Boom, which I still intend to do the full retrospective on, is still recent and liked enough to still be talked about today. And for that reason, I'm not gonna do another episode by episode play on it. Instead, I'm gonna give each season a thorough overview like I did with Sat AM at the start of this video, and the same for the games in the comic. But like I mentioned, I will also have an episode by episode review of Sat AM that's gonna be exclusive to Patreon for a full year. I'm gonna try to have that out next month and then Next month, a year from now, it'll go public. I'll have a link to the Patreon post below, and when it finally goes public, I'll put a card up in the corner. Thanks again to all my patrons and to you for watching all the way through this monster. Special thanks to Atlas, Brenna Okazaki, Disaster Dracula, Phantom General, Shea Kun, Sinistar, Sonic Fiend, Tower, and Voltic Surge. They watched both Sat AM and Sonic Underground with me. I couldn't have sat there at all and made this video without you folks and your reactions, remarks, and ideas all help make it better. Thanks a ton. All that's left for me to say is... The <laughs>